In this video, we'll look at some of the worst cards from the first two sets of the game. A time period in Yu-Gi-Oh that has some of the most broken cards ever printed, as well as some of the most terrible. And at number 10, we have Harpy Lady Sisters. This is a level 6 monster with 1950 attack, and simply has the effect, where it must be special summoned with the effect of the Elegant Egotist card, and can't be normal summoned or sent. Luckily, Elegant Egotist is actually a good card, as it has the effect where if you control a Harpy Lady on the field, you can special summon another Harpy Lady or Harpy Lady Sisters from your hand or deck. So, if you're able to get a Harpy Lady on the field, then you can use Elegant Egotist in order to special summon Harpy Lady Sisters directly from your deck, and for being a card that you can get out of your deck, 1950 in stats is not half bad. Especially when one of the strongest level 4 monsters in the game at the time was La Jin, the mystical genie of the lamp, which only had 1800 attack. However, there were a couple of problems with Harpy Lady Sisters that contributed to the card never seeing any competitive play, despite the fact that it could be cheated out of the deck. One of those was that Harpy Lady herself is pretty weak for a level 4 monster at only 1300 attack, and Elegant Egotist was unsearchable at the time, so the combo in order to pull off Harpy Lady into Harpy Lady Sisters was just not a consistent one, and since Harpy Lady Sisters has the detriment where it can't be summoned in other ways, it was basically a dead card in your hand unless you could specifically get out one named card in the field and had another named card in your hand to activate. Generally, cards which require two card combos in order to bring out that have no good ways to search out either of those combo pieces are not very consistent, which is why the next cards also failed for having a similar detriment with their unsearchable next card. However, there was support released later on that allowed you to search out Elegant Egotist, and Harpy Ladies as an archetype evolved to the point where almost all of their main deck monsters have an effect to change their name to Harpy Lady while on the field. So with being able to actually search out Elegant Egotist pretty easily, and being able to fulfill the condition to use the card easier, Harpy Lady Sisters still didn't see any competitive play, because it was better to just bring out another Harpy Lady than Harpy Lady Sisters. Because Harpy Lady Sisters still had the detriment, where it was a dead card in your hand if you drew into it, and wasn't really better than just going into one of the plethora of other Harpy Lady monsters, where you'd usually bring out Harpy Lady 1 or Cyber Harpy Lady. Which is funny because there's a lot of really good Harpy support that specifically requires a level 5 or higher Harpy Lady monster on the field to gain their extra effects. And even then, they still won't use Harpy Lady Sisters, because it's easier to go into their Synchro monster instead by just playing all their level 4 Harpy Lady monsters. So, even though they specifically created support that basically forced people to use Harpy Lady Sisters, that still didn't pan out. So it never saw any competitive play back in the day, and not in modern Harpy Lady decks either. And yet this card is still the best card on this list by a mile, which is why it's only at the number 10 spot. And at number 9, we have Fusionist. This is a level 3 fusion monster with 900 attack and 700 defense, which is important to mention because its total stats is actually less than the total stats of one of its materials. In order to bring out Fusionist normally, you have to use Polymerization plus Petite Angel and Mystic Sheep number 2. So already you have to go minus 2 in card advantage to hard bring this card out. However, if you look at Mystic Sheep number 2, it has 800 attack and 1000 defense. If you add those two values together and compare those to the values of Fusionist added together, it actually has 200 more stats total. The only advantage you have for going into Fusionist is that Fusionist has 100 more attack, which is still really bad at only 900 baseline. And this wasn't exactly uncommon for early fusion monsters. There's three others that also have stats lower than one of their materials added up. It's just Fusionist is the weakest of all of them, and was in one of the first two sets, so it makes it in this video. There's a reason no one really played fusion monsters in the early days of the game. You had to inherently go minus two in order to bring one out because the only fusion spell card was Polymerization. To the point where there were special rules in the rulebook dedicated to showing how Polymerization worked. So because of that, they didn't actually print the effect on the card in the first printing of Polymerization, and none of the fusion monsters were really worth going into anyway, because they were overly balanced, because they thought being able to special summon a monster from the extra deck was just too good. And honestly, they were completely right about that, if you look at the modern metagame that is 90% dedicated around the extra deck. Although, they were a little bit too weak, and Fusionist is kind of the poster child of that bunch. Fusionist did see competitive play later on in its life as an instant fusion target, and because it was one of the few level 3 fusion monsters in the game, and a lot of old school vanilla fusion monsters saw play because they just had the perfect type or level and were instant fusion targets, like Kaminari attack. 
But in the context of old Yu-Gi-Oh in the classic sets, Fusionist was a pretty bad card. Especially if you remember that La Jin was the strongest normal summon in the game, which had 1800 attack. Which really puts Fusionist's 900 attack into perspective about how bad that actually was. And at number 8, we have Blast Juggler. This is a level 3 monster with only 800 attack, which has the effect that if this card has managed to stay alive face up on your side of the field until your next standby phase, you can offer this card as a tribute to select and destroy two face up monsters that have 1000 or less attack. So, being able to tribute itself to destroy two monsters is not half bad. It's actually a plus one in card advantage. The problem with the cards are pretty obvious, but I'll spell them out for you. The card itself is very weak, and trying to protect this card for a full turn in order to use it on your next turn is really not worth the effort of only destroying two low attack monsters. Generally, priority targets are high attack monsters because it's rather easy to beat over monster with 1000 or less attack. Unless it was something like Spirit Reaper at the time, which was one of the few battle immune monsters in the early game. Although, in the early sets alongside Blast Juggler, we also had cards like Dark Hole, Raigeki, and Mirror Force, which could destroy all of your opponent's monsters, regardless of their attack point value. And these three cards were powerful, each one of them being banned or limited at some point in Yu-Gi-Oh's history. But early Yu-Gi-Oh also had Fissure and Trap Hole, two other cards that could trade evenly one for one in much better value. The Trap Hole worked on monsters with 1,000 or more attacks, so it was actually pretty good. The complete reversal of Blast Juggler. And there were other monsters which could actually destroy other monsters in the game at the time, with Maneater Bug probably being one of the most famous examples. So I guess they thought the effect on a monster would be too strong, so they heavily limited it with Blast Juggler. Although they went kind of crazy with the spell and trap cards because Dark Hole and Raigeki saw play all the way into the modern era, only really falling into favor once a lightning storm was printed. And at number 7, we have Electric Lizard. This is a level 3 monster with 850 attack, so another really low attack point monster, which has the effect that if a non-zombie type monster attacks Electric Lizard, it cannot attack on its following turn. So basically, it has the effect to die to one opponent's monster attack, and then allow that monster to not attack on its next turn, which is technically a positive effect. Although generally, if you're going to be playing a really weak monster like Electric Lizard, you kind of want it to provide more than just stalling out one attack from one monster on the subsequent turn. And it was also funny how it didn't work on zombie type monsters. This is kind of a theme for early Yu-Gi-Oh cards where there were certain types of monsters that had resistances to certain types of effects. Like how Steel Scorpion didn't work on machine type monsters for example. But Electric Liz's effect was technically positive and did proc if it was attacked face down even. So technically it could be used in a deck as a form of stalling. If your opponent destroyed it with one of their high priority target monsters anyway. Although it may surprise you to hear this but this card actually never saw any competitive play. And at number 6, we have Pump King, the King of Ghosts. This is a level 6 monster with 1800 attack, which has the effect that if a specific named card is face up on the field, it gains 100 attack and defense. And then, as long as that specific monster stays on the field, it will gain another 100 attack and defense during each of your standby phases for 4 turns. So that's a really convoluted way of saying that this card gains 500 attack if you have the Castle of Dark Illusions on the field. Which means after 5 turns, for the low, low price of a Tribute Summon and having a specific name monster on the field before it hits the field, you get a monster that's almost as strong as a Summoned Skull, which was the best Tribute Summon in the same time period, that just had a default 2500 attack on a level 6 monster. However, it could be boosted even further through the effect of Castle of Dark Illusions as that card had the effect that if it was flipped face up, you got to increase the attack and defense of all zombie type monsters in the field by 200 points. And then again during each of your standby phases for 4 turns afterwards. And since Pump King the King of Ghosts is zombie, it can benefit from the effects of Castle of Dark Illusions and gain an additional 800 attack after 4 turns. If you manage to bring out Pump King before the first standby phase after that card was flipped face up, which was technically possible with Ultimate Offering. However, it wasn't really worth playing Pump King the King of Ghosts for a multitude of reasons. For one, it has the same problem as Harpy Lady Sisters, in that you need a nearly unsearchable specific monster on your side of the field first before you can use it. But, it isn't even special summoned from the deck like Harpy Lady Sisters is, as you still have to go through the effort of tribute summon the card normally. And it has no inherent protection, so it dies very easily to the plethora of good spell and trap cards in the early era of the game. And also it takes forever to actually get to a good attack point value, where even back in old school Yu-Gi-Oh, taking 5 turns to almost get a summon skull as stats was too long. 
If the card didn't require a specific card to be on the field to gain its attack boost, it would still be too slow of a card to play Yu-Gi-Oh! That's the reason they kind of abandon mechanics that take multiple turns to resolve, unless it's attached to a super good effect. And only gaining 100 attack and defense on a low statted high level monster is not a super good effect. And at number 5, we have Two Pronged Attack. This is a trap card which requires you to destroy two of your monsters in order to destroy one of your opponents, which is a straight minus two in card advantage, but in one of the worst possible ways. You see, this card requires you to get two monsters on the field first, which requires you to use resources in order to accomplish that in the first place. So unless you're using something like Scapegoat, you're going to lose a significant amount of advantage in order to meet the requirements of this card. Plus, all you're doing is destroying a single one of your opponent's monsters, and you're losing a card using the trap card for two-pronged attack in the first place. So, you lose three cards on your side of the field to trade for one of your opponents. And again, this card came out when we had stuff like Dark Hole, Mirror Force, and even Fissure, which was a straight one-for-one -one trade. The only advantage two-pronged attack had over Fissure was being able to select any monster you want, and of course being a trap card so it could be used to disrupt plays during your opponent's turn. But, there wasn't really complicated plays to disrupt back in the day, and having to get two cards in the field first in order to even use it was kind of bad. The card would actually be better if it required you to discard two cards to use the effect instead of destroying two cards, because at least you don't have to dedicate resources to get those cards from your hand onto the field first. And at number 4, we have Tainted Wisdom. This is a level 3 monster with 1250 attack, so kind of low, but higher than a lot of the other cards we've talked about so far. And what it does is if this attack position card is changed to face up defense position, you gain the wonderful effect of shuffling your deck. Now, the beneficial uses of shuffling your deck include nothing. There is no real reason to shuffle your deck, as you don't actually gain a mechanical benefit from doing it. It's just technically kind of a positive effect. Although it could be detrimental if you have something on top of your deck that you put there yourself. Tainted Wisdom could have an effect to just once per turn shovel your deck and it would still be bad. The fact that you have to specifically change its battle position in order to activate the effect is why it's on this list. Tainted Wisdom was also released alongside other cards with battle changing related effects, like Dream Clown, which for the same condition got to destroy one of your opponent's monsters and Crass Clown, which had the reverse effect, where if it was changed from defense position to attack position, you got to bounce one of your opponent's monsters. Both of these cards actually had good effects on their battle changing related effects, and saw competitive play in clown control decks, although they definitely did not include Tainted Wisdom, because the only positive thing about that card is the fact that it's technically a tour guide from the Underworld target as it's a level 3 fiend. And at number 3, we have Yado Karu. This is a level 4 monster with 900 attack and 1700 defense, which also has a battle position change in effect, where if this card is changed from attack position to phase up defense position, you can place any number of cards from your hand on the bottom of your deck in any order that you desire. Now, this is a purely detrimental effect, as it can allow you to go minus in card advantage for no effect, and also requires you to change the battle position of the card in the first place to even use it. So at least with Tainted Wisdom, you weren't actively screwing yourself over by activating the effect of shuffling your deck. But just losing cards from your hand back into your deck for no reason is just really bad. One of the worst cards in the game is Pot of Generosity, and that's because it's just a minus 3 in card advantage. And Yato Karu can allow you to go minus 5 in card advantage if you desire. And the only reason this card isn't the number one on this list is because it has 1700 defense. You see, the strongest level 4 monster at the time was La Jin, who could beat over Yadokaru in battle if you set the card first. However, the second strongest monsters only had 1700 attack, and La Jin, the mystical genie of the lamp, wasn't hitting the field all the time. Generally, you'd be facing a lot of the second strongest monsters, which Yadokaru could actually wall out. And being able to wall out monsters in order to live for one turn so that you can tribute the card in order to bring out something like Summon Skull was a viable strategy back in the day. And since its defense value was just high enough to maybe be useful, it's only at the number 3 spot on this list, since the top 2 spots were a lot more useless. And at number 2, we have Gate Guardian. This is a level 11 monster with a very high attack point value of 3750, which has the effect that basically details its summoning condition just like Harpy Lady Sisters, except is nowhere near as easy to summon, as you have to attribute 3 specific named monsters on your side of the field. And these three monsters are all level 7 monsters that can't bring themselves out easily. So it requires a whole bunch of resources to get those three cards on the field. And as I've explained earlier with Pumpkin the King of Ghosts and Harpy Lady Sisters, 
getting a single named specific monster on the field first in order to activate an effect is difficult. Getting three high level ones on the field is way harder. But to the benefit of Gate Guardian, its three materials are all actually good on their own. They all have an effect where if they're attacked by a monster, they can lower the attack of the monster to zero permanently, so they're basically guaranteed to get a destroy if they're attacked into. They can only use this effect once while they're facing on the field, but you only really have to use it once. And because its materials are technically useful level 7 monsters, Gate Guardian isn't at the number one on this list, because it's also one of the best targets for Zubababa General, who can use this card in order to gain 3750 attack. And at number one, we have Great Moth. This is a level 8 monster with 2600 attack, which has the effect that's basically just conditions on how the card can be summoned, just like Gate Guardian and Harpy Lady Sisters where it can only be special summoned by tributing a Petite Moth on the fourth of your turns after Petite Moth has been equipped with the Cocoon of Evolution. Petite Moth is a level 1 normal monster with only 300 attack and 200 defense. That doesn't do anything on its own, and Cocoon of Evolution is a level 3 monster with 2000 defense, which can equip itself from your hand to a Petite Moth on your side of the field, where it grants its original attack and defense to that Petite Moth. Which means you can make Petite Moth's defense become 2000. And then you need to have Great Moth in your hand on your fourth turn after just waiting around for Petite Moth being equipped with Cocoon of Evolution on the field. Now, there's a whole lot wrong with all of this. First of all, you can only equip Cocoon of Evolution to Petite Moth while it's phase up on the field, which means in order to activate it on your first turn in order to get the ball rolling, Petite Moth is going to have to be in an attack position with zero attack, since Cocoon of Evolution replaces its original attack with its own, which is zero. So, if you wanted to get Petite Moth on the field in defense position in order to have 2000 defense with Cocoon of Evolution's effect, you'd have to protect it for a turn and put it in defense position, or special summon it with something like Monster Reborn in defense position. So at the get go, it's already kind of difficult to just set up the combo because it's ridiculously vulnerable. And then you also have to protect it for four turns, which as I've described in the Pumpkin King of Ghost sections, is a very difficult with how strong early spell and trap card removal was. And then, you need to have a Great Moth in your hand during the fourth turn after you could with Petite Moth and Cocoon of Evolution. Which means you need to have found a way to search it out by then, and can only be brought out on the fourth of your turns. So if it's the fifth of your turns after equipping it, then the effect is no longer live and you can't bring out Great Moth. And that's not even to mention the fact that Petite Moth and Cocoon of Evolution require named cards working with each other, which requires searching those cards out in order to get the combo started in the first place. Now, there are two other cards that can be brought out on different turns, with Larva Moth probably being the worst of them all, because it has all of the same terrible conditions as Great Moth, but only has 500 attack, which actually makes this kind of one of the worst cards in the game, period. Because not only is Larva Moth bad on its own, the fact that it requires all of the convoluted requirements of Great Moth in order to accomplish its bad stats is kind of hilariously bad. But at least you only need to wait two turns in order to bring out Larva Moth instead of four. And there's also a mega version called Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth, which can be brought out on the 6th turn or later with the same conditions as the other two cards. And at least Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth can be brought out on the 6th turn or later instead of exactly on the 6th turn like the previous two cards. However, Perfectly Ultimate Great Moth didn't come out until later and wasn't actually released alongside the original 4 card package. So really, this spot should be just the whole archetype of the Petite Moth and the Cocoon of Evolutions evolutions. Because the whole system of how this works is just another example of them trying out mechanics of having cards wait around for a couple of turns before they realize the speed of the game was just too fast for these kinds of cards to ever properly resolve. And the cards that they brought out after all of that waiting around were just not worth the effort. Especially since they were essentially vanilla monsters that just acted as big beat sticks. Later on, they did try this mechanic again with the ultimate insect monsters, Although that archetype failed for a different reason. But at least it was better than the Cocoon of Evolution mechanic. And also, as a side note, much later on they printed a trap card called Corrosive Scales. Which basically gives an insect type monster the effect that Great Moth was supposed to have from its anime appearance. Of lowering the attack of your opponent's monsters. If the moth had the effect of Corrosive Scales built into it baseline, it would still be bad and not worth being played because the mechanic of Cocoon of Evolution. Although, they did release the spell card Cocoon of Ultra Evolution, which can allow you to cheat the card out directly from your deck, as kind of a way to finally let people play the card if they really wanted to in an actual duel. But even then, you're better off bringing out the reprinted Insect Queen card instead. 
In order to make things more interesting for the people who've already seen all these videos, I decided to add in some extra bad cards between each segment as bonus content. Let's start off with Armageddon Designator. This is basically a trap card version of Crossout Designator, except a lot worse. Crossout Designator allows you to banish a card from your deck in order to negate cards of the same name as the card you banished for a turn. While Armageddon Designator requires you to banish a card from your hand to stop all cards of the same card's name from being activated for the rest of the duel. Now, while Armageddon Designator does last a lot longer, having to use a card from your hand makes it infinitely harder to use, because that requires you to have the specific card in your hand already that you want to negate of your opponents, and also loses you extra card advantage by losing the card from your hand as well on top of being a trap card, so you wouldn't even be able to use it until your next turn either, unlike Crossout, which can be used during your turn to stop your opponent's potential hand traps. If you're playing a mirror match though, and like to run a bunch of normal traps, then Armageddon Designator might be useful, but in every other case, it's too incredibly narrow to be worth a glance. In this video, we'll be going over some of the worst cards from the earliest portions of Yu-Gi-Oh!, this time going over cards from Magic Ruler and Feral Servant, the third and fourth sets ever released to the TCG. And starting off at number 10, we have Final Destiny. This is a spell card which has the effect where you have to discard 5 cards from your hand in order to activate it, where you gain the effect to destroy all cards on the field. Now at first glance, the cost for the effect seems appropriate. You're destroying all the cards in the field, of course it would cost something like discarding 5 cards from your hand. However, the amount of cost for this effect is rarely actually worth the effort. If you were going second in the time period and your opponent manages to have a full established board of cards, you'll basically have to ditch your entire hand in order to get rid of it, and then have nothing to extend further, since this was a time period before graveyard effects were really a thing, and there were just other powerful staple cards you could use instead. In some of those first sets, they had cards like Regeki and Dark Cold to just get rid of all the monsters, and they also had Giant Trunade and Harpy's Feather Duster to get rid of all the spells and traps. None of these cards have a cost associated to their full board wipe effects, so it's odd that Final Destiny, which combines these two cards, has such a drastic discard cost of 5, which is probably the highest discard cost of every card in the game, which specifies a specific amount of cards to discard. For the effect of discarding all 5 cards from your hand, only destroying all cards in the field is not good enough. This card should also allow you to special summon a monster from the graveyard afterwards, double your life point value, and then cut your opponent's life point value in half, and even then it might not be worth a 5 card discard, because outside of your first turn, it's kind of hard to fulfill the conditions of this card in the first place. Even though early Yu-Gi-Oh had cards like pre arata Sinister Serpent to constantly refill your hand with discard fodder. However, it does have a pretty good effect if you just disregard that ridiculous cost, and there are very few cards that can even destroy everything on the field. So it's tentatively only at the number 10 spot on this list. And at number 9, we have Darkness Approaches. This is a spell card which has the effect where you can discard two cards from your hand to change one monster on the field to face down defense position, without changing its battle position, and was unique in that it was one of the few cards in the game that could put a monster in face down attack position before the card received an errata when Link Monsters came out, specifically so that you couldn't use it on Link Monster. However, even in the time period when it still had a unique effect, it still never saw any competitive play because the discard cost of 2 is too high. Generally, if you're having to discard cards from your hand for an effect, it better be something amazing, like being able to search any spell card from your deck or recovering any spell from your graveyard, not a worse Book of Moon. That's on spell speed 1. This is another one of those early cards with a decent effect, which is too high of a cost associated for that effect. And at number 8, we have Ceremonial Bell. This is a level 3 monster with 1850 defense that has the effect where both players must keep their hands revealed. Now, this may surprise you to hear, but Ceremonial Bell is technically a floodgate. However, it has to be one of the weakest kinds of floodgates in the game. That being, your opponent just has to reveal their hand. There are certain cards in the game that require them to be revealed in the hand in order to activate their effects. So if their hand is always revealed, then they can't activate the cost of revealing the card. However, in early Yu-Gi-Oh, there weren't very many cards with this kind of effect. And the ones that did, weren't very good. So I don't think it was actually intended to be a floodgate at all, and just a way to gain information on your opponent's hand. But seeing as it has zero attack, it's kind of hard to get this card on the field in order to activate the effect immediately as the best way to use it is setting the card face down and hoping it survives being attacked in battle, which it should be able to do with 1850 defense, as some of the strongest monsters at the time that didn't require tribute only had around 1800 attack. But there were much better options in the game already, 
most of which were vanilla monsters that didn't have an effect, which was technically better than this effect monster with a bad effect, since at least they benefited from vanilla support. And the funny thing is, they also released a trap card version of this card called Respect Play. So, if all you wanted was the effect of floodgating your opponent's hand by having it constantly revealed during their turn, then you wouldn't even need to use Ceremonial Bell anyway. And at number 7, we have Curse of Fiend. This is a unique spell card which has the effect where you can change the battle position of all attack position monsters on the field to defensive position and vice versa. Additionally, these battle positions cannot be changed during the turn this card is activated, except with a card effect. So, being able to change all of your opponent's attack position monsters to defense position was not a half bad effect in early Yu-Gi-Oh! Because usually it allowed you to destroy them by battle as most strong monsters had low defense points. And it's even a normal spell card, which means you can use it during your turn in order to set up your plays to attack over all of your opponent's monsters. Or else you would be able to if it wasn't for the last restriction on this card. Which states you can only activate this card during your standby phase. Now, this is another card with a unique mechanic because you can't actually use normal spell cards during your standby phase. So, one would think that if you had this card in your hand and your standby phase is happening, you're allowed to choose to use the effect during the standby phase in order to force all of your opponent's monsters to change their battle positions, but that's not actually how it works. You need to set this card on the field first like a trap card, then wait until your next standby phase where you'll have the option to use it because for some reason the rulings of this card works in the way where it has to be on the field first in order to activate its rule breaking effect. However, another distinction about Curse of Fiend, since it's not an actual trap card, is that if you set this card during your standby phase with something like Dust Tornado's second effect, then you can activate the card immediately because normal spell cards can be activated during the same turn that they're set. If a card says it breaks the rules of the game, then it just breaks the rules of the game. But sometimes there's extra rules to the game for cards that break the rules of the game, like in the case of Curse of Fiend, which is kind of hilarious to think about. And at number 6, we have Bombardment Beetle. This is a level 2 flip effect insect type monster, which has the effect that when it's flipped face up, you can pick up and see one face down defense position monster your opponent controls, and if it's an effect monster, the card is destroyed. But if it's not, then it's returned to its original position and nothing happens. So basically, this card destroys a face down monster on the field when it's flipped face up, which means it's a straight up downgrade to a card like Maneater Bug, which is also a level 2 insect type monster with a flip effect, but at least Maneater Bug can destroy a monster regardless of its battle position. And the reason I mention Maneater Bug is because Maneater Bug was released in the first set of Yu-Gi-Oh! and didn't really see much competitive play. And for some reason, they thought to release another Maneater Bug with just a worse effect that surprisingly didn't see any competitive play at all. Because even Maneater Bug wasn't that great. And at number 5, we have Deep Sea Warrior. This is a level 5 monster with 1600 attack, which has the effect where as long as the Umi field spell is face up on the field, this monster is unaffected by spell card effects. Which hilariously enough means it's immune to the beneficial effects of the various Umi spell cards. However, the original Umi spell card didn't provide an attack boost anyway, since Deep Sea Warrior is a warrior type, so this didn't matter very much for the early days of the game. And there were some pretty powerful spell effects where having immunity to their effects was beneficial, like Raigeki, Dark Hole, or even Fissure. However, Deep Sea Warrior is a level 5 monster which means it requires one tribute for its summon. And at the time, the power level of level 4 monsters was around 1800, which means it couldn't compete with non-tribute summon monsters in terms of attack power, which meant its spell immunity was kind of useless. Because it could just be destroyed by pretty much any competitive monster in the game at the time, since the absolute lowest attack power of usable level 5 monsters was 1900, as seen with Air Knight Parshath which saw tons of competitive playing because it actually had a good effect while having a 1900 attack body in a level 5 monster. There was another level 5 monster release called the Legendary Fisherman, which also had spell immunity while Umi was face up on the field, but it also had protection for monsters as it couldn't be targeted for attacks, where your opponent could just attack you directly if it was the only card you controlled. And the Legendary Fisherman had a higher than 1800 attack, so it could actually compete with cards like La Jin, but still wasn't used because it was way too weak of a monster, for requiring a specific spell card on the field, and requiring a tribute for its summon. And the Legendary Fisherman and Deep Sea Warrior were released in the same set, so if the better version of Deep Sea Warrior didn't see any play, it's probably easy to guess that Deep Sea Warrior didn't see any competitive play as well. And at number 4, we have Performance of the Sword. This is a level 6 ritual monster, which doesn't have an effect, and simply has the normal ritual summoning mechanic, 
where you need to use its specific spell card in order to tribute monsters from your hand or field that equal or exceed its level in order to bring it out from your hand. And this in of itself is why the card is bad. Because early ritual monsters were inherently clunky by requiring two specific cards in your hand in order to bring them out, as well as requiring tributes on top of that, where you have to go at least minus two to bring out performance of the sword from your hand. Assuming you had all the combo pieces to do it in the first place. And for going minus two, only having 1950 attack is not really worth the effort. This is not the same as something like Darkness Approaches, which also requires a similar amount of card disadvantage in order to use the effect, because at least Darkness Approaches allows you to use any two cards as discard, whereas you need to have two specific cards in your hand to perform the Ritual Summon Performance of the Sword. There were three other Ritual Monsters released alongside Performance of the Sword, that being Hungry Burger, Crab Turtle, and Relinquished. Of them, only Relinquish has an actual effect, and it's a pretty good effect too. The other ones are all also equally terrible along the same veins as Performance of the Sword, and never saw any competitive play. Because rituals as a mechanic are so inherently bad that the only way to make them playable is to just actually make them broken, as seen with the Necroz and Dry Trot archetypes. And at number three, we have Solomon's Logbook. This is a trap card which simply has the effect to skip your next standby phase. Now, as we all remember, the standby phase is that short phase which happens after you draw a card and before your main phase one, and generally exists as a way for card effects to activate that you can't really interact with meaningfully outside of quick effects. Think of cards like Treeborn Frog which come back during the standby phase. However, there is another thing that happens during the standby phase pretty regularly, and that's paying the cost for certain effects that are continuous. Around the same time Solomon's Logbook came out, they also released a card called Imperial Order which negated all spell effects on the field, but required you to pay 700 life points during each of your standby phases. So I would assume the intended synergy of Solomon's Logbook was to be able to skirt the cost of certain effects. Maybe something even big like Mirror Wall, which had a 2,000 life point cost during your standby phase. Or even later on with Mirage of Nightmare, which would discard up to four cards from your hand during your standby phase. There are some cards which can benefit from having your standby phase skipped. And even with those cards, you still probably wouldn't want to play Solomon's Logbook, because that's all it does. And avoiding costs of certain effects is not that big a deal. Especially not a trap card that has to exist in the field for a full turn before you're able to use it. This card kind of falls into those categories where technically it's a useful effect, but it's just not a very good one. And it's a technically good effect that requires synergy for it to do anything at all. And even then, the most useful applications of the things you can do with this is to simply avoid pain costs, which are generally not a big deal, unless it's attached to something like Mirage of Nightmare, which is currently banned. And in number two, we have Wall Shadow. This is a level seven monster with no effect that only has a summoning condition where it can only be special summoned with the effect of Magical Labyrinth first. Magical Labyrinth is an equip spell card which can only be equipped to a Labyrinth Wall. And Labyrinth Wall is a level five neural monster with 3000 defense, so it requires a tribute in order to get on the field. However, Labyrinth Wall has zero attack, so if you equip Labyrinth Wall with Magical Labyrinth, then you can special summon out Wall Shadow from your deck, which gives you a grand total of 1600 attack points with no meaningful effect, and thus pretty bad. Remember how we talked about Deep Sea Warrior being kind of bad for a level 5 monster with 1600 attack? Well, Wall Shadow is much harder to bring out, because one of the combo pieces required also requires a tribute summon. And if all you want is a 3000 defense monster, you can just kind of leave Labyrinth Wall in the field instead for much less effort. And also, bringing out Wall Shadow requires you to play specific cards, which is incredibly difficult to get in the field and activate in the first place. A lot of early Yu-Gi-Oh! required incredibly specific cards to interact with each other without real ways to search them out. So no one played those cards because they were so ridiculously inefficient to. And there was really no reason to play Wall Shadow anyway, unless you were to combo with something like Spike Shield with Chain, so it could gain 1600 defense boost if it's tacked or maybe even Magnum Shield, since it's technically a warrior type monster, which can increase its attack by its defense. So Magnum Shield can give the wall a 3000 attack boost, which is significant for an equip spell card. But both of these cards are released over 10 years after Wall Shadow was. So if you really want to make the best use of Wall Shadow for some kind of gimmicky deck, Magnum Shield is definitely the way to go, which was just not a thing when this card first came out. And at number one, we have Drill Bug. This is a level 2 monster with 1100 attack, which is actually kind of high for a level 2 monster. Where it has the effect that if it inflicts battle damage to your opponent, you can select a specific card named Parasite Parasite from your deck, and then place that card on top of your deck. So basically it's a searcher for Parasite Parasite, but it doesn't even add the card to your hand. 
and requires it to inflict damage first. Normally, a searcher just adds the card from your deck to your hand on their summon, or that's how it became normal later on in Yu-Gi-Oh! Likely, Drillbug was one of the first archetype searches in the game, which could explain why it did its search very poorly. And the card it searched out, Parasite Parasite, wasn't even that good either. As what it did was have the effect that if it was flipped face up and survived the battle, you could then add this card to your opponent's deck face up. Where if your opponent drew the card, then it would special summon itself immediately, inflict a thousand points of damage to its controller, and then turn all the monsters the player controlled into insect type monsters. So a synergy could be stated that if you give Drillbug to your opponent after you set up your opponent with Parasite Parasite, then attack into Drillbug with a low attack monster you control to inflict damage, forcing your opponent to search out Parasite Parasite and put it on top of their deck, this could be a convoluted way of getting the intended purpose of searching the card out for your opponent. Maybe, because Drillbug's effect is optional so they can just choose not to do that. Two years later, they would release a support card for Parasite Parasite called Jade Insect Whistle, which simply forces your opponent to search out one insect type monster and then place that card on top of their deck, which still doesn't really solve the problem of Parasite Parasite not being very good for all the effort it requires in order to set up and use properly, something that wasn't solved until Duel Links came out, where there was literally a skill that just added the cards to your opponent's deck at the start of the duel, rendering Drill Bug completely useless, and Parasite Parasite actually useful, even though it wasn't super useful beforehand. We'll say Jade Insect Whistle absolutely saw play in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links because that 1,000 light point burn was actually a bigger deal when your light points only started off at 4,000, rather than normal Yu-Gi-Oh! where 1,000 light point burn is not worth the effort. If Parasite Parasite did double the amount of damage, it still wouldn't be worth the effort to activate for its burn damage alone outside of using a skill to auto-include it into your opponent's deck. Force Requisition is a trap card which can only be activated after you discard from your hand. Then your opponent has to discard from their hand any time you discard from your own. And since this does work with discard costs, it seems like the perfect card to hand rip your opponent for a lot with a card like Final Destiny. But, you see, there are two things holding this card back. For one, it has a specific trigger to even be activated in the first place, so it does not go live until after you've already discarded once. And two, it's a trap card, so it won't be live for your first turn and all of your combos that you might discard with, making it more of a going third card. So because of its double whammy of slowing the card down, this is one of the strongest sounding bad cards in the game. In this video, we'll be looking at some of the earliest sets in the game, more specifically Legacy of Darkness and Labyrinth of Nightmare, and going over the 10 worst cards from these early parts of Yu-Gi-Oh! And at number 10, we have Double Snare. This is a spell card which simply has the effect where you can destroy one phase of card in the field which has an effect that negates trap card effects. So it's an incredibly specific counter to a specific type of card. Although it was pretty obviously targeted at Jinzo, which is a 2400 attack level 6 monster that has the passive effect to negate all trap effects. And later on it could be used on Royal Decree since it works on any face up card that negates trap effects and not just monsters. However, funny enough, this card cannot be used on Trap Master because that card does not have an effect which negates trap effects and simply has an effect to destroy trap cards. Now, as far as incredibly specific counter cards go, it at least is usable on more targets than something like Griffin Wing, which was designed only to counter a specific card in the game. However, when this card came out, the game already had cards like Raigeki, Dark Hole, and Fissure, which could do the same job without being incredibly specific on their targets. And there was even Torrential Tribute and Bottomless Trap Hole, which were released in these two sets, which are also just better ways of destroying monster cards. Although granted, those two do not work on a card like Jinzo. Now, Jinzo did see a lot of competitive play. So chances are, if you used Double Snare, you might have actually been able to resolve the effect, which is why it's only at the number 10 spot on this list. And at number 9, we have Cyclone Laser. This is an equip spell card which can only be equipped to a specific monster named Gradius, and it has the effect to increase its attack by 300 and granted piercing battle damage. Now, piercing battle damage at this time was kind of rare, but not unheard of, because these sets also released a card called Air Knight Parshath, which is a level 5 monster with 1900 attack, which both has piercing battle damage and allows you to draw a card if it inflicted battle damage. It was actually pretty heavily played as a staple card because it allowed you to gain immediate advantage if you successfully resolve the effect a single time, which was useful against popular staple cards like Spirit Reaper. So why wasn't Cyclone Laser good? Well, equip spell cards inherently are not very good because they're incredibly vulnerable to all types of removal because if the monster it's equipped to is removed from the field or simply flipped face down, then the card is sent to the graveyard, in addition to being vulnerable to spell card removal as well. And it was an incredibly specific target, which heavily limits the usefulness of the card. 
where they better be super good if they're going to be only usable on a single card. And Gradius is not incredibly good. It's a level 4 vanilla monster with only 1200 attack, when these two sets included a monster like Gemini Elf, which was a 1900 attack level 4 monster. So only boosting its attack up to 1500 and granting piercing damage was not really good, and would need to do a lot more than that in order to see any kind of competitive play. Especially since the sets also release powerful equip spell cards like United We Stand and Mage Power, which provide massive attack boost to any monster you equip them to, and not just incredibly specific low attack vanilla monsters. And at number 8, we have Fang Sheng Mirror. This is a spell card which has the effect where you get to look at your opponent's hand, and if they have a spirit monster in their hand, you can discard that monster to the graveyard. So if your opponent does not have a spirit monster in their hand, the card will only just let you look at your opponent's hand. Now, if you're able to resolve the effect correctly, it's not a half bad effect. The problem is that people don't really play spirit monsters, and they weren't very heavily played when this card first came out either, despite the fact it did come out in the same set as Yatagarasu, which was one of the longest banned cards in the game. Although part of the reason Yatagarasu was banned was because of a combo that would search it out of the deck anyway, and then use it in a way where a card like Fangsheng Mirror wouldn't be able to counter it. And there were other spirit monsters that did see competitive play over the years, but only very niche amounts of it, and nowhere near enough where you'd want to run a specific counter card like Fangsheng Mirror. So, it's never really seen any play, and probably won't unless there's some kind of really good broken spirit monster support released in the future, where even then you're probably better off just running a common staple over this incredibly specific counter card. Although it does at least have a positive effect, even if it's not a very powerful effect, which cannot really be said for a lot of the higher cards on this list. And at number 7, we have Jam Breeding Machine. This is a continuous spell card that while it's on the field, it basically floodgates the player who's using it, as it prevents you from summoning any monsters except for slime tokens. And then the card itself will summon a slime token, but only during your standby phase, and only one of them per turn. Although the effect is not a hard once per turn, so if you have three copies of Jam Breeding Machine, you'll be able to summon three tokens every turn. So here's the problem with this card. The beneficial effect does not take place until your next turn, since it's almost impossible to activate this card before your standby phase to gain immediate benefits. So you can avoid the negative detriments by just using this card during your main phase too, and after you've already summoned monsters for the turn, but then you're still kind of stuck with a card that's floodgating you. If you can give your opponent Jam Brady Machine and force them to activate it, that's actually beneficial, which is not a good selling point of a card that you're trying to use on your own. The restrictions of locking you out of all summons just kind of defeats the purpose of summoning the tokens in the first place. And if you go the route of just removing Jam Brooding Machine from the field with something like Emergency Provisions, it's also not really worth it, because it only summons a single token per turn. So under best case scenarios of trying to take advantage of this card, and you use it last at the end of your main phase too, get one token during your standby phase, and then send it to the graveyard with Emergency Provisions in order to end the floodgate on yourself, and gain 1000 life points, it's basically a two card combo that gets you a level one token monster on the field, which is not worth the minus one in card advantage. However, if you instead try to stall out for as many turns as possible and gradually accumulate a lot of tokens, then use emergency provisions in order to send it to the graveyard later, that's really the only way to gain value from the card, as you need to get at least two tokens on the field to be able to pay for the cost of using emergency provisions and sending Jam Burning Machine to the graveyard, which would require you to stall out for two whole turns and protect your incredibly vulnerable tokens. Now, one of the benefits of the tokens summoned is that they don't have any restrictions on them, like say a scapegoat token does, but that's about as far as the benefits go on the card, and you really have to go out of your way to make this card work for you, as it's not really good out of the gate, and it's not really worth the effort of going through the hoops in order to get the card to work for you, unless you really want to play a gimmicky wetlands beatdown deck. And at number 6, we have Nuvia the Wicked. This is a level 4 monster with 2000 attack, which has the effect where it destroys itself on its normal summon. And with only 800 defense, it's not likely to survive being set on the field first and then flip face up. However, if it does manage to survive this convoluted summoning method, then it has another negative effect, where it loses 200 attack for each monster your opponent controls. So, if your opponent has a single monster, it goes down to 1800 attack. In this same set which had Nuvia the Wicked, Gemini Elf was also released which was a no-strings-attached 1900 attack beat stick, so it could attack over Nuvia the Wicked with its negative effect being applied. I'm not really sure why this card had two negative effects applied to it, when it either one of them was enough in order to balance the card next to a vanilla monster like Gemini Elf. And at number 5, we have Jam Defender. This is a continuous trap card which has the effect where if your opponent declares an attack, you can redirect the attack to one of your revival jams instead. 
Revival Jam is a 1500 attack monster which has the effect that if it's destroyed by battle, you can pay 1000 life points to special summon it in defense position during the next standby phase. So the synergy between these two cards is pretty apparent. The card can bring itself back if it's destroyed, and you can use Jam Defender in order to protect your other monsters from at least one attack. The problem though is that Revival Jam comes back a little bit too late in order for it to be super useful, as you don't get the card back until your next turn. And it only comes back once it's destroyed by battle, so any other kind of removal will render it completely unusable. Which means Jam Defender itself would be completely useless if Revival Jam is not on the field, which is the main problem of the card. It's an incredibly specific card, like Cyclone Laser, which only works on one specific monster, and the monster it works on is not easy to search out or very easy to use. If Revival Jam could come back during the battle phase, it might be useful as a way to stall out your opponent's attacks. But since it doesn't come back until your next turn, it at best stops one attack, and there are much better battle traps to play in the game that are not incredibly specific. And at number 4, we have Return of the Doomed. This is a spell card which has the effect where you can discard a monster card from your hand in order to return a monster from your graveyard to your hand that was destroyed as a result of battle this turn. Now, the main problem with this card is the fact that it's a normal spell card, so it can only be activated during your turn. And generally, you don't enter the battle phase under the notion that you're wanting your monsters to get destroyed by battle this turn. This kind of effect is much more useful during your opponent's turn if you really wanted to return one of those cards to your hand, which is probably not worth it because of the inherent cost of the card as well. It's a minus one in card advantage because you have to discard a monster specifically, and the activation requirement for it is only a card that you've gotten on the field in the first place and managed to get destroyed by battle. Of which, there are not too many cards that fit the distinction that you really want to get back to your hand at a minus one cost. When you can instead just bring out the monster from the graveyard with something like Monster Reborn or Call of the Haunted, which did a much better job of getting cards back to your graveyard without making you go minus one in card advantage. Really, it's that minus one in card advantage that really sets this card as kind of bad because of just how important card advantage is in Yu-Gi-Oh. If this card could be used without having to discard, it still wouldn't be very useful, but it wouldn't be on this list most likely, as there's even a similar card called the Warrior Return It Alive, which was released in the same set as Return of the Doom, and only saw a very niche amount of competitive play over the years. And that's mainly because it didn't require any costs, even if it was restricted to only warrior-type monsters. And at number three, we have Fairy Guardian. This is a monster which has the effect where you contribute in order to return a spell card from your graveyard to the bottom of your deck as long as it was sent to the graveyard this turn by your opponent. So, at least Return of the Doomed allowed you to recur the advantage directly to your hand. Fairy Guardian kind of has the same problem of going minus one for the effect, but it's not even a useful effect. If you could just return any spell card from your graveyard to the bottom of the deck with its effect without any other kind of conditions, it would still be bad. The fact that it requires a target that was sent to the graveyard by your opponent makes it laughably bad. It's basically a vanilla monster with how useless that effect is, and it doesn't even have good stats with 1000 attack and defense on a level 3 monster. Now, there are three other cards which were created in the same vein and released in the sets, but at least those ones had better stats. The Forgiving Maiden contributed itself in order to return a monster destroyed by battle to your hand, similar to Return of the Doom, but it at least had 2000 defense which was a useful stat line for a level 4 or lower monster. Lady Panther contributed itself in order to return a destroyed monster by battle to the top of your deck, and Crimson Sentry contributed itself to return a monster destroyed by battle to the bottom of your deck, and both of these cards were equally terrible, as they didn't even return the card to your hand like the Forgiving Maiden did, nor did they have noteworthy stats. Although even they are better than Fairy Guardian, because activating the effects is actually more likely to happen, because the trigger of a monster being destroyed by battle is much easier to set up and see in a common game than the trigger of your opponent sending one of your spell cards to the graveyard during your turn. Because to make matters worse, all of these effects are spell speed 1 and thus only usable during your turn. So, how could anything be worse than Fairy Guardian? Well, at least it can be used as a vanilla beat stick, without losing you a whole bunch of advantage. And at number 2, we have a dual spot with Super Robo Lady and Super Robo Yaru. These are two level 6 fusion monsters with only 1200 attack, and they both have the effect where they can return themselves from the field to the extra deck in order to special summon the other one from the extra deck, but not on the same turn that they were special summoned to the field. And then they both have different kinds of effects when attacking, where Super Robo Lady gains 1000 attack if it's attacking directly, and Super Robo Yaru gains 1000 attack if it's battling a monster. And of those two effects, Super Robo Yaru does have a more useful one, because it means it can actually beat over something like a Gemini Elf. Now, what's bad about these cards is that they're early game fusion monsters and have two incredibly weak vanilla monsters as their materials. And also, when they were released, 
There wasn't really fusion support to help get these cards in your hand in order to actually perform the fusion summons in the first place. You basically had to rely on hard drawing the two materials and a polymerization, and going minus two in card advantage in order to bring out one of the two fusion monsters. And for going minus two in order to bring out one of these two cards, they definitely did not do enough on the field to really justify the amount of investment required to bring them out. Although, to be fair, neither did most of the early game fusions. And also, their ability to tag out with each other was not even good because you couldn't actually do it until your next turn. And it was a spell speed one effect. So they were both level six fusion monsters that were technically targets for fusion weapon, which I know some people in the comments might mention as a benefit of it, which would provide a 1500 attack boost. Although that card wasn't released until a year later and wasn't a better attack boost than just United We Stand or Mage Power, which was available at their release. They could also be brought out with Power Bond to double their attacks since they're machine type fusion monsters, but that doesn't really solve the problem of them still not having the consistency tools needed in order to pull that off without going minus two in card advantage. However, five years after they were released, they did introduce a specific support card for them called Cybernetic Zone, which on a quick play spell card allowed you to banish a machine type fusion monster until the end of the turn, and when it returned to the field it had its attack doubled, but then it was destroyed during the next standby phase. And since these two cards could tag out with each other, you could use Cybernetic Zone to protect them during your opponent's turn, get a 2400 attack monster with their benefits during your turn, and then tag it out during the main phase too in order to prevent them from being destroyed. And even this combo was not worth the effort, but at least there was a useful application of their ability to tag out with each other now. And at least they could somewhat be useful, despite the massive amount of card disadvantage you incurred. And at number one, we have Chosen One. This is a spell card which requires you to select three cards in your hand, one monster and two non-monster cards, then your opponent randomly chooses one of the three cards. If the Chosen card is a monster card, it's special summon and you send the other two cards to the graveyard. If it's not the monster, you instead send all the cards to the graveyard. So basically, you have a chance to go minus three in order to special summon a monster from your hand. Or you have a two-thirds chance of going minus four for no effect. If this card could just special some of that monster from your hand with the same cost without the random chance, it would still be terrible. The fact that you have a less than 50% chance of actually being able to summon the monster just makes it that much worse. In fact, this card is so bad, it's probably one of the worst cards ever made, which probably wasn't specifically designed to be bad, like Cold Feet or a Jar of Generosity. It's really saying something when a card is worse than Cold Feet, a card that was made as a joke in order to lampoon a banned card, where the easiest way to affix Chosen One would be to simply make it so you don't discard the two non-monster cards when you use the effect, or discard any of the cards ever. If its ability lets you special summon the monster from your hand if it was chosen, and then leave the other two cards in your hand, it would be a perfectly average mediocre gamble card. And on a failure state, if it just lets you keep all the cards in your hand, it would still be an average mediocre card. The fact that you lose all of the card advantage in either scenario is what easily makes this one of the worst cards on this list. It would probably be in the top 10 of just worst cards of all time as well. Shift is a trap card that allows you to change the target of one of your opponent's attacks or spell or trap cards to another target you control. This is a kind of card that sounds like it's probably super useful until you remember how few spells and trap cards actually target monsters, especially in the early days of Yu-Gi-Oh! and how you still lose a monster anyway since it doesn't stop anything, just shifts a negative effect away to another card. Plus, it's a trap card, so you have to wait a turn to even try and gain the mediocre protection. And you have to have another monster to shift the effects to anyway from, which adds another layer of difficulty. So the card is just way too slow and clunky for Yu-Gi-Oh! for an effect that sounds decent at first glance. In this video, we're looking at some of the earliest sets of the game. More specifically, Pharaonic Guardian and Magician's Force, and going over 10 of the worst cards from these early parts of Yu-Gi-Oh! And at number 10, we have Great Dizard. This is a level 6 monster with 1900 attack, which has the effect that it gains effects based on the amount of monsters destroyed by battle. Where if it destroys one monster by battle, it now has the effect where any spell or trap card that targets it has their effects negated and is destroyed. If you destroy two monsters, you can tribute this card during your main phase in order to special summon Fushio Richie from your hand or deck. Now, what's really unique about this card is it's one of, if not the only monster in the game, which gains effects based on the amount of monsters destroyed by battle. Where usually destroying monsters by battle is a trigger in order to activate a singular effect, like with Fire Dog bringing out a fire monster with 200 defense every time it destroys something by battle. There's also a Blackluster Link monster which has three different effects that can activate each time it destroys a monster by battle, which is still unique from this card's requirement of destroying specific amounts for different effects. Where obviously you're trying to destroy up to two monsters so you can use his ability to special summon the boss monster from the deck, although Fushio Richie is not that great of a card either. Fushio Richie is a level 7 monster with 2600 attack, which has the effect where it can't be normal summoned or set and must be special summoned by Great Dizard. 
It also has an effect where it can special summon any zombie monster from your graveyard, although the trigger for this is that it must be flipped face up, which is kind of a weird requirement for a monster that can only be special summoned, and especially for one that has kind of a difficult summon requirement in the first place. It does, however, have an effect that lets you change it to face down defense position once per turn, so you can eventually use the ability to special summon a zombie from your graveyard. Additionally, it also has protection, where it negates and destroys spell or trap cards that target it, just like the first effect of Great Dizard. Now, a little side note about this card. Its Japanese name is actually Nosferatu Lich, so it's really weird that it was given such an incredibly different name in the TCG. Anyways, for a monster that requires two battle phases of setup on a one tribute monster, the payoff is having to wait an additional turn for the card to flip itself face down, and then back up in order to maybe special summon a zombie from the graveyard. Now, being able to special summon a zombie from the graveyard is good, but not good enough to be worth all the investment required. The only reason Great Desert is only at number 10 on this list is because at least the effect is somewhat unique. And the protection it gets is pretty decent as well, since this is a set that introduced cards like Raigeki Break, which could target and destroy it, which it can become immune to. Although even in the early time period this card was released, slowly tribute summoning a monster with only 1900 attack was not very good, so it saw all of no competitive play. And at number 9, we have Cobra Man Sakuzi. This is a level 3 monster with 1400 defense, which has the effect when it's flipped face up, you can look at all of your opponent's face down spell or trap cards. And also, once per turn, you can change it to face down defense position. Now, the set this card came out in had the theme of cards being able to put themselves back face down, and then having effects whenever they flip face up, like Fujio Richie. And while some of them were pretty decent effects, some of them were like Cobra Man and had absolutely mediocre effects, which technically were positive. It also had pretty mediocre stats at only 800 attack and 1400 defense, which wasn't really enough to push any kind of big damage or survive the beaters of the day. Its typing and attribute weren't anything special at the time either, so it was basically just pack filler. And at number 8, we have Pharaoh's Treasure. This is a trap card with a rather unique effect, where when you activate it, you shuffle it back into your deck face up. Then, when you draw this card that was face up, you get to add one card from your graveyard to your hand, then you send this card from your hand to the graveyard. So basically, it allows you to add any card in your graveyard back to your hand, which technically is a very good effect. They don't really have cards in the game which allow you to add any card in your graveyard back to your hand, so there obviously had to be some kind of cost for this. Especially since this direct one-for-one -one trading doesn't lose you card advantage, like you normally do for effects like this, like with Boogie Trap or Magical Stone Excavation. However, the fact that you do end up with this card face up into your deck and then draw it later is kind of a very hard condition to fulfill. This effect can be considered a quest condition, where you have to wait a few turns and then maybe even try to do something special in order to increase your chances of getting it for the payoff of the actual effect. And for all of the payoff of having to actually resolve the card, simply recurring one card from your graveyard is honestly not that good. If the card lets you search out a card from your deck instead, even that might not be good enough. Did you know we have a card in the game called Sales Pitch, which is a trap card that allows you to search out any card from your deck under the condition that your opponent adds a card from the deck to their hand outside of drawing? You know, the same conditions as activating Ash Blossom, one of the most played cards in the game. Well, Sales Pitch sees absolutely no competitive play. And that's because the condition is just hard enough, and the restriction is the card where you can't use the card you add to your hand that turn you use it, plus it being a trap card, means it's just too slow for modern Yu-Gi-Oh! And Pharaoh's Treasure is kind of like the old school version of Sales Pitch, just too slow even if technically it has really good effects, because there were very powerful cards that you would want to get back from the graveyard. And at number 7, we have Kishido Spirit. This is a continuous spell card which has the effect where monsters on your side of the field cannot be destroyed by battle if they have the same exact attack as your opponent's monster. Normally in Yu-Gi-Oh, if two monsters have the exact same attack in battle, they both get destroyed as a result of that battle, unless those attacks are zero. So this card basically gives you a very limited amount of battle immunity, and with how many stable monster cards people would share amongst their decks, chances are there was an opportunity for this card's effect to actually come into play. However, this card is kind of like Cobra Man, in that it's technically a beneficial effect, just not good enough to take a spot in your deck. It's more like an incredibly mediocre effect that doesn't do anywhere near enough to justify a spot in your deck, or one of your precious 5 card draws. In fact, this card is one of the trash items they give to players in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links, as one of the few common cards they hand out like candy every time you randomly get cards from events. And in number 6, we have 8 Claw Scorpion. This is a level 2 insect monster which has the effect where it can put itself face down once per turn, just like a lot of the other cards from the sets these cards came from. It also has the effect while it's on the field that if it attacks a face down defense position monster, its attack becomes 2400 during damage calculation only. Now, being able to have 2400 attack when attacking a face down defense position monster is actually not half bad for a low level monster. The problem is that it's not good enough, especially for how low all of its stats are. Even if you can use this card to attack into an opponent's defense position monster, nearly guarantee that it's destroyed with its high attack, then putting it face down during the main phase 2 so it's not vulnerable to life point damage, 
It's still not really worth it because it only has 200 defense, and anything that slightly breathes on it could destroy it by battle as well. If this effect was tied to a monster that had more defense points, i.e. like 2000 defense, then it might have been a useful effect because it could actually survive battles. But since the stats are so low, and its attacking effect only works on face down defense position monsters, which were never really high priority targets, even old school Yu-Gi-Oh anyway, it's kind of a decent effect tied to a two weak body, which actually makes it kind of bad. And at number five, we have Pyro Clock of Destiny. This is a trap card which has the effect where you can advance the turn count by one, which basically means if a card has an effect which counts a turn as part of its conditions, then you can add plus one to it. So something like Sword the Revealed Light or Final Countdown. And this effect is completely unique. There are no other cards that have this kind of effect in the game. And if you're able to somehow loop the effect of Pyro Clock of Destiny over and over, it used to be able to win on the very first turn of the game with Final Countdown. Although they have since nerfed all the cards that did allow to activate trap cards as many times as you want per turn, so it's not really thing that's possible anymore in modern Yu-Gi-Oh. So the only really useful application of Pyro Clock of Destiny is to win one turn earlier with Final Countdown. However, Final Countdown decks historically just try to stall for as long as possible and would value cards that allow them to stall further over using Power Clock of Destiny, since being able to stall your opponent out of one turn gives you two counts on Final Countdown, whereas Pyro Clock only gives you one. So it's never really seen any competitive play, even though Final Countdown has seen a lot of competitive play over the years. And since it's not really beneficial to any of the other, very few cards where it actually works on them, it's just not a very good card in general, despite how completely unique the effect is. And at number 4, we have Senriai. This is a continuous spell card where, once per turn, during each of your standby phases, you can look at the top card of your opponent's deck by paying 100 life points. So, basically, it only gives you knowledge of the top card of your opponent's deck, and didn't actually let you do anything with it. It was also only usable during your standby phase, which meant when you activate the card, you wouldn't get any benefit from it until your next turn. And on top of that, it even had a life point cost for some reason, even if it was an incredibly minor one. Now, technically, gaining information of the top card of your opponent's deck is beneficial, especially if you're trying to activate the effect of something like Conscription, where the card lets you look at the top of your opponent's deck, and if it's a monster, you can special summon it to your side of the field. But if it's a spell or trap card, it gets into your opponent's hand instead. So if you wanted to set up a two-card combo in order to try to find out if you can actually summon the card with Conscription, then obviously Senri Eye is a beneficial effect. However, in this case, if you look at the top card of your opponent's deck and it's not a monster, then you just kind of have to wait until your next turn to look at another card because it didn't let you do anything with the top card of the deck. If it allowed you to look at the top three cards and then rearrange them in whatever order you wanted, that actually might be a good effect. Or if you could just look at the top card and choose to put it on the bottom of the deck, that would be better too. But it's still not worth the cost that it has. So obviously not being able to do anything with it kind of bumps this card down to the almost useless tier. And at number three, we have Armor Exe. This is a level 4 rock monster with 2400 attack, which has nothing but negative effects to account for its very high attack stat for its low level. As a reminder this time period, the highest attack for level 4 lower monsters was around 1900, so cards rarely went above that threshold without negative effects. And the negative effect this card had was that it could not attack during the same turn that it was summoned. And during each of your standby phases it had a maintenance cost, where you had to remove one spell counter on your side of the field, otherwise destroy this card. Now, there have been plenty of cards with high attacks and downsides that have seen competitive play over the years, like Goblin Attack Force or Zombra the Dark. However, one thing each of these two cards had over Armor Exe was that you could completely ignore the downsides if you played a Skill Drain deck. Skill Drain is a floodgate which negates the effects of all monsters in the field, and combos incredibly well with monsters with high attack and negative effects, except with Armor Exe. This card is one of the few high attack level 4 monsters which can't effectively play under Skill Drain. And that's because you can't negate costs. And because you can't negate this card's costs, once your next standby phase rolls around, it would destroy itself unless you were actually able to pay a spell counter for it. And if you were trying to play it pure, it was also pretty bad because it couldn't even attack on the first turn it was brought out. So you'd have to pay the maintenance cost at least a single time before you're able to use it normally. And all of this just led to the card being one of the few high attack level 4 monsters with negative effects that never saw any kind of play. Because it was bad in decks that wanted to use cards like these, and it was bad in decks that played spell counters. Because funny thing about early Yu-Gi-Oh spell counters, they were very hard to get on the field in the first place. Having to remove one spell counter from your side of the field was a legitimate difficult cost to pay, because spell counters were generally only created and then used immediately by one-time effects, like Breaker the Magical Warrior. They did have other cards that could generate spell counters, but they weren't very good. And the only spell counter cards that actually saw play were ones that would use their spell counters immediately. So there generally weren't a lot of spell counters lying around to pay the cost for Armor Exe, as the card itself couldn't even hold spell counters. 
and you can't play spell counters on cards unless they have an effect that specifically allows you to. Unlike pretty much every other counter in the game. Although I should specify, this isn't because spell counters are ruled differently or anything. It's just pretty much every card that has to do with spell counters specifically says that they can hold them or not. And cards that play spell counters specifically ask that a card has text, which says that you can hold them. Which means you wouldn't be able to use something like Spell Power Grass to put a spell counter in Armor XA, since it technically doesn't have the effect to hold them, even if it has the maintenance cost to use them. Also, just a side note, Armor XA is one of the few cards that was given a pronunciation guide on how to say its name as XA. But it was given out in one of its rulings randomly, funnily enough. And at number two, we have Card Shuffle. This is a continuous spell card which has the effect where you can pay 300 life points in order to shuffle either yours or your opponent's deck. Additionally, this effect is once per turn. Now, to be able to shuffle yours or your opponent's deck does technically have beneficial applications. Like, for example, if you look at the top card of your opponent's deck with Senri and you don't want your opponent to add that card to their hand, you could use Card Shuffle in order to make sure that card is no longer on the top of your opponent's deck. Or if you use some kind of effect in order to stack the top card of your deck where you don't want to draw into it, like maybe putting a card back on top of your deck with Plague Spreader Zombie as a cost, you can then shuffle your deck in order to make sure you don't draw into that card. However, none of these cases are worth using a whole card slot in your deck for, when you could instead just play something like Raigeki to destroy all your opponent's monsters, or a Pot of Greed to draw more cards, etc, etc. There's just better stables you can use instead of using one of your slots for card shuffle. In fact, the effect is so unimpressive, they even added as a skill to Duel Links where you don't even have to have the card in your deck in order to gain the effect, and it's still bad because even if you don't lose card advantage for the effect, it's still not beneficial enough to play it over any other skill in the game, except for decks that specifically just need to pay 300 life points for some reason. And also, since it's once per turn, you can't even use it in order to adjust your life points by constantly shelving your deck and paying 300 over and over, whereas cards like Inspection did have this niche before they nerfed the card so you can no longer use its effect multiple times per turn. And finally, at number one, we have the Great Phantom Thief. This is a level three monster with 1,000 attack, which has the effect where, if it inflicts battle damage to your opponent, you get to declare one card name. Then you get to look at your opponent's hand, and if your opponent has any cards in their hand with that declared name, you get to send them all to the graveyard. Now, the ability to discard from your opponent's hand is actually one of the strongest effects in the game. Specifically because it's so rare, most cards which can allow you to discard from your opponent's hand have had very tough activation requirement. And being able to successfully deal battle damage to your opponent with a low attack monster like Great Phantom Thief should warrant the effect of being able to discard from your opponent's hand. The problem with this card is that you have to know what's in your opponent's hand first in order to be able to pull off the effect. At the same time period, there were cards like White Magical Hat, Don Zalug, and Spirit Reaper, which all had the effect where if they successfully inflicted damage to your opponent's life points, you could discard one random card from your opponent's hand. And these effects were actually good in slot competitive play in early Yu-Gi-Oh! And there have been a lot of other cards printed since then which do similar things. So, the Great Phantom Thief not only has the exact same conditions as these other, more guaranteed effects, but they are effects already balanced by the fact that it's hard to pull this off in the first place. You then have to jump through the extra hurdle of knowing what cards are in your opponent's hand in order to get a discard from this one card. However, if you're lucky and you know what cards are in your opponent's hand, and they have multiple of those cards in their hand, then Great Phantom Thief can potentially discard more than one card. However, with how hard it is to get off the activation requirement in the first place, adding extra hurdles on top of this effect it just makes the card kind of bad. And there was no reason to play it when you just had the other three cards in the game instead. However, if you had two copies of Great Phantom Thief on the field, you could use the first one to attack in order to use the effect to check your opponent's hand, and then use the second one in order to actually be able to declare a card in their hand to discard. Although, in this same scenario, if you just had two white magical hats, you could just discard two cards in the hand instead, guaranteed. So an effect that seems pretty decent on service level actually becomes kind of bad when compared to its competition, which can do the exact same thing, but easier, but were also hard to activate as well. Ancient Dragon is a level 4 dragon with only 1400 attack. Its effect is a permanent 500 attack boost if it scores a direct attack. It also gains a permanent level boost of plus 1. So after one successful attack, it goes up to 1900 and becomes level 5. The idea behind the card is that it slowly gets older and stronger as it survives more battles, but in actuality, it requires resources to bring it to the field, i.e. your valuable normal summon, and it has to live into the battle phase through all kinds of disruption effects. And it even has to specifically declare a direct attack, not just any attack will do. All these things lead to a card that seems fine on paper, but once put into the context of the actual card game, it's actually pretty terrible in all regards. Because even if you do get the effect off once, 1900 attack isn't even impressive. It could start out at 1900 attack and still be mediocre. In this video, we're going to go over some of the worst cards from the Dark Crisis pack, one of the earliest sets in Yu-Gi-Oh!, which is a pack full of terrible cards even by early Yu-Gi-Oh! standards. And at number 10, we have Maju Garzette. 
This is a level 7 monster with question mark for attack, where its attack becomes equal to the combined original attack of the two monsters used for its tribute summon. Now, the effect of this card seems like it might not be half bad. If you had two high attack monsters in the field, you could simply tribute both of them to bring out this one card, you would have a very beefy beat stick that your opponent would have a hard time beating over. However, in the same set that released this card, they also released a card called Great Maju Garzette, which is a level 6 monster that has the effect where its attack becomes equal to twice the original attack of the monster used for its tribute summon, which is a much better effect. And the reason for that is the amount of resources in order to bring out both of them, plus the attack power values. For example, if you have two summon skulls on your side of the field, both with 2500 attack, and you tribute them both to bring out Maju Garzette, you now have one monster with 5000 attack on the field. However, in the same exact previous board state, if you instead tribute one of them for Great Maju Garzette, you'll have a monster with 5000 attack and a 2500 attack summon skull left, which is just more value overall. And in fact, Great Maju Garzette was such a good card at being a great bait stick, it actually saw some competitive play. Whereas Maju Garzette was so bad, it was purely pack filler. However, even though its effect is not that great, it's still probably better than the other cards on this list. Mainly because the effect is only really bad in comparison to its much better level 6 counterpart. And at number 9, we have Rod of the Mind's Eye. This is an equipped spell card which has the effect that any damage the equipped monster deals becomes 1000 points. So, for example, if you attack directly with something like Drill Barnacle, instead of doing 300 points of damage, it would instead deal 1000. Also, if a monster has more than 1000 attack, it does the same and lowers it to only 1000. Now, this effect is kind of mediocre. Even in this time period, they had cards like Mage Power United We Stand, two cards which would give a monster well over 2000 attack points for a single equip. So making it so monsters only do a thousand points of damage was kind of an incredibly minor effect that wasn't worth using. Specifically with an equipped spell card though, because later on they did create a retrain of this card in the form of a field spell called the Temple of the Mind's Eye, which basically applies the effect of the equipped spell to all monsters on the field, where no matter how much battle damage they deal it always becomes 1000. This was actually incredibly useful in stall decks in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links, because with only 4000 life points and only 3 field zones, it meant if you had this field spell card out, it was impossible for your opponent OTK you, giving you time to regain your life points and just stabilize in some other way. And it also synergized pretty well with the backup squad, that allowed you to draw one card for every 1000 points of damage you took, which you were guaranteed to take exactly 1000 points of damage with each proc of Temple of Mind's Eye. However, even though the effect was useful, it wasn't useful if it was only on equipped spell card given to a single monster on your side of the field, and was more useful on your opponent's monsters from doing too much damage to you and only really in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links with three field zones. And at number 8 we have Battle Scar. This is a continuous trap card which has the effect where you select one of your Arcfiend monsters, then each time you would pay life points during the standby phase for the monster's maintenance costs, your opponent also pays the same amount of life points. Now the original line of Archfiend monsters added in this set could all also probably make this list, since they were infamously bad. They all had very low attack points, they had maintenance costs during your standby phase, and the effects of the cards were incredibly minor. Dark Bishop Archfiend, for example, only has 300 attack and has an effect where if an Archfiend monster on your side of the field is targeted for a card effect, you can roll a 6-sided die. And if the result is 1, 3, or 6, you get to negate and destroy that card. However, all of the other first-gen Archfiend monsters also had a similar effect of target protection, so granting it to another Archfiend monster wasn't super necessary, especially on such a weak body that required a maintenance cost and couldn't even special summon itself. Viopon Archfiend also had a 500 life point maintenance cost, could negate on a roll of a 3 that targeted it, and only had the effect where your opponent could only attack this card instead of your other Archfiend monsters. And with only a paltry 1200 attack and no way to special summon itself, was kind of useless. Infernal Queen Archfiend could negate on a roll of a 2 or a 5 that targeted it, only had 900 attack, and had the effect to increase the attack of one Archfiend monster by 1000 points until the end phase during the standby phase. So, you wouldn't even be able to gain the attack until your opponent's turn rolled around, or if you somehow survived until your next turn, where it could maybe become a 1900 attack beat stick. Probably the most useful card was Shadow Knight Archfiend, which had an impressive 2000 stat line for a level 4 monster. Where it can negate card effects that target it if it rolled a 3, had a 900 life point maintenance cost, the largest of all the other Archfiend monsters, and had a negative effect where it dealt half battle damage to your opponent. And again, none of these cards could special summon themselves. They were all incredibly weak besides Shadow Knight and Terror King, and the support cards weren't super good especially when you had stuff like Battle Scar that just made your opponent also pay your maintenance costs with you. So if you equipped it to Shadow Knight Archfiend, which paid 900 life points, the largest amount out of all of them, that meant you could basically burn 900 damage to your opponent every standby phase, but didn't even prevent you from taking the damage yourself. And while 900 damage every turn from one card is decent for continuous trap burn damage, it's not from one card. 
It's a two card combo that can be interrupted from either of them being destroyed. And at that point it's definitely not worth the effort to use it, because there's plenty of other burn strategies to use that don't involve using one of the worst initial archetypes ever made, because the rest of the archetype had nothing to do with burn damage either. And at number 7 we have Agito. This is a level 4 fairy monster which has the effect that if it's destroyed by battle specifically you can roll a 6 sided die. Then based on the result you get you can special summon a fairy type monster from your graveyard whose level is exactly equal to the number rolled. Or if it was 6 you can special summon a level 6 or higher fairy monster from your graveyard. Now the problem with this card is that most people who play decks full of monsters generally play monsters of a single type of level, not a whole variety of level. So if you're playing a whole bunch of level 4 fairy monsters, Agita would only have a positive effect if you rolled exactly a 4, which is a very low 1 in 6 chance. However, even if Agita was able to special summon a monster regardless of its dice roll, it still wouldn't be that useful because of all the other recruiters that existed in early Yu-Gi-Oh! which for the same condition could special summon a monster from your deck. The obvious bonus of this card was a chance to maybe summon a high level monster from your graveyard, which isn't really worth the amount of effort required to do that. Since you need to get the high level fairy monster in the graveyard, you have to make sure Aegido is destroyed specifically by battle, and then you have to roll a 6 on a dice roll, which is way too much effort for trying to special summon a high level monster. They did, however, retrain this card in the modern era with a much better effect, where if this card is sent from your hand or deck to the graveyard, you can send the top 5 cards of both players' decks to the graveyard. Then if you have Exchange of the Spirit in the Grave, you can send another 5 more cards from either player's deck to the graveyard. Additionally, if it's in your hand, it has a hand effect, which is more similar to its old school effect, where if cards are sent from the hand or deck to either player's graveyard, you can special summon this card from your hand, then special summon a level 4 Earth Fairy monster from your graveyard as well, except another copy of itself. If Agito had its new effect back in the day, it might have actually seen competitive play because of how useful familiar deck was even in old school Yu-Gi-Oh! Not even counting the effect of being able to special summon a monster from the graveyard with its hand effect, something that was incredibly rare back then. And at number 6 we have Dark Scorpion Gorg the Strong. This is a level 5 monster which has the effect that if it inflicts battle damage to your opponent you can activate one of its two effects, where you can either return one of your opponent's monsters to the top of their deck, which is one of the best forms of removal I might add, or send the top card of their deck to the graveyard, which is an incredibly minor effect. So if you manage to actually inflict battle damage with this card, you did get a really good removal effect, or incredibly minor mill effect. However, here are the problems with this card. For one, it's a level 5 monster with only 1800 attack. At this point in time, we had terrible archetypes like Archfiend monsters with 2000 attack on a level 4 monster. So a lot of high attack, low level monsters could just beat over this card. And since its condition for getting its effect off was to deal battle damage, that was kind of a problem. So if your opponent only had monsters with more than 1800 attack on their side of the field, you wouldn't be able to use the effect of this card, which under best case scenario would allow you to remove some of your opponent's monsters. So it had a monster removal effect that was reliant on it being able to deal damage, which just it wasn't very good at, because it was hard to bring out and had such low stats. So the amount of resources that would be required in order to both get this card on the field and buff it up enough so it can attack over something or attack directly would not be worth only being able to return one of your opponent's cards to the top of their deck. For the same amount of effort you could just use Phoenix Wing Wind Blast, which on a trap card they could just use during your opponent's turn to disrupt their plays, also performing the same effect for a simple discard from your hand, and did see tons of competitive play because that was really good. However, Gorg the Strong never saw any competitive play, even if some of the other Dark Scorpions did, which was another archetype pretty infamous for being really bad. And at number 5 we have Ray of Hope. This is a trap card which allows you to shuffle two light monsters from your graveyard back into the deck. Now, I will say, there is some merit to shuffling your own monsters back into your deck, as shown with the Ishizu Shufflers or even the Transmigration Prophecy, which was a trap card that returned two cards from either graveyard back into the deck and was on the limited list for years. However, a key difference between these cards is the versatility in how many cards are able to be shuffled back and from where. The Transmigration Prophecy and the Ishizu Shufflers can target cards from both players' graveyards, which allows you to both recur resources if you need to, and more importantly, disrupt your opponent's graveyard from their graveyard effects. However, Ray of Hope only allows you to choose cards from your graveyard and only specifically light monsters, which narrows the scope of its usability considerably. And there wasn't really any light monster support released in this set, as the Chaos monsters weren't released until the very next set, and Light Swords wouldn't come out until years later. So Ray of Hope was just kind of a random card that didn't really have any merit, because you couldn't use it to disrupt your opponent as a modular option, and its only effect wasn't very beneficial to any strategy that existed at the time. And for the light monsters it did exist for, namely the recruiters like Shining Angel perhaps, it wasn't the best use of one of your one cards in your deck. And at number 4 we have Dark Flare Knight. This is a fusion monster which requires a Dark Magician and a Flame Swordsman as its two materials. 
and has the effect where you take no battle damage from battles involving this card. And if it's destroyed by battle specifically, you get to special summon one Mirage Knight from your hand or deck. And Mirage Knight is a 2800 attack monster that can only be summoned by the effect of Dark Flare Knight, and basically has the effect where if it attacks a monster, it gains attack equal to the attack of its target. However, during the end phase in which this card was involved in a battle, it's banished. So, the intended synergy with Dark Flare Knight was to bring it out, crash into one of your opponent's monsters so it dies, then bring up Mirage Knight from your deck so you can finish the job of actually crashing over whatever you wanted to for a lot of damage. However, there's a couple of problems with this intended strategy. For one, one of the fusion materials for Dark Flare Knight is a fusion monster itself, the Flame Swordsman. So you either had to find some way to also bring out a terrible vanilla fusion monster, or just play a fusion substitute monster, which was a lot more practical as there wasn't really any other options on how to bring this card out back then. However, if you did manage to use the resources to bring this card out, then you'd have to find a way to destroy it by battle in order to get its good effect. So what you could do is just bank on the fact that it had 2200 attack, and use it for poking for damage, and then just have Mirage Knight as a backup option in case it gets destroyed by battle. But the problem with that is that the floating effect only procs from being destroyed by battle, and there was a plethora of monster destruction early Yu-Gi-Oh!, as well as just mind control effects to take control of it. So they could just choose to never attack it and just remove it with one of the other plethora of removal spells instead, and completely bypass the floating effect, never having to deal with Mirage Knight. And then there was the fact that you had to play Mirage Knight in your main deck, which just added an unusable Garnet that could never be summoned if you drew it into your hand, as its condition made it so it could only be summoned by Dark Flare Knight's floating effect. And that's not even counting the fact that Dark Flare Knight is weaker than one of its fusion materials. And at number 3, we have Guardian Seal. This is a level 4 monster with 1700 attack, which cannot be summoned unless you control the equip spell card Shooting Star Bull Seal on your side of the field in some way. Shooting Star Bull Seal has the effect where the equipped monster loses 1000 attack, but it's able to attack your opponent directly. This card was actually used in some OTK strategies over the years, but it was only ever used in incredibly specific decks that did not care at all to use something like Guardian Seal, because they were trying to usually win on that turn by just attacking directly with a whole bunch of other equip cards. And if you did manage to bring out Guardian Seal, it had the effect where you could send one equip spell card you control that is equipped to this card to the graveyard in order to destroy one monster your opponent controls. Now, here's the problem with this card. You're not able to use the original equip card that's equipped to it on the field for its summoning requirement in the first place as the material to be used for its effect to destroy monsters. Because Guardian Seal only allows you to use equip spells that are equipped to it currently, and not just equip cards that you control on the field in general. So you would have to use Shooting Star Bull Seal on one of your other monsters, Normal Summon Guardian Seal, then equip a different equip spell card from your hand to it in order to destroy something. And for all the effort required to do that, it's really not worth only being able to destroy one monster, when you can instead just play something like Fissure. So it's basically a hard to bring out monster, with an effect that wouldn't be very good even if it wasn't a hard to bring out monster, which definitely puts it into nearly garbage tier. And at number 2, we have Checkmate. This is a normal spell card which has the effect where you can tribute one Archfiend monster you control in order to make it so a specifically named monster Terra King Archfiend on your side of the field can attack your opponent's life once directly this turn. Now, Terra King Archfiend is a level 4 monster that can only be normal summon if you already have an Archfiend monster on your side of the field. And as we discussed earlier, the other Archfiend monsters were terrible. One of the worst archetypes ever made before they released a whole bunch of retrain support that had nothing to do with the original monsters. So in order to even bring out Terra King, you had to use something like Archfiend's Roar in order to special summon one of your Archfiend monsters from your graveyard, then you could normal summon this card. Then you can activate Checkmate so that Terra King can attack for 2000 points of damage. However, What's funny about Terra King's effect is that if it destroys the monster by battle, it's able to negate the effects of the monster it destroyed, which was actually a pretty decent effect in early Yu-Gi-Oh, where there were tons of monsters that floated when they were destroyed by battle, or flip effects. So having a card like Checkmate, which allowed it to attack directly, seemed kind of counterintuitive to its actual effects. And also, it having a cost of having to tribute an Archfiend monster specifically to use for an effect that can only work on one specific monster, that's not even a very good effect for that monster, is kind of all kinds of convoluted and just not very good. If anything, this might be one of the most not very good spell cards in the game that wasn't specifically designed to be bad like Cold Feet. However, the only reason this card isn't number one on this list is because it was also released in the same set that released one of the worst boss monsters in the game's history that's even harder to use. And at number one, we have Exodia Necros. This is a level four monster with 1800 attack that can only be special summoned with the effect of Contract with Exodia. And the card Contract with Exodia has the effect where you can only activate if you have all 5 pieces of Exodia in your graveyard, which allows you to special summon Exodia Necros from your hand and not your deck. Now already, this is an incredibly difficult monster to summon, because getting 5 named monsters in your graveyard at the same time is incredibly difficult, something that would be hard to do even in modern Yu-Gi-Oh with modern support cards, let alone cards from the early days of the game. The intended way to bring this card out easier is with the card Painful Choice, 
which could easily get all five pieces in the graveyard with one card. Which is probably why they thought Contract with Exodia would be so good, that they had to restrict it so you can only special summon Exodia Necros from your hand, because if it could be special summoned from the deck, it would obviously be too overpowered. Now, let's take a look at what Exodia Necros actually does once on the field. While it's on the field, it cannot be destroyed by battle, or the effects of spell and trap cards. Then, during each of your standby phases, it gains a permanent buff of 500 attack points. And also, if at any point all five pieces of Exodia are not in your graveyard, or if just one of them is moved, the card will immediately destroy itself. So, having protection from battle and destruction from spell and trap effects is actually pretty decent protection for early Yu-Gi-Oh! Monster destruction effects did exist and were played, but they weren't as plentiful as spell or trap card removal. So, if you got Exodia Necros on the field, there is a chance it would probably survive for a few turns. And with it surviving for a few turns, it would probably eventually get to a high enough attack point value where they would have to have no real option for dealing with it except to draw into one of their monster removal effects, and it just leads to a really early Yu-Gi-Oh version of having a towers-like monster. Luckily, early Yu-Gi-Oh never had to worry about this card because it was so incredibly difficult to bring out. Painful Choice wasn't banned when Exodia Necros was introduced to the game, but it was limited to one copy which meant the combo to bring this card out was incredibly flimsy and not very consistent. You'd have to draw into Painful Choice, Exodia Necros, and Contract with Exodia in order to actually bring the card out, while also playing 5 Garnets in your deck on top of that. And if you did manage to bring all this out, there was a chance it might be able to win you the game as long as your opponent didn't have Exiled Force, man or Bug, or Tribe Infecting Virus. Metaphys Executor is the boss monster of the Metaphys archetype, although you probably never know that because not even Metaphys play the card. This card requires you to banish 5 Metaphys monsters from your field or graveyard to come out, and then has an effect that only works if you have less cards than your opponent, which lets you summon back one of your banished Metaphys cards. Now, banishing 5 monsters of a specific archetype is actually a super steep cost to hit the field, so its ability to just bring back one monster is not worth the massive effort required to bring it out, let alone one you can't even actually use unless you're behind in card advantage. In this video, we're going over the worst cards that have an effect that allow you to attack your opponent directly. An effect in Yu-Gi-Oh, which allows you to damage your opponent's life points even if your opponent controls monsters on their side of the field. And at number 10, we have Amphibious Bugroth MK3. This is a level 4 monster with 1500 attack and simply has the effect that if the field spell card Umi is face up on the field, this card can attack your opponent's life points directly. Now at 1500 attack, that's actually not half bad for monsters that can attack directly even if it does have the condition where you need to have a field spell card in order for it to work. Although, funny enough, if you actually have the original Umi field spell card out, this card will lose 200 attack because it's a machine-type monster. Luckily, Umi is like one of those cards that has the most amount of other cards that can treat their name exactly as Umi. So if you just have something like a Legendary Ocean out, then it will gain 200 attack and be a lot better. Now, the only real problem with this card is it doesn't really have any synergy with the deck that likes to run Umi, and has never seen any competitive play over the years because it's pretty squarely mediocre. It's not that bad, but it's funny that when this card originally came out, it actually got a damage decrease if you used it in its intended way. So it's just a good one to start off this list at number 10. And at number 9, we have Elemental Hero Rampart Blaster. This is a level 6 fusion monster which requires two named normal monster elemental hero cards as its materials, and has the effect that while it's in defense position, it can attack your opponent directly, but its attack is halved during damage calculation. So with its baseline attack at 2000, it will only deal 1000 points of damage if it tries to attack directly in defense position. And with 2500 defense, that's not half bad. You can poke for around 1,000 points of damage every turn while having a 2,500 attack wall that your opponent has to get over in order to stop those direct attacks. The problem with this card is it's kind of the same as the previous spot, and that it's really mediocre. That's just not really a good strategy either. Plus, you have to play two normal monsters in order to bring this card out, or at least one of them, and a fusion substitute, and its effect is not really worth the effort to fusion summon this card. It also can't be cheated out. So, why is a plainly mediocre card on this list? Well, usually for worst of videos, there aren't exactly super bad cards to talk about, and just kind of below average or mediocre ones. But also, because this card is actually a little bit worse than I described. You see, its effect in the official TCG Yu-Gi-Oh! database states that this card can only attack while in face of defense position if your opponent controls no monsters. And then if it does attack, then its attack is halved during damage calculation. You see, in the OCG, there's an official ruling where this card can attack directly, but according to this card's second errata in the TCG, it actually has the effect where it can only attack directly 
if your opponent controls no monsters. And since this card is incredibly mediocre either way, I don't think it really matters. So it's just at number 9 because in the OCG it's just mediocre, and in the TCG it's kind of bad. But I'm not sure if we're even using the TCG rulings or if they just forgot to update it. So I'm just playing it safe by putting this card at the number 9 spot, rather than somewhere near the top just in case it is actually working like the OCG is supposed to. And at number 8 we have Overpowering Eye. This is a spell card which allows you to target one zombie monster you control with 2000 or less attack, and that monster can attack directly this turn. Now this card is fine on surface level, you can just use it on a zombie monster with less than 2000 attack, and then retroactively give it a boost because it still keeps the effect to attack directly for this turn. So if you use it on something like Zombie Master and then equip it with Psychic Blade and give it 2000 extra attack, that's 3800 points of direct damage right there. The problem being is you have to set up a whole bunch of extra work just to get off that one little attack, and generally it's not worth it. The ability to attack directly is not that big of a deal in the TCG, especially not on monsters who have a baseline of less than 2000 attack and can't bring themselves out of the extra deck. And especially not on zombies who aren't really known for having high attack point value potential, like with machine type monsters and their specific support limiter removal. Zombie is a pretty safe type for a card like this to exist with, and it's perfectly mediocre enough where it's never seen competitive play, because having to use one card in your hand to give one monster a direct attack for one turn is honestly not worth the card in your hand. However, I remember a lot of the old Yu-Gi-Oh games, since this card is kinda mediocre, they would include it a lot in any deck that has zombie cards in it, so that you wouldn't have too hard of a time against that NPC. Although in Duel Links, with the starting life point value of 4000, being able to attack directly is a little bit more of a big deal over there. But even then, I don't think they would probably use Overpowering Eye if it was introduced. And at number 7, we have Alien Infiltrator. This is a card which can attack directly if there's no other cards in the same column as this card. And with a baseline attack of 800, that's not really a big deal. It also has another effect where once per turn you can move this card over to an adjacent monster zone that's unoccupied, so that maybe can get off its effect to attack directly. When this card first came out, players didn't really keep track of cards in columns and zones. That wasn't really a widespread thing people kept track of until Link monsters are introduced. So this card was kind of useless in the early days when cards were just kind of laid out wherever, and no one really cared what monster zones your cards were in. I mean, if you use cards like Alien Infiltrator, then both players would have to start following the rules, but it wasn't good enough for that to really matter. It also has nothing to do with the alien archetypes besides having an alien in its name and the same aesthetics with its artwork, so it was never really played in alien decks who really like cards that can do something with A counters. They just really missed the mark with this card. It's not a good direct attacker, and it's not even good in its own archetype and it had a column-based mechanic back when no one paid attention to them. Although at the very least, if you normal summon this card, you can probably attack directly with it at least once, with very little resistance. And at number 6, we have Battle Teleportation. This is a trap card which can only be activated if you control a single face-up Psychic-type monster, in which case that monster can attack your opponent directly this turn. But at the end of the battle phase, you have to give control of that monster to your opponent. Now, psychic type monsters are at least a little bit better at granting themselves extra attack through their effects and cards than zombie monsters are, but they're still not really a powerhouse when it comes to big numbers. So, granting them the ability to attack directly isn't that big of a deal, especially since you have to set this card first and then wait a whole turn before you can even use it. Then it has a conditional effect where you can only control that one face up card, and after it does attack, you have to give that monster to your opponent. So you just kind of go minus three in that whole exchange. You lose one card for using battle teleportation itself, you lose another card for giving your monster to your opponent, and then your opponent gains a monster, hence the minus three. However, if you win that direct attack, that doesn't really matter. I'm not sure that was the intended use of the card, and that's why they kind of made it a little bit restrictive. It's still not good, kind of bad even, which is why it's an excellent card for this list. And at number five, we have Infernity Archer. This is a level 6 monster with 2000 attack, which has the effect that if you have no cards in your hand, this card can attack your opponent directly. This card doesn't have any way to bring itself out from the hand easier, so you'd have to expend resources in order to get this card in the field. And it doesn't really mesh with its archetype very well, other than just having the same restrictions as a lot of the Infernity cards. Infernities specialize in gaining insane advantage when you have no cards in your hand, 
due to cards like Infernity Archifiend or Infernity Launcher, and locking down your opponent with cards like Infernity Barrier or Infernity Break. Infernities are a very good control deck that's able to generate a lot of advantage, and those kinds of decks don't need low attack level 6 monsters whose only effect is to attack directly. So outside of the Infernity Archetype, Infernity Archer is also not very useful because you have to have no cards in your hand in order to gain its good effect. And it's still not really worth bringing out a card that requires a Tribute Summon and has mediocre attack for a level 6 monster. Basically, anything less than 2400 attack on a 1 Tribute monster is kinda bad. So, it's kind of like Alien Infiltrator. It's bad in its own archetype and not really useful outside of it. But it's even less useful than Alien Infiltrator. And at number 4, we have Mucus Yolk. This is a level 3 monster who can attack your opponent's life points directly, and each time it inflicts battle damage to your opponent, you get to increase the attack of this card by 1000 during your next standby phase. And it gains this attack increase permanently. So as long as you're able to keep making attacks with Mucus Yolk, it will keep gaining a thousand attack every turn. So what's bad about this card? Well, it has zero attack, which means this card literally cannot activate its own effect under its own power. Sure, it can attack directly even with zero attack, but since it can't deal any battle damage, you can't use its effect to increase its attack during your next standby phase. You would have to use some other card to give this card some attack points so they could attack directly, which could probably most easily be solved if it fit into some kind of field spell card, but the card itself kind of has an awkward type and attribute combination, being Dark Aqua. You could still just give this an equip spell card or just some other kind of attack increaser, like Banner of Courage, and it would start gaining its attack, but funny enough, there are actually two other cards in the game with the exact same effect, and just better. There's Drill Barnacle and Raging Flame Sprite. Both of them have the effect that allow them to attack directly, and both have the effect that when they inflict battle damage to your opponent by a direct attack, they gain 1000 attack points permanently. And they both actually have more than zero attack. Granted, they also both have very low attack, but it's still better than having zero. And the other problem with Mucus Yelk is the fact that it doesn't actually gain the attack boost until your next standby phase. So it stays a super low attack vulnerable monster for a lot longer than its other two counterparts, who gain their attack boost immediately after doing damage. And its two better counterparts aren't even that good of cards either, but they at least don't need support in order to start using their effect. And at number 3 we have Plasma Ball. This is a level 3 thunder monster who has the effect where it can attack your opponent directly. But when this card inflicts battle damage to your opponent by a direct attack, it destroys itself. Now I'm not really sure what the point of this card is. Usually I can kind of see some benefit to cards even if they're kind of mediocre or bad, but this one just seems to have a very unnecessary restriction on its pretty mediocre effect. It only has 900 attack, which isn't good for a direct attacker. Pretty much all the Watt monsters have more attack and gain effects after attacking directly. Like Watt Cobra can go plus one if it attacks directly, and even has 100 more attack, you know, and also has the ability to attack directly. Also, the fact that it's a Thunder Light type doesn't seem to be that big of a deal either, because again, the Watt monsters also share the same type and attribute, and are just better. It almost seemed like this card was probably made bad on purpose, because it's not like this card came out in the early days of the game either. It literally came out in the exact same set that had the Watt monsters. In fact, the same set that had Watt Cobra even. So unless there's some kind of super good synergy I don't know about, I'm pretty sure this card was meant to be a joke. But at least it's easy to use. And at number 2 we have Hero Flash with two exclamation points. This is a normal spell card which can only be activated by banishing four specific spell cards from your graveyard. Then it gives you the ability to special summon an Elemental Hero Neural Monster from your deck, and grants you the effect where all of your Elemental Hero Neural Monsters can attack your opponent directly this turn. The best target for this card is Elemental Hero Neos, and of the Hero Flash cards you need to banish, at least one of them is good. E Emergency Call is played in pretty much all hero decks, and R Righteous Justice is a neat alternative to Spell or Trap card removal, but the other two cards required are pretty meh. And Hero Flash itself is basically a dead card until you can activate its tough activation requirements. And that's basically the whole crux of this card. It's too hard to use and not worth the payoff. Like, compare this card to something like Law of the Normal, which requires you to have 5 level 2 or lower monsters on your side of the field. And if you have this activation requirement set, you get to destroy all of the cards in the field in both players' hands. 
That's in effect worth its tough activation requirement, not only allowing elemental hero normal monsters to attack directly this turn, and only be able to special summon one elemental hero normal monster from your deck. It's just too much work for such a pretty mediocre payoff that probably won't even win you the game, as getting four specific cards in the graveyard is actually a lot harder than you'd think. The number one spot on this list kind of falls in the same category as this one. It's just not really worth the amount of effort that's put into actually using it. And at number one, we have Checkmate. Probably one of the most disappointing uses of such an iconic chess move, as what this card does is it allows you to tribute one Archfiend monster on your side of the field, then, during this turn, a single Terror King Archfiend monster you control can attack your opponent's life points directly. Terror King Archfiend is a level 4 monster with 2000 attack, which cannot be normal summoned unless you have an Archfiend monster already on your side of the field, and also has a maintenance cost where you have to pay 800 life points to each of your standby phases to keep this card on the field. And why does this card have a maintenance cost? Well, because of its excellent effect, of course, where if this card is targeted by the effect of a card controlled by your opponent, you can roll a six-sided dice. And if the result is two or five, you can then negate the opponent's effect and destroy that card. So you have a one-third chance of targeted effects to be cancelled out on this card. And also it negates the effects of monsters it destroys by battle. That is to say, this is definitely the boss monster of the original Archfiend archetype, and it's also a huge contributing factor to why Archfiends were kind of a joke on Inception. Modern Archfiend decks don't play any of the original Archfiend cards because they're all kind of bad. And Checkmate is supposed to be the signature card that allows this one card to attack directly at the cost of tributing another one of your Archfiend monsters. Checkmate is just a worse version of Overpowering Eye, because Overpowering Eye could be used on zombie monsters with 2000 attack, and didn't require a specific named zombie, nor a tribute cost in order to activate the card. Generally, if a card requires a specific named monster, it needs to be really good to kind of justify a spot in the deck. Kind of like the entire Eldritch archetype. So, Checkmate is already restrictive enough by only being usable on one monster, who actually himself has conditions for how it can even be brought out from your hand. But adding a tribute cost on top of that just makes the card laughably bad. Which is why I think it's probably a little bit worse than Hero Flash with two exclamation points, which is also really hard to activate, but at least that card allows you to special summon a 2500 tank beat stick from your deck. And at least Plasma Ball can attack directly without jumping through hoops. Fantastic Streborg is a one tribute monster which has the effect to return the monster as uses its tribute materials back to your hand instead of going to the graveyard. Also, you can discard one card to bounce all cards your opponent controls back to their hand in the same column. Now, this effect isn't really bad for an early era card, except for the fact this card was released in 2017, the same year as cards like Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring, one of the most played cards in history, and cards like Spiral Double Helix and Zodiac Rat Pier, which brought in some of the few Tier 0 decks in the game's history. Fantastic Streborg isn't the worst card in the world, but when compared to other cards it came out alongside of, it's laughably underpowered and never saw any kind of competitive play. For this list, we'll be going over cards that give you at least a plus one in card advantage, but are just not very useful, even with the advantage they give you, or just too hard to use. And at number 10, we have Oja Magic. This is a spell card which has the effect that if it's sent from your hand or field to the graveyard, you get to add three monsters from your deck to your hand, one each of Ojama's green, yellow, and black. So this card is potentially a plus two in card advantage, which sounds excellent on paper, and is the perfect card to kind of open this list on. Because the three cards it allows you to search out from your deck are kind of useless. All three of them are just normal monsters with zero attack, and the archetype they're part of is all about locking out your opponent's field zones and then swapping the attack and defensive monsters in the field with Ojama Country. Although the main problem with this deck and archetype is the fact that it's just not very strong and loses to any tier two or above competitive deck. But if you're a huge fan of Ojamas, they did release some support that allowed combining Ojamas with ABC Dragon Buster cards due to Ojama Simulation, which allows you to banish Ojama monsters in order to special some of the three materials for ABC Dragon Buster directly from your deck. And what do you know, this weird gimmick was actually good enough to technically see competitive play once or twice, which is why Oja Magic is only at number 10 on this list. It technically saw competitive play a few times, but most of the time it's just a funny gimmick card in an archetype which is very good at granting advantage actually, it's just the advantage is kind of useless most of the time, outside of Ojama simulation shenanigans. And at number 9 we have Diamond Dust Cyclone. 
This is a spell card which has the effect that you can destroy a monster that has four or more fog counters on it, and then draw one card for every four fog counters that were on it. So if you use this on a monster your opponent controls with a whole bunch of fog counters, you have the potential to draw any number of cards from your deck, and easily go above the plus one threshold that is a requirement for a card to make this list. So what's the problem with this card? Cloudian decks specialize in placing fog counters on themselves, not your opponent's monsters, and rarely do they allow them to place four or more counters on themselves at a time even, as pretty much all main deck level four or lower Cloudian monsters have the effect, where when they're normal summoned, you get to place a number of fog counters on themselves for each number of Cloudian monsters on the field. So unless you have a full board of Cloudians and you're not placing too many cloud counters on yourself immediately. Cloudians do have a really good continuous spell card called Cloudian Squall, which places one fog counter on every face-up monster on the field during both player standby phases. And by really good, I mean good for a counter placing card. It's still not very good since it doesn't do anything immediately, and you have to wait two full turns before it places four counters on any one card. While not doing anything for those entire two turns, unless you use the fog counters for other things, which would go completely counterintuitive to Diamond Dust Cyclone. As you can't use the card until a monster has at least four or more counters on it. They did release some new Cloudian support randomly, in the form of Cloudian Aerosol, which allows you to discard a Cloudian monster, to place the number of fog counters on any face-up monster on the field equal to that Cloudian's level. So if you discard something like Cloudian Eye of the Typhoon, a level 8 Cloudian monster, then you can immediately place 8 cloud counters onto one of your opponent's monsters, and then finally be able to destroy it with Diamond Dust Cyclone in order to draw 2 cards. Although in that whole exchange, you're spending 3 cards from your hand to draw 2 cards while only removing a single card your opponent controls, which is only card neutral in advantage. The same card advantage as activating Upstart Goblin. Upstart Goblin's not half bad, but it doesn't require you to play three specific cards to get that effect. Diamond Dust Cyclone is just one of those cards that's good in theory, and probably a lot more better in casual play, where your Cloudians are actually living long enough to accumulate a lot of fog counters. But it completely falls apart in any kind of competitive play, and is not really worth playing if you want to play a Cloudian deck, unless you have some really good cloud stall strategy and you're going to be placing fog counters like crazy with Cloudy and Squall. And at number 8, we have Human Wave Tactics. This is a card that allows you to special summon any number of level 2 or lower normal monsters from your deck, up to the number of level 2 or lower normal monsters that were destroyed by battle during the end phase. So if you had 5 level 2 or lower normal monsters, and all 5 of them were destroyed by battle, then you can special summon 5 monsters from your deck during the end phase. Now, I'm not really sure if this counts as card neutral in card advantage, or if it's actually the potential to go plus 5 in card advantage, because you are getting 5 monsters out of the deck with level 2 or lower in our monsters, who are actually quite easy to swarm on the field, with stuff like the League of Uniform Nomenclature, Tri-White, Enchanted Fitting Room, Treasure Panda, and Overlimit. Technically, it could be card neutral, or a plus 1 for each destruction because you were going to lose them anyway, but either way, it fits the spirit of this list, even if it might have issues and its technicalities on the card advantage front. So, what's wrong with Human Wave Tactics? Well, it requires you to have level 2 or lower Nor monsters on the field that live long enough to get destroyed by battle, and also have this card stay on the field long enough to resolve during the end phase. It only replaces normal monsters that are destroyed by battle, and generally, normal monsters don't stay around long enough to be destroyed by battle as they're generally used as link climbing tools or for a number of extra deck focus plays. And even if you do have some monsters that stay around long enough to get destroyed, it would probably be best worked with tokens getting destroyed by battle, since they can count as normal monsters and most of them are level 2 or lower. It sounds like an excellent card in theory, but in practice it's just too slow. It relies on your opponent to not destroy all your cards with card effects, which is how most cards are removed from the game anyway in modern Yu-Gi-Oh. If you're playing in a really slow, casual setting, where destruction effects are rare and you're going into grind games, then Human Wave Tactics might be a fun addition to a low-tiered Law of the Normal deck. This is one of my favorite decks to play against friends in high school, but not because I was trying to win, because I was trying to play a dumb deck that would occasionally pull off a fun win. Because there's so many better cards that interact with level 2 or lower monsters like I described earlier, there's no reason to play Human Wave Tactics because it's just slower than all of them. And at number 7, we have Tongue Twister. 
This is a level 6 monster with incredibly low stats that has the effect that if this card is tribute summoned, when it's sent from the field to the graveyard, you get to draw two cards and remove from play this card. So technically a plus one in card advantage, depending on how this card is removed from the field. There are some ways to make use of this card actually, like if you're playing a Heretic deck and use it as a combo piece in order to go into Ultimaya to Zulkin. But generally, you're better off just using other Heretic cards and not bothering with Tongue Twister. Now, the problems with this card is it's just a little bit too difficult to use and make good use of. You have to tribute some of this card and then find a way to use this material for something else because it's useless on its own. And as we've seen with the Monarch decks, getting tribute summon monsters out is kind of difficult unless they have an archetype that supplements it heavily, like True Dracos. And Tongue Twister is part of no such archetype. It's just full of potential. Maybe one day there'll be an archetype that's able to easily search and bring out Tongue Twister and turn that plus one into amazing advantage. But currently, it's mainly a gimmick outside of erratic shenanigans and kind of hard to use and will probably just end up being a brick in your hand most of the time. And at number six, we have Alchemy Cycle. This is a trap card which has the effect that it turns the original attack of all face-up monsters you control to become zero until the end phase. Then, each time a monster who's had its attack reduced to this effect is destroyed by battle, you get to draw one card. So if you have a full board of monsters in defense position, all of which had at least more than zero attacks so they could be lowered with this card, and then your opponent destroys them all by battle, you could draw up to six cards, which is kind of the same restrictions as human wave tactics, where technically you're just replacing cards that are being destroyed, but you're replacing cards that normally wouldn't replace themselves at all. So it could be argued to be a plus five in card advantage or a minus one. Whatever the case, the reason why this card doesn't see play is basically because it banks on the fact that you have a board set up of monsters who are ready to get destroyed by battle, and you won't lose the duel immediately by having them all set to zero. And you'd probably have to have enough cards in the field that have floating effects, that way you'd actually be able to get a whole bunch of use out of that advantage. So if you have a full board of monsters like Yang Zings, I think you could use this card in order to draw a whole bunch of cards while replacing your field, unless that causes the Yang Zings to miss timing because they infamously miss timing pretty easily. I don't know, I didn't really check for this video. Although most of the time your opponent will just wipe out all your cards before the battle phase, where you won't have enough time to get out cards during the battle phase where something like this would give you a significant advantage. And it's useless half the time as well. It has pretty specific situational usefulness, which kind of requires you to go out of your way in order to set it up so that you don't lose during that battle phase. And if you do have a full board of cards set up that would allow you to gain a whole bunch of advantage from Alchemy Cycle, your opponent can just choose to skip the battle phase and not attack anything past the one card that you might have activated this to, making most of that advantage moot. So, for how hard it is to actually set this card up in its best possible way, it's also easy to counter by just not attacking. And this card is pretty high on my list of cards that I've always wanted to make useful in a deck but could never find a gimmick deck that can make full use of it, without it just being a dead card most of the time. And at number 5, we have Black and White Wave. This is a quick play spell card which has the effect that if you control an Xyz monster that has a Synchro monster as one of its materials, you can banish one card on the field and then draw one card. So the hardest thing to use with Black and White Wave is the activation requirement. Have an Xyz monster with one of its materials being a Synchro monster. But if you meet the requirements, you get a full plus one in card advantage, as you're removing one card from the field while also drawing a card to replace the card you're using from your hand. And a quick play spell card that's able to banish and draw a card? That's really good. This card is actually, like, a really good effect. The problem lies entirely in its activation requirement, where there are very few decks that naturally allow you to use Synchro monsters as Xyz materials and you'd kind of have to build your deck around this card in order to make it work. And that's just not good enough to build your deck around. Unless you're playing something like Virtual Worlds, they're actually really good in going to Xyz monsters and have Synchro monsters as the materials. But they would not play this card either because they're basically a combo deck, and this is more of a control-oriented card. They could use it, sure, but if they were to use a card that could situationally pop one card in the field, they would probably want something they could use no matter what game state they had. So, even a deck that could use this card, it would only be a win more card, and wouldn't help you establish that board state in the first place, which is why it doesn't see competitive play, even though there is a top meta deck that can actually make use of the card pretty easily. Generally, win more cards are just not super useful. And at number 4, we have Nitro Synchron. This is a level 2 Synchron monster, which has the effect that if it's sent to the graveyard for a Synchro Summon of a Nitro Synchro monster, 
you get to draw one card. And there is actually a synchro monster which requires this card as one of its materials, Nitro Warrior. In fact, the only Nitro synchro monster in the game. You can see they had plans to make more, but didn't for some reason that will probably be obvious as we explain the rest of the card. However, Nitro Warrior itself actually saw a lot of competitive play over the years, since it has the ability to attack twice and can boost its attack to around 3800. Although, funny enough, none of the competitive decks that use Nitro Warrior played a single copy of Nitro Synchron. The card was 100% brought out with Quick Draw Synchron. Quick Draw Synchron is a level 5 tuner monster that can special summon itself from your hand by discarding one other monster, and has a special ability where it can be substituted as any one Synchron tuner monster for the Synchro Summon of a monster that requires a specific Synchron tuner, like Nitro Warrior does. And the reason Quick Draw Synchron was played over Nitro Synchron is because it could special summon itself from the hand, which is much more useful. Sure, Nitro Synchron technically allows you to go plus one with its granted effect, but only if it's used for a Nitro Synchro monster, and it doesn't really have any utility outside of that. Quick Draw Synchron is just much more versatile and has a distinction where it's a tuner monster that can special summon itself from the hand, which is way more valuable than drawing a card on a Synchro Summon. Quick Draw Synchron can actually extend combo plays, whereas Nitro Synchron would probably be the only play, or you'd have to expend extra resources to get on the field outside of your normal summon. Its plus one effect is just a little bit too weak for it to be useful, and its specific Synchro monster isn't strong enough where you'd want to play it with anything else besides Quick Draw Synchron. That card was basically just an option in the extra deck, and not really the whole focus of Quick Draw Synchron decks. And at number three, we have Arcane Barrier. This is a continuous spell card which has the effect that each time a spellcaster monster in the field is destroyed, you get to place one spell counter on this card. Then you can send this card and one face of spellcaster monster you control to the graveyard in order to draw one card for each spell counter that was on this card. And this card can hold a maximum of four spell counters. So you can send this card and a spellcaster to the graveyard with its maximum amount, and that's a plus two in card advantage. And here's why this doesn't see play. That's just a little bit too slow. The only way for this card to gain spell counters on its own power is when a spellcaster type monster is destroyed, and kind of falls into the same problems as Alchemy Cycle or Human Wave Tactics, where you either just have to wait for the cards to get destroyed naturally, or find a way to destroy them yourselves. There are ways to accomplish this, sure. You could bring out the four spell counters and just destroy them all with Dark Hole in order to immediately grant this card the four spell counters. That would be really stupid unless you were going to gain some other advantage from those four cards. There are cards that can move spell counters around on the field as well, but none of them are efficient enough to fuel this card with its maximum amount in a timely manner. That wouldn't be better spent on just other spell counter cards. Even a powerhouse like Spell Power Mastery requires a bit of resources in the graveyard before you're able to place four spell counters on it with one card. And there's also the cost where you still need to send a spellcaster monster you control to the graveyard in order to even use its effect to draw cards. So even after going through the trouble of getting four spell counters on it, you still also need to get a spellcaster monster on the field that you're willing to send to the graveyard. Which is just enough of a hindrance, where it seems like it would be good advantage, kind of like Shard of Greed, but it's just a little bit too slow and cumbersome in order to gain that advantage. And so it just doesn't see any play, and is also super likely of just being destroyed before you get the four spell counters going anyway. And at number two, we have three Hump Lakuda. This is a level three beast monster who has the effect that if there are three face-up copies of this card on your side of the field, you can tribute two of them in order to draw three cards. So technically a plus one in card advantage. And this card actually does have a way to get this combo out a little bit easier. If you already have one of these copies on the field, you could actually just use Rescue Cat in order to get the other two copies out directly from your deck. Then you'd only need one of them to have their effect alive in order to tribute the other two in order to draw three cards. The problem with all of that is the amount of effort required in order to accomplish that feat, which just isn't super consistent and a plus one is not enough of an incentive to try to pull that off. If there was a one card way to get these three cards in the field, that might be useful kind of like Evil Thorn, and how it can special summon two other copies of itself from the deck, and is technically a plus one in card advantage, and did see competitive play in the OCG. Three Hump Lakuda, though, really needs help from other cards in order to accomplish its plus one, and doesn't really do anything else. It's kind of a low-statted level three beast-type monster that you need to spend a whole bunch of resources to get the three copies on the field of. But if you are trying to pull this effect off for whatever reason, Outside of the Rescue Cat method, you could also get the other copies on the field pretty easily with Infernal Reckless Summon, 
which would still require you to special summon one copy in some other inconvenient way in order to meet the conditions for Infernal Reckless Summon. But it would also give your opponent a couple of extra monsters and is probably not worth it. But it is a way to use its effect easily if you want to pull off an inconsistent draw engine. And at number one, we have Neo Spacian Twinkle Moss. This card has the effect that when it's involved in a battle, you get to draw one card. And then reveal the card in order to apply an effect based on the type of card you drew. Where if it's a monster card, the battle phase is ended immediately. If it's a spell card, then this card can declare a direct attack, if it was the one attacking. And if it's a trap card, this card is changed to defense position. So if your deck is full of nothing but monsters, you can just continuously end the battle phase anytime your opponent tries to attack into this card. Or just draw an extra card on your turn by attacking. This card is easily a plus one in advantage if you're able to pull off its effect two times. As the conditions for bringing this card out have to use the spell card next on a Neospatian Glow Moss you control. And funny thing about Neospatian Twinkle Moss, this card's name is also treated as Neospatian Glow Moss, as in exactly the same name. So if you want to bring this card out and have a single copy of it in your extra deck, you can only play two copies of Neospatian Glow Moss in your main deck, because then you run into the three cards in your deck with the same name rule. So, this fusion monster directly impacts the consistency at which it can be brought out. And the card you need in order to bring this card out is unsearchable. Or at the very least, unsearchable with archetype specific searchers. It can technically be searched out with any card that can search out a normal spell card. Which is generally one of the hardest types of cards to search out. So if you're going through the effort of trying to bring this card out, what you get is an incredibly low statted fusion monster with zero protections outside of the battle phase shenanigans. That can potentially give you a lot of advantage if it stays on the field long enough to declare a whole bunch of attacks. That is to say, not super useful, and also easily one of the worst cards that technically gives you card advantage. If it survives long enough to give you that advantage anyway. It's too hard to bring out, its effect directly makes it more inconsistent to bring out, it has really low stats, and dies to any form of removal. A Cell Breeding Device is a continuous spell card that places one A counter on each of your opponent's face-up cards during your standby phase. Now, aliens do have a lot of cards that want your opponent to have eight counters on them to do things. However, this card is just a tad too slow to actually help the archetype very much. You don't actually get to place any counters until your next turn. So it just kind of sits on the field for two whole turns before it finally does something. Which is why it was a little too slow for the archetype it supports, which is already so slow and clunky it barely functions on its own anyway. However, even for how mediocre this card is, a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh players will still probably recognize it since the card starts with a quotation mark in its name. So it shows up first in a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh searching databases alongside a cell incubator. However, incubator was actually used in alien decks and it's not as well known as breeding device because it shows up second in search databases and nobody looks at the second best. Many of the strongest cards in Yu-Gi-Oh have had effects that take cards out of your opponent's hand. And in this video, we'll be going over the absolute worst ways there are to discard away your opponent's cards. Starting us off at number 10, we have Help Pomier. This is a level 5 Dark Fiend with 2000 attack, and it cannot be special summoned from the graveyard, and its effect is at the end of your opponent's battle phase, if it's in the graveyard because it was destroyed by battle, your opponent discards one random card. The restriction matters a lot because at the time it was released, the best way to cheat monsters out was to bring them back from the graveyard. Still, Help Pomier's biggest issue is how slow and telegraphed it is. This is a level 5 with no summoning condition. If you wanted to play a tribute monster that hand rips your opponent, you could be playing Thestalos the Fire Monarch instead, who just takes a card on summon. Even if you do bring out Help Amir, your opponent will most likely try to remove it with an effect instead to prevent its effect from going off. Your best bet is then either a tribute set and praying they beat over it, or crashing this into something else. At the very least, this restriction doesn't stop this card from being summoned from the deck from Reasoning or Monster Gate, which were popular ways to bring out much better boss monsters for the time. But even if you manage to both bring Help Amir out and get it destroyed by battle, your opponent can easily play around it by just not going into the battle phase, or set in their cards near the main phase 1. Though if you do manage to get it off, it will actually activate every time while Help Amir stays in the graveyard, which is probably more value than you can get out of any of the cards on this list, which is why it's only at number 10. And at number 9, we've got Dark Coffin, a normal trap that actually came in the same set as the last card. When a face down Dark Coffin is destroyed and sent to the graveyard, your opponent can choose to either discard a card from their hand or target and destroy one monster they control. Dark Coffin, alongside Statue of the Wicked, were some of Konami's first attempts into making trap cards that punish your opponent for destroying them. Trap cards which gain effects when destroyed have seen play, but either because they had a good effect when they were used normally, such as Artifact Sanctum being able to pop a card or extra clock your opponent, 
or because they saw play when they're destroyed and they actually offered a very big payoff like waking the dragon, cheating out a game ender. Dark Coffin not only seems like a slight inconvenience compared to both of these cards, and its modal nature makes it even worse since your opponent can just choose whatever effect would bother them less. Not only that, but you could also be playing traps that do what Dark Coffin do it better without needing your opponent to destroy them. Dogmatica Punishment can give you two pops instead of one by sending Elden Ring into Tist, and a point of the Red Lotus can rip out a card of your choice instead. But at least since this card triggers when destroyed while face down in any way, you could combo with cards that pop your own cards, such as Magical Hats letting you bring out two copies of Dark Coffin from the deck for a double hand rip, or Monster Pop during the battle phase. And at number 8, we've got Aquarian Alessa. This is a level 4 Gemini monster with 1500 attack, and Alessa has the standard Gemini effects where it's treated as a normal monster on the field or graveyard, and you can normal summon it while it's already on the field to make it gain its effect. That being, when it destroys a monster by battle, your opponent discards one random card from their hand. This card has the issue many other Gemini monsters did back in the day, where it probably wouldn't see play even if it got its effect without needing to go through the trouble of normal summoning it again. Even back in the day, it was pretty rare for monsters that only got their effects off when destroying monster by battles to see play, unless the payoff was getting free resources from your deck instead, like Blackwing Shirai the Blue Flame or Flame Veil Fire Dog for easy extra deck plays. Alessa does benefit from being the right level for Gemini Spark, which was the saving grace for Geminis back in the day, though you could just play something with better stats and typing, such as Alias or Crusader of Endymion. Nowadays, we have much better Gemini support to go around, such as Catalyst Field and Gemini Ablation to cheat them out from the hand or deck with their effects up. However, that's not nearly enough to make Aquarian Alessa playable, since we also got countless other Gemini monsters you'd want to bring out before it, such as Phoenix Gearfried and Gold Knight. And at number 7, we've got Swarm of Crows. This is a level 5 Dark Wing Beast with a measly 1200 attack and 1800 defense. It cannot be special summoned from the deck and has the ability to flip itself face down once per turn, and when it's flip summoned, your opponent discards one random card from their hand. This card is very similar to the Pac-Man monsters, a very old rogue strategy. Pac-Man stood for Pure Advantage Camel Munches All Noobs, named after Des Lacuda, which would let you draw a card every time by setting itself face down after being flip summoned. This wasn't a very good deck due to being too passive even in Yu-Gi-Oh's first formats. So of course Swarm of Crows would be on this list since it came out about a decade later than that. And if being 10 years out of date wasn't enough, it also has more restrictions than the older cards, requiring a tribute while not being able to special summon from the deck off of something like Mystic Tomato. On top of that, it's easier to play around Swarm of Crows than other Pac-Man cards, since you could just set your hand after you know what your opponent has. When this card came out, there were some other cards around that needed to be flipped to get their effects off, such as Raikou popping a card while milling, or Gear Guy Armor searching you a card. But in the case of both of these cards, they were easily searchable and were almost guaranteed to advance your game plan unless your opponent popped them while they were face down. And in the case of Gear Guy Armor, it even had better stats at level 4 than Swarm of Crows at level 5. And at number 6, we have Watt Beta. This is a level 2 Light Thunder Tuner monster with 100 attack and no defense. Its effect is that upon inflicting damage to your opponent by a direct attack, your opponent discards one card of their choice. The Watt archetype was actually playable for a short period of time upon release as a stun deck. It focused on their small monsters that could attack directly and get their effects off when they do so, such as Watt Cobra searching you a card, or Watt Giraffe preventing your opponent from activating cards for the rest of their turn. Watt Beta inherited that kind of effect, but not the ability to attack directly like the rest of them, making it much harder to pull off. This card is even outclassed directly within its own archetype, since Watt Barracks has pretty much the same effect but discards a random card from your opponent's hand, instead of letting them choose. Watt Beta's only saving grace is that since it's a level 2 tuner, it did allow you to go into the better synchro monsters of the archetype, in Watt Chimera, but none of the competitive builds would ever bother with that due to the deck's lack of swarming capabilities. There was very little reason to run this card in a dedicated Watt strategy, and none to do so outside. But at least throughout the years, both Thunder-type monsters and Watts have received decent support that help you bring out the Watt monsters outside of your normal summons, so you could probably use Watt Beta as a really bad enabler for Christian Hockey Firebacks plays at the very least. And at number 5, we have Dicelops. This is a level 4 fire monster with 1800 attack, and its effect is that once per turn you can roll a 6-sided die and apply one of these effects depending on the result. If it's a 1, you can look at your opponent's hand and discard one of their cards. If it's between 2 to 5, you discard one card. And if it's 6, you discard your entire hand. Gamble cards have pretty much never been good in Yu-Gi-Oh with a couple of exceptions. But Dice Lops is certainly not one of them. There's only a 1 in 6 chance of actually getting a good effect with this card, and the negative ones are all pretty crippling most of the times. Especially if you have to discard your whole hand, but you can play around them to some extent by setting as many cards as you can. 
Dicelops is actually one of the many gamble cards that have an effect to discard a card from your opponent's hand, but no other one gives you odds as bad as this one to get a beneficial effect. However, it does have the best payoff out of all of them by giving you the same effect as a banned card, Confiscation. This card's stats and attribute probably give it the best support out of all the cards in this list though. It can be special summoned from the deck with the new Dimension Dice by tributing another monster with a dice roll effect, and you can even tribute a Dice Slops to bring out another since its effect is not once per turn. If you're feeling lucky, you could even play that 6 to force the dice result to be either 1 or 6, giving you a 50% chance to get the best result instead. Lastly, this card happens to be a fire monster with 200 defense, so you could even use it with rekindling if you wanted to. And at number 4, we've got the Great Phantom Thief. This is a level 3 spellcaster with 1000 attack and defense, and when it inflicts battle damage to your opponent, you can declare one card name and look at your opponent's hand and discard any cards with that name. Cards that discard cards out of your opponent's hand when doing battle damage have actually seen a ton of play throughout the years. Don Zalug was a retro format staple due to being an easily searchable warrior, and later on we got X Saber Airbellum, who could be brought out with a rescue cat and was also a tuner on top of that. What these cards all had in common was that they take advantage of your opponent being open for a single turn to heavily punish them with a discard. Phantom Thief cannot do that unless you've got previous hand knowledge on your opponent somehow. Most of the times, not only will you have to get an opportunity to attack for damage with this very low statted monster, you'll have to get the same opportunity again next turn after seeing what your opponent has in their hand. Even if this card has the same effect as a card which has actually seen a ton of play throughout the years, without having Mind Crush's downside in case you miss, it lacks all of its versatility of being a chainable trap card. The small benefit of being able to get hand knowledge with this does not beat giving your opponent a guaranteed minus one with other similar effects. And at number 3, we have Kunoichi. This is a level 4 warrior monster with 1800 attack, and it has the effect that, when control of this card changes, its new controller discards one random card. This is the only card on this list that's actually incapable of discarding a card out of your opponent's hand by itself. Now, the meta in which this card came out actually had quite a few cards which stole your opponent's monsters, such as Mind Control and Brain Control. But of course, your opponent can see that you have Kunoichi out, and wouldn't use these cards in that case. And even if they ended up really needing to, they could just make sure to use Brain Control as their last card in their hand so they don't lose anything. Also, since these cards all return the targeted monster back at the end phase, Konoichi can actually enable your opponent to hand rip you instead. Defensively, this card has less utility than something which just can't change control, and that was never a relevant protection effect. Offensively, well, you can combo this with Shien Spy to rip a card of your opponent's hand, but you better kill it before the end phase or spend the whole rest of your hand until then. You could also use Creature Swap instead to rip a card while still in a monster too, but you'd probably get a bigger payoff by giving your opponent a recruiter to crash into instead. And at number 2, we've got Fang Sheng Mirror, a normal spell that lets you look at your opponent's hand and then discard one other spirit monsters to the graveyard if they have any. Now, if you didn't know, spirit monsters are a subset of monsters who usually share a couple effects. They cannot be special summoned and return to the hand during the end phase of the turn where they're normal summoned in. Fang Sheng Mirror is meant to be a side deck card, letting you remove your opponent's spirit monsters from the hand after they return to your opponent's hand. This card suffers from being an extremely narrow counter card since there are just a few dozen spirit monsters in the game in the first place. When it comes to relevant spirit monsters, Tsukiyomi was really popular in old formats due to being able to set your flip monsters face down to reuse them again. Dark Death Spirit saw some scattered play and tribute summon strategies due to being a reusable threat that could wipe monsters out every turn as long as you had some tribute fodder like Treeborn Frog. Feng Sheng Mirror is hardly the best out for either of them, since using it effectively means that your opponent already got the value out of the monsters at least once before you manage to snipe it with a mirror. You're much better off just stopping the summon entirely, or negating the effect while also being able to use those effects against non-spirit monsters as well. The only thing this card gives you over other options is some hand information, which has never been a good reason to run a card in Yu-Gi-Oh! And finally, at number 1, we have CXC's Battleship Cherry Blossom. This monster is a rank 4 XC's monster with 2400 attack, 2000 defense, and it requires a whole 4 level 4 monsters to be made. Its effect is that during your opponent's end phase, if they have more cards in their hand than you, they discard one of their choice. Also, if it has a Battlecruiser Deanthus as an XC's material, you can detach one XC's material to inflict 300 damage to your opponent for each card they have on their field as a hard once per turn. Now, the first issue of this card is of course its insane summoner requirement of 4 level 4 monsters. Pretty much no XC's monster that has ever seen play require that many monsters, unless they could be cheated out easily like Zodiac Trident. Rongo Minia was one of the few things to ask for a similar investment, but Rongo would win you the duel on the spot by locking your opponent out of summoning entirely. There's no reason why you'd ever make this when you can just make two good rank 4s instead. 
like Abyss Dweller locking your opponent out of graveyard effects while Red Doer gives you value every turn, or even just one good Link 4 like Appalooza. Since this is a CXC's monster, it's meant to be ranked up on top of the Anthus to get its full effect, but that's arguably even harder since you need three level 3s and a rank up spell on top of that. To make matters worse, you can't even use any of the actually good rank up spells with this due to the monster's rank and typing. The reward you get for all the trouble this card takes to bring out is minuscule. Not only does this protectionless card have to live through a whole opponent's turn to get its effect off, it even lets your opponent choose which cards to get rid of on top, making it trivial to play around. You also need to have less cards in your hand than your opponent to even resolve the effect, to make matters even worse. This is meant to go together with its second effect making your opponent set their card so that it burns for more damage, but at a whopping 300 damage per extra card they put down, I don't think this is going to dissuade anyone from doing that. When it comes to burning, you're much better off with something like Secret Barrel instead, and if you wanted hand ripping, you're much better off with any other card on this list, which is why Battleship Cherry Blossom is indisputably number one. Dark Angel is a level 5 Dark Fairy, which has a hand trap effect that only activates when a fairy monster you control is targeted for an attack where you then tribute your fairy monster, send this card from your hand to the graveyard, then change the attack target to another one of your monsters, then the new target gains attack equal to the fairy you tributed until the end phase. So basically, you go minus two in card advantage to redirect one attack and give an attack boost, or like a really bad honest or even dark honest. However, this can be useful if you really want to trick your opponent into attacking one of your dangerous monsters to attack, like a Ubel, for example. The dragon type is widely regarded as one of the best typing of monsters that a Yu-Gi-Oh card can have, specifically Dark Dragon. However, in this video, I'm going over some of the worst dragons that have ever been put into the game. And at number 10, we have the Blue Eyes Shining Dragon. This card shares its stats and attribute with the Blue Eyes White Dragon, being light with 3,000 attack and 2,500 defense. It's two levels higher than the Blue Eyes at level 10, and it must be special summoned by tributing the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. Shining Dragon's effects are that it gains 300 attack for each dragon monster in your graveyard, and it can also negate any effect that targets it, and that effect is not once per turn. Now, while this card does have an extremely powerful effect for the year it came out, in 2004, it was actually impossible to summon this card all the way until four years later. Konami wouldn't release the monster it needed to tribute, the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon, until 2008. At the very least, when it came out, pretty much the only reliable way to cheat Ultimate Dragon out, Future Fusion, existed already, even if it got limited soon after release. However, by 2008, this slow gimmick strategy already had no room in the meta. That was the time where Dark Arm Dragon had a tight grip on the game, being a tier 0 threat throughout the whole year. After Dad was taken care of, monsters with similar targeting protection to Blue Eyes Shining Dragon did rise up to eventually be part of the metagame, but they were a thousand times easier to bring out, while only being slightly weaker. Also, since this card negates the effects of targeted and not activations, it cannot be activated in the damage step, so it can't even protect itself when attacking into a man eater bug, or pre errata Ryoko unlike other cards. Still, it benefits from being a Blue Eyes card, one of the most widely supported archetypes in the game. They've also released many more ways to cheat out the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon as the years went by. So that is why this card occupies only the 10th spot on this list. And at number 9, we have Sniffer Dragon. This is a level 2 Dark Dragon with tiny stats at 800 attack and 400 defense. Sniffer Dragon's effect is, when it's normal or special summoned, it can add another copy of itself from your deck to your hand on a hard once per turn. Dragon decks in Yu-Gi-Oh! have often had the fame of having some of the most powerful starters in the game. From Rocket Tracer being able to get you a level 8 Synchro, and Safer to getting you a Spheres at the very least, Sniffer Dragon just pales in comparison to pretty much any Dragon card that actually sees play in Dragon Link. Its effect is one of the most meaningless plus ones you can get in the game. Adding a copy of itself with no benefits to having multiple copies, or any special summon condition, isn't going to do much more than serve as discard fodder. This could have been fine if it was an old card, but Sniffer Dragon was actually released at the beginning of the Link era, in the same set that introduced the rocket monsters into the game nonetheless. However, it is interesting to note that a very similar card to this would actually see playing in Dragon Rulers of all things back in the day. Pokey Draco has pretty much the same effect as this card, on an even smaller body, but it being fire attribute was relevant for being a non-tuner for Blaster to Search after the baby dragons were all banned. And at number 8, we have Chobham Armor Dragon. This monster is level 1 with zero attack and defense and the following effects. When your opponent declares a direct attack, you can special summon in attack position, and then, for this turn only, it cannot be destroyed by battle, and any damage you take from battles involving this monster is halved. Also, when it's sent to the graveyard as a link material, you can return another dark monster in your graveyard to your hand, but your opponent can get back one monster from their graveyard too. Chobham packs two incredibly mediocre effects. When it comes to the first one, this card is pretty much just a straight downgrade from Battle Fader, 
since it doesn't end the battle phase, negate the attack, or even do anything if it gets removed. It's much worse than all the other battle-related hand traps that ever managed to actually see play. Now, as for the effect it gets when it's used as a link material, it's not that bad in theory. It is easily linked off with either Pitsy or Striker Dragon, but it does require graveyard setup to be used effectively. It doesn't help that every good Dragon Extender is a hard once per turn, making it unlikely you'll be able to use it again during that turn. The worst part though is how it lets your opponent return any monster from their graveyard to their hand. Not only are most of the hand traps in the game monsters, a fair amount of them can be used however many times you want per turn, giving that effect the potential to be given back to your opponent to answer whatever threat you were going to do with it anyway. And at number 7, we have Flameveil Dragnov. This is a level 2 fire dragon with 1100 attack, and it has the effect that, when it's destroyed by battle and sent to the graveyard, your opponent takes 500 damage. Dragnov also has a graveyard effect that lets you banish it from the graveyard and a face-up fire monster to add another copy of itself from your hand to your deck. Of all the incredibly mediocre Flameveil cards with burn effects, this is the most minor of them all. Much older cards were doing this amount of damage while also floating at the same time. The fact that this card can only add itself with its graveyard effect is disappointing since there have actually been multiple Flameveil cards that were actually decent enough to see play, such as Flameveil Fire Dog and Flameveil Guard. But even if this card could just add any of the Archetype's members from the deck to the hand, odds are it would still be on this list anyway. The cost of banishing a face of fire monster you control for a search is such a major loss of card advantage and tempo. This huge cost also has anti-synergy with its very own archetype. The main reason to run the Flameveil Dog package back in the day was because of the card Rekindling. Rekindling lets you special summon as many fire monsters with 200 defense from your graveyard as possible. This card was the closest the game had to a soul charge back in the day, and it even ended up on the ban list for some amount of time. But despite having the so desired stat line for 200 defense, if you do end up using Flameveil Dragnov's effect, they'll just rob you of two monsters to bring back with it. And at number 6, we've got Kiryu. Kiryu is a level 5 Dark Dragon Union monster with 2000 attack and 1500 defense. It has the unusual Union effect of being able to equip himself to a monster or unequip to special summon itself once per turn. While equipped, Kiryu gives a 900 attack and defense bonus, and it can also attribute itself to allow the monster to attack directly this turn. And as if that all didn't sound unimpressive enough, Kiryu can only be equipped to Dark Blade, an 1800 vanilla beater who was outclassed even when it came out. Union monsters have been known to be quite bad outside of the ABC archetype, but Kiryu manages to be the worst of all Union dragons by a long shot. Its effect was outclassed by every half-decent equip spell back in the day, and it also needs a tribute to be brought out due to being level 5. Even with modern support, there's no good way to bring this out if you wanted to for whatever reason. Most new Union cards focus entirely on light machine monsters, and pretty much the only Union dragon monster to ever see play was Trigon during Dragon Ruler format. Purely due to being a level 3 monster with 500 attack that can be brought back with Debris Dragon for level 7 synchro plays. But still, even if Trigon was only ever used for its level and stats, that's more than anyone could ever say about Kiryu. And at number 5, we have Baby t Rangan. This is an Xyz Earth Dragon that's rank 1 and requires 3 level 1 monsters as its materials. Baby t Rangan's effect lets you detach an Xyz material during your main phase 1 to make one of your level 1 monsters be able to attack directly this turn. The amount of resources this card asks you to sink into it to actually get its effect off is simply absurd. Not only is it asking for 3 level 1 monsters on the field, which isn't a very easy task by itself, you also need a 4th level 1 monster to actually use that direct attack. For that to be worth anything in the first place, the 4th monster would either need to have a massive attack stat, or a really good effect when it inflicts battle damage. So we're looking at a 4 monster investment, one of which has to be a somewhat specific one to get a payoff weaker than just linking them off for a good Link 4. Baby t Ragon was one of the first Xyz monsters to be released, but even then it was outclassed by Xyz era staples which came in the same set such as Zen Mains and Dalka. In fact, this set also had another rank 1 Xyz, which would be better than Baby t Ragon in pretty much any situation. Number 83, Galaxy Queen. In the current metagame, Xyz monsters with the effects that let you attack directly are valuable and actually see tons of play to easily go into Zeus to wipe the field. But sadly, since Baby t Ragon can't use its effect on itself, it can't even be useful for that much. And at number 4, we have Poly Chem Critter High Dragon. This card is a level 8 water Gemini monster with 2800 defense and 200 attack. High Dragon has the regular Gemini effect where it's treated as a normal monster on the field or in the graveyard, and it can then be normal summoned again while it's already on the field to gain its effect. Its first effect is when another Gemini monster is normal summoned, you can make that monster gain 500 attack and defense permanently. His second effect is that if a Gemini monster you control would be destroyed by a card effect, you can destroy one other card from your field instead. 
Gemini monsters have always been known to be the worst kind of main deck monsters. This is how they can get away with having so many strong support cards. But even with being able to cheat this card out without too much difficulty, there's just no reason to run this over any other high level Geminis. Within its own archetype, it's outclassed by Polychem Critter Dioxogre, who can impact the field more with a pop and a huge attack stat. Outside of that, Phoenix Gear Free can provide Graveyard Recursion and a Spell and Trap Card Negate. High Dragon just sits on the field, giving you minor stat buffs and some protection, but only if you manage to bring it out alongside other actually impactful monsters. In the history of the meta, Geminis have only really seen play a handful of times, either due to having crazy recursion effects in the early synchro format, or a really good fortunate combination of level, archetype, and attribute to be used alongside Gemini Spark. Not only does High Dragon not have either of these, he was also released years after they were relevant as well. And in number 3, we have Divine Dragon Excelion. This is a light dragon level 5 monster with 1500 attack and 900 defense. When Excelion is normal summoned, you can choose to gain one effect for each other copy of Divine Dragon Excelion in the graveyard, and you can't make it gain the same effect twice. These effects are, this card gains 1000 attack, another attack if it destroys an opponent's monster by battle, and to burn your opponent for the same amount of attack the monster had if it beats over something. Excelion came out in the same set that introduced the gimmick of needing multiple copies of the same card to gain additional effects, but it got the worst effect out of all of them, and these monsters weren't good in the first place. It only gains its buff exactly when normal summoned, so you won't be benefiting from dumping extra Excelions in the graveyard after it's out. It will also forget its effect if it leaves the field temporarily, or gets flipped face down and then back up. All of this on a monster that needs to be tributed to be brought out in the first place. Cards which only work with more copies of themselves would eventually be meta, and some would even land on the ban list. But these effects all gained you advantage somehow. Even for the time this card was released, when Tribute Summons were actually a premium and seen play because of the Treeborn Frog, Exilion was one of the worst things you could use your normal summon for. There's just never any reason to play this card over something like Zaborg the Thunder Monarch or even Jinzo. Even being a Dragon card does this card no favors, as it's too high level to be used for either of the Dragon Link 1s as well. And at number 2, we have Diabolos King of the Abyss. Diabolos is a level 7 Dark Dragon, so it needs 2 Tributes to be Tribute Summoned, with 2800 attack and 1000 defense. This monster cannot be special summoned, and when it's tribute summoned, both tributes must be dark. It has the effect that, before your opponent draws a card for turn, you can look at the card at the top of their deck and decide if you want to keep it there, or put it on the bottom of their deck so they draw another random card. There's just a huge gap between how difficult this card is to bring off, and the payoff you'd actually get for doing so. Two tribute monsters that cannot be special summoned have always been quite hard to summon, but they did actually see some play. Light and Darkness Dragon was relevant for years, and Vanity's Ruler still sees play to this day. The thing is that these cards provided absurd payoffs if you do get their summons off, with Vanity's logging out special summons completely, and Light and Darkness Dragon being able to negate four effects and being a monster reborn if it gets destroyed. Diabolos, while being even harder to get out since it requires dark tributes specifically, gives you a very weak effect that makes your opponent draw a mediocre card for turn. This kind of effect was only ever used in Mystic Mind stall decks, who'd be unable to summon it anyways. These decks also have access to the much better Goddess Skull Oracle instead, which just requires you to activate it from your hand, and lets you look at the top three cards from your opponent's deck and put them in any order instead. But at the very least, Diabolos did get two retrains over the years which were good and widely used in some strategies, with Darkest Diabolos and Light Ray Diabolos. But the original itself is completely worthless, and that's why it gets the second spot on this list. And at number 1, we have Jormungandr the Nordic Serpent. This is a level 8 dark dragon monster with 3000 attack and defense, and is one of the lesser known monsters of the Nordic archetype. This card cannot be normal summoned or set, it must be special summoned from your hand to your opponent's side of the field in defense position, while an Azure monster is on the field. Jormungandr destroys itself if there's no Azure on the field, and also the first time it's changed from defense position to attack position while it's on the field, its controller takes 3000 damage. So. First of all, the issue with this card is that it needs an Azure monster in the field to be brought out and stay on the field in the first place. The Azure are the boss monsters of the Nordic archetype, and they're all level 10 synchros that each require one specific Nordic subtype of tuner plus two or more non-tuners. These have always been some of the most restrictive synchros to be brought out, and even with the new support, you still need to invest quite a few cards to make them in the first place. And if you do manage to do that, you can summon this huge level 8 beater to your opponent's side of the field. Now. Monsters that are summoned from your hand to your opponent's field have seen play regularly, but usually they do so while removing your opponent's monsters at the same time, like Kaijus or Lava Golem, while Jormungandr just gives your opponent a body for free. Of the monsters that weren't being used as removal, they at least had effects to floodgate your opponent until you got rid of them. 
like Nightmare Corruptor Ebly, locking them into only Link monsters. What does this huge beater do to your opponent once you give it to them? Well, it inflicts some chunk of burn damage to them if they decide to change it into attack position, something your opponent is not forced to do. This card has absolutely nothing to do or any synergy with its other archetype members and left Nordic fans baffled when it came out. With the exception of Fenir, the Nordic Wolf, who came out in the same wave of support as Jormungandr, Fenir has the same summoning condition as the Snake, where its spells will summon to your opponent's side of the field if there's an Azure out. With even bigger stats and has the effect to change all monsters of its controllers from defense position to attack position at the start of the battle phase. So, this is the ultimate payoff for this two card combo, which makes your opponent go plus four. You get to inflict 3000 burn damage, and that's if they don't use them off as material and choose to enter the battle phase in the first place, which they don't even have to. To make matters even worse, Fenrir itself can only be summoned during the main phase too, so you can't even pull this combo off on your first turn. Not that you'd ever want to do so at any point in the game. The other monsters on this list so far have ranged from weak to mediocre, but none of them had effects that benefited your opponent over you so much. Jormagander easily earns its first spot on this list, as it's the worst dragon monster by far. The Accumulator is a level 1 Thunder monster that gains 300 attack times the number of Link ratings on the field. So if you have a Link 4 monster on the field, it gains 1200 attack, which is laughably bad once you remember how hard it is to get a Link 4 monster on the field in the first place. There's also another card called the Calculator, which gains 300 attack for each level of monsters you control. And while the Calculator was never what one would call competitive, it's 10 times easier to get a level 4 monster on the field over a Link 4 monster. I assume the intention of the Accumulator was to be used against an opponent's board full of Link monsters to maybe crash over one of them if they just had a ton of them out, which is still honestly such a nice situation that it's still not very good. Some of the most powerful card effects in Yu-Gi-Oh are locked behind a discard cost, and in this video we'll be going over the absolute worst cards in the game that take a card out of your hand to work. And starting us off at number 10, we have Spirit Ryu. This is a level 4 Wind Dragon with 1000 attack and defense, and during the battle phase, if this card battles, you can discard one Dragon Monster to make this card gain another 1000 attack and defense until the end of the battle phase. This is a tiny 1000 attack monster you're meant to use as a beater by discarding something, when you could just be playing something that's bigger by default instead. Except this card is even worse than that since the effect can only be triggered during your battle phase, making it a sitting duck during your opponent's turn. The only benefit this card has over those other ones is that its effect is not once per turn, so you could discard multiple dragons for an even bigger boost. But why would you ever want to go minus two or worse to get a high attack monster when pretty much every removal spell will do the same job but better? Even for this card's time, a generic discard cost would usually impact the field much more, such as Tribe Infected Virus or Raigeki Break, while this card does much less while also requiring specifically a dragon. Still, due to being a really old card, and because lots of dragons do want to be in the graveyard, this card only gets the 10th spot on this list. And at number 9, we have Geomancer of the Ice Barrier. This is a level 3 spellcaster tuner with 800 attack and 1200 defense, and it lets you, once while it's face up on the field, discard one card and declare one attribute. Then this card cannot be targeted by attacks to the monsters of the declared attribute. Now, the first wave of main deck Ice Barrier monsters were notoriously bad when compared to their extra deck counterparts, and a Geomancer was no exception. When this card came out, tuners which could protect themselves did have some value, such as Krebons and Full Helm Knight being able to negate attacks. Even within that niche, Geomancer is not very good, since all of them had their protection with negligible costs and would work on all attributes without a discard. Most decks also lean towards tuners that could special summon themselves. Still, despite all these issues, this card is still an easily searchable tuner, so at least a Hal can save it from being completely useless. The new Ice Bear support allows you to search it from your deck if you need a level 3 tuner for synchro plays, even if there's another better monster you could be running instead. And at number 8, we have Flying Red Carp. This is a level 4 water fish monster with 500 attack and defense. It can, as a quick effect, discard one water monster to gain 500 attack permanently. Then, if it ever destroys something by battle, it can tribute itself to special summon a fish, sea serpent, or aqua monster from your hand or deck. Cheating out monsters from your deck is by no means a bad effect but this card really makes you work for it. There are some actually pretty good targets for it, such as King Colacanth, who can special summon four fish monsters from your deck, being the main enabler of old fish OTK decks. The issue is that it's pretty much impossible to get this effect off, especially considering the year this card was released. Realistically, you're not beating over anything with this unless you're playing cards to boost it further, something that has been out of the meta for several years, and you'd probably need at least a discard on top of it. Still, this card has a small bit of utility solely due to being a water monster that can discard monsters as a quick effect. 
This means it can be used to trigger Adelantian monsters during your opponent's turn. Monsters which trigger their effects when used as a cost to activate a water monster's effect. So you could, for example, discard Adelantian Heaven Infantry to disrupt your opponent's turn with a pop. Even if this job of flying carp is heavily outclassed by other water monsters who could do the same thing. And at number 7, we have Radiant Vorai Essence. This is a level 4 light dragon with 1600 attack, and it has the effect that when you normal summon this card while your opponent controls a monster, you can discard one card to send any number of other copies of itself from your deck to the graveyard. Then, while in the graveyard, you can make it be treated as a dark monster until the end of your turn. This card's second effect is a worse version of the Elemental Sabers, who were not very good themselves in the TCG, even if they were meta and Duel Links. Radiant is obviously meant to be used as a chaos enabler of sorts, since it can put dark and light in your graveyard for something like Blackluster Soldier, which used to see tons of play in the past. If only this card had been released a decade or so earlier, it could have been used in chaos decks to turbo out BLS and Chaos Sorcerer. However, it came out in 2021, where the only chaos monsters that were seen play were searchable and only needed their deck's regular combos as setup. None of these would ever need to be ran alongside a monster which required a discard, your normal summon, and your opponent to control something. But at least Light Level 4 Dragon is a really fortunate typing, so you can just link this off into something better. And at number 6, we have number 58, Burner Visor. This is a rank 4 Xyz monster with 1000 attack and defense, and can be made with any two level 4 monsters. It has the same kind of effect as a Union monster, where it can either equip itself to an Xyz monster you control, or special summon from the spell and trap card zone once per turn. The monster is equipped to gains the ability to attack directly, and also, if it inflicts battle damage to your opponent, you can discard one card to inflict 500 damage to them. Burner Visor is clearly meant to be used as a finisher of sorts, allowing you to attack directly for lethal with another Xyz monster you control. This would have been fine if the rank 4 engine did not have about a dozen better options, who would allow you to push for damage while also providing way more utility. Burner Visor asks for more than its counterparts, since it needs you to have another Xyz monster out in the first place to work, while also letting your opponent trade 2 for 1 if the monster it's equipped to gets destroyed. But the worst part is that the discard cost attached to it is only a minuscule 500 burn effect, when you can easily burn for more without losing any hand advantage using Gagaga Ga Cowboy. And at number 5, we have Glacial Aquamador. This is a level 6 water monster with 1200 attack and 3000 defense. It has two effects. The first is a hand trap effect that at the start of the damage step, if your normal monster is battling, you can reveal a Glacial Aquamador from your hand and discard one card to protect it from battle destruction. The second one activates while it's on the field, where if it battles another monster, it lets you reveal a normal monster in your hand to destroy the monster at the beginning of the damage step if you then discard another card. Aquamador was notable for being one of the better stated 2000 walls in early Yu-Gi-Oh, but its Glacial Retrain is unremarkable in every way possible. The first effect is a way worse version of many other battle-related hand traps, which didn't really see any play themselves, but it asks for a discard on top of it. Being technically reusable doesn't make this card much better. It doesn't actually address the opponent's threat in any way. The on-field effect is way better since it's essentially El Shadal Construct, but the really obtuse cost of needing to get this high-level monster in the field first makes it even harder to pull off, plus it also has a discard cost as well. Normal Monster support has only gotten better over the years, giving you little reason to run this over anything else. And at number 4, we've got Return to the Doom. This is a normal spell that lets you discard one monster to add one monster that was destroyed by battle this turn from your graveyard to your hand. These kinds of generic recovery from the graveyard effects are actually quite rare, and quite a few of them have seen play at some point. The problem with Return is that on top of being a minus 1 instead of card neutral or plus like the previous cards, it doesn't do what it's supposed to. You're meant to use this card to return one of your monsters that was destroyed by battle to the hand, but it only works on a monster that's been destroyed the turn it was activated, and it's a normal spell. So this only works if you're crashing your monsters into your opponents for some reason. Now, that's not the most uncommon thing in the world, since you can lose a battle due to your opponent's card effects. You could also be crashing one of your recruiter monsters and make them float into something from the deck. In either case, getting them back to the hand isn't the worst thing in the world. But you wouldn't be able to use them into your next turn, since the effect only happens during the end phase for some reason. You'd be much better off running cards that can add the monster back to your hand immediately, or just summon it out instead. And at number 3, we have VW Tiger Catapult. This is a fusion light machine monster with 2000 attack and 2100 defense. It must first be special summoned by banishing a V Tiger Jet and a W Wing Catapult you control from your field. And its effect is that you can discard one card to target an opponent's monster and change its battle position. The V and W pieces were meant to complete the XYZ archetype, but despite coming out years later, they still managed to be worse than those. 
They still had the issue of the XYZ monsters, where one of the parts was a vanilla, so it wouldn't work with the little unit support that they did have at the time, except V was even worse statted than X for some reason. They also gave VW the tiniest stats out of any of the other two pieces, while also having the worst effect out of all of them. All the other pieces have the effect discard one card to destroy a certain type of card in the field, and these could actually clear a board due to not being once per turn. VW Target Catapult's effect is not worth a single discard to be used once, much less multiple times. It doesn't trigger flip effects at the very least, so it could be useful for playing against a flip monster, but even in that aspect it's straight up worse than YZ Tank Cannon that destroys them instead. To put the final nail in the coffin, the original pieces did get a few pieces of modern support specifically meant for it, while the VW ones were pretty much forgotten instantly after. And at number 2, we have Little Fairy. This is a level 3 light monster with only 800 attack and defense, and it has the effect that up to twice per turn you can send one card from your hand to the graveyard to increase this card's level by one. Level modulation effects are rarely ever good at Yu-Gi-Oh by themselves, but doubly so when they want a cost as high as one card from your hand for each one. In every case where monsters that change their levels ever saw play, they'd allow you to gain advantage while doing so, not lose it. During the Xyz era, a Harpy Channeler would let you special summon a monster from your deck and change its level for rank 7 plays. The Mythic Dragons could be brought out of the field easily and give you access to the much wanted rank 8 pool. Little Fairy gives you access to the rank 3, 4, and 5 pools, which had tons of better options that wouldn't be eating up your hand. In the anime, this card was used to make Fairy Cheer Girl, which is a rank 4 that requires fairy type monsters and can draw you a card, but even then you'd just be making up for the card you had to pitch in the first place. And finally, at number 1, we've got Curse of Aging. A normal trap that, for a discard, reduces the attack and defense of all monsters your opponent currently controls by 500 points until the end of the turn. This card came out of the game already outclassed since Reinforcements was released earlier and offered almost the same utility, but without a discard cost. Even that had already gotten pushed out by Rush recklessly before Curse of Aging was a thing to make matters even worse. Cards that only modify stats for a single turn have generally not been very good in Yu-Gi-Oh! outside of the first few formats, since most of the time you get more utility out of simple battle traps like Sakuretsu Armor. The decks that ran those were usually Gadgets and Gladiator Beasts. Gadgets because these decks maxed out in all forms of removal due to their tiny monsters, and sometimes a card like that was just the third or fourth best removal spell to play. Gladiator Beasts would want to play those because they actually need battles to occur for their effects to go off. Even in these two cases, Rush Recklessly would soon be replaced by Shrink, the next card to power creep this sort of effect. Seeing how quickly cards that were way better than Curse of Aging got pushed out of the meta just highlights how little of a reason you ever had to run it. Even in Duel Links, a game in which battle traps have been meta for far longer, you never had a reason to run this since reinforcements came out in the same pack. Basically, all the other alternatives had better effects and didn't require a discard in order to use them. So that's why Curse of Aging is the least impactful trap with a discard cost you could ever put in your deck in any format that Yu-Gi-Oh has ever had, and why it's number one on this list. Specimen Inspection is a spell card that lets you declare a type and level, and your opponent has to send a monster that fits those two criteria from their hand or deck to the graveyard. Now, if this card didn't have an additional cost and restriction, it might be an okay card to send one-off combo pieces from your opponent's deck or hand to the graveyard so they can't use them easier. However, we both know it doesn't end there. First, in order to even activate the card, you have to reveal the specific spell card Fossil Fusion in your hand. Then you have to send a monster from your hand to the graveyard as well. So it has an incredibly specific reveal condition and a discard cost on top of that, and the effect of just sending maybe one monster to the graveyard from their hand or deck is really not worth the massive effort it takes to use this card. Flip monsters are a type of card which basically have the rules that when they're flip face up, they activate one of their effects designated by flip and is one of the oldest types of effects of monsters in the game. In this list, we'll be going over 10 of the worst ones. And at number 10, we have the Castle of Dark Illusions. This card has a flip effect where you immediately increase the attack and defense of all zombie monsters at the field by 200. Then it has a continuous effect where after it's been flipped face up, it will increase the attack and defense of all zombie monsters in the field by 200 during each of the standby phases until the fourth turn after this card has been activated. So it's a unique card in a whole bunch of different ways. There's not too many cards which continue to provide a permanent attack boost for a set number of turns. And there's not too many cards which don't have a round even number for its attack and defense. As the Castle of Dark Illusions has 920 attack and 1930 defense. Now the effects of the card are kind of mediocre, as the card itself is fiend type so it doesn't benefit from its own attack increase. And having to flip a face up monster then keep it alive in order to provide a minor attack boost every turn is not a big deal. However, 
It does have a decently high defense at 1930, which is just high enough for it to be kind of a wall to a lot of level 4 lower monsters. So there is a chance it could be used as a high defense monster in a low power level version of the game. And at number 9 we have Jigen Bakudan. This card has 1000 defense and has the full effect that after it's flipped face up, you can offer this card as a tribute during your next standby phase in order to destroy all of your opponent's monsters and then inflict damage to your opponent equal to half of their attack. So it's kind of like a blazing mirror force with extra steps, which honestly is a pretty good effect. Although there's a couple of things that make this card not really viable. For one, it needs to survive the battle phase after being flipped face up. And with only 1000 defense, it's not going to be doing that on its own. You need support of other cards, like maybe a catapult zone to allow it to survive a battle. Or Wabaku. Then it simply needs to survive to your next standby phase where you then get to tribute it in order to destroy all of your opponent's cards. So while you could definitely play other cards to support this one flip effect monster in order to destroy all of your opponent's cards after a long delay, Generally, it's not worth the effort to go through all that trouble. Because you also have to find a way to keep the card alive outside of the battle phase through all of that, or find a way to flip it up without requiring your opponent to attack in through over battle, and then just keep it alive until your next standby phase. And if you're going to invest all those resources into slowly setting a flip monster and then protecting it just to destroy your opponent's card, there's really no reason to do all of that outside of just playing Blazing Mirror Force, or a Raigeki or Dark Hole. So technically, good effect, but flip effect monsters are already inherently slow as is, because you kind of have to wait a full turn before you can even try using the effect. And if you want to use the effect early, you have to use other cards in order to flip it up, like A and D Changer. But Jigen Bakudan has the extra waiting where it can only be used during your next standby phase, so you can't even use this effect early like you can other full flip monsters, if you really want the effect to go off. But it is still a lot better than a lot of the other flip effect monsters on this list, which is why it's only at the number 9 spot. And at number 8 we have Dark Eyes Illusionist. This card has the full effect where you can target one monster in the field and make it so it can't attack as long as this card is face up on the field. Which means it has to survive a battle before it can stop a monster from attacking. And with only 1400 defense baseline, you're going to protect it in the same way you do with Jigen Bakudan, with maybe a catapult zone or Wabuku like card. And the effect is just to simply stop one monster from attacking, while keeping a low statted monster on the field, which isn't that strong of an effect. It would be much better to just destroy the card with something like a Maneater Bug, or at least negate the effects of the monster too, like with Fiendish Chain. But simply preventing a monster from attacking doesn't really accomplish much, especially when the card is so easy to remove from the field in order to allow the monster to attack again. And at number 7 we have Death's Feral Imp. This card has the flip effect where you can return one card in your graveyard back to your deck. Now, technically, being able to return a card to your deck is not half bad in some circumstances. Like if you have a Garnet that you want to use again but don't want to play more than one copy in your deck, or you have a single copy of a card in your deck that you want to reuse again, like maybe a Salaman Great Gazelle. The problem is that it's much easier to just use something that's not a slow flip effect monster in order to accomplish something like this. Like maybe the Transmigration Prophecy, which allows you to return two cards from either graveyard back to the deck which means you can use it to deny your opponent of resources in their graveyard, while also returning one card in your graveyard back to your deck if you want. And even the Transmigration Prophecy is a slow trap card. It's still faster than a flip effect monster, who also has to wait to turn anyway and might get destroyed in the battle phase. There is a saving grace with Death's Feral Imp though. Its stats aren't half bad. It might actually survive being attacked with 1800 defense, and it has a decent-ish 1600 attack stat line for having that decent-ish high defense. Its stats are still kind of mediocre, but definitely higher than what a normal flip monster might have. So if this card is just used for its stats for whatever reason, the effect of shuffling one card back into the deck might still not be useful, as most archetypes don't really care, outside of very specific circumstances where they definitely are not going to play Death's Feral Imp to do it. And most likely will just use the Transmigration Prophecy or Pot of Avarice. And at number 6 we have Bite Shoes. This card has the flip effect where you can change the attack or defense position of one face up monster on the field, but that card must remain face up. Which is just reminder text to signify how old the card really is, when they still used to add reminder text to monster effects before problem solving card text was added. So basically what this card does is just change the battle position of a face up monster and that's it. So think of it like the first effect of enemy controller. However, that first effect of enemy controller attached to a low statted flip monster, which is much slower than enemy controller. So this is another use of a card with a technically good effect, just very underpowered, and generally flip monsters need to be really good in order to see play, 
And even then, they might not. To give you an idea of just how unviable flip monsters are in meta decks, we have a card like Morphine Jar at one copy in the game. Morphine Jar has the effect to discard both players' hands, and then both players draw five cards. So if you have no cards in your hand, then it just simply allows you to draw five new cards, which is insanely good. This has got to be one of the strongest draw effects in the game, and it's perfectly legal to play in decks, and no one touches it. So a card with a pretty mediocre effect like Bite Shoes is obviously not going to be seen in any play either. And at number 5 we have Weather Report. This is a card which has anti-support for Swords of Revealing Light, as it basically has the effect that when it's flipped face up, you can destroy all of your opponent's Swords of Revealing Light in the field, and then you can perform your next battle phase twice. And this is one of the only two cards in the game that allow a player to perform a battle phase twice, with the other being a terrible card called an Unfortunate Report, which allows your opponent to conduct their next battle phase twice. And because these two cards exist, every card which allows a monster to attack multiple times has to specify that it works during the battle phases, plural, instead of the battle phase, singular. And Weather Report and an Unfortunate Report see absolutely zero play. And it's kind of funny that these bad cards have influenced proper problem-solving card text for years to come. Now, there is technically ways to make use of Weather Report, like in the early days of the game when people were playing Swords of Revealing Light a lot, and it was even on the ban list for a bit because of how much use it saw, as it basically allows you to stall out three battle phases. And you can even just give your opponent the Swords of Revealing Light and bait your opponent into using it, so that you can destroy it with Weather Report in order to gain two battle phases for yourself. It's not a very good combo to do, but it is technically something you can do in order to force the activation of its effect. The effect itself is good. The activation requirement for it though is one you'll probably never actually accomplish in a regular duel, unless you're playing in a limited format where Swords of Revealing Light is running around rampant, or if you just find your way to give your opponent Swords of Revealing Light through something like a Graceful Tear, for example. And at number 4, we have Big Eye. This card has the effect that when it's flipped face up, you get to look at the top 5 cards of your opponent's deck and then place them on top of their deck in any order. So if you're playing a Spiral deck, where knowing the top card of your opponent's deck can help your plays go off, then Big Eye is still not good in that kind of deck because it's an incredibly slow flip effect monster. The funny thing is, there has been a competitive deck in the past where you want to look at the top cards of your opponent's deck, but even they wouldn't want to use a card like this to accomplish that goal because there's no reason for it unless it does something else, which their archetype can already accomplish without having to run a slow flip effect monster. Although that's kind of the norm for early Yu-Gi-Oh flip monsters, this was still when effects were new to cards, so a lot of them just had really underwhelming effects like this. It's still technically a positive effect, just not a very good one. And at number 3 we have Dragon Piper. This card has the flip effect where you can destroy all face-up dragon capture jars in the field. And then if you destroy any, you get to change all face-up dragon type monsters in the field to attack position. Dragon Capture Jar is a floodgate which changes all dragon type monsters in the field to defense position and then makes it so they cannot change their battle positions. So, they're essentially stuck in defense position and can't attack. Back in the real early days of Yu-Gi-Oh, like before we had modern rules, even before Master Rule 1, and Blue Eyes White Dragon was the strongest monster in the game and didn't require tributes to be brought out, Dragon Capture Jar was a legitimate floodgate and one of the only trap cards in the game at the time. So having a Dragon Piper to destroy Dragon Capture Jar was almost equivalent to allowing it to destroy a trap card, since Dragon Capture Jar was like one of only two, if not the only trap card in the game in that incredibly early format which probably predates Yu-Gi-Oh itself. However, I don't think Dragon Piper was in that format. I'm pretty sure Dragon Piper was released afterwards in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, and it just has its effect because of anime lore reasons, which is why it's incredibly specific and not very good, because Dragon Capture Jar isn't very good. However, Dragon Piper does have decently high-ish defense, which was a reason to play some cards back in the day, so at least it had that 1800 defense going for it, which is better than its nearly useless effect. And at number 2 we have the Stern Mystic. This card has the full effect where you can reveal all face down cards in the field and then return them to their original positions. So just being able to gain knowledge on face down cards in the field is technically a positive effect. It's just like one of the least impactful ones you can do, if you don't actually do something else on top of it. So usually cards whose sole effect is just looking at your opponent's cards will find their way into my top 10 worst of lists, because gaining information is useful but only if you can gain that information while doing something else, like a point or the Red Lotus. A point of the Red Lotus seems like it would be a useless card because it requires you to pay 2,000 life points, revealing your hand to your opponent, and then it just allows you to look at your opponent's hand and banish one of their cards temporarily. 
However, that's incredibly good, and it sees competitive play. The Stern Mystic just has one of the weakest, technically positive effects out of all the flip effect monsters. However, the number one spot has a nearly detrimental one. And at number one, we have Fire Sorcerer. This card has the effect that when it's flipped face up, you can randomly banish two cards from your hand to then inflict 800 points of damage to your opponent's life points. Now, going minus two for 800 points of burn damage is terrible, even when this card first came out. Generally, a card doesn't do good burn damage unless it's at least 1,000 or higher, or if you're able to inflict burn damage without some kind of loss of advantage, but this card doesn't really pass any of those hurdles. However, because its effect is so incredibly terrible, it's actually an excellent card to give to your opponent. You see, flip effects are mandatory. You can't choose to not activate flip effects once it happens. So if you simply give your opponent a face down fire sorcerer with something like creature swap or reverse reuse and then attack into fire sorcerer, your opponent will be forced to banish two random cards from their hand in order to inflict 800 points of damage to you. And that exchange is actually incredibly good. The only problem is having to give the card to your opponent. But with Reverse Reuse, you can give your opponent two face down flip monsters from your graveyard. So if you get two Fire Sorcerers in your graveyard and then give them to your opponent with Reverse Reuse, you can snipe four cards from your opponent's hand by attacking into both of the Fire Sorcerers. You know a card is bad when it's really good to give the card to your opponent. And I'm pretty sure Fire Sorcerer was not created to be given to your opponent. I'm pretty sure its full intention was to inflict that burn damage, which is why it's number one on this list. It was kind of made in the early days of the game, before they got down how much you should discard for an effect like this, but it unintentionally made it an excellent card to just give to your opponent. Afterglow is a spell card with the effect, where when it's activated you banish it and all of the copies you own. Then you shuffle one copy of the card back into your deck. It then applies a lingering condition, where during the next draw phase, when you draw a card, if it's Afterglow, you get to inflict 4,000 points of damage to your opponent. Now, the chances of drawing Afterglow in a full deck after a shuffle is pretty low but you do get a full turn to try and stack at the top of your deck. However, outside of the banned card, Lavalvel Chain, there are very few ways to stack a specific spell card on top of your deck from your deck. So while the effect of dealing 4k effect damage is really nice, it's just a tad too cumbersome to be anything more than a gimmick. A floodgate is an unofficial term for cards with continuous effects that restrict one or both players from performing some actions. With that in mind, we'll be going over the worst cards of the game, which technically fall under this definition. And at number 10, we have Aurora Paragon. This is a level 4 monster, which prevents both players from special summoning monsters while it's on the field, and doesn't have a restriction on the card being special summoned itself, like Vanity's Fiend. However, Aurora Paragon also has an additional effect, where when another monster is normal summoned to either player's side of the field, its effect activates, which destroys itself. Now. Aurora Paragon has never seen competitive play, which is saying something because every single other generic level 4 lore monster, which prevents special summons, has seen competitive play. Even all the level 5 and higher monsters that prevent special summons have seen competitive play. Aurora Paragon is the only one with this really good effect, which has never been played, and that's because its downside is just too easy to get this card off the field. However, there is a way around it. There's a continuous trap card called By Order of the Emperor, which has the effect that if a monster activates an effect which triggers when a monster is normal summoned, you can choose to negate the activation of that effect and then draw one card. And what do you know, Aurora Paragon's effect involves the normal summon of a monster. So, you could just negate its effect with By Order of the Emperor, and then draw a card every time it would try to destroy itself, to instead keep that wonderful floodgate effect and then draw a card every time a monster is normal summoned. And you would think with this wonderful two-card combo in the game, which lets you draw a card and lock out special summons, that Aurora Paragon would see play. But it's more of a gimmick than it is a meta-defining combo. Because if you really want to just stop your opponent from special summons, there's no reason to play this combo over just Fossil Dina Pachycephalo, or one of the barrier statues. And at number 9, we have Talisman of Trap Sealing. This is a continuous spell card which can potentially negate the effects of all trap cards and prevents trap cards from being activated while it's on the field. Basically a similar effect to Jinzo, an excellent floodgate card that has seen competitive play ever since it came out. However, in order to activate this card, you need to control a face-up level 3 vanilla monster called the Sealmaster Mace. And Sealmaster Mace only has 1100 attack, but at least is a dark spellcaster type monster, so enjoys a whole bunch of generic support. However, if Sealmaster Mace is removed from the field, then Talisman of Trap Sealing is destroyed. So in order to gain the wonderful effects of locking out all trap cards, 
you have to keep a level 3 vanilla monster on your side of the field alive, which is pretty difficult when you can't use trap cards, ironically enough. They do also have another card called Talisman of Spell Sealing, which has the same conditions as Talisman of Trap Sealing, except it negates the effects of all spell cards instead of traps. And being able to lock out all spell cards on a continuous trap card that you can chain to a spell card during your opponent's turn is a little bit better, but still bad because of the same restrictions. So really, we could have both of the two sealing cards on here, since they both have the bad downside of being attached to an incredibly vulnerable normal monster. And at number 8, we have Narrow Pass. This is a continuous trap card which can only be activated when both players have two or less monsters on their side of the field, where it then gains its effect where both players can only normal summon two additional monsters to their side of the field, and then they can't normal summon monsters at all as long as this card is face up. So on service level, this seems like a pretty decent floodgate. Your opponent only gets normal summon two more times total, before being completely locked out of normal summons and they have to destroy this card in order to do more. However, it only locks out normal summons, not normal sets, flip summons, or the ever-important special summon. Sure, losing your normal summon after two turns is tough, but you can only normal summon one time per turn anyway, so you can kind of ignore the card for two whole turns, before you would begrudgingly have to find a way to destroy it. Usually, good floodgates can't be ignored for two full turns, but I guess cases can be made against decks that normal summon more than once, like Yosenju's. In which case, yeah, I guess it would be a pretty decent, incredibly specific counter to those kinds of decks. And hey, if your opponent's not able to get rid of the card after two turns, then it is a legitimate floodgate, which is why it's only at number 8 and not towards the higher spots on this list. And at number 7, we have Cuban. This is a level 4 Thunder Monster with only 600 attack that has the effect where once per turn you can roll a 6-sided die. And then based on the result, it gains a continuous effect where neither player can normal or special summon monsters with the same level as that dice result. So if you're lucky and get level 4 on the dice roll, you could potentially lock your opponent out of summoning a very important level of monster. However, you can't control which level of monster you're locking out, which is the main drawback of this card and why it makes this list. Technically, if you're lucky, you could hit the perfect level that stops whatever deck your opponent's playing. However, chances are that's not going to happen, and instead, you have a very vulnerable monster with only 600 attack, if you have normal summon and face-up attack position, that's really easy to beat over in order to get rid of this floodgate. Although if you're able to get this card into defense position, 1900 isn't half bad, but still not hard to beat over either. And at number 6, we have Insect Barrier. While this card is face-up on the field, your opponent's insect-type monsters just cannot declare an attack at all. So, it's a full-on stop on attacks for your opponent's insect-type monsters. However, this falls under anti-support, as it only works against one type of monster. And insects are not an incredibly popular type of monster in the metagame. If you know your opponent's playing a full insect deck, like Insectors, chances are it's still not going to be super useful, because only stopping attacks isn't that big of a deal. Especially when Insectors, like used in my example, can destroy this card very easily with Insector Hornet. There's also the option to just use DNA Surgery to change all monsters to insect type, but that's kind of a waste on how to best use DNA Surgery. Although, putting aside the fact that it's not a very good floodgate, it does indefinitely stall your opponent from attacking. So, if you're able to stall your opponent with a whole bunch of other floodgates, and you're playing Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links, you could combo it with the Parasite Parasite skill in order to stop your opponent from attacking completely, as Parasite Parasite treats all monsters on your opponent's side of the field as insect-type monsters when it brings itself out. This is probably the only useful scenario I can think of using this card in, because it's definitely not useful in the TCG. However, Insect Barrier is not available in Duel Links, so I'm not really sure why I even mentioned this. If they were to make it available to players in the future, then this could be a niche combo available to the mobile version of Yu-Gi-Oh! And at number 5, we have the Emperor's Holiday. This is a continuous trap card which simply has the effect that it negates the effects of all equipped card effects on the field. So, it's a full lockdown on a whole type of card. However, equipped cards are definitely the worst type of card in the game. Sure, there are incredibly niche scenarios where this could come in handy, like Dark Warrior combos definitely love to use equipped cards, like DDR Different Dimension Reincarnation and a Living Fossil, or even Infernoble Knights. They use a plethora of equip spell cards. But you're better off just using anything else really, even against decks where it could specifically be somewhat useful. Because for the most part, Noble Knight decks don't really care if their equip spell cards are negated, because they care more about the action of actually equipping those spells to gain their monster effects than the effects of the equip spells themselves. 
Sure, they definitely want the equip spell effects, but it's not a big deal if their effects are negated either. If you're facing a Dark Warrior deck and you're turning off their two useful equip spells, that's not really going to stop their combos very much, as mid-combo they can just destroy Emperor's Holiday with something like a Nightmare Phoenix. So basically, it only negates the effects of cards that no one really uses. And since it only negates the effects of cards no one really uses, it's too easy to actually destroy this card with anything else in order to make them live again. Generally, incredibly specific floodgates are too vulnerable to see competitive play, unless they stop something incredibly common, like non-fusion area, which prevents players from fusion summoning. If you activate non-fusion area against a deck that only uses fusion monsters, which there are a lot of, then they're actually in trouble. Although non-fusion area isn't that great of a card either, it's just an example of an incredibly specific floodgate that has seen competitive play in the past. And at number 4, we have Spatial Collapse. This is a trap card which can only be activated if both players control 5 or less cards in the field. Where it gives a restriction where both players can only have 5 cards total on their side of the field, instead of the usual 10, or 12 if you count the two extra deck zones. Now, this seems like a good way to stop your opponent's plays in their track if they have an incredibly limited amount of space to work with. But, unless you activate Spatial Collapse as soon as they have exactly 5 cards and can't decrease the number, like maybe a whole bunch of cards in the back row due to Pendulum Scales, then it's all too easy to just use two of those monsters to go into a Nightmare Phoenix to get rid of the card. And most decks wouldn't really care to destroy it immediately either, because they can easily play with only having 5 monster card zones to work with. And most players will wait to set cards until their main phase 2 anyway. Although against Pendulum decks, where they really have to set their scales early, which adds to cards on their sides of the field, and their whole gimmick is summoning a whole bunch of cards from their hand, then you could have a case that it may slow them down a little bit. However, even then, it's kind of too easy to play around, to be useful without a whole bunch of help and support, as even giving your opponent three Ojama Trio tokens isn't the be-all end-all with Spatial Collapse anymore, because you can just use those tokens for Link Summons now. And at number three, we have Discord. This is a continuous trap card which has the effect where neither player can synchro summon. And then, because it has this incredibly powerful effect, it has a clause where you send this card to the graveyard during the third end phase after activation. So it's kind of like Non-Fusion Area, a card I talked about earlier which did see competitive play. Both of these cards essentially lock both players out of summoning a specific extra deck monster. And during the Synchro Era when Discord was released, pretty much everyone was using Synchro Monsters. And there were definitely Synchro Monster focused decks. So why did Discord not see any competitive play, while Non-Fusion Area did? Well, for a couple of reasons. For one, if you're going to be playing an anti-extra deck card like Non-Fusion Area, it's really easy to not have any fusion monsters in your extra deck to have to worry about. Most decks that are going to use fusion monsters have to build their deck around going into fusion monsters, because they're not as easy to go into as other extra deck types. So locking your opponent out of going into fusion monsters is more detrimental than single monsters. As there's the other important thing to remember, in order to perform most fusion summons, you have to activate a spell card which has the effect to do that fusion summon, which you can then chain non-fusion area to, which will make that card lost and kind of counted as a counter card in that scenario. But with Synchro Summons, you can use Discord in response to them summoning a Tuner monster, but it won't really have the same effect as completely stopping a Fusion spell card. And so Discord never really saw any competitive play, even though Synchros have seen competitive play ever since they came out, essentially. And at number 2, we have Goblin Fan. This is one of the earliest Floodgates, where it has the effect that any level 2 or lower monster which is flip summoned is destroyed, and it does not have its effect activated at that time. So if your opponent flip summons a Man Eater Bug, then Goblin Fan will destroy the card immediately and not allow its effect to activate. However, if you attack into a Man Eater Bug and it flips and activates the effect in the damage step, then that does not count as a flip summon. So Goblin Fan won't actually stop Man Eater Bug from destroying your monster. So Goblin Fan only stops low level monsters in one of the slowest ways you can summon a monster, through an actual flip summon. During the same era that Goblin Fan came out, i.e. early Yu-Gi-Oh, they also had Infinite Dismissal, which would destroy all level 3 or lower monsters that were normal or flip summon during the turn, during the end phase. Which was infinitely more useful and versatile, and also hardly saw play. But I guess it wouldn't stop flip effects immediately if your opponent was flip summoning a Man Eater Bug. And at number 1, we have Enervating Mist. This is a floodgate so bad that I'm not 100% sure it counts as a floodgate. Because what it does is, while it's phased upon the field, your opponent's hand size limit becomes 5. The standard hand size limit is 6. The hand size limit doesn't come into play until the end of your turn, 
which determines the amount of cards you're allowed to keep in your hand before your opponent's turn starts. And if you have more cards in your hand than the size limit, you have to send cards in your hand to the graveyard in order to go down to the hand size limit. So essentially, Enervating Miss stops your opponent from having one more card in their hand during their end phase, which I guess technically restricts your opponent in some way. But it's in such a minor way that it's negligible. And it's so minor that it's kind of hard to determine if it counts as a floodgate. But I think it does, because it technically restricts your opponent. If your opponent really wants six cards in their hand at the end of their turn, then they cannot, which means they were floodgated. They did release a power creep version of this card called Finite Cards, which, while it's on the field, the hand size limit of both players becomes three. So it cuts the hand size limit in half instead of just reducing it by one. And Finite Cards has never seen competitive play either. And if the power creep version hasn't seen play, you can probably guess the competitive history of Enervated Miss. So it's kind of hard to find other floodgates that are worse than this card, without them not actually being floodgates. I think even Respect Play, which doesn't count as a floodgate, is technically a more useful floodgate than Enervating Miss, because it actually stops danger monsters from activating their effects. Intruder Alarm Yellow Alert has an effect that only activates when an attack is declared, where you get to special summon a monster from your hand. Then your opponent can only attack that monster, and it's returned to the hand at the end of the battle phase. So basically it can be used to stall out a battle phase potentially, depending on the monster summoned. However, here's what's wrong with the card. Cards that activate on attack declarations are inherently less powerful than traps that can use the effect whenever or on summit, because that makes them sitting ducks in your back row for your opponent to pick off with their removal before ever entering the battle phase. Plus, the effect has to compete with Mirror Force and its variants, and this effect is not really better than those. Plus, the card only summons from the hand, one of the worst places to summon from, and it's returned shortly after, which I guess is good for proccing labyrinth effects, but not much else. Plus, the attack redirect to the monster only works while the monster is on the field, so as soon as it's destroyed, they're free to attack whatever they want again. And to top things off, this card came out in 2020, when the card would have been power crept in 2010. In Yu-Gi-Oh, a hand trap is a card which activates during your hand from either player's turn in response to an opponent's action or an effect with the goal of disrupting your opponent's plays. Some hand traps, however, are more useful than others and can either have terrible effects or just do nothing to justify their activation conditions. So in this list will be focused on the worst of the hand traps in the game and why they should be avoided when deck building. And at number 10, we have Karibo, a level 1 Dark Fiend monster with 300 attack and 200 defense, with the simple effect that during damage calculation, if an opponent's monster is attacking, you can discard Karibo from your hand to take no battle damage from that specific battle. Now, in the anime, Karibo was often mocked for being one of the weakest monsters in the game, but you might be surprised to know that Karibo actually saw a fair amount of competitive play. From 2005, even so far as up to 2007, as a tech option in some side decks in order to counter one turn kill strategies, like the infamous Cyberstein OTK, and can even be used against modern OTK decks like Grand Maju in the same capacity. So, why does Karibo make it onto the list? While the card can certainly prevent you from being OTK'd, there are simply better options available. Like Battle Fader and Swift Scarecrow can prevent the battle from even occurring and end the battle phase entirely, stopping every attack the opponent can make while also preventing you from taking battle damage. Although both Battle Fader and Swift Scarecrow do only trigger when a direct attack is declared. But even within its own archetype, Rainbow Karibo and Sphere Karibo are arguably the better cards since they can also ensure your monsters aren't destroyed by battle. Rainbow Karibo preventing the monsters from attacking, and Sphere Karibo by switching the attacking monster to defense mode. In fact, Sphere Karibo saw a lot of play in both Duel Links and Speed Duels for this reason. Although in the TCG, there is the argument that Sphere Karibo doesn't work as well because Link monsters can't go to defense position. All in all, while Karibo has had its uses, it takes number 10 spot on this list as its particular niche is currently filled by other cards which do its job way better. Though Karibo isn't a terrible choice, if you need to play a hand trap to potentially survive an extra turn or two against OTK strategies, since it's not once per turn, and can be used against multiple high attack monsters provided you have multiple Karibos to discard. So there are certainly worse options like some of the higher spots on this list. And at number 9, we have Ghost Sister and Spooky Dogwood, a level 3 zombie tutor monster belonging to the Ghost Girl or Yokai series of cards, which brought about some of the strongest hand traps in the game, like Ghost Ogre and Snow Rabbit and Ash Blossom and Joy Spring. So you would think this card would be equally as powerful. Yet its effect is much worse compared to the other Ghost Girls. It's a hard once per turn and can be activated at any point during either player's turn, except the end phase, and has the effect that every time your opponent special summons an effect monster, during the main or battle phase you gain life points equal to that monster's attack. But it comes with the major downside that if you don't gain any life points of the effect of Spooky Dogwood, your life points are halved instead. 
At first glance, this seems like an influential effect similar to that of Max-C, a card currently banned in the TCG due to its effect to draw one card every time your opponent special summons a monster. Creating an environment in which your opponent is disincentivized from special summoning in order to put a stop to your opponent from generating card advantage. In a similar capacity, Spooky Dogwood disincentivizes the opponent from special summoning to prevent your opponent from gaining a whole bunch of life points, and incentivizes not special summoning at all to ensure your life points are halved, which sounds strong on paper. However, the main difference between Max C and Spooky Dogwood is that in Yu-Gi-Oh, card advantage is much, much more important when compared to life points. With Max C drawing one card on every summon, it makes it more likely that you're going to draw into another powerful hand trap, like Nibiru the Primal Being, a game determinative board breaker, like Forbidden Droplet, or a necessary piece of their engine that their deck needs to build their own board. Spooky Dogwood does none of these things, and while it can accumulate a lot of life points to prevent you from being OTK on your next turn, it's more than likely that your opponent will have gained a lot more in resources, card advantage, and board presence by the time they're done with their combo. Enough to stop your potential plays and eventually reduce your life points to zero, even if it's over the course of several turns. With all that being said, the reason why Spooky Dogwood only takes number 9 spot on this list is because it actually saw and still occasionally sees some amount of competitive play, which is surprising to hear since life points usually don't matter in Yu-Gi-Oh, due to the way current time rules work in Yu-Gi-Oh. And at number 8 we have Watt Kinetic Puppeteer, a level 4 light psychic monster with 1800 attack, and its only ability is its hand trap effect, where you can discard Watt Kinetic Puppeteer in order to target any monster your opponent controls and move it to one of their other main monster zones. In the modern era, this effect is usually pretty bad, as moving your opponent's monsters to different zones rarely does much to affect their plays. Although, there are some instances in which Watt Kinetic Puppeteer can actually make for a pretty effective hand trap, allowing you to set up your own plays for Mech Knight monsters by ensuring there are two more cards in a column, floodgate your opponent by putting their monsters in the same column as an S-Force monster you control, or more commonly, and more likely, mess with the effects of certain Link monsters that require the arrows to be set up in specific ways in order to activate and resolve their effects, such as the case of Guard Dragon Pitsy. If Pitsy is moved by the effect of Watch Kinetic Puppeteer so there's no zone in which two Link monsters point to, then it won't be able to special summon a dragon from the graveyard. In fact, Watch Kinetic Puppeteer actually saw a minor amount of competitive play during Master Rule 4, as a niche hand trap option which could prevent certain effects from being used, stop extra links which would prevent you from special summon at all from the extra deck, or to change where your opponent's link arrows point to in order to stop them from summoning more synchro, fusion, XCs, pendulum, or link monsters from the extra deck. Currently though, in the Master Rule 4 revisions you can special summon synchro, fusion, XCs monsters to any available zones, meaning that Watt Connect Puppeteer has far less of an impact in that regard but can still potentially give Pendulum and Link decks fewer arrows for them to special summon and swarm the field, and does still have applications against or with certain strategies, which either require columns or Link arrows to function well. Although, its current usage is extremely niche and doesn't justify the minus one in card advantage, as you'd usually be better off by just playing other, more impactful hand traps, with a wider range of use. Still, for its niche application, it's not the worst card in the world, and being hyper-specific is something a puppeteer shares with the next card on this list. And at number 7, we have Engraver of the Mark, a level 4 dark spellcaster monster with two fairly unique effects. Its on-field effect is that during either player's turn, you can target one card in the field to destroy it during the end phase of the next turn. This is an extremely slow effect in the same vein as Swordsman from the Distant Land and Zone Eater, as while it has the potential useful effect of destroying any card in the field, it does so during the end phase of the next turn meaning your opponent will more than likely have a chance to use that card in some capacity, as material to summon out a monster from the extra deck in the case that you targeted a monster, or just by using that spell or trap card that's targeted before it gets destroyed. The on-field effect has some niche applications against particularly hard to out floodgates like Gozen Match or There Can Be Only One, but even then, regular spell and trap removal like Mystical Space Typhoon or Twin Twisters is both easier to use and deals with floodgates more quickly, rather than needing to wait an entire turn. The more interesting part of this card, however, is its ability to be used as a hand trap. It has the in-hand effect that during either player's turn when your opponent activates a card or effect by declaring a card name, you can send Engrave of the Mark from your hand to the graveyard to declare another card name from the one initially declared, and then your opponent's declared name becomes the one you declared instead. So, if your opponent is trying to use a card like Prohibition to stop you from using one of your key combo pieces or end board bosses, you can chain Engraver the Mark to declare one of their key combo pieces to lock them out of the game instead. Engraver the Mark's hand effect does have some applications against Crossout Designator, a card currently seen meta play for its ability to stop hand traps, and Crossout Designator just so happens to declare a card name upon activation. 
Meaning that if you try to hand trap your opponent and they attempt to stop you by using Crossout Designator, you can, like with Prohibition, chain Engrave of the Mark to declaring one of their key cards, which not only ensures your other hand traps aren't negated, but that a really important card they may need to finish their combo is negated instead. The main reason this card's on this list, despite its unique and seemingly powerful effect, is due to the fact that, because it's so niche, it only has a few cards which it can really counter. And most of those cards haven't and are unlikely to see competitive play. Even in the case of Crossout Designator, there are other, better counter cards which have a wider coverage of applications. Like Artifact Lancia, which can also floodgate the opponent out of banishing cards for the turn, causing Crossout to resolve without any effect since it needs to banish the declared card. All while preventing your opponent from activating other cards like Pot of Desires or any of the Phantom Knight Graveyard card effects. Engraver of the Mark, however, is potentially a card to keep an eye on and could even become more powerful hand trap and more cards are released which declare a card name. But for the time being, its applications are far too small for it to be really considered above other hand traps. But its interesting effect brings it to the number 7 on this list, yet you might be surprised to hear that the next card on this list has an even weirder effect. And at number 6 we have Bahalutia, the Grand Radiance a level 7 light dragon monster with a really odd effect. During your opponent's main phase when a card is added from the deck to their hand, you can tribute summon the Grand Radiance. Usually, because it's a level 7 monster, you would need to tribute summon two monsters to do this. However, the Grand Radiance can also be summoned by distributing any one effect monster. And when it's successfully summoned from the hand, you can make your opponent banish the top cards of the deck face down, equal to the number of cards they have in their hand. Then your opponent shuffles their entire hand into their deck, and if they do, they add the cards you banish to their hand. So, the idea of this card is that you wait for your opponent to search out for a particularly important card, and then cut off access to that card by forcing them to shuffle their hand into their deck and giving them new cards, which are hopefully less strong than the cards you shuffled back, giving it a similar use to cards like Drawn Lockbird and Ash Blossom and Joy of Spring, both of which are extremely powerful cards in their own right, which cut off access to strong engine pieces. So, why doesn't Bahalutia compare? Well, part of the reason why hand traps are usually so strong, and why they've seen meta play for over a decade, is that they're powerful tools to interrupt your opponent's plays, and make going second a lot easier. Bahalutia, however, requires that you tribute summon in order to summon it from your hand during your opponent's turn, meaning that you need to already control a monster for this card to be useful, making it a hand trap that's only capable of performing well when you're going first to set up a monster to tribute it. So it loses a lot of versatility compared to other hand traps. And furthermore, when you consider that its effect has a chance to potentially give your opponent an even better hand than the one once had, then it appears extremely weak and sometimes even beneficial to your opponent, which is why Bahalutia makes it cleanly on this list. And at number 5 we have Confronting the Sea, a level 5 earth insect monster belonging to another series of monsters, the Sea Monsters. Like the Ghost Girl series, most of the Sea Monsters are hand traps with specific effects in order to counter different things your opponent is trying to do. The infamous and aforementioned Maxi gains advantage from your opponent's special summoning monsters. Flying C stops your opponent from XC summoning, and Retaliating C is basically a macrocosmos. Confronting the C, on the other hand, doesn't hold a candle to any of these effects. It can special summon itself from your hand when your opponent summons a monster from the extra deck, and if it's summoned in this way, it's unaffected by monster effects that target it. Additionally, this effect doesn't seem half bad, as you essentially get a free level 5 monster that's particularly difficult to deal with, especially with a rather beefy defense of 2500, even if its attack is somewhat lacking. And being unaffected is the strongest type of protection a card can have. The main issue with Confronting the Sea is that while it doesn't lose you any advantage since it's a free summon from your hand, assuming your opponent summons a monster from the extra deck, it doesn't really gain you any advantage or impede your opponent at all. So, while it's technically card neutral, it doesn't really do anything. In comparison, Contact C is technically a minus 2 in card advantage, as not only are you losing a card from your hand, you're giving your opponent an extra card, yet Contact C has seen a lot more competitive play than Confronting the C ever has. This is because, despite Contact C giving your opponent a free monster, it also floodgates the opponent out of special summoning monsters from the extra deck unless they use Contact C as material. This can be particularly awkward for XCs or fusion decks, since Contact C's level, type, and attribute are all very awkward. For Even against Tri Brigade, Contact C acted as a direct counter to them, as after a Tri Brigade monster has used their effect, they can't use any other monsters except Beast, Wing Beast, and Beast Warriors as materials to Link Summon, and Contact C happens to be an insect type monster. So, you would essentially stop your opponent from summoning Links for the turn. In contrast, Confronting the C is card neutral, but doesn't do anything but exist on the field. And while its protection is somewhat strong, not only can it still be destroyed by battle, it can also be removed from the field by any spell or trap effect, 
or even any monster effect so long as it doesn't target it. Still, Confront in the Sea can have some minor use and could even potentially help out some rank 5 strategies in swarming the field, since they usually require at least one monster tribute to summon and it could potentially be annoying to deal with. But it simply doesn't do anything to really interrupt your opponent, kind of like the next card on this list. And at number 4, we have Time Escaper, a level 2 Earth Psychic Monster with a hand trap effect specifically designed to protect other psychic monsters, where you can discard Time Escaper from your hand during your opponent's turn to target and banish one psychic monster you control into your next standby phase. Conceptually, the idea behind Time Escaper is actually pretty interesting. You can use Time Escaper to protect your psychic boss monster on the field, including monsters that were special summoned from the extra deck. So, if you're worried that your opponent may destroy your Full Metal Foe's Alkahest, you can simply discard Time Escaper to banish it, and the monster it banishes will return to your next standby phase, letting you keep your psychic monster to deal with your opponent's board on the next turn. This card isn't the worst thing in the world if you really need to protect your psychic monsters, but there are a couple of key issues with it. It can open you up to potentially getting OTK'd by your opponent's board, and chances are, if they have the ability to threaten your psychic boss monsters, they're likely to end up dealing a ton of damage to you if they don't kill you instantly. And secondly, it has very few good targets to banish. Currently, the strongest and most easily accessible psychic type boss monsters in the game are Time Thief Redoer, Cyframe Lord Omega, and Virtual World QB Shen Shen, each of which have the ability to either banish themselves to dodge card effects anyway, in the case of Redoer and Omega, or can infinitely resummon themselves like Shen Shen can. In essence, there aren't really good targets to protect with Time Escaper, but if your deck just so happens to end on a psychic type monster that doesn't have a way to protect itself, then you can at least consider Time Escaper, even if there are a myriad of other ways that it can be done better. And at number 3, we have Gadget Driver, an Earth Machine hand trap which, despite its namesake, doesn't support the Gadget archetype. Instead, it actually supports the Morphtronic archetype. With no once per turn, during either player's turn you can send Gadget Driver from your hand to the graveyard in order to target and change the battle position of a face-up Mortronic monster you control. This can occasionally be somewhat beneficial, as the particular gimmick of Mortronic monsters is they gain different effects depending on their battle position. So, if you control a face-up attack position Morphtronic boomboxin, but are worried your opponent might beat over it with one of the more powerful monsters during the battle phase, you can activate Gadget Driver to change Boombox into defense mode and negate the attack. Or if you really need to protect your Morphtronic Slingin from being destroyed, you can use Gadget Driver to change the defense position so you can destroy another Morphtronic card you control instead. In fact, Gadget Hauler can even be used offensively during your own turn to gain access to powerful effects of cards, like Morphtronic Vacuumin, which can equip your opponent's monsters to it, essentially acting as an easier to access relinquish. Despite this utility, however, Gadget Driver requires a fair amount of setup in order for you to get any use out of it, requiring that you both have it in hand and a Morphtronic with an effect that you're likely to use the effect of. So, even though it can technically disrupt your opponent, it's very situational and given how weak the Morphtronic effects can be, oftentimes it can have little impact, so you'd rather just run other hand traps instead. In fact, Gadget Driver, despite somewhat helping the Morphtronics with their gimmick, rarely sees any play within the archetype, as there are much better options to use rather than Driver. And furthermore, because Gadget Driver isn't technically a Morphtronic card, you can't even special summon it or search for it with the effects of Morphtronic Cell Phone and Morphtronic Smartphone, respectively, making it a card you have to draw to see any use out of. And it can even be detrimental since it dilutes the concentration of Morphtronic names for Cell Phone and Smartphone, making it occasionally even a detriment to the archetype it was meant to support, which is why it deserves a number 3 spot on this list. Rocketing to number 2 is DD Save Into Galilee, the first and only Pendulum monster on this list. It's a Dark Fiend monster with 0 attack and defense, and a scale of 1 with a Pendulum effect that states you cannot pendulum summon monsters except DD monsters, and during your standby phase, increase the pendulum scale of Galilei by 2, and if you do, destroy all monsters you control with a level equal to or lower than its pendulum scale, except DD monsters. Now, already, this isn't a great effect. Locking you into only pendulum summoning DD monsters, and slowly destroying your non-DD monsters on the field, can actively be a detriment to your place. Especially if you happen to splash other archetypes or boss monsters into your deck, like Borrowload Savage Dragon for example. But the more relevant effect of this card, and the reason why it's on this list, is because of its rather weak monster effect, where during either player's turn you can discard Galilei to the graveyard in order to target a DD or Dark Contract card you control and return it to the hand. Despite how weak this effect is, it does technically have a fair amount of utility, in a similar fashion to Time Escaper, where you can use it to protect every one of your contracts or DD cards, including your own boss monster, like DDD Divisor King Death Machinex, 
The main issue with this is that Galilei returns the monster to the hand. So while Time Escaper would give your monster back to the next standby phase, you have to jump through all the necessary hoops in order to special summon back your DDD extra monsters as they would be returned to the extra deck. So what about returning Dark Contracts? While it is correct that you could activate the effect of Galilei in order to avoid taking the damage from your Dark Contract cards, like with Dark Contract with the Gate or Dark Contract with the Swamp King, DDD has other better options to use in order to avoid the damage. DDD Rebel King Leonidas, for example, not only gains back the life points you lose from your gates, it also special summons itself from your hand if you take effect damage and also prevents you from taking effect damage while it's on the field. Even in Duel Links, where each player only has 4,000 life points, there are just better options available. And even an entire skill, Emergency Contract Laundering, dedicated to doing what Galilei does, but better. Although you could technically use DD save into Galilei as a decent enough pendulum skill in a DD, and the effect might come up once in the blue moon, which is why it's not at the number one spot on this list. And at number one is the worst hand trap in the game, Death's Rook Archfiend. A level three light fiend monster belonging to one of the first archetypes in Yu-Gi-Oh, the Archfiends. An archetype which has a few gimmicks, two of the most consistent of which is their standby phase life point cost and their ability to roll a die whenever they're targeted by a card effect to potentially negate that effect. And the effect of Deathwork Archfiend states, you must pay 500 life points to each of your standby phases while you control it, and if it's targeted by an opponent's card effect, you can roll a six-sided die, and if the result happens to be three, you can negate and destroy the card, which would be pretty strong effect if it happened to hit three each time it was targeted. But unlike the other Archfiends, Deathwork is also technically a hand trap. When a Terror King Archfiend you control is destroyed and sent to your graveyard, you can send Deathwork Archfiend from your hand to the graveyard in order to special summon back that Terror King. Now at first glance, this effect doesn't appear to be worthy of the title of the worst hand trap in the game since it can revive a fairly strong monster with a decent enough stat line. The main issue with this effect is just how difficult it is to set up and use for a payoff that just isn't worth it. You see, Terror King Archfiend can't be normal or flip some into your field unless you control an Archfiend monster. And most of the Archfiend monsters in the game don't really have easy ways to special summon themselves, making it hard for Terror King Archfiend to even be normal summoned instead of your Deathwork Archfiend in the first place. But even if you manage to summon out Terror King Archfiend, it's not really a monster that's worth the payoff of keeping it around with Deathrook. As while it potentially has a form of strong targeting protection, it isn't at all guaranteed, and despite being a normal summon monster with 2000 attack, its stats don't really justify how hard it is to normal summon, even if it has a decent enough effect of negating monsters destroyed by battle with. If Deathrook Archfiend could trigger on any Archfiend monster's destruction and not just Terror King, then it might actually be a somewhat okay hand trap, as you could use it to revive a Summon Skull or even a Red Dragon Archfiend, which are both technically Archfiend cards, or even a stronger monster like Archfiend Emperor, the First Lord of Horrors. But as it stands, Deathwork Archfiend has an incredibly mediocre and specific payoff for how unwieldy and difficult it can be to use, especially with the abundance of non-destruction removal which now exists in the game, a lot of which doesn't even target, bypassing all of the protections of Terror King Archfiend and Deathwork Archfiend completely, making them less than useless a lot of the times. If you ever manage to set up Terror King Archfiend and your opponent happens to destroy it and doesn't have the means to get over a 2000 attack point monster, then Deathwork Archfiend might come in handy in this extremely specific situation, but it is more than deserving the number one spot on this list. 10,000 Dragon is a level 10 monster with the effect where it can only be special summoned from your hand if the combined attack and defense of your monsters used for its summon is 10,000 or more. Then its only effect is that if it's properly summoned this way, its attack and defense become 10,000. Now, while having 10,000 attack is a good effect, since you can pretty easily win the game with a direct attack, Getting this attack from a main deck monster you have to summon from the hand is not as ideal. And even less ideal when you have to tribute monsters who already have that much attack on the board. So unless you somehow bring out a lot of useless high attack monsters who are just taking up space, this card isn't really a new advantage on the field. If this card had any kind of protection at all, it might be okay. But it's basically a vanilla beats deck whose only effect is to gain attack and has a tough summoning requirement on top of that so it's just a sitting target for any and all removal or effect negation. In this video, we'll be going over the worst Link monsters in the game. But with Link monsters being one of the newest type of monsters added to the game, most of them are more mediocre than actually bad, so just keep that in mind. And at number 10, we have Tindangle Acute Cerberus. This is a Link 3 monster, which requires exactly three Tindangle monsters as its materials, and its effects are basically it becomes a 3,000 attack beat stick under the conditions that you have three or more different Tindangle monsters in your graveyard, including a specific Tindangle monster, 
called Tindingle Base Gardna. Also, it gains 500 extra attack for each Tindingle monster it points to, and if this card declares an attack, you get to special summon a Tindingle token. So basically, this card requires three specific types of monsters from an archetype, and all they get for that kind of tough summoning requirements is just a 3000 attack beat stick. That's like using three tributes to summon Blue Eyes White Dragon. However, Tindingle monsters really like this card because they have a couple of cards in their archetype which specifically are designed to work with Tindingle Link monsters, and this is the only Tindingle Link monster. Tindingle Trinity allows you to add a card from your deck to your hand if it's used as a material for a Tindingle Link monster, as well as send any spell or trap card from your deck to the graveyard. Gurgon's End is a trap card that can only be attached to a Tindingle Link monster, and they have another trap card which allows you to cheat the Tindingle Link monster out of the extra deck. In the OCG, they even have a card called Tindingle Dulse, which grants a Tindingle Link monster that uses as its material three attacks during the battle phase. So, the Tindingle archetype obviously loves going into the Tindingle Link monster. So, they do play Tindingle Acute Cerberus. But not because the card itself is very good. It's more like they're forced to play it, and at least it's a beat stick. Which means it doesn't have anything going for it. The trap card made for it, Gurgon's End, does actually give the monster some protection, where it can't be destroyed or targeted by card effects, and allows you to destroy all the monsters that the Link monster points to in order to inflict damage to your opponent, which are all actually really good effects. That would have been 10 times better if they were included in the actual Link monster itself, and not attached to a trap card that you have to use in order to unlock its full potential. And at number 9, we have Nephthys, the Sacred Flame. This is a Link 3 monster who requires any 2 plus monsters for its materials, including at least one ritual monster. And then it gains effects based on the number of ritual monsters used for its Link Summon, where if you used three ritual monsters, it becomes a 4800 attack beat stick that cannot be destroyed by battle or card effects, nor targeted by card effects. So, like a worse Red Eyes Dark Dragoon, who can accomplish similar feats by just negating a few card effects. Basically, the potential of Nephthys the Sacred Flame is not half bad, it's just using three ritual monsters to get to its maximum potential is kind of a lot. Ritual monsters are inherently kind of bad because of how hard they are to get on the field because of just how their mechanics work. Nephthys the Sacred Flame only really saw play in Necroz decks because they can at least get out a fair few amount of ritual monsters in one turn. And Nephthys the Sacred Flame is a decent boss monster to go into against certain decks. It's just too hard to bring out and doesn't gain the best form protections or attack unless you use three ritual monsters for its summon. And generally, you don't want to use that many ritual monsters to go into a slightly worse Red Eyes Dark Dragoon. But it is at least an option that exists to decks that can spam out ritual monsters, which is why it's only at number 9 on this list, not at a higher spot. Technically, a niche option for ritual decks. And at number 8, we have Double Bite Dragon. This is a Link 2 monster that requires two Link monsters as materials and has the effects where it gains additional attack points equal to the Link ratings of the monsters used for its summon times 300. And it's unaffected by monster effects and cannot be destroyed by battle, except by other Link monsters. So if you know your opponent doesn't play any Link monsters or spell a trap card removal, then you have an option to get a monster who's pretty hard to get rid of. The problem with this card is that a lot of decks do still use Link monsters, and the ones that don't generally have spell or trap card removal. If this card is brought out the most efficient way possible with two Link 1 monsters, it's basically a 2100 attack beat stick who only has protection from monsters that are not Link monsters. Which sure, there's still a majority of monsters in the game. But at 2100 attack with no other effects, that isn't really something to be scared of. If you want this thing to be scary, you have to bring it out with really big Link monsters. The maximum attack you can get this thing to under its own effects is 4800. Although that would require you to link away a Link 6 and a Link 5 monster. It would be a huge waste to use those two kinds of monsters as materials to bring this card out. And at number 7, we have a Gave Dragon. This is a Link 4 Worm type monster who can be brought out using any 2 plus monsters except tokens, and then activates in sequence its 4 effects based on the number of types of cards you have in your graveyard when it's Link Summoned. Where, if you have Dragon type monsters in your graveyard, you get to inflict 100 points of damage to your opponent for each one. It then gains 200 attack for each dinosaur, all of your opponent's monsters lose 300 attack for each sea serpent, and then you gain 400 life points for each worm in your graveyard. Now, all four of these effects are pretty minor, like ridiculously so, and it uses a whole bunch of monsters which generally don't see play together. So, the only real use of this card is in its dragon effect to inflict damage to your opponent. It is an incredibly minor amount of damage, at only 100 damage per dragon in your grave, 
but any amount of effect damage is sometimes useful in extract monsters, just in case you go into overtime and you can win by just inflicting a little bit of damage to your opponent. That's the only reason this card saw any play, because it technically inflicted effect damage, even if it was an incredibly minor amount. And at number 6, we have Belcat Fighter. This is a Link 3 monster, which requires exactly 3 monsters for its materials, including a token. Now, usually Link monsters say you can't use a token, like the previous spot on this list, so this is a big improvement over a lot of other cards. It's like one of the few Link monsters who actually wants to use tokens for its materials. But there's a couple of problems with this card. For one, its Link arrows are kind of terrible, where it has one pointing up and two to the side. So it's not a Link monster you start your combos with, but one that happens mid-combo. And if it had downward pointing arrows at all, it might have actually seen competitive play. Also, its effect is pretty mediocre. It just allows you to special summon a token if this card destroys a monster by battle. The token itself isn't half bad though. It does have 2,000 attack and defense, which is pretty high for a token. Although the main use of Link monsters wanting to use tokens as materials is in order to convert those tokens into effect monsters for better Link summons. But this one requires an awkward amount of tokens at 3, which doesn't fit in with a whole lot of token generators, and doesn't really help you extend combos, and its effect is definitely not useful in the kinds of decks that would want to use tokens to extend combos either. And at number 5, we have Arcana Extra Joker. This is a Link 3 monster which requires 3 warrior monsters of different names as its materials. And then it has the effect that, if a card is activated which would target this card or a card this card points to, you can then discard a card from your hand of the same type, so if it's a monster you discard a monster, a spell for a spell, or a trap for a trap. In order to negate the activation of that card, but not destroy it. So its effect is like a worse version of Invoked Macabre, where it only allows you to protect from targeted effects, which is already kind of lame, but then it has a really restrictive condition on protecting from that targeted effect, and then it doesn't even destroy the card after it negates the effect. Whereas Makaba is a full negate and then banishes the card afterwards. That's why Invoked Makaba is easily the best Invoked Fusion monster and sees a whole bunch of competitive play. Now it also does have a floating effect, where if this Link Summon card is destroyed by battle and sent to the graveyard, you can special summon a level 4 warrior normal monster from your deck, and if you do special summon that normal monster, you can then add a level 4 warrior monster from your deck to your hand. So. In order to get the wonderful search effect of a level 4 warrior monster, you have to play a level 4 warrior normal monster, which just seems overly restrictive. Sure, if you already play a level 4 warrior normal monster in your deck, then its floating effect is pure advantage. But there aren't really decks that do that. And also, the floating effect only activates if it's destroyed by battle, so that doesn't really matter anyway because big boss monsters are rarely destroyed by battle. Now, this card is based on Arcana Knight Joker, a fusion monster that requires three specific normal warrior type monsters as its materials, and basically has the same form of protection with its effect. So this Link monster is supposed to be a modern version of that fusion monster, and while it's not worse than its fusion counterpart, it's definitely not good either. And at number 4 we have Backup Supervisor. This is a Link 2 monster which requires any two monsters as materials, and if this card is Link Summoned using Backup Secretary as one of its materials, then it gains the effect where, if the monster this card points to battles an opponent's monster, you can Special Summon a Cybers type monster from your hand. And also, if this card is destroyed, you get to Special Summon a Backup Secretary from your hand deck or graveyard, with both of these effects being a hard once per turn. So, the floating effect is fine, and even Backup Secretary isn't half bad. It's just a level 3 Cybers type monster which can Special Summon itself from your hand. It's just, for a Link monster that requires a specific named monster as a material, its effect is incredibly mediocre. It requires a monster to attack in order to special summon a specific type of monster from your hand, which is like one of the worst places you want to special summon a monster from during one of the worst phases to do that. Technically, special summoning from the hand is decent, just not during the battle phase. The best time to special summon monsters from the hand is during one of your main phases, or at a time before the main phase one. And that's basically it. If you just ignore the fact that it requires a specific named monster for its effect, it's a generic Link 2 monster that can use any two monsters as materials. So it can still be used in order to convert tokens into effect monsters and be more useful than Bellcat Fighter, since the arrows aren't half bad. But there's a lot better Link 2 monsters you can use instead, and if you do actually fulfill the conditions to use its effect, it's not even a good effect, which is why this card makes this list. And at number 3, we have Vorticular Drum God. This is a Link 3 Dragon, which actually has a good effect. When this card is special summoned, you get to draw one card. And being able to draw a card on an extra deck monster is excellent. 
as proven by cards like Formula Synchron or TG Hyper Librarian. Extra deck monsters that let you draw cards have historically been on and off the ban list in some way because of how useful that is. And to not repeat their past mistakes with the new easier to summon Link monsters, they decided to give Vorticular Drumgon some restrictions so that it could not be abused, in the form of three drawbacks. One of them is that this card requires exactly three Dark Dragon monsters as materials, so it needs specific types and attributes. It has a hard once per turn on the effect, so you can't use it multiple times per turn, and after the effect resolves, you can't use the monster zones this card points to for the rest of the turn. So if you want to go into this card in order to extend combos, it basically shuts that down. And I guess a soft downside number four is it also has ridiculously low attack for a Link 3 monster at only 1,000. And you know what? Dark is the best attribute in the game, and Dragon-type monsters have a ton of support. So you'd think, even with all of these downsides, the three specific types of cards it requires for its materials would probably warrant the card scene play anyway, right? Well, as it turns out, that was not the case. Even with the great upside of drawing one card, it's just too cumbersome to use even with excellent type and attribute in the Dark Dragon type. Turns out, you can overly balance a card, and a good example of that is Vorticular Drumgun. And at number two, we have Linker Bell. This is a Link 2 monster which requires any two monsters as materials and has two excellent diagonal downward pointing arrows. However, this card cannot be Link Summoned unless you have at least three more monsters in your extra deck than your opponent. So if you and your opponent start the duel with 15 cards in your extra deck and you go first, you can't bring this card out, unless you have a way to get rid of cards in your opponent's extra deck, with maybe something like Lithosagem the Disaster. And if you go second and your opponent did bring out some cards on their extra deck, chances are you'd probably match their numbers pretty quickly. So this would have to be one of the first Link monsters you brought out before you could no longer meet the conditions for it summoning. And the card doesn't do anything else. Basically, the whole selling point of Linker Bell is just having two good arrows and being completely generic for those two arrows, which is why the card only has a downside to it, which is why when Land for Rinkus came out, it immediately power crept the card by basically being what Linker Bell is trying to do, but without any negative downsides. And ever since then, they've just been a lot more Link 2 monsters have been released that are also completely generic, but also have good effects on top of them, and with those two downward diagonal pointing arrows, which power crept land for Incas, like Beat Cop from the Underworld and IP Mascarina. And at number one, we have Link Bumper. This is a Link 2 monster which requires two Cybers monsters as materials, and has the effect that at the end of the damage step, if a monster this card points to attacks an opponent's Link monster, you can then activate the effect where that monster gains one additional attack for each Link monster you currently control, except this card. And those additional attacks can only be used on opponent's Link monsters. Then your other monsters can't attack the turn you activate this effect. So basically it grants a monster you control an extra attack, but only on Link monsters, and only if you control a whole bunch of other Link monsters that aren't Link Bumper, because for some reason it doesn't count itself when granting those extra attacks. And if this card wasn't bad enough, it also restricts you from attacking with other monsters for the rest of the turn. This card is overly specific, and I have to assume this is probably an anime card they forgot to convert into the real card game, and give it non-incredibly specific effects, because this is not very good. Generally, attacking multiple times is really good if you can use it unconditionally, which is why they usually limit multi-attacks to being only usable on monsters, and that's usually more than enough to balance multi-attacks. Although this card goes even further in restricting what kinds of cards it can attack into, and restricting how you grant those extra attacks, while also having another downside on top of that. And battle-related effects aren't even that good anyway, plus its arrows are kinda terrible. And also its materials are kinda terrible as well. Requiring two Cybers monsters basically means you have to convert regular monsters into Cybers Link monsters if you want to go into this card outside of Cyber decks. Not that you'd want to, because any other effect is probably better than this, which is why I think Link Bumper kind of easily takes number two spot on this list, even above a card which only has negative effects, because its effect is hilariously restrictive and specific. Deep Dark Trap Hole is a normal trap card that banishes cards when they're summoned. However, it only banishes level 5 or higher effect monsters specifically. Now, this card was printed in a time when they were releasing the Trap Tricks cards in support, and was meant to be a slightly weaker bottomless trap hole, since that card was limited at the time. And you know what? it actually saw a bit of competitive play, because even a weaker Bottomless Trap Hole was still good. However, as Power Creep happened, and Bottomless Trap Hole was removed from the ban list, Deep Dark Trap Hole went into the unplayed category, and mostly people just forgot it exists. 
Bottomless Trap Hole is even a normal quality card in Master Duel, and it's not even used in their NR format, to give some indication of how much the game has changed since then. In this video, we're going over some of the worst cards which technically allow you to gain life points. And at number 10, we have Muscle Medic. This is a 2200 attack level 4 monster, which is important because that's way higher than normal, where it has the ability that, if a player would take battle damage from this card, they instead gain that much life points. So if this attacks over one of your opponent's monsters, then they're just going to be continuously gaining life points, which isn't good for you, as you kind of want to make your opponent's life points go down and not up. Now, there are some decks which specialize in increasing your opponent's life points. More specifically, Nurse Burn decks. And Nurse Burn decks have two cards, which make it so any life points your opponent gains instead inflicts an equal amount of damage to them. Which turns cards like Gift Card, a card which seems like it would be useless on surface level because it just gives your opponent 3,000 life points, actually a good burn card because 3,000 life points is a huge amount to burn in one go. However, Mad Reaction to Samachi and Muscle Medic literally just allows the card to function like normal, and isn't a real benefit. There are other cards with 2200 attack that are level 4 with negative effects, like Goblin Elite Attack Force, so there is a precedent set for this. Its effect is not unusual, as the whole point of these high attack low level monsters is to find some way to circumvent their negative side effects. With Goblin Elite Attack Force, what you can do is just play cards like Skill Draining or just negate its effects on the field, or Final Attack Orders so it does always change back to attack position. With Muzzle Medic, it also benefits under Skill Drain since it negates its negative effect, and you can also use Bad Reaction to Samachi in order to allow it to deal damage like normal. Alternatively, you could just give this card to your opponent and just attack into it with a zero attack monster in order to gain 2200 life points every time you did that. I'm not sure if there's a deck that could actually do this to advantage, but for the most part, Muscle Medic kind of came out way after high attack, low level monsters were meta relevant, as it came out in 2017. So, it never saw any competitive play, and is not really worth running in any kind of actual deck. Although its usefulness is pretty obvious, so it's still better than everything else on this list, kind of. And at number 9, we have Griffin's Feather Duster. This card simply has the effect where it can destroy all of your spell and trap cards in order to increase your life points by the amount of cards it destroyed times 500. So if you destroy your entire back row, including your field spell card, you gain 2500 life points. Which is a lot from one card, but not a lot for going minus 6 in card advantage. And if that were the end of Griffin's Feather Duster, it would definitely be the worst life point gain card in the game. However, floating effects exist and Griffin's Feather Duster activates his life point increase effect at the same time as its destruction, which means it doesn't cause cards like Gear Town to miss timing. Gear Town is a field spell card, which has the effect where you can special summon an ancient gear monster from your hand deck or graveyard once it's destroyed on the field. Although Gear Town's effect is a when effect, which means it misses timing super easily. If you use a card like Storm, which also has the effect to destroy all of your spell and trap cards in order to gain a beneficial effect, Storm does cause Gear Town to miss its timing because after it destroys your spell and traps, it then counts the number of cards you destroyed in order to destroy the same amount of your opponent's spell traps. And since those effects do not happen simultaneously, Gear Town misses the timing to activate its effect. Not with Griffin's Feather Duster though, because the life point gain happens as soon as the cards are destroyed without any delay. And purely because it doesn't cause cards to miss timing when its effect is used to destroy them, it does actually have some use, even if the life point gain is pretty minor. It's just there's also better cards which can also do the same thing, like Double Cyclone, or just archetype specific cards meant to destroy Gear Town, like Ancient Gear Catapult. And generally, archetypes which have spell and trap cards that float will have archetype specific cards in order to destroy them, so that you don't need cards like Griffin Feather Duster. So it hasn't really seen competitive play, but it does have a niche use, even if there are technically better cards that can kind of do the same thing. In at number 8, we have Genis, Lightsworn Mender. This card has the effect where during the end phase, if a card is sent from your deck to the graveyard by a Lightsworn effect, you can inflict 500 damage to your opponent and then gain 500 life points. Now, the Lightsworn archetype has this little gimmick where during the end phase, they send a number of cards from the top of your deck to the graveyard as part of their effects during the end phase. And this is beneficial because the Lightsworn decks like to have their cards in the graveyard in order to activate a lot of their effects. And it's also just really good in other decks like to put monsters in the graveyard. So Lightsworn engines have been played inside other decks basically since they came out. And Lightsworns are one of the few archetypes which constantly has seen competitive play over the years. 
However, Genis is one of the very few main deck Lightsworn monsters from the first wave of Lightsworns, which neither sends cards from the deck to the graveyard, or provides you advantage when sending cards from the deck to the graveyard. There is Wolf Lightsworn Beast, which also doesn't have an ability to mill cards, but has seen competitive play pretty much since it came out, because it directly benefits from being milled from the deck to the graveyard. Genis simply deals a little bit of damage and gains you a little bit of life points, if it's on the field while your other Lightsword monsters are sending cards to the graveyard. It also has an incredibly low attack point value at only 300, and it doesn't special summon itself like Wolf, so you have to spend resources to get this card on the field. Then you have to find a way to get in defense position so it's not immediately destroyed by your opponent just breathing on it. And since it doesn't directly contribute to a Lightsworn's win condition, i.e. getting a bunch of cards in the graveyard, and in fact requires you to go out of your way to bring it on the field, it's easily one of the worst Lightsworn monsters. But I'm sure most people forget it's even part of the archetype. Even though it's one of the original Lightsworns, the fact that it also gives you a minor life point increase is why it's on this list. And at number 7, we have 7. This has got to be the shortest name of any card in the game, as it's literally just the number 7. And the fact that this card is the number 7 spot on this list is purely coincidental, it just kind of fits at this spot. Because you see, this card is definitely worse than the first three cards we've talked about, but it's also kind of better than the next six. As what this card does, is if you have three copies of this card face up on your side of the field, because it's a continuous spell card, you can then draw three cards and then destroy all three copies of this card in the field. And the card has an additional effect where, if this card is sent directly from the field to the graveyard, you get to increase your life points by 700. So, the effect sounds pretty good on paper. If you get three of these cards in the field, you get to draw three cards. So it's a pure one for one in card advantage, which would also net you 2100 extra life points in the process. However, getting three specific continuous spell cards on the field is difficult, because spell cards are some of the hardest cards to search out in the game and expending resources in order to get this card in the field easier kind of defeats the whole purpose of the card. And there is no accumulative advantage you gain. You either get all three of them on the field and gain their benefits, or nothing. If you have two of the cards in the field and you're just waiting for the third one, then you're basically just at a minus two in card advantage with those two cards, not really advancing the game state. However, if they're destroyed, you get some life points, which is a nice consolation prize. But it's not really the good effect. Because unless your opponent destroys the card for you, then you have to spend resources trying to destroy the card if all you want are those life points, using something like Griffin's Feather Duster, for example. But if you're just very lucky, and you know you can open up all three copies of these in your starting hand every time, then it's a pretty good cycling card through your deck, while also giving you extra life points. Which is why it has a slot machine in its card art, because that's not very likely. And at number 6, we have Fushi no Tori. This is a spirit monster which has the effect that when it inflicts battle damage to your opponent's life points, you gain an equal amount of life points as the damage inflicted. Now, this effect on the surface is fine. However, it's attached to a low-statted spirit monster, which makes it kind of bad. You see, spirit monsters are this type of card where they all share the distinction that they can't be special summoned, and they return to your hand during the end phase of the turn that they're normal summoned or flip face up. And both of those restrictions are really bad. Like, the card needs to be amazing to be worth being played. And there have been a number of really strong spirit monsters in the game's history, like Yatagarasu or Tsukiyomi. Although Fushi no Tori has an effect that's alright, which is just straight up bad on a spirit monster, where their effects need to be above average to be worth being played. You could attach this effect to just a regular level 4 monster with 1200 attack and it wouldn't see any competitive play. It being attached to a spirit monster is much worse. And at number 5, we have Muyan Curry. This card simply has the effect where you can choose one player in order to increase that player's life points by 200 points. So, if you have bad reaction to Samachi on the field, then you can use this card to inflict 200 points of damage to your opponent, or just give yourself 200 life points. It's also one of the few cards in the game which specifically designates that you target a player, which means you can use cards like Mystical Rough Handle in order to reflect it to a different player. Although there are a lot of cards which technically target a single player, which can also be reflected with Mystical Rep Panel, it's just Muyan Curry is one of the few which makes it so easy to see if Mystical Rep Panel actually works on the card or not. Now, the only problem with Muyan Curry is the fact that its effect is incredibly underpowered. It's basically the least amount of life points you can gain from a singular card, whose effect is purely to gain more life points and do nothing else. So, it's a minus one in card advantage for 200 extra life points, which is generally not worth a trade-off, and why it makes it on this list. 
And at number four, we have Graceful Tear. This is a trap card which has the effect where you can add one card from your hand to your opponent's hand in order to gain 2,000 life points. So it's a minus three in card advantage for 2,000 life points. As you lose the card, Graceful Tear itself, when it goes to the graveyard, you lose one card from your hand, and your opponent gains one card in their hand. And since the card doesn't affect the game state other than increasing your life points, it's just a lot of negative card advantage for a life point boost. There is actually another card in the game called Side Effects, which is a potential minus four in card advantage. Although at least that card allows you to gain 6,000 life points for doing that effect. So Graceful Tear definitely seems like it's one of the worst life point gain cards in the game. And on surface level, it definitely is pretty bad. However, there are some cards in the game where it doesn't matter who activates them, as it affects both players equally. Think of cards like Cup of Ace. This card has the effect where if you flip a coin, then if the result is heads, you get to draw two cards. If the result is tails, then your opponent gets to draw two cards. The player who activates the card doesn't get to choose which result they want to pick, so technically it doesn't matter which player activates the effect, as you always have a 50% chance to draw two cards. So if you give your opponent a card like Cub of Ace, and then they just use the card, then regardless of the result, it's like you didn't lose any card advantage at all. It can also be used in order to thin out your opponent's deck by tricking them into using cards which mill a lot, with cards like Pot of Desires. This is a card which allows you to banish 10 cards from your deck in order to draw 2 cards. If you're playing a mill deck, a deck which is trying to make your opponent run out of cards in their deck, giving your opponent a copy of Pot of Desires in order to activate the effect of Graceful Tear is equivalent to milling one-fourth of their deck if they actually use it, which is a huge amount to mill for a two-card combo. What I'm trying to say is there are some uses to giving your opponent a card in their hand, and the amount of life points you gain is enough where it's not insignificant, but it's definitely not enough where the card is trying to offset its downside too heavily. The card is in this weird place, where it seems like the card was made bad on purpose, but it actually is a little bit more useful than what a normally useless card would look like. So, it's still on this list, there are ways to use it to advantage, but none of them are super competitive or even super practical, but it's not completely useless either. And at number 3, we have the Immortal of Thunder. This is a flip effect monster which has the effect that you gain 3000 life points with its flip face up. However, it has a negative effect, where if this card is sent from the field to the graveyard, you lose 5000 life points. And this negative effect is worded in a way where it's very hard to circumvent that effect. If you increase your life points by 3,000 with its full effect, and then give control of the card to your opponent with something like Creature Swap, you'll still take 5,000 points of damage after it's sent to the graveyard. And the 5,000 life reduction is done in a way where it's not technically dealing damage to you, so you can't reflect it to your opponent with something like Barrel Behind the Door. In fact, one of the only ways to actually avoid the downsides of this card while gaining its upside is to flip it face up and then use it as an Xyz material for an Xyz monster. Because Xyz materials are sent to the graveyard are not counted as being sent from the field to the graveyard, so it's not impossible to circumvent its downside, but it's so impractical to try to flip this card up and then use it for an Xyz summon that the card itself is just kinda bad. The net amount of life points you lose from this card is 2,000, although it's possible to lose 5,000 life points without ever gaining the 3,000 life points if the card is simply destroyed while it's still face down before it has a chance to be flipped face up which is how most flip effect monsters are destroyed in the modern metagame, and that's kind of the reason why flip cards don't really see competitive play outside of sub-terrors. And in number two, we have Hysteric Fairy. This monster has the effect where you contribute two monsters on your side of the field to increase your life points by 1,000. This card was released in the early days of the game, and having 1,800 attack baseline, it was actually played as just a high-statted level 4 fairy monster. And generally, high-statted level 4 monsters had negative effects attached to them, Whereas Hysteric Fairy's negative effect was just having a bad effect that didn't actually impact the card unless you choose to use it. So if you just completely ignore the effect of the card, it was basically a vanilla beater. Although, going based on the actual effect of the card, attributing two monsters to increase your life points by only 1000 is not very good either. There is the fact that this card does not have a once per turn on this effect, so if you have a way to get out a whole bunch of cards in order to activate this card effect, you're better off just using Cannon Soldier in order to actually win the game instead of just increasing your life points for no reason. And the reason offering two monsters as a tribute for only 1,000 life points isn't very good is because you have to spend resources to get monsters on the field in the first place. And monsters themselves are a valuable resource. So tributing a card for an effect is one of the harshest costs a card can have. So it better be worth the effect of actually doing it. Kind of like how spirit monsters have to have good effects in order to be worth playing because they're so detrimental. 
And there are some really good cards which have tribute costs, like Monster Gate or Lone Fire Blossom. Since the act of getting life points itself is incredibly minor, as far beneficial effects go, tributing two monsters for such a minor effect is just way disproportionate to the cost for its benefit, which is why it's so high on this list. And at number one, we have Princess Pikaru. This is a 2000 attack level 4 monster, which is pretty high for a level 4 monster, although that does come as a detriment where this card cannot be normal summoned or sent, and it can only be special summoned with the effect of Trial of the Princess. And the card on the field has the effect where during each of your standby phases you gain 800 life points for each monster you control. Trial of the Princess is an equipped spell card which can only be equipped to two specific monsters, where it has the effect to grant them 800 attack, and as a condition where, if the monster is equipped to destroys a level 5 or higher monster by battle, you can then tribute the equipped monster in order to special summon from your deck Princess Pikaru or Princess Kura, depending on which of the two cards you have this card equipped to. And that condition is actually pretty tough to pull off, since it requires your opponent to have a level 5 or higher monster in the first place. Then you have to destroy that level 5 or higher monster with a monster that probably only has 2000 attack. And bringing out Princess Pikaru is definitely not worth the effort of even trying as it just gives you life points in your standby phase based on the number of monsters you control, but not enough where it's worth going through all that effort. In fact, there are very few life point gain cards in the game that are worth going through all the effort to gain their effects, as the whole act of gaining life points isn't actually very beneficial. Although explaining why is a very long topic, which I do cover in a different video, suffice to say, gaining life points doesn't really advance the game state, and you only need one life point in order to win. So, if bringing out a card whose whole benefit is just gaining you life points, and it's incredibly convoluted to bring that card out, then it's probably not very good. Psy Beast is a level 2 psychic monster, which on normal summon banishes one psychic monster from your deck to make this card's level equal to that monster's. Now, while psychic monsters do have lots of ways to interact with banished psychics, what really kills this card in particular is its normal summon requirement. There are two really good cards to interact with psychics of this level one that summons from the deck, and one that can mass summon it alongside other psychic monsters from the graveyard. However, this card's effect would not proc in either of these cases, making it basically a vanilla monster in decks that might actually want to use it. However, funny enough, it is a potentially decent card in catch tier decks since it can become level 7 and banish one of their monsters to set up their plays. However, even then, it would have been better if the effect could just work on special summon as well. The ability to steal one of your opponent's monsters is one of the strongest effects in the game. So, pretty much all the cards that allow you to do that too easily are either banned or have been eroded. And in this list, we'll go over some of the worst cards in the game that have way too harsh restrictions on their effect to steal one of your opponent's monsters. And at number 10, we have Mind Pollutant. This is a spell card which simply has the effect where you can discard one monster to target one monster your opponent controls that has the exact same level as the monster you discarded, where you then get to take control of that target until the end phase. Now, this is probably the easiest to use card out of all the ones on this list, because if both you and your opponent are playing a lot of level 4 monsters, for example, it might be pretty easy to discard a level 4 monster to take one of your opponents, and having to go minus 1 for that exchange can be worth it. However, you generally don't care about stealing your opponent's level 4 monsters. You want to steal your opponent's boss monsters, so you can tribute them or use them for link plays. That's the best way to use mind control, as using something like mind control is great because it's technically not removal, so very few cards have protection against it, and you're simultaneously denying your opponent of a resource and gaining one for yourself. So even though mind pollutant itself requires you to go minus two to use the card, since you immediately deny your opponent of a resource and gain one for yourself, it kind of evens out, and it's technically a neutral card. The problem is just kind of the same as Brain Control, where no longer sees play after it's errata because it can only target monsters that can be normal summon or sent. And most decks in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! don't end their turns with monsters that are even targets for Brain Control. It might actually be a little easier to use Mind Pollutant if you have a mirror match and you want to steal your opponent's Eldritch the Golden Lord, for example. But it's way too situational. It requires a very specific level in order to steal a specific level of your opponent's. That's not really something you can reliably plan for, and it's not even that good of an option since you basically just go hand neutral in order to steal one monster, which is probably not a high priority target anyway, like an extra deck monster would be, where most of those don't even really have levels outside of synchros and fusion monsters. Although when this effect is baked into a whole bunch of other effects, like the monster Tragodia, then it's actually a really nice option, 
as Tragodia also has this card's full effect inside of it. But it's also able to do a whole bunch of other things, which is why that card saw a lot of competitive play in the past. And why Mind Pollutant hasn't really seen any, since its cost and lack of versatility makes it a little bit too difficult to use, even if it is one of the best cards that will appear on this list. And at number 9, we have Emperor of Prophecy. This is a level 5 monster, which has the effect that you can banish both one face-up spellcaster type monster you control, except this card, and one spellbook spell card from your graveyard, then you can take control of one of your opponent's monsters until the end phase. And this card cannot attack the turn you use this effect. Now, the deck this card belongs to is able to get spellbook spell cards in the graveyard pretty easily, but they don't exactly swarm spellcaster type monsters very well. And they also do have ways to get this card a little bit easier, since it does require a Tribute Summon normally, where it can be summoned directly from the deck with Temperance of Prophecy. But its effect is a little bit too restrictive in order to steal a monster. Part of the greatness of being able to steal a monster is the inherent plus to advantage that stealing a monster entails. And this card has so many restrictions that it kind of evens out, just like Mind Pollutant. But it's at least more versatile and lets you steal any face-up target. The only problem is the archetype it belongs to can't use it very well. The archetype would kind of have to go out of its way to summon Emperor Prophecy, and also deny themselves of resources by tributing one of their other spellcasters in order to have a mind control which doesn't give them very much advantage, and they don't have a good way to make use of the card they just stole. Or at least they didn't when it first came out, due to the fact that Emperor Prophecy is level 5, which is a pretty unpopular level and there was a good chance you wouldn't be able to steal anything you could use with Emperor Prophecy to go into extra deck plays. However, nowadays with Link Monsters being so versatile, that wouldn't really be much of a problem, but the card being level 5 and being kind of difficult to bring out still gives it just enough of a restriction where it's kind of bad and basically still on par with Mind Pollutant. It's kind of hard to determine which of these two is the best of this bad bunch. And at number 8, we have Ally of Justice Enemy Catcher. This card has the effect that when you normal summon it, you can take control of one face-down defense position monster your opponent controls until the end of the turn. With it being a level 6 monster, you have to tribute summon this card in order to gain its effect. And generally, not too many people play face-down monsters anymore, and they weren't exactly super popular when this card first came out either. The card definitely fits within its archetype though, as just being kind of mediocre, as it even has incredibly low stats for a level 6 monster, at only 1800. You also only get to steal the monster until the end of the turn, which is pretty normal for a lot of these cards let you steal your opponent's cards. But for all the requirements of this card, you'd think you'd be at least able to keep it permanently. And at number 7, we have Dummy Golem. This is a flip effect monster that when it's flipped face up, your opponent selects one monster they control, and then you swap control of that monster with this one, and this effect does last permanently. So if you're able to flip this card up during your turn, you could just give this card to your opponent and steal one of theirs just like Creature Swap, which is a good mind control card. But here's a little hidden ruling of this card. If it's destroyed by battle, then it can't activate its flip effect, since it won't have a target to give to your opponent. So if your opponent attacks into this monster with anything that has more than 800 attack, then they can just completely ignore the effect because it won't go off. And that's a very easy to do. Its defense is laughably bad. In the card's defense though, it is rock type, so it can benefit from the field spell card Catapult Zone, where if a monster you control will be destroyed by battle, you can send a rock type monster from your deck to the graveyard instead. The field spell card is only once per turn, but you only need to protect it once, and you'll be stealing one of your opponent's monsters and then giving them a low attack monster, which you can beat over pretty easily. I've had a couple of fun gimmick decks in the past where I took advantage of this little combo, so I can tell you it's not very good. Even if it was fun to occasionally steal one of your opponent's boss monsters, on its own it's really hard to activate its effect, and you really have to build your deck around this card, which is not good enough to really do that. And at number 6, we have Shadow Tamer. This is another flip effect card where when it's flipped face up, you can take control of one fiend type monster your opponent controls until the end phase. Now, unlike Dummy Golem, this card doesn't need to survive the battle in order to activate its effect. So if your opponent has a fiend type monster, you can take control of it until the end of the turn, even if it's destroyed by battle. But the reason this card makes the list is because that is an incredibly specific target for this card to steal. 
It can only take one type of monster out of the many 20 plus different types in the game, which is way too specific to be used in any kind of capacity outside of knowing exactly what your opponent is using beforehand. And even then, it's just a flip effect that steals the monster for one turn. That's not very good. There are good cards which steal very specific types of monsters, like Puppet Plant and Electric Virus, for example. But those cards saw play because they allowed you to pick one of two different types of monsters and could be activated from the hand, which is one of the easiest places to activate monster effects. Having to set a monster on the field and then flip it face up is too much of a hurdle to steal one specific type of monster. Whereas Electric Virus can just discard itself from the hand in order to steal two specific types of monsters, which is a lot easier to accomplish. There is one other incredibly specific flip effect mind control card called Dragon Manipulator, and I kind of lumped them together on this spot on the list, as Dragon type is a lot more useful than the Fiend type. So that's why Shadow Tamer makes it on this list, but they're both kind of bad. Fiend and Dragon types are both pretty plentiful, it's just Fiends are less plentiful than Dragons. And at number 5, we have Gladiator Taming. This is a quick play spell card, which can only be activated if you control a Gladiator Beast monster. In which case, you get to pick one of its two effects. You can either change the battle position of a face-up monster your opponent controls, or take control of one of your opponent's Gladiator Beast monsters until the end of the turn. So, the ability to change the battle position of a monster is kind of useful in Gladiator Beast decks since they're all about surviving the battle phase and being able to attack to activate their effects. If you change one of your opponent's monsters to defense position, then it makes it easier for a lot of them to attack into them. The second effect to steal one of your opponent's monsters, though, is so incredibly specific that it's almost useless. Unless you're playing a mirror match against another Gladiator Beast player, it's not really beneficial to use. You also can't just play this card against the Gladiator Beast deck since it requires you to have a Gladiator Beast to even activate it. There is a Gladiator Beast card called Trojan Gladiator Beast, which is a trap card that allows you to special summon a Gladiator Beast monster from your hand to your opponent's side of the field, where it will then also allow you to draw one card. Giving your opponent a monster from your hand with a trap card is just straight up minus two in card advantage, but drawing a card brings it down to only a minus one in card advantage, which is pretty standard for a lot of spell and traps. But generally, you only want to go minus one if you have a really good card to use, which Trojan Gladiator Beast is definitely not. So if you use Trojan Gladiator Beast to give your opponent a Gladiator Beast monster, you could then use Gladiator Taming to take it back in order to attack with it and activate its tag out effect in order to possibly gain advantage. It's an absolutely terrible combo, but it is a combo that is available to Gladiator Beast decks. And funny enough, Gladiator Taming came out four years after the first wave of Gladiator Beast support. And Gladiator Beast did see a lot of competitive success when they first came out. So it might have actually seen play if it came out during Gladiator Beast's heyday. But it came out when no one was playing them anymore, so it never saw any play. And at number four, we have Missing Force. This card has the effect where, if you control no other monsters, give up your battle phase, and the ability to special summon monsters for the turn, you can then tribute this card in order to take control of one of your opponent's monsters until the end phase. So this card is incredibly restrictive for its activation costs, but at least allows you to target basically anything with its mind control. Although the limits on it kind of make it unplayable. Generally, one of the best things to do with one of the monsters you steal is to use it as materials for one of your own summons, or to just get rid of it so you can attack directly that turn and not have to deal with its presence on your opponent's side of the field. You kind of have to jump through hoops if you want to use Missing Force in any kind of meaningful way. You definitely can take advantage of its effect, but the fact that it locks you out of special summoning for the entire turn means you can't just use Monster Reborn to bring it out during your turn in order to steal an opponent's monster, and then tribute it for a tribute summon. But you can use double summon in order to normal summon missing force, and then tribute the monster you steal from your opponent at the cost of not really being able to do anything else for that turn. Or if you have some kind of continuous effect on the field that lets you tribute cards, specifically a spell or trap, since you can't have other monsters in the field and activate the effect of missing force, it could be a way to tribute it for something like Ectoplasma. Although it, this isn't very good, and needless to say, Missing Force hasn't really seen competitive play. And at number 3, we have Synchro Control. This is a quick play spell card which allows you to steal one of your opponent's Synchro monsters until the end of your turn. 
but only under a whole bunch of restrictions. You can't have any Syngro monsters on your side of the field or in your graveyard. Plus, you have to pay 1,000 life points. So it's basically anti-Synchro support, but one which doesn't really let you use Synchro monsters either, for almost no reason. Back during the Synchro era, when the only extra deck summoning method was basically Synchros and Fusions, this card definitely had the opportunity to be a niche side deck addition. Although it wasn't really used for that, because even when the extra deck method of choice was Synchro monsters, this card was a little bit too restrictive to really see any kind of play. And at number 2, we have Splash Capture. This is a trap card that allows you to steal one of your opponent's Xyz monsters permanently. But in order to activate the card, you need to banish two Fish-type monsters from your graveyard first. The Fish-type is incredibly unpopular, so there's a very good chance you just won't have the targets in your graveyard to banish to use the effect. And if you specifically want to play this in a Fish deck, it's not really something you can readily use whenever you have it, since you do need to make sure to get the targets in the graveyard and know your opponent is playing Xyz monsters. The ability to steal it permanently is pretty nice, but it's even more restrictive, funny enough, than Synchro Control, and surprisingly, didn't see any competitive success when it came out, even during the early days of the XC format when everyone was only using Xyz monsters anyway. And at number one, we have Thoneon Polymer. This is kind of like the previous two cards, where it only allows you to steal a specific type of extra deck monster, except this one only works on fusion monsters, and requires you to tribute a monster in order to take control of it. So the card is an inherent minus two, which is kind of evened out with the stealing of an opponent's monster, but you do get to keep it permanently, just like with Splash Capture. Except fusion monsters are kind of the least play type of extra deck monster, so over the years it never saw any competitive success, despite the fact that it technically kind of balances out card economy wise. Currently, one of the best cards in the game is a fusion monster, although that monster cannot be targeted by card effects, so Polymer doesn't even work on it anyway. Even if it did, it still wouldn't see play because there's so many better cards to use in order to deal with that monster that are also more versatile and work against almost everything else, instead of requiring you to tribute a monster in order to steal one specific type of extra deck card. Though Neon Polymer and the previous two spots are all kind of equally terrible, it's just fusion monsters are historically the least used extra deck monster, and it kind of has the steeper of all the cost of actually using it, since it requires a tribute on the field and can only be activated on the monster summon, which I think makes it a little bit worse, and hence takes the number one spot on this list. Sorry of the Silverwing Axe has the effect to equip itself to a monster on the field from your hand or field, and boosts its attack and defense by 100 points. This effect is quick effect, so you can do it on your opponent's turn. However, its attack boost is so minor that it's quite possibly one of the most minor beneficial effects in the game. So its real power is supposed to be in its ability to equip from the hand during your opponent's turn, which it can be used to proc the surge effects of the red and green min concos. However, there are also trap cards that can equip during your opponent's turn, which give much better effects, so even that point is kind of weak. In this list, we'll be going over the worst cards that require two tributes, which basically means we'll be going over level 7 or higher monsters that can't special summon themselves, and are not inherently part of an archetype that revolves around special summoning them. And at number 10, we have Maju Garzette. This is a level 7 monster, which requires two tributes, and its effect is that its attack becomes the combined original attack of the two monsters that you tribute for its tribute summon. So if you have two monsters in the field that have abilities that allow them to come out into the field easier but with a lower attack power value, like Beast King Barbaros, or monsters with high attack that restrict other attacks, like Malefic Cyber and Dragon, then you could tribute both of those cards in order to get a super strong Maju Garzette in the field. Tributing a Beast King Barbaros and a Malefic Cyber and Dragon would result in 7000 attack for example which definitely sounds more impressive than it actually is, because this is all requiring a tribute summon to accomplish, playing those kinds of cards and getting them on the field in the first place, and then of course there's the whole problem with the card that it has absolutely no inherent protection. So if your opponent just has any form of disruption, then you're basically just painting a huge target on this card's back, because you have to put in a lot of resources in order to get it out as a big beat stick. There are other versions of this card which are a lot better, like Great Maju Garzette, which is a level 6 monster that only requires a single tribute, and when you bring it out it has double the attack of the monster attributed. So, in the same examples I gave for Maju Garzette, 
If you instead just tributed a single malefic Cyber and Dragon for Great Maju Garzette, you'd have an 8,000 attack beat stick on the field, while using one less card. And Great Maju Garzette isn't that good either. There's also the legendary Maju Garzette, which is much better as it can special summon itself from the hand by distributing all the monsters you control. Then it gains attack equal to all the original attacks of the monsters distributed, and it also has piercing battle damage, so it's just much better of a bigger beat stick than the normal Maju Garzette. And the legendary Maju Garzette actually saw some competitive play in a deck that was trying to turbo out number 95 Galaxy Eyes Dark Matter Dragon. Although Maju Garzette is just a way too slow, very vulnerable level 7 monster, where every single other card that's similar to him is much better, especially Grand Maju Da Aiza, which has seen the most amount of play out of all of the Majus. And at number 9, we have Sword Hunter. This is a level 7 monster, which has the effect that if it destroys a monster by battle and sends it to the graveyard, you can equip every monster it destroys to this card as an equipped spell card, where it gains the effect to give this monster 200 attack. So if it destroys a single monster by battle, its attack will go up to 2650, which is still kind of low for a 2 tribute monster, seeing as level 6 monsters can get up to 2500 attack. And while the effect is a unique one, where it equips monsters it destroys to increase its power, it's very obviously an early Yu-Gi-Oh card, which is very underpowered, for the amount of effort required to bring it out. As again, one of the requirements for the cards to be on this list is that they don't inherently special summon themselves, and aren't part of an archetype which is obviously meant to special summon them, like Arm Dragon level 7 for example. However, according to Yugipedia, there are some spicy combos you can pull off with this card's unique effect, which is normally not possible with other cards that don't convert monsters they destroy into equipped spell cards. You could use all of this free advantage in order to summon out Ant Eater Eating Ant, which normally has an atrocious summoning condition where you have to send two spell or trap cards you control to the graveyard in order to special summon it from your hand, but has a good effect where once per turn it can destroy a spell or trap card, just at the cost of being able to attack that turn. With Sword Hunter, you can offset its terrible summoning condition to make it not as much of a minus to win guard advantage. And of course, you can also use a spell card release Restraint Wave in order to send one of the equipped cards to the graveyard to destroy all of your opponent's face down spell and traps. None of these combos really make Sword Hunter worth playing, but I do like how Yugipedia gives tips on how these cards could be useful, so I'll mention them at a couple of other spots in this video when relevant. And at number 8, we have Arcana Force 18, the Moon. This is a level 7 monster which has the effect that when it's summoned you get to toss a coin in order to determine which effect it has on the field. Where if you get a heads, its effect becomes basically Jam Breeding Machine, where you get to special summon a token during each of your standby phases. If you get a tails, however, its effect becomes during each of your end phases, you have to give control of one monster you control to your opponent. So the head's effect of getting a token during each of your standby phases is pretty neat. That's just a pure plus one in card advantage every turn. And there's lots of decks that can make use of tokens. However, giving control of one of your monsters to your opponent is incredibly bad. And literally a minus two in card advantage. As you lose one card and your opponent is gaining one card in the process. So that's a pretty terrible downside, where if you compare it to its upside, it's not really worth the risk. And in Arcana Force decks, they do have ways in order to force a Heads effect, that way you don't have to get the Tails effect ever. However, the Arcana Force archetype is absolutely terrible, and they're not very good at facilitating two tribute summons. And if they are going to facilitate a two tribute monster, they would probably want to use it on Arcana Force 21, the world, for a chance at being able to skip your opponent's turn. And if you were to play it outside of an Arcana Force deck, well, its effects are just not good enough to risk the Tails effect. And it's too hard to bring out, even if you could force a Heads effect pretty easily, like using the skill in Duel Links, which allows you to get a Heads effect for your first three coin tosses. Although, there are some useful applications of giving your opponent a card, like if you give them a card which is only detrimental to the person who controls it, like Ra's Disciple, which doesn't allow you to special summon while it's on the field. And since the Heads effect is technically kind of okay, it's not on a higher spot on this list. And at number 7, we have Great Poseidon Beetle. This is a level 7 monster with 2500 attack, and has the effect that if it attacks a face-up attack position monster, and that monster is not destroyed by that battle, this card can attack the same monster again in a row, and this effect can be used twice per turn. So, if your opponent is playing Spear Reaper Beatdown, and they have a Battle of and Spear Reaper on their side of the field, you could bring out Poseidon Beetle in order to attack into it three times and deal 6600 points of damage with its effect. Which I assume was the intended purpose of this card. Attacking into battle immune monsters because the card itself doesn't help its case at all. 
It doesn't actually stop the monsters attacking from being destroyed by battle, like Luna Light Cat Dancer can, who has a similar effect. Although being a main deck, high level monster, it's infinitely less easier to use than an extra deck monster like Luna Light Cat Dancer. And if you're trying to counter a deck full of battle immune monsters, I still probably wouldn't recommend playing Great Poseidon Beetle, unless you just want a hilarious way to counter them. Mainly because the resources required to bring out two tribute monsters are just generally not worth it. Unless that two tribute monster does something amazing, like Ether the Heavenly Monarch. And even that card has a whole archetype dedicated to allowing you to bring it out easier. And at number 6, we have Storm Shooter. This is a level 7 monster with only 2300 attack, so on the low end for a high level monster. And it has the effect where, once per turn you can activate one of its two effects. Its first effect you can choose allows you to move it to an adjacent unoccupied monster card zone. The other effect you can choose allows you to bounce a spell trap or monster card on your opponent's side of the field in the same column as this card. So being able to bounce a monster is nice. Only being able to bounce a monster in the same column as this card though is a little bit too niche for it to be super useful. Especially since the ability that allows it to move into another monster card zone is shared amongst the once per turn between its bounce effect. So you can't both move this card to a zone another monster is in and then bounce it in the same turn. And since the card requires resources to bring out and has low attack, it's probably not going to stay around very long either. This card also came out before people really kept track of their columns and zones. So it definitely didn't see any play when it first came out. And at number 5 we have Laval Judgment Lord. This is a level 7 monster with 2700 attack, where it has the effect that once per turn you can banish a Laval monster in your graveyard to then inflict 1000 points of burn damage to your opponent. And also, this card cannot declare an attack the same turn it activates its effect. Now, the Laval archetype excels at getting Laval monsters in the graveyard, and then using them in the graveyard to activate effects, like Dust Flame Blast, which allows you to banish all the Laval monsters from your graveyard to destroy all of your opponent's cards. Or Searing Firewall, to special summon a number of tokens for the Lavals you banish. Or even better, Rekindling, to special summon as many Laval monsters from your graveyard as possible, just as long as they have exactly 200 defense, which most of them do. For being in an archetype with a whole bunch of fire theme, they don't actually do burn damage very often. And if your archetype doesn't focus on burn damage, then the full effect of a card being burn damage is generally not worth it. Unless it deals that burn damage as an extra effect, like Volcanic Scattershot, which can destroy all of your opponent's monsters and then deal 1500 points of burn damage on top of that. Although Laval Judgment Lord is a hard to bring out boss monster, whose only effect is to inflict 1000 burn damage, while having a cost and a drawback to that mediocre effect. It also does not have 200 defense, so you can't bring it out easily in their archetype, so you have to expend resources to get this card on the field, which is definitely not worth it. And at number 4, we have Ally of Justice Thunder Armor. This is a level 8 monster with 2700 attack, which has a restriction where it cannot be special summoned. And its effect is that if an Ally of Justice monster battles, you can inflict piercing battle damage if it attacks a defense position monster. Now, the Ally of Justice archetype is kind of a joke for how terrible the majority of their cards are. So, being able to grant those monsters piercing battle damage is not a big deal at all. And they thought this effect was so good that they had to have restrictions with how it could even be brought out, as it cannot be special summoned at all, which is an absolutely terrible restriction to have on a monster. That's usually the kind of effect you put on a card which has an absolute banger of an effect, like Vanity's Ruler which also requires two tributes, cannot be special summoned, but has a really good effect where your opponent cannot special summon any monsters at all. Getting out Vanity's Ruler can win you the game. Getting out Ally of Justice Thunder Armor can allow your terrible Ally of Justice cards to maybe deal piercing battle damage. It does count itself in the piercing battle damage, so a 2700 track beat stick with piercing damage is nice, but not if that's the full effect of the card. Piercing battle damage is a thing that's nice to have on top of another good effect, like Blackwing Boar of the Spear. And there's other cards with similar effects that are much easier to use, like Enraged Battle Ox, which grants piercing battle damage to three types of monsters, instead of just a very specific archetype. And Enraged Battle Ox doesn't restrict you from special summoning the card, and is also not very good. Because being able to grant all your other cards piercing battle damage isn't a big deal, as shown by how Enraged Battle Ox grants three types, and doesn't see competitive play in any of those types of decks. Well, not in the modern era anyway. It did see competitive play back in the day when it first came out, absolutely. But not Ally of Justice Thunder Armor. The ease of use of the card definitely factors into the playability of it. And at number 3, we have Dread Scythe Harvester. 
This is another low attack, high level monster, where it simply has the effect where you can tribute one insect type monster to have this card gain 500 attack until the end of the turn. However, the thing to note about this effect is that it's not once per turn. So if you have a way to infinitely get cards on the field for its attribute, what you could do is not use it on this card and instead play Cannon Soldier to go for an FTK, as it would be both better and easier to accomplish since Cannon Soldier allows you to infinitely tribute cards for 500 points of burn damage without requiring them to be a specific type of monster. Although technically Dread Scythe Harvester could get to an infinite amount of attack if you have a way to infinitely tribute an insect type monster over and over. And there are some ways to do that with some banned cards in the game, but more realistically in a normal duel, this effect is incredibly weak. Having to tribute your cards in order to gain extra attack is generally not a good cost, because you have to expend resources in order to get a card on the field in the first place. So if you're then using it as a resource on the field, you'd better be granting yourself an amazing effect for all that effort, like the effect of Ballista Squad or Monster Gate. Only gaining 500 attack until the end of the turn is not what I would call an amazing effect worth the effort. In fact, gaining attack points is one of the weakest effects you can accomplish, and it's not even worth gaining the attack unless it's at least over 1,000. And in some cases, it needs to be even higher than that for it to be even considered. We have cards like Guy, the Magical Knight of Dragons, which can gain 2600 attack every time it destroys something by battle, is easier to bring out, and even has spell speed to destruction, which doesn't really see competitive play because that's just not good enough in the TCG. And Guy, the Magical Knight of Dragons, doesn't require you to expend resources in order to grant its attack. So, when compared to Dread Scythe Harvester, there's definitely a big contrast between both of their effects. And you can kind of see why Dread Scythe Harvester has never seen any competitive play. And in fact, you'd be hard pressed to see success of this card in casual environments as well. And at number two, we have Diabolos, King of the Abyss. This is a card which cannot be special summoned, and when you tribute some of this card, its tributes must be dark attribute. And what do you get for these incredibly restrictive summoning conditions? Well, the card has a passive effect where it cannot be tributed by card effects. And once per turn, during your opponent's draw phase, you get to look at the top card of your opponent's deck when they draw a card, and then either place that card back on top of their deck, or on the bottom of their deck. And what kind of benefits can you get from looking at a card your opponent's about to draw? Well, you get information on that one card, which might allow you to use something like Mind Crush to get rid of that card in their hand. Or if you don't have Mind Crush and the card you looked at would be a really good card in their hand, you can choose to put it on the bottom of their deck so they draw something else that's maybe not as good. Basically, what I'm trying to say is the effect isn't very good. It's technically a positive effect, but it doesn't really result in a change in game state. And if all you want to do is gain information on your opponent's hand, there are much better cards you can use instead of a hard to bring out level 7 main deck monster, like a Pointer of the Red Lotus for example. However, since the card cannot be attributed, according to Yugipedia tips, you could play it in an Ectoplasma stall deck, where when it gets to your end phase and you would have to tribute a monster, you won't have to tribute Diabolos because he's immune to the effect of that card. They did create a retrained version of the card called Darkest Diabolos Lord of the Lair, which is actually a much better boss monster. It also has an effect where it can't be tributed, but only by your opponent's card effects. And it also cannot be targeted by your opponent's card effects either. Then it has the effect where, if a dark monster you control is tributed, you can special summon this card from your hand or graveyard. In addition, it has the effect where you can tribute a dark monster in order to force your opponent to place one card in their hand on the top or bottom of their deck, which is much better than what Diabolos King of the Abyss could do. Darkest Diabolos Lord of the Lair shares a hard once per turn between both its special summon and hand rip effect, so you can't use both of them on the same turn. But the card brings itself out super easily, and you can tribute your opponent's monsters to activate its other effect, as long as you have its field spell card out Layer of Darkness. And in fact, Darkest Diabolos is so good that it's kind of funny that it's based on a really bad monster from the early days of the game, with effects that are only slightly similar to the original card, just given an actual good effect without crazy restrictions. And at number one, we have Insect Queen. This is a level seven monster with 2200 attack, the lowest base attack of all the monsters in this list, if you ignore the question mark attack from the number 10 spot. And it has the effect where it gains 200 attack for each insect type monster on the field. Once per turn, during the end phase, if it destroys a monster by battle, you get to special summon a level 1 token with 100 attack and defense and attack position. And also, this card cannot declare an attack unless you tribute one monster, so it has the same attack restriction as Panther Warrior. Although, the reason Panther Warrior has its restriction is because it's a high attack level 4 monster, which means it's easy to bring out. 
and the restrictions on having this high attack level monster that it must tribute in order to attack. Insect Queen is a high level monster with low attack, so it doesn't make sense to have the same restriction. Like, at all. And sure, it does special summon a token if it destroys something by battle, but not until the end of the turn. So it could theoretically fuel its own effect, as long as you're able to pay the cost for it with some other card the first time you attack with it. If you're able to find a way to stop your opponent from destroying any of your other cards, as Insect Queen doesn't offer any other kind of protection, and it's just a liability to keep on the field. Since it can't do anything without tributing your other cards, and it summons a low attack token in attack position. And like I explained with Dread Scythe Harvester, generally tributing a card better be attached to a really good effect, otherwise it's not worth it. Unless you combo it with Layer of Darkness, where you can tribute one of your opponent's cards when it declares an attack. Although generally, there's much better uses of Layer of Darkness than with Insect Queen. And just like with Diabolos, they released a retrained version of Insect Queen to try to make it better, while only loosely basing the new card effects on the old one. Metamorphosed Insect Queen is a 2800 attack monster, which has a restriction where it cannot be normal summoned or set, and must be special summoned by a card effect. Although since it doesn't restrict it from being special summoned with different kinds of card effects, and you wouldn't want to tribute some of the card anyway, that's generally not a big deal. And while it's on the field, if you control another insect type monster, then all of your insect type monsters on the field cannot be targeted or destroyed by your opponent's card effects. So it grants itself and all your other insects excellent protection. Then it has the effect where at the end of the damage step if this card attacked, you can tribute one monster to have this card attack another monster again in a row. And during the end phase, once per turn, you get to special summon a token. Although you can choose to put it in defense position instead of only attack position, like the original Insect Queen does for some reason, which just makes that really low attack token incredibly vulnerable during your opponent's turn. And Metamorphosed Insight Queen doesn't need to destroy monsters by battle to special summon a token during the end phase. You just get one by default. So it's much better than the original card in pretty much every way, where it can tribute cards to attack an additional time instead of just that one time. It gets the token for free at the end of each player's turns, it has a higher baseline attack, and it offers all of your monsters really good protection. The original Insight Queen has low attack, can't do anything without expending resources, and if it does destroy something by battle, you have to summon a low attack token in attack position at the end of the turn, which makes you vulnerable to big swings by your opponent. The original Insight Queen is so bad that I think it deserves number one spot on this list, even if technically it is easier to bring out than Diabolos or Ally of Justice Thunder Armor, since it can be special summoned, although it's not as useful in the field as those other two cards. Because you have to expend so much resources to just allow this card to do its effects, where you don't really get anything in return to be worth that effort. Cassie Molar is a level 3 fiend which has the effect on normal summon to double the attack of one monster your opponent controls, but then it's destroyed at the end phase of the next turn, and also at the start of the battle phase you can tribute this card to make it so they can't attack directly this turn. Now, the abilities it have seem like it's trying to set up a really beefy magic cylinder, but it also fulfills the requirements by itself to use Smile Potion, although neither of these cards are particularly good and the card's effects require it to be normal summoned, and its effect is way too niche to be worth that normal summon, especially since the card came out in 2023. Being able to attack multiple times is a pretty rare and valuable effect to have in Yu-Gi-Oh! Many game-ending threats can swing the game completely due to being able to do so, but it's also seen in lots of terrible monsters. In this video, we'll be going over the worst monsters of an effect lets you attack more than once. And starting us off at number 10, we have Ruin, Queen of Oblivion. This is a level 8 light fairy ritual monster with 2300 attack and 2000 defense. And it can be ritual summoned with End of the World, which is just a generic ritual spell card. When Ruin destroys an opponent's monster by battle, it can activate its effect to be able to make a second attack in a row. Note that this effect can only be activated the first time it beats something over by battle each turn, so you can't just activate Ruin multiple times to beat over your opponent's whole field. Historically, ritual monsters haven't seen play unless they offer absolutely busted effects to make up for how hard they are to summon, or have some other effect that can be activated without actually ritual summoning, and Ruin doesn't really tick either of these boxes. Being able to attack twice isn't nearly enough of a payoff for a level 8 ritual monster, especially one with such low stats at just 2300 attack, which loses to all the monarchs, the most common beat sticks that were around at the time when this card was released. To make things look even worse for Ruin, its counterpart in Demise, King of Armageddon, the other monster mentioned in its ritual spell, actually offered a pretty powerful effect, being able to destroy all other cards in the field for a 2000 life point cost. Demise was enough of a threat to even get advanced ritual art, the main way to bring out rituals of the time on the limited list for years. 
Even if Ruin wishes it was half as played as Demise, at least it has a single top in its name as a one of as a Tekken Herald of Perfection Turbo decks from the Synchro era, so despite it all, it's probably the only card on this list that was ever seen in a functioning deck. And at number 9, we have Tyrant Burst Dragon. This is a light dragon fusion level 8 monster with 2900 attack. It can attack all monsters your opponent controls once each, and it can also equip itself to a monster you control, giving it a 400 boost to their attack and defense, and the ability to attack thrice during each battle phase. Tyrant Burst can only be spelled with some by the effect of Fang of Critias, a normal spell which can send a trap card from your hand or field to the graveyard to special summon a specific fusion monster from your extra deck. For time of burst, it requires Tyrant Wing as a material, which can be used to give a monster the same 400 stat boost and only two attacks, but it falls off during the end phase of the monster attack. The Fang of Critias, alongside the Claw of Hermos and the Eye of Timaeus, were a series of pretty clunky anime card adaptations which never really saw play with Critias probably being the worst of the bunch. At least the Eye of Timaeus can be used to bring out Red-Eye's Dark Dragoon, which is a pretty formidable boss monster with protection and a gate. The Claw of Hermos makes up for its mediocre monsters by having extremely generic materials, such as any warrior or spellcaster. Outside of Tyrant Wing, this card can also work with Mirror Force, Ring of Destruction, and Crush Card Virus. All of which are much better cards to run in your deck, and even then they're pretty mediocre by today's standards. The other dragons resulting from this card are also much better due to having effects that can actually impact the game outside of the battle phase. While Tyrant Burst can be used to OTK, if you had enough time to assemble the two card combo needed for it to be brought out, as well as the board state required for them to survive and do lethal damage to your opponent, odds are you were winning that duel anyways. And coming at number 8, we have Binary Blader. This is an Earth Cybers Link 2 with 1800 attack, arrows pointing left and right, and can be made with two normal monsters. Two monsters are considered co-linked if they have link arrows that point to each other, and this card gains effects depending on how many monsters are co-linked to it. So if there is at least one, this card becomes able to attack monsters twice during the same battle phase, but your opponent's monsters cannot be destroyed by those battles. If it has two, it can banish an opponent's battling monster after damage calculation. So, you're supposed to get this card surrounded by link arrows, so that you can hit into two monsters and banish them. This isn't that bad of an effect, all things considered, it just requires far too much setup to remove a couple of bodies during the battle phase. Usually, an effect that requires you to co-link the monster offers an incredible payoff, like the Codebreakers being able to get you even more link materials, or the Nightmares giving you an extra draw on top of their usual effects. This applies doubly so to cards that require multiple co-links, like the Firewall Dragon being able to non-target mounts monsters, or Trigate Wizard giving you an audio negate and a banish. Fully setting up this card requires a similar amount of setup to resolving any of these effects, but all it does is give you a highly telegraphed battle phase removal. This card's summoning requirements make it even worse, since you're limited to using tokens or a gimmicky way of spamming Nora monsters onto the field. Why would you go through all that trouble when there are about a dozen better payoffs for so much materials that you could easily set up better than them? And coming in at number 7, we have Grey Wing. This is a level 3 Wind Dragon that lets you discard a card during the main phase to be able to attack twice in a row for a turn. And as far as a normal summonable double attacker from early Yu-Gi-Oh goes, Grey Wing is probably the worst out of all of them. Needing to discard during your main phase 1 makes it incredibly punishing if you ever get hit by any removal during the battle phase. But at least its tiny 1300 attack stat would make it unlikely your opponent would waste any cards because of it in the first place. Mataza the Zapper is a card from a similar time and offers a pretty much exact same stat and effect, with the upside of not being able to be snatch steal. Even that, however, was mostly blown out of the water as a multi-attacker by a Super Priest, which has a much better 1700 attack and can attack all of your opponent's monsters once each, which can let you attack over a chain of recruiters or tokens all in the same battle phase. Mataza's, and by extension Grey Wing's only upside compared to Asura, was that they could attack twice directly, which could be used to attack for game when used together with powerful equip spells. While this niche did allow Mataza to see a tiny bit of play, its much worse counterpart in Grey Wing of course saw none. However, at least this card finally got more useful as time went on, since Link Summoning allows you to get it off the board for a much better monster in either Striker Dragon or Guard Dragon Pitsy. While being the worst Dragon Link Enabler in the game isn't too much to brag about, it's still more than a lot of the other cards in this list can do. And coming at number 6, we have Berserk Dragon. This is a level 8 Dark Zombie with actually quite a big body at 3500 attack, but it cannot be normal summoned or set and must be special summoned with a deal with Dark Ruler. It can attack all monsters your opponent controls once each, but during the end phase of your turn it loses 500 attack. A deal with Dark Ruler is a quick play spell that can only be activated if a level 8 or higher monster you control was sent to the graveyard this turn, and it lets you bring up Berserk Dragon from your hand or deck. Now, Berserk Dragon's effect and stat line are actually pretty good, especially for its time. Its power in the battle phase can even be compared to the much more modern boss monster Ultimate Conductor Tyranno, and its accompanying spell can even bring it out from the deck, just like Tyranno's double evolution pill. However, the parallels end there, as this monster is a much more awkward to bring out than Tyranno, 
will also be much less impactful. You need a very specific hard to search out spell that also has a very specific hard to set up condition. Even in the modern game, you will still need a bit of setup to get a level 8 monster out in the field in the first place, but at the time this card was released, it was even worse. Bringing out this huge beater that dies at pretty much any disruption is definitely not worth all the setup, since even back in the day, there were better OTK combos than this. But at the very least, if by some miracle this does hit the battlefield and doesn't get removed instantly, Berserk Dragon does have the highest attack out of all the monsters on this list. And at number 5, we have Watt Woodpecker a level 3 Light Thunder with 1000 attack that can attack twice during each battle phase, and any monster that battles it cannot change its battle position. This card just falls short in everything it's meant. As far as being a double attacker go, it's even weaker than the other generic option can get, with its 1000 attack reducing its direct damage potential to as much as vanilla as you could play. This card's other effect only really comes up to ram into defense position monsters to keep them stuck in that for the rest of the game, which could come up, but at that point you could have just played something that removes defense position monsters instead such as Sasuke Samurai or the Light Sword Monk. As far as the Watt Double Attackers go, this one provides the least utility of the bunch, since Watt Mole can at least remove face down monsters, and Watt Squirrel can negate the monster's effects instead, which is a much better disabling effect if anything. Despite being better, neither of these cards really saw play either. Watts have always been a pretty terrible archetype, with the only viable way to play them being to play the good direct attackers such as Watt Giraffe and Watt Cobra in a stun deck with lots of floodgates. The other less competitive versions of this deck, which revolved around getting a couple of Watt Hoppers onto your side of the board to give all your Watts protection from targeted and battle protection, or the so-called Watt Lock, doesn't benefit from this card either. You can tell Watt Woodpecker is bad when even the worst variant of a quite low tier strategy didn't want to run even a single copy of it, even if it is endlessly searchable within its archetype. And at number 4, we have DZW Chimera Clad. This is a level 1 Dark Fiend that works almost like a Union Monster. It can equip itself to a number C39 monster you control, and makes it immune to battle destruction. Also, if it attacks into a monster and doesn't destroy it, it can make your opponent's monsters attack zero and then attack into it again. This card just suffers from all the usual problems unions have, and was absolutely unusable at release. The only semi-relevant number C39 card was number C39 Utopia Ray, which was sometimes ran as a rank-up target for regular Utopia. However, that had already begun to be phased out of the meta at the time due to the release of way better rank 4s to take up space in the extra deck by the time this card came out. Even so, if you've ever had trouble with the 2500 attack beater not being able to destroy things by battle, you'd most likely be better off just running equip spells at that point, which are easier to use and to search out, but still not really good enough to include in any deck list from the Xyz era. Many years later, newly released Utopia support would actually give the ZW equip monsters a huge boost though. Ultimate Leo Utopia Ray isn't hard to bring out in Utopia decks, is treated as a number C39 Utopia Ray, and can equip ZW to itself from the deck and even gets a negate when it's equipped. But since you could be running the Zexa weapon that gives you actual protection, or the one that gives you one of the strongest forms of negation in the game with ZW Pegasus Twin Saber, it doesn't even matter that you can fetch Chimera Clad from the deck easily. And at number 3, we have Predator Plant Squin Dracera. This is a level 2 dark plant monster, which can be sent from your hand to the graveyard to make one of your monsters be able to attack all monsters your opponent controls with a predator counter this turn. Also, if it leaves the field, it places a predator counter on every special summon monster your opponent controls. For a long time, there were two kinds of predator plant cards in the game. The ones that interact with predator counters, and the actual good one. Pretty much the only card that places them that ever saw play was predator plant Dragostepalia since it makes the counters negate the activated effects in the field on top of the usual effect of just making the monsters into level 1. But it's also easily made in other decks as a super polymerization target. Squid Dracera was never good enough to see play, even after the newest support gave people a reason to run the main deck monsters for the first time in years. You're forced to choose between its two mediocre effects, because one requires you to have it in hand and the other on field, while it wouldn't see play even if you got both at once. If you're playing Predator Plants, you already have mini cards to help you clear the board and OTK during the battle phase inside your extra deck, like Predator Plant Trophy over Utum getting an attack equal to the attack of all monsters with Predator Counters on the field. You can also have access to much better Predator Counter Spreaders, like Predator Planting, which can also do so at quick effect speed during your opponent's turn, and even gives you a pop with its graveyard effect. It's amazing that the same archetype whose generic fusion support has already broke the game a couple of times, with Predator Plant Darlingtonia Cobra and Predator Plant Verte Anaconda letting you splash fusions to pretty much anything, also has cards like this, which wouldn't look out of place in Pack Fielder from a decade ago. And at number 2, we have Master Monk. This is a level 5 Earth Rock monster with 1900 attack and 1000 defense. It cannot be normal summoned or set, and must be spelled with summoned by attributing specifically a Monk Fighter you control. Its effect is that it can attack twice during each turn. Monk Fighter itself is a level 3 Earth Rock with 1300 attack, 
whose only effect is to prevent you from taking battle damage and attacks involving itself. Of all the high level double attacking monsters, Master Monk is by far the worst, due to its mediocre stat line and requiring a very specific, also incredibly mediocre monster to be brought out. At least the other bad doubling attacking monsters who are level 5 can usually be cheated out, and have way more attack to make them an actual threat in combat. All Master Monk has going for it is being part of one of the worst almost archetypes in the game, together with the aforementioned Monk Fighter and a level 3 vanilla, Chusuka the Mouse Fighter, for some reason. These cards are all deleted in case you want to use some extremely specific support spells, namely Kaminote Blow, Legendary Black Belt, and Lone Wolf. The first two only offer battle-related effects to those unremarkable monsters, none of which are even in attack boost. At least Lone Wolf is one of the first cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! to be able to make a monster completely unaffected by your opponent's monster effects, but that hardly counts for anything when the monsters you're protecting aren't even getting over vanillas from the first set of the game. This is a double attacker that will most likely only ever be slightly annoying when coupled with its otherwise terrible, unsearchable continuous spell, and only if you leave it in defense position and your opponent has forgotten to put any spell or trap removal in their deck, and that's why it takes such a high spot on this list. And finally, at number 1, we have number C49, a high manipulator of chaos a rank 3 Xyz monster that takes 4 level 3 dark monsters materials. Its effect lets your tokens attack twice during each battle phase, and if it has number 43 as an Xyz material, it lets you special summon a token with attack and defense equal to half your opponent's life points. Number 43, Manipulator of Souls, is a rank 2 that takes 3 level 2 dark monsters, and it has never really seen any play in any serious deck, and is useless outside of very gimmicky FTKs, which also require you to gain 8000 life points for it to work. Usually, extra deck monsters place in lower spots on these lists since they tend to be more readily available than main deck monsters since you don't have to search or play them from your hand. However, sometimes their summoning requirements are so demanding that this isn't the case anymore. Fielding 4 level 3 dark monsters is a pretty high asking price for a single card out of the extra deck since that much material is enough to give you a complete combo board through other cards. However, if you want this card with its token generating effect, needing 3 level 2 darks and a rank up spell is much harder. Even Sprite, probably the only deck ever capable of spamming so many dark level 2s on the field, would have trouble setting it up consistently. If you do manage to resolve it all, you do get to attack your opponent for game with the token, provided they have an entirely empty board, since any chainable card or body on board will stop it short, and it's unlikely you will have other cards to deal with them after bringing this out. As a way to close out a game, this card is outclassed by every other extra deck enabler that takes up as much material as this one does. Even this card's ranked down form is more useful than itself, since even its extremely gimmicky FTK, which uses Red Resonator, is set up more easily than this card's OTK. High Manipulator's most interesting application is making a huge Nibiru token to be able to attack twice for a game. But if it's hard enough to make this guy in the first place, imagine trying to do so after getting your board Nibiru. For all that, it's easily the worst card with an ability that lets you battle multiple times in the game. Arm Protector Dragon is a level 8 monster with two effects. It gains 500 attack for each card equipped to it and it makes it so equipped cards cannot be destroyed by card effects. And honestly, both of these effects are not half bad. Back row protection on your equips is something that they desperately need. And most equips give attack points anyway, so getting an extra 500 on top is just extra good stuff. However, it's a level 8 monster with no way to make its summoning easier. And level 7 plus monsters need super good effects to justify the resources required to bring them out. An Arm Protector Dragon is not good enough. If it had its effect on a level 4 or lower monster, it might be okay. But on a level 8, it's just straight garbage tier. Now, an Omni Negate in Yu-Gi-Oh! refers to a card that can negate the effect of basically any other card. So every card on this list has the ability to negate basically anything, assuming it's fast enough to respond to it anyway. But those are the criteria for this list, because generally, Omni Negates are super good because the ability to negate basically any card can win you the game if you do it to the correct target. And at number 10, we have Broken Line. This is a counter trap card which has the ability to negate the activation of a spell, trap, or monster effect and destroy that card, assuming it was activated in the same column as this card. And that's the only requirement, it just has to be in the same column. And ever since Link Monsters force people to actually pay attention to columns, there is the chance you'll be able to actually use this. Here's the thing though, there is a very commonly played card called Infinite Impermanence, which also has column based mechanics, although that one gains a bonus if a card is activated in the same column. So a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh players are conditioned to just not play cards in the same column as set trap cards, if they can help it. So if your opponent just simply avoids the column this card is in, then you just will never be able to activate it. So it's really that simple to play around. 
Although there are definitely situations in which you can kind of play with this card anyway. Like if you force your opponent to play in the column this card is set in or something. It's just a little bit too situational to use, but still probably one of the better Omni Negates that will appear on this list. Although pretty much all the other ones on this list appear because they're too situational to use, but technically have the effect of negating anything. And at number 9, we have World Legacy Sorrow. This is a counter trap card that can only be activated if you control a co-linked monster, which means two link monsters pointing at each other with their link arrows. In which case, you get to negate the activation and destroy any one card. And also, this card has a hard once per turn on its effect. Now, there are definitely some link decks that can co-link pretty easily, but it's not something that happens very commonly. You do kind of have to go out of your way in order to get a co-link on the field. And at that point, you're kind of in a pretty good position. World Legacy Sorrow is more of a win more card than it is a versatile one that can be used in order to disrupt your opponent's plays or help your plays go through. Although the fact that it has World Legacy in its card name does allow it to benefit from some World Legacy support, and can even be set directly from the deck with Lib the World Key Master. Although even with those interactions, it still rarely sees competitive play, because they are just easier to use semi-omni negates you can use instead, which also don't have an arbitrary hard ones per turn. So it does make this list, but only at a low spot. And at number 8, we have Jolt Counter. This is a counter trap card which can negate the effect of any spell trap or monster effect and destroy the card, assuming two conditions are met. One of them requires you to control a battle in box and monster, and the other one requires it to be during the battle phase. So if you're playing a battle in boxer deck and you can make it to the battle phase, you have one negate of basically anything that your opponent tries to do to you during the battle phase. The thing is though, the battle phase doesn't matter very much. Having the card locked to the battle phase restricts it way too much to be viable, because it also has another requirement on top of that. Generally, you want your counter traps in order to negate stuff during your opponent's turn to disrupt their plays, which usually happens during their main phase. Jolt counter kind of exists in order to protect you from battle traps like Mirror Force, in which case you're better off just clearing your opponent's back row if you're that afraid with spell and trap card removal. Even back when this card first came out in 2013 with the Battle and Boxers, the few Battle and Boxer decks that saw competitive play didn't use this card, because there was no big need to have an Omni Negate during the battle phase. It was kind of a niche, situationally useful card, which wasn't that much better than just playing Trap Stun, which might actually offer better protection than Jolt Counter, since it can be used during your main phase to prevent your opponent's negates. And at number 7, we have Misjudge. This is a monster card which has a non-optional effect where the first time your opponent activates a card effect during the turn, before the effect resolves you get to toss a coin twice, and if the result of both of those coins is heads, you get to negate that card's effect. Now since this card just kind of passively sometimes negates the effects of one of your opponent's cards, which I think is a 25% chance, it's not the worst thing in the world. Technically, it has a positive outcome and its stats are not half bad for being a level 4 monster. It's just it doesn't really belong to an archetype and it doesn't work well with coin flip cards since it requires two heads in order to resolve. Whereas the card Lucky Chance could be perfect synergy with Misjudge since it can sometimes allow you to draw a card when a monster performs a coin flip. Although that card only works on a single coin flip with a monster, and since Misjudge flips two coins, it's not eligible to activate that trap card's effect. And even if you second coin toss to redo the coins, you still have to land heads two times in a row, which is pretty difficult. So what I'm trying to say is Misjudge is not bad, it's just it doesn't really have any synergy with other cards or archetypes. So if they just kind of built an archetype around this card, which allowed you to use Misjudge in the field almost effortlessly, then it might not be half bad in the future, since you'd essentially gain a 25% chance and negate the first card effect your opponent uses during their turn, or on your turn, it does work on both players' turns, which is a nice effect to have in addition to something else. Although when you're using your full normal summon to bring this card out, it doesn't really do enough to justify a spot in a deck. And at number 6, we have Forbidden Scripture. This is a quick play spell card which has the effect to negate the effects of all other card effects on the field, but can only be activated when one of your monsters battles an opponent's monster. The effect only lasts during damage calculation, and it also changes the attack and defense of both monsters to their original attack and defense. So this card basically just shuts down everything during damage calculation, and resets both their cards to their most prime state. So. 
its uses should be pretty obvious. Say you're trying to attack over something that has a very high attack, like Dark Rebellion XYZ Dragon. This would allow you to set it back to its normal 2500 attack value. And then you could beat over it much easier as long as you had a monster with a base attack that could beat over it. It also allows you to negate the effects of Honest Light cards, since it happens at the very end of the damage step and kind of resets the attacks of both monsters and negates everything else on the field for that incredibly short window of opportunity. So you can't really activate anything else in response to it without it also just being negated. Although for the same reason Jolt Counter doesn't really see play, no one really cares about activating stuff during the battle phase anymore. And playing an anti-honest card in the form of Forbidden Scripture is kind of too niche to see competitive play. The effect to shut down all card effects on the field for a limited amount of time can have a lot of funny unintended side effects. Like if your opponent had another monster on the field who had a temporary attack boost. Like 10,000 Dragon for example. Forbidden Scripture would just kind of reset that monster's attack to zero accidentally. Even if you're not trying to use it on that card since it just hits everything else on the field for an instant. It's not the most traditional Omni negate in the world, but it does kind of meet the requirements for this list since it does negate everything on the field for a hot second. And it also doesn't really see competitive play because it's too focused on the battle phase. And if a card is going to see play during the battle phase, it has to do a lot more than just temporarily negate card effects and reset the attack of two monsters. And at number 5, we have Showdown of the Secret Sense Scroll Techniques. This card has the ability to negate the effect of basically anything. Although, just like everything else in this list so far, it's the activation requirements that kind of kill it. You need to activate this card in response to any of your opponent's card activations, and it will negate and destroy those cards, as long as your opponent has another card with the same name as the card you're trying to negate already in their graveyard. And generally, since people like to play three copies of all their best cards for just deck consistency, it seems like you would get a lot of mileage out of this Omni Negate. Although, unless you know you're going to be playing a long grind out game, this card is way too slow to even consider it as a viable Omni Negate option. Because, you see, normally trap cards are already very slow to begin with. Only the absolute strongest, most broken trap cards even see play in the current meta, and generally only if they can be activated from the hand. Or that are very generous in their activation requirements and negate cards, like the Solemn Brigade. And Showdown is kind of even slower than normal since you need to wait for your opponent to have cards in their graveyard in order to negate second copies of them when they're activated. Generally, the good thing about Omni Negates is stopping your opponent's plays from happening in the first place, not stopping them after they've gone through a whole bunch of combos already, unless it does a little bit more than just negate one card. So like I said, unless you know you're trying to grind it out or stall in your opponent, then you're probably not even able to use this card most of the time. And even then, you're better off just playing cards that are easier to activate. And at number 4, we have Do a Barrel Roll. This is a counter trap card for the Mecha Phantom Beast archetype, where it allows you to negate and destroy any card that's activated as long as you tribute all of your Mecha Phantom Beast tokens in order to do so. So here's the thing about the Mecha Phantom Beast archetype. They kind of revolve around their tokens on the field being on the field, so they can use them in order to activate their effects and to grant them their immunities, since they can't be destroyed by battle or card effects as long as they have tokens on the field. So they love their tokens and they always have a couple of them out, unless things are not going so well, in which case they don't have any tokens. So you don't really want to get rid of all of your tokens in order to activate one Omni Negate. Even if this card only tributed a single token, it might not see play because they kind of want their tokens to be there. And you would still go minus one in card advantage for that one negate. And a negate in that way would still require setup and waiting a turn before it was even live. But the fact that it gets rid of all of your tokens just kind of makes it unplayable in the deck it was made for. So it's kind of funny that a card named after a very well-known meme is kind of bad and never sees play. Despite the fact that it technically does have a good effect. It's just it has way too high of a cost to use it. If I were to fix this card, I would just make it so it requires a Mecha Phantom Beast token to be on the field in order to activate it, and not tribute any of them. And even then, I'm not sure if it would see play, just to give a little indication of how bad its original effect is. And at number 3, we have Vanity's Call. This is a counter trap card which can only be activated as a chain link 4 or higher, where you have to pay half your life points and then you get to negate the activation and effects of all other cards in the same chain as this card and then destroy them. 
so it has the potential to destroy up to three other cards if activated at the end of a long chain link. And in theory, this sounds amazing. Paying half your life points to negate three cards sounds more than worth it. Considering Solemn Judgment sees all kinds of play, also requires you to pay half your life points, and only negates the effects of one card. Here's the thing though, normal decks do not go into chain link four. Generally, chain links only go two deep, and sometimes three, but you don't use a negate for only a sometimes. If you're trying to hit chain link four or higher, you have to specifically use your own cards in order to force it to go that high. So if you really want to use Vanity's Call to negate some of your opponent's card effects, you'd have to activate at least one card of your own in order to get it to the chain link three so that you could even use this card. In which case, you're kind of negating your own cards in order to activate this one, which just makes it a two for two trade-off in that case. And that just adds more hurdles to having to activate the negate, which kind of defeats the purpose of the negate, which is to disrupt your opponent's plays at key moments. Not just disrupt them whenever your opponent happens to activate a long chain link. There is a meta viable deck that occasionally sees play, which does go into high chain links regularly, and that's the Chain Burn deck. Although, funny thing about Vanity's Call, even though it seems like it would be the perfect counter to a Chain Burn deck, the fact that it requires you to pay half your life points kind of defeats the purpose of it. You'll basically burn yourself for more damage than your opponent can deal to you by just paying this card's cost. So it's not even good against the one deck that its effect is useful against, which is why it definitely has to take a high spot on this list. Although it's still a little bit more useful than the top two cards. And at number two, we have Face Off. This card is an Omni Negate, which can only be activated during the damage step, where it can be activated in response to a spell trap or monster effect in order to negate and destroy whatever effect you use it on. Although just like with Forbidden Scripture and Jolt Counter, its effect is way too specific on when it can be activated during the battle phase. At least Jolt Counter is any time during the battle phase, and Forbidden Scripture can kind of help you win the battle. Face Off can only be used during one specific part of a battle between a monster, and it's generally during a part where effects don't happen very often, the damage step. The damage step is after the attack has already been declared, so it can't be used to stop cards like Mirror Force since that happens at attack declaration, which is before the damage step. It also can't be used on effects that happen after the damage step, like floating effects of monsters in the graveyard. So it's specifically only things that happen during the damage step, which are basically just cards that specifically mention the damage step in their card text, like Ultimate Conductor Tyranno, or effects that change attack and defense. Those are generally used during the damage step since most other cards can't respond during that phase of the battle. Or cards and effects that activate when you take battle damage, like Tragodia or Gores the Emissary of Darkness. Those also happen during the damage step. And flip effects will activate during the damage step before the card is sent to the graveyard. So in order to know what face off can actually negate, you kind of need an intricate understanding of what is and isn't allowed during the damage step, which is kind of a complicated thing even for veteran players. I might have even gotten one or two of those things wrong trying to explain it, although I'm pretty sure that's all the things that can be activated during the damage step. So face off is kind of another anti-honest card. It's supposed to counter the effects of attack increasers and decreasers during the battle, although Forbidden Scripture kind of does the same thing in a less confusing way, and is easier to use since you don't have to set up as a trap card first and wait a turn before activating it. And the thing about face off is that what it's good at negating is something that doesn't really happen very much in modern Yu-Gi-Oh anymore. No one's really using flip effect monsters outside of subterra decks. No one's really using Gore's The Emissary of Darkness, but I guess this could allow you to get a sneaky kill on Ultimate Conductor Tyranno if you're playing against a dinosaur deck. Although any of the Solemn cards could accomplish the same feat of strength while being much easier to use. That's kind of the thing with a lot of these cards. Why would you play these incredibly specific Omni Negates when you could just play one of the Solemn Brigade members to get kind of the same effect while being able to use it basically whenever you want? Unless you really don't like paying life points, then I guess some of these cards could be alternative options, just not very good ones. And at number one, we have Seal of Wickedness. This is a continuous trap card, which has an effect that once per turn, during your opponent's standby phase, you can select one face-up card in the field and negate that card's effect until the end of the turn. And then it goes on to have a maintenance cost, where you need to pay 500 life points during each of your standby phases or destroy this card. So this is definitely the slowest Omni Negate on this list by far, 
as it can only be activated during your opponent's standby phase in order to select one card, whereas basically everything else on this list can be chained in response to your opponent trying to do something. Technically it is an Omni Negate, it can allow you to negate any card effect, it's just a very slow one, and Omni Negate doesn't really specify the speed of the card. Otherwise, nothing else would count as an Omni Negate, since none of those can technically respond to spell speed 4 cards anyway. So, why is this card bad? Well, I kind of explained that while trying to justify its spot on this list. It's way too slow and one of the worst negates of just selecting something that's already on the field, rather than being able to use it in response to something in order to try and disrupt your opponent's plays. If your opponent is playing a Floodgate, and you want to turn it off for a turn, then Seal of Wickedness could negate the effects of Mystic Mind, for example. So, it has some niche uses, although you don't really want to turn off Floodgates during your opponent's turn. So it's probably best use on some kind of boss monster that's already on the field, who might have a really good effect that would break your board and help them win. Or something, I'm not sure. I can't really think of good reasons to use this card, since a negate only works during your opponent's turn, and only for cards that were already on the field before they entered their main phase. So it would have some niche uses against other bad cards, like maybe shutting down your opponent's evil hero Dargaia and resetting its attack to zero. There are so many better cards to do that instead, that Seal of Wickedness kind of easily takes number one spot on this list. Cucumber Horse is a level 8 plant monster that can only exist during the battle phase, where at the start of your battle phase, you can special summon this card from your graveyard, then special summon any other monster from either graveyard to the field, but then both are sent to the graveyard at the end of the battle phase. And honestly, this effect would be amazing if not for the cost, where you have to send a plant from your hand or field to the graveyard. So, while being able to summon something like Thunderclap Skywolf on your opponent's battle phase would be amazing, this card is relegated to plant-only decks for the most part. And competitive plant decks are almost all combo decks who do not care at all about summoning extra cards during the battle phase. So while it technically has a decent effect, it's just relegated to one of the few types in the game that can't really take advantage of it. In Yu-Gi-Oh, a Pendulum Monster is either a monster card that can be summoned out, or alternatively can be sent in the Pendulum Scale, gaining properties similar to that of a continuous spell card, while also providing its user with the ability to perform a Pendulum Summon. And while sent in the scales, you gain access to Pendulum Monster's Pendulum Effects rather than its monster effects. And in this video, we're looking at some of the worst Pendulum Effects in the game, why they're so detrimental, and why they should be avoided when setting up for a Pendulum Summon. And starting us off at number 10, we have Performa Pal Trump Girl, a Pendulum Monster with a scale of 4 that actually has no Pendulum Effect at all. And this lack of an effect is shared with quite a few Pendulum Monsters. Flash Knight, Fire Opal Head, and the entire Magispector archetype, just to name a few. It just so happens that Performer Pal Trump Girl is the worst of the bunch due to her terrible scales. Now, technically speaking, having no Pendulum Effect has no inherent downsides that would otherwise make it difficult to use. It doesn't lock you into any specific archetypes, it doesn't prevent you from activating certain types of cards or effects, nor does it have any kind of minor downside like losing life points, or slightly decreasing the attack of one of your monsters, which makes cards like Trump Girl somewhat useful for Pendulum strategies that need generic scales and don't really care about any kind of powerful Pendulum effect. However, it's this lack of effect that makes Trump Girl quite worthless when compared to most other Pendulum monsters, as while other Pendulum monsters may have extremely niche effects that rarely occur, they do technically have positive effects. Performer Pal Kaleidoscorp, for example, provides a minor attack buff for all light monsters you control. Performer Pal LaBelle Man raises the level of all Pendulum Summon monsters you control by one. And even PM Captor, the only zombie-type Pendulum monster in the game, has the minor effect of protecting your Pendulum Summon zombie-type monsters from being destroyed by battle or card effects for a turn. All of these effects are niche, unlikely to come up, and are especially unlikely to be the reason why you win a game. But they are all positive bonus effects that have a chance to help with some kind of strategy. In comparison, Trum Girl and other Pendulum monsters without Pendulum effects have no outstanding benefits other than allowing its user to Pendulum Summon, a trait which all Pendulum monsters have, making it worse than even the most minor positive effects since it has a terrible scale of 4, so it completely locks you out of the most popular level of monsters in the game. Usually, Pendulum monsters that have a scale of 4 have it as a downside, as you'll see a lot more as this video continues, whereas that's all Trump Girl provides as her main benefits. So this begs the question, what could be worse than a Pendulum effect that literally does nothing? And at number 9, we have a double whammy with Cleefort Disc and Cleefort Stealth, both of which are scale 1 monsters which belong to the Cleefort archetype and have exactly the same pendulum effect. While they're in the pendulum scale, every Clee monster you control gains 300 attack, 
which is a positive, I believe, minor benefit. However, like every other Cleefort Pendulum monster in the archetype, while you have stealth or disc in your pendulum scale, you cannot special summon monsters at all except for Klee monsters. Now, there are a lot of pendulum monsters in the game which restrict you to only being allowed to pendulum summon monsters within that archetype, with the trade-off being that for restriction you get a particularly powerful pendulum effect or a particularly beneficial skill, such as the case of every death spot pendulum monster. And the same is true of Cleeforts. Cleefort Scout, for example, while locking you into Klee's, allows you to immediately search out any other Klee card from your deck by paying 800 life points. And every pendulum in the archetype actually has great scales, either being scale 1 or scale 9, allowing for every Klee that isn't a Plockafort to be summoned out from the hand or extra deck with ease. The main issue lies in the fact that this continuous effect doesn't just lock you out of pendulum summoning other monsters, it locks you out of special summoning any other monsters completely, preventing them from gaining access to generic boss monsters like Appalooza, Bow the Goddess, or IP Mascarina, while also preventing the Cleefort monsters from being able to be splashed into other decks. Though, that didn't stop people from trying, and in fact there are plenty of Metal Foes decks that topped in 2017 that utilized the Pendulum Effect of Cleefort Scout to search out Cleefort Monolith, and then proceeded to get by the harsh restrictions of Scout by destroying it with the scale effect of Metal Foes Pendulum Monsters. Then, after Pendulum summoning out the Scouted Monolith, you could overlay them for Cyber Dragon Nova to rank up into Cyber Dragon Infinity for an easy negate. Cleefort Stealth and Disc, however, simply don't have the same utility in their Pendulum Effects, as in their case, you're only gaining an extremely minor attack buff for your Klee monsters, making the restriction not at all worth it. In fact, for a while, this restriction even hindered the main Cleefort strategy. You see, during Master Rule 3, you could simply pendulum summon out as many monsters as you wanted from your phase of extra deck to the field, but with the introduction of Master Rule 4 and its revisions, you could only pendulum summon out Cleeforts in the extra deck to your extra monster zone, or to a zone where a link monster points to, which made things quite difficult during the time Cleeforts had no link monsters as while other Pendulum decks could take advantage of generic link options to summon up the three monsters from the extra deck, Klee decks didn't have access to these options due to their scale's archaic restrictions, and thus were stuck only being able to Pendulum summon out one monster from the extra deck per turn, until 2018, when Cleefort Genius, a link monster, was introduced to the TCG. Yet despite how harsh this restriction is, Disc and Stealth only make it to the number 9 spot on this list, as while the effect is harsh, it actually doesn't do too much to hinder Klee from playing now that Cleefort Genius is part of their arsenal. And prior to Master Rule 4, Cleefort was actually a well-respected deck, being one of the top contenders that existed during Duelist Alliance format all the way up until 2016, as it didn't need to summon any other kind of monsters to be competitively viable. And the Disc and Stealth effect to gain 300 attack acted nicely as a minor benefit, which ensures that they don't have higher spots on this list. And at number 8, we have Metronome, a generic pendulum monster with a scale of 4. Metronome has the pendulum effect that on a soft once per turn, you can target a card in any pendulum zone, including your opponent's, and Metronome's pendulum scale becomes the same as that card's until the end of this turn. Metronome technically does have some niche utility that would allow it to be somewhat useful. Being able to target any card in a pendulum scale lets you copy your opponent's high or low scale, meaning that in a situation where your opponent has two pendulum scales, Metronome scales could be either allowing it to have some interesting versatility. So if you drew a handful of high pendulum scale monsters, Metronome could be the missing piece in order to find a low scale. And if you have a handful of low scale pendulum monsters, Metronome could instead be a high scale, allowing you to customize Metronome scale depending on which cards you have in your hand. However, in spite of this interesting use, Metronome's pendulum effect will more often than not be a detriment rather than a benefit. You see, the reason why Metronome has this particular pendulum effect is because, as we mentioned earlier, having a pendulum scale of 4 is usually a pretty bad downside for a pendulum monster, as it prevents you from pendulum summoning level 4 monsters. So it's quite important that this scale is changed. But it heavily relies on your opponent playing some kind of pendulum strategy, which aren't really too prevalent in the current metagame. And if your opponent doesn't place a pendulum monster into their scale, the only skills Metronome will be able to target are your own and doing so would lock you out of Pendulum Summoning, which works by allowing you to special summon monsters from your hand and or face up extra deck, provided those monsters you're summoning have a level between the two cards in your Pendulum Scales. So if you have a scale of 1 and a scale of 5, you can Pendulum Summon any level 2, 3, or 4 monsters. In contrast, if you were to have two Pendulum Scales of the exact same scale, you wouldn't be able to Pendulum Summon at all. So, by using Metronome's effect to copy your own scales, you actively lock yourself out of your Pendulum Summon. And if you don't use Metronome's effect, you have a pretty bad skill that'll prevent you from being able to Pendulum Summon one of the most common levels in the game, making a pretty lose-lose situation and occasionally worse than useless. The effect is usually bad to use, but there are some niche circumstances where it could be of some assistance, even if there are plenty of other cards which could fulfill the same role. 
In fact, Metronome has now been power corrupted by Clock Arc, a card which changes Pendulum Scale depending on which zone it's in, becoming a scale 1 in the left zone and a scale 8 in the right zone, allowing it to have the same utility as Metronome without relying on your opponent playing Pendulum Monsters. There's just very little reason to play Metronome in the modern era, even if it can sometimes be beneficial, which is why it makes it to number 8 spot on this list. And at number 7, we have Performer Pal Swin Cobra, a level 4 Earth Reptile Pendulum Monster with a pretty good Pendulum Scale of 2. Yet despite this excellent scale, Swin Cobra has quite the middling effect. On a soft once per turn, when a monster you control inflicts battle damage to your opponent, whether by battling a monster or with a direct attack, you can send the top card of your opponent's deck to the graveyard. In the modern era, there are plenty of cards based around the concept of milling. Chaos Ruler, the Chaotic Magical Dragon, Reasoning, and Monster Gate are all extremely powerful cards that send cards on top of your deck to the graveyard. Where these cards differentiate from Swin Cobra is that they mill cards from your own deck rather than your opponent's which is part of why these cards are so powerful and the main reason why Swin Cobra is incredibly risky to use. By milling cards on top of your deck, you could potentially excavate a card with a strong graveyard effect, such as Water Enchantress of the Temple, or provide you with some graveyard setup. For example, Therion decks currently make use of a Punk Engine in order to go into Chaos Ruler and the Zombie Vampire to set up their graveyard with Therion monsters, so they can summon out other Therions from their hand and gain access to the powerful effects making milling your own deck something many strategies actively want to do. In contrast, there are very few strategies that want to mill cards from your opponent's deck, and those that do usually aim to FTK, force them to deck out before they can really make proper use of the graveyard. Empty Jar, for example, is capable of constantly flipping Morphing Jar or Needle Worm to mail at your opponent before their first draw phase. Comparatively, there's no way for Swin Cobra to be used in a similar capacity. It requires the battle phase in order to mill and thus can't be done on the first turn. And furthermore, it's a soft once per turn, so can't really be abused. This is a pretty big detriment, as if you're not decking your opponent out or OTKing them, you've potentially given them access to some strong graveyard effects to allow them to force a comeback. Now, there are some minor applications for milling out a small amount of cards from your opponent's deck that aren't FTKing. If you manage to mill an important engine piece, like a Destiny Hero Celestial, you'll lock your opponent out of the engine and stop their boss monster from ever hitting the field in the first place. However, this scenario is unlikely to happen, and more often than not, you're going to set up your opponent's graveyard with Swin Cobra's effect. Combine that with the somewhat difficult activation requirement, Swin Cobra's Pendulum effect more than earns a number 7 spot on this list, only safe from a higher spot due to the small chance that you could get lucky with it, though in general it should be a card that's avoided in Pendulum strategies, even in Performer Pal decks due to how bad the scale effect is. And speaking of bad Performer Pals... And at number 6, we have Performer Pal Trump Panda the third Performer Pal on this list. Trump Panda has an okay scale of 3, but can alter that scale with its simple but interesting Pendulum effect. On a soft once per turn, you can increase this card's scale by 1 with a maximum potential of 12. Now, at first glance, this effect doesn't seem too terrible, as you can increase the scale of Trump Panda over the course of several turns to gradually Pendulum summon out your boss monsters of higher and higher levels for free provided you have corresponding scales to go alongside Trump Panda. However, for as interesting as Trump Panda's effect can be, the main issue plaguing the card is, like Metronome, its incredible awkward initial scale. You see, all Pendulum scales are situational to the archetype they're part of. In the case of Performer Pals, their levels vary from 1 through 8. However, by far the most populated level for Performer Pals is level 4, and this particular level performs so advantageously it positions itself as the backbone of a tier 0 strategy, based around utilizing the synergies between Performer Pals and Perform Mages to create a bevy of rank 4s or link 5 synchros with X Saber Polomario. But by using this scale effect of Performer Pal Trump Panda, you'd actually increase Trump Panda's scale to 4, preventing you from being able to pendulum summon out those powerful level 4 monsters at all until the next turn, or you would then be able to increase Trump Panda's scale a second time. Now, you could also just wait until after you Pendulum Summon out your level 4 monsters to use the effect of Trump Panda, which is a fairly sound strategy. However, in order to get full use out of Trump Panda's effect, you need to wait multiple turns in order to increase its scale, which is an extremely slow effect and one that makes it pretty awkward to use. Especially when it would take 5 of your own turns to reach the same scale as simply activating Perform Pal Celestial Magician. And, like Metronome, Trump Panda has also been power crept by Clock Arc, as instead of utilizing Trump Panda as a low scale and waiting over the course of multiple turns to make it into a high scale, you have the instant choice with Clock Arc, or whether or not you want to have a low or high scale, making Trump Panda a pretty worthless card, which is why it makes the number 6 spot on this list. And at number 5, we have Time Gazer Magician, the card on this list which has undoubtedly seen the most amount of competitive play, though certainly not for its pendulum effect. Time Gazer Magician has a scale of 8, 
and can only be activated when you control no monsters. But if you do manage to get it into your scale, it prevents your opponent from activating any trap cards until the end of the damage step when your pendulum monster battles. And it comes with yet another restriction that if you don't have an Odd Eyes or Magician Pendulum Monster in your other Pendulum Zone, Time Gazer's Magician's Pendulum Scale becomes 4. Despite both of these harsh restrictions, Time Gazer Magician differentiates itself from most of the other cards in this list by actually having an effect that has a fair amount of applications, even if it is niche in its use. With Time Gazer Magician in your scale, your opponent is essentially floodgated out of using battle traps like Mirror Force entirely. This is definitely a decent effect and one that may occasionally come up, but it doesn't really make up for the number of restrictions on Time Gazer's scale effect. Its Xenophobia as a scale makes it hard to use when splashed into other pendulum strategies, as when it's paired with a scale that isn't an Odd Eyes or Magician pendulum, its usually advantageous 8 scale becomes a level 4 scale, one of the worst numbers a scale can be, and one that will lock you out of being able to pendulum summon out most pendulum magicians, since they're mostly a collection of level 4 monsters. On top of that, not being able to activate it while you control monsters means that before you commit any monsters in the field, you must place Pendulum Magician into your Pendulum Zone, which also means that searching it via something like Beyond the Pendulum or Perform Pals Corporat Joker becomes unusable as a Pendulum Scale. Although you could instead use the effect of Chronograph Sorcerer in order to place Time Gears Magician the Pendulum Scale directly from your deck, even if you control a monster, making it a lot easier to put in the scale, and in fact, Chronograph Sorcerer was the main reason that Time Grazer Magician saw competitive play in the Pendulum Magician decks in 2018. However, more often than not, you're using Chronograph Sorcerer to special summon Time Gazer Magician from your deck to use an easy link material for Heavy Metal Foes Electromite, rather than placing it in the scale for a somewhat middling effect, which is why it makes the number 5 slot on this list. But if you do manage to put it into the scale, and manage to keep it its advantageous 8 scale, it does technically come with a wholly positive effect. It's just one that's not really likely to be useful as battle traps aren't really too prevalent in the modern era, especially since those cards can be dealt with by using more versatile cards like Nightmare Phoenix that don't have harsh restrictions. And speaking of cards with harsh restrictions, and at number 4 we have Performer Pal a Handstand Coon, yet another monster belonging to the Former Pal archetype. Handstand Coon has a scale of 3 and a pendulum effect that on a hard once per turn you can target any Perform Pal card you control and return it to the hand, but this comes with a stipulation that for the rest of the turn, you cannot activate cards or the effects of cards of the same name as that card you return to your hand. If this pendulum effect didn't come with any restrictions, it'd actually be fairly strong, as you'd be able to use Hand Santa Coon to pivot between using a card as a monster and as a pendulum scale and vice versa. So what you could theoretically do is use the on-field effect of a card like Performer Pal Skullcrabat Joker or Performer Pal Seal Eel, and then use the effect of Hand Santa Coon to return those cards to your hand so you could take advantage of their high scales or pendulum effect. On the other side of the spectrum, you could instead use the powerful Pendulum effect of one of your Perform Pal cards that has a bad scale, like Perform Pal Odd Eyes Dissolver, and then bounce it to the hand with Handstand Coon in order to Pendulum Summon it out later during the turn to use its monster effect. As it stands, however, the restrictions placed on Handstand Coon prevent it from having this powerful type of modularity. You see, by bouncing a card from your Pendulum Scale to your hand using Handstand Coon, you lock yourself out of using the monster's effect for the rest of the turn so you can't use the effect to really take advantage of a scale effect, and then a powerful monster effect. However, you are capable of summoning out the bounce monster to use as material for an extra deck summon. The real kicker comes from when you turn one of your Performer Pal monsters to hand, as when you return the monster to your hand, you'll not only be locked out of using its pendulum effect, you also won't even be able to place that bounce monster into your pendulum scale at all, as that counts as activating a card with the same name stopping you from gaining access to either a strong scale or a pendulum effect, making Handstand Coon lose a lot of appeal. All in all, Handstand Coon has an interesting pendulum effect, and one that might even be quite powerful, if it wasn't for the number of restrictions placed on the card it bounces, as it essentially gives you a dead card in hand that can only really be used as a vanilla body, which is why it makes the number 4 spot on this list. And looping through to number 3 is Supreme King Gate Infinity, the complementary scale of Supreme King Gate Zero a card that has actually seen a ton of competitive play as part of an engine for Pendulum decks. Gate Infinity, however, doesn't share this same privilege. Gate Infinity has the best a high Pendulum scale in the game, being the only Pendulum monster with a scale of 13, and has the effect that while you control a monster, you can't Pendulum summon at all, and this effect can't be negated. However, if you do put in your Pendulum scale, you do get the relatively minor buff that once per turn if you control a Supreme King Zark, you can target any monster in the field to gain life points equal to that monster's attack. And if you just so happen to target Zark you control, you gain 4,000 life points. So, usually what Pendulum decks running a Supreme King engine will do is run Supreme King Dragon Dark Worm alongside copies of Dragon Shrine in order to put that Dark Worm in the graveyard. And Dark Worm is a level 4 dark dragon monster 
that can be special summoned from the graveyard provided you control no monsters. And when you normal or special summon it, you can search out any Supreme King Gate monster directly from your deck. And therein lies the problem for Gate Infinity, as while the high skill is extremely beneficial and allows you to summon out any level of monster in the game, the main way of searching the card is by putting a monster on your side of the field, locking you out of being able to pendulum summon entirely, making the card lose a lot of its appeal. Now, you could also use the oft-forgotten Pendulum Effect of Dark Worm in order to set Gate Infinity directly from your deck to your Pendulum Zone, and while doing that is certainly an option, you'll only be capable of summoning level 6 or higher monsters due to the middling scale of Dark Worm, severely constricting your options. Then there's the third option with simply drawing Gate Infinity, which allows you to access its high skill without committing anything, though unreliably. It is technically an easy way to get a very good high skill to pendulum summon as many monsters from your hand as possible. But even then, not being able to pendulum summon while you control monsters is a huge issue, as it prevents you from setting up link monsters to zones in order to summon out monsters from your extra deck, locking you out from pendulum summoning entirely if you want to use a card like Halky Fibrax or Beyond the Pendulum to extend and set up before you pendulum summon. And the cherry on top is that despite this card's harsh restrictions, the effect isn't all worth it. Supreme King Zark is a genuinely difficult boss monster to bring out to the field, as it requires four dragon monsters of each extra deck mechanic apart from Lynx. Now, there are ways to cheat out Zark, such as with the effect of Astrograph and Chronograph Sorcerer, but even they aren't too practical. And for bringing out Zark to the field, you only gain life points. A large amount of life points, but it doesn't really do anything to help you win the game. All in all, Supreme King Gates Infinity's positive effect isn't worth it in the slightest for the number of restrictions it places on you which is why it clearly makes it to the number 3 spot. Yet despite all the restrictions, there are two pendulum effects that just so happen to be worse than Gate Infinities. And at number 2, we have yet another Performer Pal monster, and the second Pendulum Magician on this list, Performer Pal 5 Rainbow Magician. 5 Rainbow Magician actually has an incredibly impressive scale of 12, meaning it can summon any monster that's level 11 or lower, but in order to balance the scale, they give it a pretty harsh restriction on its pendulum scale, just like with Gate Infinity. You can only Pendulum summon out monsters from the extra deck, and this effect can't be negated by something like Beyond the Pendulum. But, while you have it in scale, it has an effect which impacts both players, depending on the number of set cards in their spell and trap card zones. While a player has zero cards in their spell and trap card zone, their monsters can't attack nor activate their effects. If the player has one to three cards in their spell and trap card zone, then no effect applies. And finally, if there are four more set cards in the spell and trap card zone, all monsters that players control have their attack doubled. On the surface, this Floodgate actually seems like a very good way of punishing monster-heavy combo decks by locking your opponent out of the game if they don't draw or play any spell or trap cards, essentially fulfilling the same role as a card like Mystic Mind, potentially locking your opponent out of the game entirely. In reality, this isn't likely to be able to Floodgate your opponent at all. You see, with a card like Mystic Mind, there are very few ways for your opponent to deal with the Floodgate outside of running cards like Cosmic Cyclone, or in archetype outs like Paleozoic Dynamishkus. As while Mystic Mine is up, your opponent doesn't need to commit any monsters in the field and can potentially sit behind it until you deck out completely, unless you have an out in your deck, which some decks simply don't play. In contrast, the out to 5 Rainbow Magician's Floodgate is simply setting any card to the spell and trap card zone. The main issue with this is that most combo decks play some kind of powerful spell or trap cards that's either generic or belonging to the particular archetype. Infinite Impermanence, for example, is a card that sees a lot of competitive play, and is extremely common to be found within decks as a hand trap that your opponent could simply set on the field. The main play starters in branded decks are spell cards, and even the most monster-heavy combo decks in the meta right now, Sword Soul, has an archetype spell card and plays it in order to further its game plan. All of these cards can be set to the field in order to out the Rainbow Magician Floodgate, and in the case of branded fusion and Sword Soul Emergence, these cards could even be used later in the same turn since they're normal spells. Meanwhile, if your opponent is playing a control strategy like Eldritch, you've indirectly given their monsters a buff as control decks are extremely likely to have four or more spell and trap cards to set to their field. Granted, this buff is accessible to both players, so theoretically speaking, you can gain this buff to increase the attack of your monsters to potentially OTK your opponent. The main issue with that, however, is that you'd be locking yourself out of Pendulum Summoning entirely. You see, in Master Rule 3, Pendulum Zones were introduced to the game and were their own separate zones, which allowed you to place two Pendulum Scales and set up to five cards on your field. However, with the introduction of Master Rule 4, one of the ways in which Pendulum specifically was nerfed was by moving the Pendulum Scales to the same spaces of the Spell and Trap card zone. Meaning that if you wanted to set up Pendulum Scales, you were only capable of setting up to three Spell and Trap cards in your back row. This is a huge problem for Pendulums trying to utilize 5 Rainbow Magician's Pendulum Effect, as while you are still very much capable of setting four cards, one of those cards needs to be placed in your alternative Pendulum Scale, 
lock at you from pendulum summoning while you gain the attack buff. All of this combined with the harsh restrictions of only being able to pendulum summon out monsters from the extra deck just makes Perform Pal 5 Rainbow Magician very awkward to use correctly. And even the main appeal of the effect, locking your opponent out of monster effects, can easily be undone by most decks in the game which is why it fits easily at the second worst pendulum effect in the game. Locking out a pendulum summons from the hand is a really harsh restriction, but honestly not as harsh as the next card on this list. And glittering in at number one is Pandora's Jewelry Box, a scale four dark worm pendulum monster with the worst pendulum effect in the game designed specifically to counter other pendulum strategies. It just doesn't do a very good job at it. You can target one card in your opponent's pendulum scale and destroy it. And if you do, you must place Pandora's Jewelry Box into your opponent's pendulum zone. And most importantly, you can only activate this effect while you have no cards in your extra deck. So, the core concept behind Pandora's Jewelry Box isn't terrible. It manages to turn the usually detrimental force scale into a reason why you'd want to run it, as you remove one of your opponent's beneficial scales to instead replace it with a useless four scale that can potentially lock them out of summoning their best monsters. However, that's just about where Jewelry Box utility ends. You see, in order to use Jewelry Box, your opponent needs to already have a card in their pendulum scale, meaning that you can't use Pandora's Jewelry Box to gum up your opponent's scales before they have a chance to Pendulum Summon, and can only be used after your opponent has had a chance to set up their border disruptions and negates, making Jewelry Box a card that they aren't really going to care too much about, since they've already had the chance to build a board. And to add insult to injury, a lot of the best Pendulum decks in the game's history center around destroying their own Pendulum scales to put them into the extra deck, so cards like Sky Iris and Wavering Eyes can make quick work of this pseudo floodgate and turn it into an immediate plus one card advantage for your opponent. Some Pendulum decks, like Odd Eyes for example, can even take advantage of the 4 scale as a low scale to summon out their high level monsters, again acting as a way to actively help your opponent rather than hinder them. And to top it all off, in order to use the effect in the first place, you need to control absolutely no cards in your extra deck at all, preventing you from playing other Pendulum monsters in your main deck, or any other extra deck summoning mechanic. This is of course a huge detriment as it narrows down the number of decks that can play Pandora's Jewelry Box to only a select few. True Draco and Monarch, for example, are both capable of utilizing the effect of Pandora since those decks don't need to run an extra deck at all, while most other decks would usually prefer to have some kind of extra deck. The issue is that both of these decks simply have better options if they really want to floodgate your opponent out of the game, or destroy a problematic Pendulum scale. And in these decks, if your opponent manages to destroy or deal with Pandora's box from either Pendulum Zone, it'll go to your face-up extra deck, which is a huge issue for these strategies as many of the Monarch cards require that you have no extra deck in order to activate them, essentially floodgating yourself out of the game, and even stopping you from being able to use other copies of Jewelry Box. All in all, Pandora's Jewelry Box is a difficult to use card that requires most decks to lose access to one of their strongest tools in the game, i.e. the extra deck, in order to utilize it, and even when you do get the chance to use it, it doesn't really do anything at all to stop your opponent, and occasionally can actively be a benefit for them, making it an absolutely awful card to use to counter pendulums especially when there's so many other cards that could be used to get rid of scales. Like Cosmic Cyclone, or Floodgate your opponent out of Pendulum Summons with something like Dimensional Barrier, which is why Pandora's Jewelry Box easily claims the title of worst Pendulum Effect in the game. Psychic Rover is a level 2 Psychic Monster that on Special Summon lets you roll a 6-sided die. Then you get to destroy up to 2 cards if the result is 1 or 6. Additionally, if it's sent to the graveyard, you also get to roll, and if you roll a 2 through 5, it comes back. And neither of its effects are once per turn. So if you're lucky enough, it can keep coming back and blowing up cards. However, it has one more effect. While you control this card, you cannot special summon from the extra deck. So while it's an easy search and try for its gamble effect off of emergency teleport, its extra deck lock makes it unplayable in any real deck and just purely a gimmick. Raigeki has the effect to destroy all of your opponent's monsters, and many cards were released to mirror Raigeki's ability to turn the tide of the game, but a lot of them missed the mark either due to how difficult they were to use, or how weak their effects are comparatively. So in this list, we're going to go over all of the worst cards that can destroy all of your opponent's monsters. Clocking in at number 10, we have Time Wizard, a level 2 light spellcaster monster with 500 attack and 200 defense, and the simple effect that once per turn you can toss a coin and call heads or tails. If you call it correctly, you get to access the powerful Raigeki-like effect to destroy all monsters your opponent controls. If you call it incorrectly, however, you must destroy as many monsters as you control as possible, which is already a pretty bad downside. But also take damage equal to half the attack of all the monsters destroyed by this effect. This is a pretty unfortunate downside, especially because the risk of Time Wizard outweighs the reward, since you also have to take burn damage from your monsters being destroyed, and because it's based on chance. 
there's no real way to guarantee the positive effect of Time Wizard by itself. But if you do manage to call the coin toss correctly, its effect is extremely strong and mirrors Raigeki exactly, only made slightly worse by the fact that it needs to be summoned to the field rather than being activated from the hand. So in theory, if you were able to have some influence over the coin toss to guarantee that you call it correctly, then Time Wizard would actually become way better. Now in the TCG, the only real way to do this is with second coin toss. A continuous spell card which allows you to redo any coin toss on a hard once per turn if you don't get the result you want. Though, even then, it's still 50-50 chance on whether Time Wizard's effects go through. You just get a second shot at it. But in Duel Links, there was a skill known as Master of Destiny, which allowed you to make your first three results of coin tosses always heads, provided you had at least five cards in your deck which flipped coins. And when Master of Destiny was in its prime in popularity and power, Time Wizard was one of the cards that saw a lot of play. As if you knew your coin flip was going to land on heads, you could simply call heads with Time Wizard to ensure you clear your opponent's field, rather than risking it with a random chance. Though nowadays this skill has been errata to require 7 cards with flip cards in your deck, and further nerfed to skip your own draw phase due to how much utility it had, as you could use it alongside Cup of Ace to essentially act as a pot of greed and draw you 2 cards, or Desperado Barrel Dragon to wipe your opponent's field, like Time Wizard with the effect added that it also drew you extra cards. While Time Wizard did see a fair amount of playing Duel Links and it has an extremely strong positive effect, its unwieldy and random nature in the TCG is enough for it to take the number 10 spot on this list. Especially now that Master of Destiny has become a lot worse with Zerada and Power Creep of the game. And speaking of Power Creep, pouring in at number 9 is Acid Rain, a normal spell card that is essentially just a Raigeki for machines, plainly stating that it destroys all face-up machine type monsters on the field. There are actually a few cards that all came out around the same time acting as a dark hole for specific types, some of which are far less likely to see play since they're targeted towards types that aren't really that popular or robust. Breath of Light, for example, destroys all face-up rock type monsters in the field, which is only really useful against Emancipators. Eternal Drought is even worse as it can only destroy face-up fish monsters, a very insignificant type in comparison to machines. So why does Acid Raid make it on this list? While having the ability to clear the field of powerful machine boss monsters, Acid Rain isn't even the best card in its niche. System Down, for example, does everything Acid Rain does and more. Not only is it specifically targeted towards your opponent's machine monsters, ensuring that none of your monsters are caught in the crossfire, but it also banishes all of their machines on the field and in the graveyard, deleting all of their machine boss monsters. And also any follow-up they might have in the graveyard, all at the cost of only 1,000 life points. The fact it banishes without targeting also allows for a system down to bypass machine monsters with destruction protection, like Longursu, the Orcus Orchestrator, which is why system down sees a large amount of competitive play in people's side decks whenever there's a strong machine deck in the meta like Orcus. Comparatively, Acid Rain has never seen any play at all and is extremely unlikely to while system down is still legal. Meanwhile, a card like Eternal Drought, while being targeted towards a pretty bad type, doesn't really have anything to power creep it which is why Acid Rain specifically makes on this list above any other type-based Dark Holes, even if it hits a more popular type. And at number 8, we have Weed Out, a normal trap card that costs 500 life points to activate, and when it's activated, you destroy all face-up attack position level 3 monsters in the field, including your own. Theoretically speaking, Weed Out isn't the worst card in the world, as while it's superbly specific in what it destroys, it can technically be used as a powerful hate towards the deck's focus on level 3 monsters. For Phantom Knights and Virtual World strategies, Weed Out seems like it could potentially be an incredible interruption. Especially because it's a trap card that you can surprise your opponent with if they're not careful enough to play around it. However, Weed Out has two key issues which prevent it from seeing any real use. The first issue is just how specific it is to level 3 monsters. As while this could be particularly effective against the previously mentioned strategies, both Phantom Knights and Virtual World have access to monsters other than level 3 monsters like level 6, 9, or 12 synchro monsters in the case of Virtual Worlds, or monsters without levels at all, like XEs or Link monsters which have ranks and Link ratings instead in the case of Phantom Knights, meaning that even against the meta decks it could see some use against, it's not that effective against their boss monsters, making it a very proactive card that can be used as interruption, but a terrible reactive card that doesn't do much more once they've gained access to their extra deck. The second is that Weed Out only destroys attack position monsters, so it can be extremely easy to play around, even accidentally, by just summoning your level 3 monsters in defense position before using them for some kind of extra deck play, making it virtually useless as interruption, especially if your opponent knows that you have it set with something like a trap trick. For what it is, Weed Out is just too specific and too hard to use in order for it to be of any relevance, which is why it makes it the number 8 spot on this list. 
And at number 7, we have Dragon Laser. A quick play spell card which destroys all monsters your opponent controls, provided you send one Trigon equipped to a Delta Tri to the graveyard. Without its activation requirement, Dragon Laser is actually a better card than Regeki, as not only you're able to use it reactively during your own turn to clear the board of boss monsters, you can also use it proactively during your opponent's turn to disrupt their plays and prevent them from gaining access to their boss monsters in the first place, since it's a quick play spell card. This kind of versatile removal is currently why cards like Prank Kids Battle Butler and Mirror J the Ice Play Dragon are currently seen playing the metagame, being adaptable in their use as both easy accessible ways to break boards and easy usable interruption. Although as powerful as Dragon Laser's effect is, it's exceptionally difficult to set up. It revolves around equipping Delta Tri with the Union Monster Trigon, and this is actually fairly hard to do as both of these monsters have no way of special summoning themselves out to the field from the hand, and Trigon can only equip to Delta Tri using its effect from the field. Even modern Union support like Union Hanger and Unauthorized Reactivation can't help as they only support a light machine Union Monsters, and Delta Tri, despite being a light machine, isn't a Union Monster, and Trigon, despite being a Union Monster, is a Fire Dragon type. Now, as difficult as it is to equip Trigon, it isn't impossible, as if you manage to get both of these cards in the field, you can set up Dragon Laser's Quick Play Raigeki using Trigon's on-field effect to equip itself to Delta Tri, or alternatively, if you can find a way to put Trigon in the graveyard, you can destroy monster by battle using Delta Tri to trigger its effect and equip Trigon from the graveyard. However, this is pretty difficult to do since Delta Tri only has 1200 attack points, which is a minuscule amount compared to most other normal summonable monsters in the game. And because its effect only triggers in the battle phase, you can't use Delta Tri's effect to equip Trigon from the graveyard during the first turn of the duel, when it would be most valuable to set up a play to interrupt your opponent. Though if you do happen to set up Dragon Laser, you'll have a pretty powerful interruption that can even be repeated over the course of several turns by destroying whatever monsters you may have left with Delta Tri to re-equip Trigon from the graveyard, as long as you've drawn into other copies of Dragon Laser. All in all, due to its difficulty to set up Dragon Laser, it deserves a number 7 spot on this list. It's not a terrible interruption in the slightest, but it requires multiple cards to really be viable when other interruptions, despite perhaps being less versatile, are a lot more accessible and easier to use. Torrential Tribute, for example, has similar versatility in being able to be used both to break boards and interrupt your opponent's plays, and only requires that any player summons a monster, while Dragon Laser requires a very specific setup involving three cards for an admittedly strong payoff that's just a bit too awkward to set up just like the next card on this list. And at number 6, we have Worm Victory, a level 7 light reptile flip monster with 0 attack and 2500 defense. That has the effect that when it's flipped face up, you must destroy all monsters in the field except reptile type worm monsters, and it gains 500 attack for each reptile type worm monster in your graveyard. Now, like most Raigeki-like effects, the effect itself is actually solid, especially for worm strategies that are able to send cards to the graveyard with stuff like Snake Rain, or the recently released Ogdala deck Water Lily, so that you can clear the field of all monsters except for your light reptile worm monsters on your side of the field, while also getting a massive beat stick in Worm Victory to deal a huge amount of damage to your opponent, with Snake Rain alone buffing Worm Victory to 2000 attack. The unfortunate side to Worm Victory, however, is that it's a level 7 monster, so it requires that you tribute two monsters in order to normal summon or set it to your field. Usually you can circumvent this issue by special summoning high level monsters to your field, either through Pendulum Summoning or more commonly by a card effect, such as Agadoa Dick Water Lily to Special Summon from the Graveyard, or the Iris Sword Soul to Special Summon it from the Hand. But unless a card specifies otherwise, you can only Special Summon monsters face up to your side of the field. And there are very few cards which can generically Special Summon a monster in face down defense position. Even W Nebula Meteorite, a card designed specifically to work with worms, can only special summon Worm Victory from your deck in face-up attack position. Although the other Worm support card that everybody forgets about, Worm Recall, does allow you to special summon it from your hand to your field face down, but only if you control no other monsters. So while Worm Victory may have a powerful effect, it earns a number 6 spot, although as awkward as Worm Victory is to set up, its effect is more likely to trigger than at least the next card on this list. And at number 5 we have Tribe Shocking Virus, a level 4 monster with the uncommon combination of Water and Thunder type with a soft once per turn effect where you can banish one monster from your hand to destroy all monsters in the field with the same type as that monster. At first glance, this is an excellent effect on par with the similar card, Tribe Infecting Virus, a level 4 monster with the more common typing of Water Aqua with the ability to discard one card from your hand to declare one type of the field to destroy all monsters in the field of that type. In fact, Tribe Infecting Virus had been on the ban list for over 14 years, and only recently has just come off as early as 2020 
rivaling but not matching Raigeki's time on the ban list. So why is Tribe Shocking Virus on this list? Well, astute viewers will have already noticed a couple of key differences between the car techs of Tribe Shocking Virus and Tribe Infecting Virus. Firstly, Tribe Infecting has no once burnt on it at all, and saw a lot of competitive play during GOAT format for that reason. Since it has no once per turn, a single copy of Tribe Infecting can keep discarding cards to declare different attributes to wipe your opponent's field of monsters. Even if they have a field of five different types, you can discard five cards to destroy each one. In contrast, the retrain of Tribe Infecting Virus, Tribe Shocking Virus, has a soft once per turn. You could technically use its effect in a similar capacity to Infecting Virus by summoning out multiple Tribe Shockings to clear out most of your opponent's field, even if it is a bit harder to set up since they have no way to special summon themselves. But the main reason why Tribe Shocking Virus makes it on this list is because you must banish the same type of monster from your hand that you want to destroy. So, in the case of Tribe Infecting Virus, if your opponent controls a dragon, a spellcaster, and a machine, you can discard any three cards from your hand to declare a dragon, spellcaster, and machine to destroy them. But for Tribe Shocking, not only would you need to summon out three of them, you would also need to specifically banish a dragon, spellcaster, and machine type monster from your hand in order to use this effect to destroy each of those monsters of the corresponding type on the field. And if you just so happen to not be playing the same types of monsters as your opponent, or you happen to not draw into those monsters, Tribe Shocking is essentially a vanilla monster with low stats to boot. It can technically have some use in dealing with decks that only use one type, especially mirror matches, and can even be used as a janky starter for Thunder Dragon decks because of its Thunder typing, allowing you to banish a Thunder monster from your hand in order to trigger its effect when they're banished. But Tribe Shocking isn't really an effective board wiping tool, so it earns a number 5 spot on this list. And at number 4, we have Link Party, a normal spell card with a grand total of 6 effects depending on the number of attributes or Link monsters on the field. With only one attribute on the field, all Link monsters you control gain 500 attack. With two, all Link monsters your opponent controls lose 1000 attack. Three Link Monsters of different attributes lets you gain 1500 life points, while four lets you burn your opponent, dealing 2000 points of damage. Five lets you special summon any monster with 2500 attack or more from your deck. And finally, with six different attributes of Link Monsters on the field, you can destroy all monsters your opponent controls with 3000 or less attack. And you can only activate one Link Party per turn. Technically speaking, every one of Link Party's effects is beneficial, even if there's only one Link Monster on the field. All of your Link Monsters gain a permanent 500 attack buff, meaning that provided you have at least one Link Monster, you should be able to get some use out of Link Party. Practically speaking, however, Link Party's effect is extremely capricious because while every effect from one to four attributes is beneficial and can occasionally be helpful, they're not as impactful as the harder to access effects, which either special summon a high attack monster from your deck or can wipe your opponent's field of monsters. And in order to guarantee access to these effects, you have to jump through the necessary hoops in order to special summon at least 5 Link Monsters on different attributes, 6 if you want to be able to destroy all your opponent's monsters with 3000 less attack, and assuming each of these monsters is a Link 2, that's 12 monsters worth of materials to commit to the field. This isn't impossible however, as many extra Link combos during Master Rule 4 were able to commit plenty of monsters to the field in order to build a board of co-Link monsters, so they could use both extra monster zones, which would lock your opponent out of special summoning monsters from the extra deck. In fact, a lot of these extra link combos summed out multiple monsters of different attributes, and because Link Party doesn't specify that the link monsters have to be on your side of the field, you can wipe an opponent's entire extra link board away if they have access to six attributes. Or if they only have five, and you can summon at least a beat stick from your deck to break the extra link and let you summon from the extra deck. So, you would think that a format where extra linking was common, like a Goku format, Link Party might have been an interesting choice in people's side decks. However, not all extra links were on monsters of multiple attributes, and those that did often employed the Nightmares, a series of fiend-type monsters of different attributes, which can all discard a card to trigger an effect of their Link Summon. But more importantly, they all have a continuous effect to benefit from co-link monsters. The Fire Nightmare Phoenix ensures all co-link monsters can't be destroyed by battle. The Wind Nightmare Goblin prevented Cone Link monsters from being targeted by card effects, and the Earth Nightmare Cerberus prevented Cone Link monsters from being destroyed by card effects, including Link Party. So while you can use Link Party to wipe an entire board of your opponent's monsters without Link summoning a single card, it's extremely unlikely that your opponent's board doesn't have some kind of protection from card effects, either because of the nightmares or due to a negate like Trigate Wizard. And setting up the 6th Link Party by yourself is more difficult than summoning the Arrival Cybers at Ignister, since at the very least the Arrival allows it to be summoned using any monsters of different attributes and not just Link monsters. To Link Party's credit, there are some hyper-specific situations in which you could control 3 Link monsters of different attributes, 
and your opponent controls three monsters with different attributes, but those situations are going to be incredibly rare. Link Party is just a little bit too difficult to use to gain access to its ability to destroy your opponent's monsters, something it shares with the next card on this list. And at number three, we have Blind Destruction. Blind Destruction is a continuous trap card with a relatively simple effect that, on a soft once per turn, during your standby phase, you must roll a die and destroy all cards in the field that have the same level as the number you rolled. But if you roll a six or higher, you can destroy all level six or higher monsters in the field. Now, it's not too difficult to see why this card can be pretty ineffective at wiping an opponent's board like Raigeki. It's a random effect which only manages to destroy monsters at the same level you roll, acting as more of an aimless weedout. Furthermore, you can't even use Blind Destruction as a form of interruption since you can only trigger it during your standby phase, meaning that you have to set Blind Destruction on your field, hope your opponent ends on a board of monsters with levels, rather than Link monsters, or Xyz monsters, and doesn't OTK you, hope that they don't remove it from the field, activate Blind Destruction during the standby phase, and then you can trigger its effect if you get lucky, and you roll exactly the level you need to clear your opponent's board, making it an extremely slow and hard to resolve effect, even by trap card standards. What's worse is that, like the name implies, Blind Destruction can also backfire and end up destroying your own monsters if you happen to roll the same level as a monster you control on your side of the field. So at times, Blind Destruction can be worse than useless, occasionally acting as a detriment, especially because its effect is mandatory. So you can't even choose whether or not you think it's worth the risk to roll the die while it's already face up on the field. The only thing that Blind Destruction has going for it in its favor is it doesn't require any setup at all, which is why it's not further down on this list as at the very least you can generically use Blind Destruction over and over over the course of a couple of turns to eventually clear a board of monsters with levels, which funnily enough contrasts with the number two spot on this list. And at number two, we have Dark Hunter. Dark Hunter is a level four Dark Fiend monster with 1600 attack, and like Link Party, it has multiple different effects, this time determined by the number of Dark Monsters in your graveyard. With one or fewer Dark Monsters in your graveyard, Dark Hunter loses 400 attack. With 2 to 4, the opposite happens and Dark Hunter's effect becomes that it gains 400 attack. But at 5 or more Dark Monsters in the graveyard, Dark Hunter gains access to its Raigeki-like effect. By sending it to the graveyard, you can destroy all face-down defense position monsters your opponent controls. This is kind of a ridiculous amount of setup for an effect that isn't really worth it in the slightest. Being able to destroy only face-down defense position monsters really hampers the utility of Dark Hunter. In the modern era, setting monsters is a rarity that even few decks actively want to do, and is usually a sign that you've bricked and can't make a strong play. But if you were to encounter a deck that does actively want to set their monsters to the field like Crawlers or Shadals, you could technically use Dark Hunter in order to clear whatever board they set up without triggering their powerful flip effects, if you manage to put five or more Dark Monsters in your graveyard, which is an absurd amount of setup for such a niche effect. For comparison's sake, Dark Armed Dragon, a card released in the same year as Dark Hunter, not only special summons itself from the hand, but only requires three Dark Monsters to be in your graveyard to do so. And while it's on the field, it has a not once per turn effect to banish one dark monster from your graveyard to destroy any card your opponent controls. So for less setup than Dark Hunter, you can destroy any three cards your opponent controls, even face up monsters or any of their spells and traps. Or even more if you happen to put more dark monsters in your graveyard after Dark Arm Dragon is on the field. Dark Hunter just does not have the same utility and only works in hyper specific scenarios in which your opponent has actively chosen to set their monsters or that you flip monsters face down with Book of Moon while also having five or more dark monsters in your graveyard. The one saving grace of Dark Hunter, and the reason why it's not the number one spot on this list, is simply because it can have some minor use in stopping flip effects from activating if you manage to meet its absurd requirements for its third effect, and because the number one spot on this list just happens to require even a more specific scenario. Last, and certainly not least, at number one we have anti raigeki a normal trap card designed specifically and only to counter Raigeki, with the effect that when Raigeki is activated, you can activate Anti-Raigeki to negate their Raigeki and destroy all monsters your opponent controls. Now, in the past, Anti-Raigeki hasn't had the opportunity to see any use at all, mainly due to the fact that the only card it was designed to counter, Raigeki, has either been limited or banned for 20 years, which essentially made Anti-Raigeki a useless card. But with the newly unlimited Raigeki, it's now suddenly just gained an increase in power as the activation requirement of your opponent activating Raigeki is now a lot more common with it at three copies. So, unlike in, say, 2015, you're potentially likely to get some use out of anti raigeki even if there are other cards which can protect your own monsters from card effects that can negate any card that destroys and not just Raigeki, like My Body as a Shield. So, since Raigeki being activated is now more of a common occurrence, why does anti raigeki still take the number one spot on this list? It's because its effect to destroy all monsters your opponent controls actually works to the card's detriment. 
You see, in the modern era, the way going second tools like Raigeki are used is to either deal with or to bait the interactions of your opponent's monsters before you commit to your own combos. So, for example, if your opponent controls a Boreload Savage Dragon with one counter, which can negate the activation of any card or effect, and you have a Dark Ruler No More in your hand, and a card that you really want to resolve, like the effect of Magician's Rod, it makes logical sense that before you use the effect of Magician's Rod, you use the effect of Dark Ruler No More to negate the Borlo Savage Dragon first, so that your monster effect goes through. The same is usually true of Raigeki, as when you're going second, Raigeki is a tool to either bait your opponent into negating it, so that you can resolve the effect of another more powerful card, or deal with their interruptions completely by wiping their board. But why is this relevant to anti-Raigeki? Because when you activate Raigeki, you usually haven't committed any monsters to your field yet, as you're trying to bait your opponent to interact with your going second tools. And because the effect to destroy all monsters your opponent controls is mandatory, you currently can't trigger the effect of anti-Raigeki, even in response to Raigeki, if your opponent controls no monsters. So, what anti-Raigeki should really read is, when your opponent activates Raigeki, while they control a monster, negate its effects, and if you do, destroy all monsters your opponent controls. Unfortunately, tunneling anti-Raigeki into an even further niche than it once was, making it worse than other specific counter cards like Whitehole, which activates in response to Darkhole and can protect all of your monsters from the effect of Darkhole. Whitehole at least is activatable in response to Darkhole all the time, while Anti-Raigeki requires your opponent to control the monster to negate the effect of Raigeki to even be usable in the first place, which lands Anti-Raigeki squarely the number one spot on this list. Bear Blocker is a level 3 fiend which makes it so during your opponent's turn, your back row can't be destroyed. Also, if one of your back row cards is destroyed, it gains 800 attack until the end phase. Now, while protecting your back row is important for back row heavy decks, it's all too easy for an opponent to just destroy this card before using a Harpy's Feather Duster, or just destroying cards during your turn, since for some reason it only protects them during your opponent's turn. If the card worked more like Lady Labyrinth and had protection while you had a face down card, then it might actually be useful in its job. But as it stands, it's all too easy to get rid of to then just go ham on your back row. Occasionally, they create retrains of specific cards that are meant to be weaker versions of banned cards, and sometimes they just create different versions of cards that are just worse than the original. So in this list, we'll go over 10 of those retrained cards that are not as good as their original. And at number 10, we have Monster Reborn Reborn. Now, this card is a retrain of Monster Reborn, and it has a funny artwork that directly references the fact that Monster Reborn has two different artworks for the OCG and the TCG as it has the OCG cross on top of a pile of TCG Monster Reborn Angel things, as they routinely censor card art in the TCG in order to remove any kind of religious references. So it's funny to see them referencing that art in one of their cards. Now, what Monster Reborn Reborn does is it allows you to target three monsters in your graveyard, then special summon one of them that your opponent chooses, and then you banish the rest. It also has a hard once per turn on its effect, because that's not half bad. It is strictly a worse version than the original Monster Reborn, which allows you to special summon any one monster from either graveyard, but still, being able to special summon a monster from the graveyard is good, which is why this is the lowest spot on the list. It's not exactly a powerhouse card that sees play, but it is a worse version than its original, and generally retrains are better, so there's not a lot of them where the reverse is true, which is why this card makes this list if at the lowest spot. And at number 9, we have Lightning Vortex. This card is a weaker retrain of Raigeki, who recently received a new stronger retrain in the form of Lightning Storm, which is currently one of the most played cards in the game. Now, what Lightning Vortex does is it allows you to destroy all of your opponent's face-up monsters at the cost of discarding one card from your hand. So, using Lightning Vortex is an inherent minus 2 in card advantage, but if you're able to destroy two or more monsters with its effect, it balances out, and can even allow you to go for plus if you destroy three or more monsters. So not half bad as far as the effect goes, but the original card, Raigeki, destroys all of your opponent's monsters without a discard cost, and regardless of their battle positions. So Lightning Vortex is limited with the discard cost and only face-up monsters. Granted, most people play face-up monsters, so that's not a huge downside but an extra downside nonetheless, where Lightning Vortex saw nowhere near as much play as its more, stronger counterpart. As Lightning Vortex was another one of those lesser versions of a banned card that was released. As when Lightning Vortex was first released, Raigeki was still banned on the banned list and is currently limited to one copy. Although they recently released the other retrain, Lightning Storm, which is kind of better than the original card, as it allows you to choose one of two effects, 
but can only be activated if you control no other face-up cards. One of them allows you to destroy all of your opponent's attack position monsters, which is kind of restrictive monster destruction like Lightning Vortex, and the other effect is to destroy all of your opponent's spell and trap cards, which is where the real value of this card comes from. And Lightning Storm also has a hard once per turn on its effect. So, Lightning Storm is just a really good going second card, since you'll have no cards on your side of the field anyway, and it's one of the only generic ways to clear your opponent's spell and trap cards, beating out cards like Twin Twister and the amount of spell and traps you can destroy, which itself is also one of the more heavily played cards in the game. The ability to destroy back row is what makes this card so good, but the fact that it can also destroy monsters gives it the versatility that makes it see so much play. Lightning Vortex did see play in the past as well, which is why it's at a low spot on this list, because even with all of the restrictions and the discard costs, the ability to destroy all of your opponent's face-up monsters is still pretty good. And at number 8, we have Fishborg Launcher. This card is a retrain of Fishborg Blaster, which is currently a banned card that can special summon itself from the graveyard, is a level 1 tuner, and does not have a once per turn on its effect. So it's kind of broken when something like Loa Bulb is banned for being a weaker version of Fishborg Blaster. And Fishborg Launcher is another one of those series of cards that was made as a weaker version of a banned card, which you'll see a lot more as this list continues. So, Fishborg Launcher is a level 1 tuner that can special summon itself from the graveyard, but it has all kinds of restrictions on its effect. For one, it requires you to have a specific graveyard setup, it restricts which monsters you can synchro summon it with, it banishes itself when it leaves the field, and even has a hard once per turn on its effect as you can only have water monsters in your graveyard in order to discard a card to special summon it, and it can only be used as a synchro material for a water monster, whereas the original Fishborg Blaster simply required you to have a level thrill or water monster on your side of the field in order to discard to special summon it, and then its only restriction on the field was if it was used for a synchro material, the other materials had to be water, not that the synchro monster itself needed to be water. And since Fishborg Launcher was given three more restrictions than its original, as well as a harsher restriction on the synchro summoning thing, it's no wonder it didn't see any competitive play. As part of the reason Fishborg Blaster saw so much play was because of how easy it was to bring out of the graveyard multiple times per turn. Although Fishborg Launcher is still a level 1 tuner that can special summon itself from the graveyard, which isn't half bad if you're playing a deck that only has water monsters, and probably a little bit better than some of the other cards on this list. And at number 7, we have Trishula, the Dragon of Icy Imprisonment. This card is a retrain of the synchro monster, Trishula, Dragon of the Ice Barrier, which is a super powerful synchro monster that recently got limited on the ban list, and was banned for a lot of years, so it makes sense that a weaker version of it was created. Now, what the original Trishula does, is when it's brought out, you can banish three of your opponent's cards, one from their hand, field, and graveyard. This effect is not once per turn, and was supposed to be bounced by the fact that it kind of has a tough summoning requirement, and the effect only activates when it's synchro summoned, as it's a level 9 synchro monster which requires at least two or more non-tuners, so you need to have at least three monsters to bring out Trishula. And if used on your first turn, it basically allowed you to snipe one card out of your opponent's starting hand, which is always a great thing to do if you're going first, especially if you use desynchro in order to bring it out twice with the same materials. And to add to that powerful hand sniping effect, none of its banishing targets, so it bypasses all kinds of protection that monsters might have on the field. Now, what the retrain does is it's a fusion monster that requires at least three monsters for its materials, just like the synchro counterpart, although the monsters for this card's fusion summon are simply any three monsters with different names, but has restrictions on how it can be fusion summoned. You see, if you bring this card out with a fusion spell card, you're only allowed to use materials from your hand or field, which means you can't use super polymerization to use your opponent's monsters, but you can still use it on your own, nor dragon mirror to use materials from your graveyard. It has an alternative summoning condition as well, where you can special summon it without a fusion spell card if you banish the required materials from your side of the field instead. Now, this card's effect, if you're able to bring it out, can only be activated if the monsters used for its fusion summon were originally dragon type where you can then banish three cards. One from your own deck, one from the top of your opponent's deck, and then one from your opponent's extra deck. Now, being able to banish any one card from your deck is not half bad, I guess. And being able to banish one card from your opponent's extra deck is pretty good. If you're able to target a crucial extra deck monster that they usually only play one copy of, like maybe an Opalooza, Bo the Goddess, or even Boral Sword Dragon. And then the one card it banishes from the top of your opponent's deck is definitely the weakest of the three, and not really worth note. 
And to add on to the restrictions of this card, this effect has a hard once per turn on it. Now, the three places you banish from with the retrain are nowhere near as good as the three you banished with the original Trishula, as it's also much harder to bring out, has the exact same stats, and even has a hard once per turn on it, as if someone was going to abuse its mediocre effect. They did also release a Necroz retrain version of it, called Necroz of Trishula, which basically has the original Trishula's effect, where when it's summoned you get to banish three cards from your opponent's hand, field, and graveyard. But the Necroz version requires you to banish all three of those targets. So if your opponent doesn't have a card on the field or one in the graveyard, you can't banish from anywhere, as it's all or nothing. Unlike the original card, which can only banish from the hand, for example, if that's the only place your opponent has cards at. And the Necroz Retrain also has a hard once per turn, as that's definitely the most problematic part of the original Trishula. And at number 6, we have Robin Zombie. This card is a zombified version retrain of Robin Goblin, which is a pretty good continuous trap card that has the effect where every time you inflict battle damage to your opponent, your opponent discards one random card from their hand. And being able to discard random cards in your opponent's hand is super good, which is why this card saw some competitive play in the past. And Robin Zombie has the effect where if a monster you control inflicts battle damage, you simply send the top card of your opponent's deck to the graveyard. Now, this is a much worse effect, to the point where it's not very good at all, but does kind of fit the theme of zombie decks, where one strategy they have is that they can mill your opponent's deck, thanks to cards like Soul Absorbing Bone Tower, Goblin Zombie, or to a lesser extent, Soul Levy. But Robin Zombie isn't as good of a choice as those cards, and doesn't provide anywhere near as much advantage as the original card it's based on, even if it does fit the theme of some zombie cards which mill. It would have to mill more than one card to be worth playing though. At least two cards like Soul Absorbing Bone Tower, preferably three cards like Soul Levy, because those decks aren't inflicting a lot of battle damage if they're trying to mill out your opponent anyway. So the deck which this card was probably made for doesn't really need it, and it's a much worse version of its original, so it definitely deserves a spot on this list. It's just funny enough, it's kind of still better than the top five spots. And at number 5, we have Trade Toad. This is another retrain card of a banned card, this time Substitoad. Substitoad is banned because it allows you to tribute one monster to special summon a frog monster from the deck, on an effect that is not once per turn. So Substitoad could dump like half your deck into the graveyard on your first turn, which could then be used as tribute fodder with Ronin Toadin to burn your opponent for 8,000 points of effect damage on your first turn with Mass Driver, which was also banned thanks to Substitoad. Now, the retrain, Trade Toad, tries to rectify the problems of the original by adding much more restrictions on it, in the same way as Fishborg Launcher. Trade Toad obviously has the same look as Substitoad, and even has the exact same stats, and its effect allows you to tribute an Aqua-type monster to Special Summon a Frog from your graveyard, instead of being able to tribute any monster to Special Summon a Frog from the deck. This effect is also on a soft once per turn, and does not have the extra effect of Substitoad, which gives all of your frogs protection where they could not be destroyed by battle while Substitoad was on the field. So only being able to special summon one card from the graveyard, no battle protection, and not gaining frog support since it's a toad monster, it never saw any competitive play in frog decks after it was released, despite the fact that frog decks have consistently seen competitive play, even after Substitoad was banned. And at number 4, we have Counselor Lily. This card is a retrain of Injection Fairy Lily, who was supposed to be a tuner version of that once powerful staple card. Injection Fairy Lily was a really good beat stick back in the day that got even banned for one format, where you can pay 2,000 life points to increase its attack by 3,000 every time it's involved in a battle. So it can attack over pretty much any monster with less than 3,400 attack, which is pretty much every monster in the early version of the game. Well, monsters that saw competitive play anyway, like Summon Skull or Jinzo. So what does this retrained version of an attacking powerhouse do? Well, with the same exact stats as the original, only being fairy type instead of spellcaster, which honestly makes more sense than the original, is that if it's sent to the graveyard for a synchro summon, you can pay 500 life points to have that synchro monster gain 1000 attack until the end phase. Now, I can kind of see the similarities between the two cards. You pay life points in order to gain attack, but the reason Injection Fairy Lily was so good was because you got to pay a crap ton of life points to gain a whole bunch of attack, even if it was very temporary. 
The retrain pays a minor amount of life points to gain a minor amount of attack for a little bit of a longer amount of time, as the synchro monster gets to gain the attack boost until the end phase. Although a 1000 attack boost is not very much, and not really worth playing a tuner monster that can't special summon itself, and doesn't really have support for it to be special summoned easier. Outside of maybe something like Hal Quiff or Rax. So, Counselor Lily never saw any competitive play, as it kind of misses the whole point of what the original card was used for, while also having a harder attack boost restriction to activate, as you can only give the attack boost to a synchro monster after you successfully synchro summon using this card, which is not a good combo piece. If Counselor Lily had an effect similar to Injection Fairy Lily, where you could pay 2,000 life points to have the Synchro Monster gain 3,000 attack until the end phase, then it might be worth running. But they tried to rein in those numbers a little bit too much, and instead created kind of a bad tuner monster, which is relegated to common pack filler status. And at number 3, we have Tribe Shocking Virus. This card is a retrain of a previously banned card called Tribe Infecting Virus, where Tribe Infecting Virus has this really good effect, where you can discard a card in order to destroy all monsters in the field who have a type that you declare. So, for example, if you discard a card and then just declare Dragon Type, you can wipe out all of your opponent's Dragon Type monsters, and any of your own if you happen to have them. And since this effect is not once per turn, you can just keep discarding cards until you wipe out all of your opponent's monsters, with a really good chance that you won't be destroying your own monsters, because Tribe Infecting Virus is Aqua Type, which is a very unpopular type of monster which rarely pops up. So Tribe Shocking Virus tried to replicate the effects of this card it was based on, only with a lot of restrictions put in place like all of the other banned retrains, where once per turn you can banish any monster from your hand in order to destroy all face-up monsters in the field of the same type as that monster. Now, two things about this card's effect. One, it requires you to banish the card from your hand instead of discarding it, which is a definitely worse requirement for a lot of decks. And two, the big one, it doesn't let you declare any type you want, and only destroys monsters of the exact same type as the monster you banish for its effect, which is so much harder to actually destroy cards that it's kind of unplayable. Part of what made the original so good was that you could destroy basically anything very easily, whereas Tribe Shocking Virus can only really destroy stuff if you're playing monsters in your deck that have the same type as cards your opponent controls. It also tries to share some of the other similarities of the card, where it had a very unpopular type when it was released, before Thunder Dragon support made the Thunder type a lot better, so that you wouldn't accidentally destroy your own card by banishing a popular type of monster. But that little distinction, where you need to have a monster of the type you want to destroy, is just too much of a restriction, where Tribe Shocking Virus never saw any play, even after Thunder Dragon support came out, which could directly benefit from a lot of stuff Tribe Shocking Virus does as they like to banish their monsters, but they also don't like to destroy their own Thunder-type monsters in the field, so it's not actually good for them. And at number 2, we have Cyber Barrier Dragon. This card is kind of like an evolved version of Cyber Dragon, which I'm counting as a retrain for this video, but it's a little bit of a different kind of retrain than all the other cards I've talked about so far. Now, Cyber Dragon was a really good staple level 5 monster, with the distinction of being really easy to special summon from the hand while also having high attack points at 2100, and was useful as both tribute fodder for going into even stronger monsters, or to beat over problem staples, like Air Knight Parshath or Gemini Elf. It was also a card used in the anime, so it got a lot of support, some of those being upgraded versions of the card which could be summoned through their specific upgrade card. Cyber Barrier Dragon could be brought out with Attack Reflector Unit, which required you to tribute a Cyber Dragon on your side of the field in order to bring out Cyber Barrier Dragon from your hand or deck. And what Cyber Barrier Dragon did was have way less in attack than its original counterpart at only 800, having a high defense at 2800, and having an effect that requires it to be in attack position, where once per turn while this card is in attack position, your opponent's next attack is negated. Now. It should be pretty obvious what's wrong with this card, but I do try my best to explain these things in easier to understand terms, since I know not everyone is an expert on everything in the game. You see, it requires a specific monster to be on the field, while also using a specific trap card to summon it. The trap card itself does nothing else except tribute Cyber Dragon to bring out Cyber Barrier Dragon, so it's difficult to search out the upgrade card, and you have to wait a turn before you can even use it. Cyber Barrier Dragon is essentially a garnet in the hand, and if you go through the trouble to try to bring it out, the card itself is garbage. 
Its only effect is to negate one attack, which can only be activated if it's in attack position and its attack point stats are terrible. The baseline attack of a decent level 4 or lower monster is 1800. Anything below that is considered low, and anything above that is considered high. The original Cyber Dragon was considered good for clearing that threshold by 300 points, and not requiring your normal summon. Cyber Barrier Dragon is obviously not meant to be in attack position, with its well below attack average, and its high above average defense. Yet it has that as a condition for its mediocre effect nonetheless. It's kind of hard to figure out what they were thinking with this card because of how bad it is. The original card is better and bringing this card out could be considered a downgrade while also requiring you to go minus one in the process. And something like this should have easily taken the number one spot on this list. But the number one spot is just a little bit more of a special case that it's kind of hilarious, which will be better explained when I move on to the next part. And at number one, we have Neospatian Marine Dolphin. This card is kind of like Cyber Barrier Dragon in that it's technically an evolved version of its retrain, Neospatian Aqua Dolphin. And what this card does is it's a fusion monster whose effect is that its name is also treated as Neospatian Aqua Dolphin, an effect that happens at all times, which means if you play this card in your extra deck, that counts as one of the three copies you're allowed to play of Neospatian Aqua Dolphin in your deck or extra deck total. So you can only play two copies of Neospatian Aqua Dolphin in your main deck alongside this card in your extra deck which is just such a terrible card design flaw that it really kills any kind of viability this card might have right out the gate. But that's not all. They also had to give this card an upgrade card similar to Cyber Barrier Dragon in the form of a spell card called Nex. At least Nex is a spell card, so it can be activated as soon as you draw it, rather than having to set it and wait a turn like Attack Reflector Unit. And all Nex does is allow you to send the Neospatian monster you control to the graveyard to special summon the level 4 monster with the exact same name from your extra deck. So, Neospatian Aqua Dolphin in order to get out Neospatian Marine Dolphin. Neospatian Aqua Dolphin is a good card, and it actually saw a ton of competitive play in the last year, as it's really good at sniping hand traps from your opponent in certain warrior-centric decks. And what Neospace Marine Dolphin does is exactly the same as Neospatian Aqua Dolphin. You get to discard one card from your hand, look at your opponent's hand, select a monster which has less attack than a monster you control, then you get to destroy that card and inflict 500 damage to your opponent. The only upgrade Marine Dolphin has over the original in regards to its effect is that there is no negative effect if you don't find a monster to destroy in your opponent's hand. As with the original card, you take 500 points of damage if you don't find a card. So just simply not taking effect damage for not being able to resolve the effect is definitely not worth all the effort required to bring this card out. But that's not all. This card also has incredibly low stats as well. It only has 900 attack and 1100 defense. Granted, that is an improvement over the original, but the original is used as a combo piece, so its stats don't really matter, since it's mainly used to take out hand traps that have zero attack anyway, so it's real easy to activate that effect with its 600 attack. And then the card itself will just be used for link plays or other combo plays. Neospatian Marine Dolphin, on the other hand, is the end play of a combo not the start of one like its original version, and ending on 900 attack is laughably bad. Like I said a little bit earlier, the average attack is around 1800. You want to pass that value in order for you to be considered having a higher than normal attack, and this card has exactly half that very low bar. It also requires you to play an unsearchable upgrade card. It locks you out of being able to play three copies of its main combo piece because of its really terrible card design, and you can't really play more than one copy which is kind of hilarious. They had another Nex upgrade card called Neospatian Twinkle Moss, except that card actually had a better effect than the card it was an upgraded version of, and it wasn't very good either. Mainly for the same reason Marine Dolphin isn't, as it's probably one of the most awkward ways to incorporate a card level up system in the game, something they abandoned after these two cards and never tried again, and never actually made upgraded versions of the other Neospatian monsters, as there's four other ones which they didn't even touch with Nex, Despite the fact that they obviously had planned on it, considering the rest of the archetype revolves around all six of the Neospatians, and all six of them appear in the card artwork for Nex. So this card is a very nice dichotomy where the original, unupgraded version has seen tons of competitive success in the game, and this supposedly better version of the card is probably considered one of the worst cards in the game. And I think it slightly beats out Cyber Barrier Dragon, just because of the mess of the whole card design and sharing a name with the card it's supposed to be an upgraded version from. 
Whereas at least Cyber Dragon has a whole bunch of support cards that can change their names to Cyber Dragon to make getting out Barrier Dragon easier. End of the line is a trap card that can only be activated if you have less than 100 life points, where you can then draw two cards. Then, if your life points are lower than 10, you get to draw two more. Now, the average deck cannot get its life points that low intentionally, and even decks like Dynamorphia, whose whole game plan is having low life points, can't even make this card work half the time. Trying to get under 100 life points is very hard. Getting under 10 is almost impossible, which makes this card a pure gimmick. Search effects in Yu-Gi-Oh! are kind of required for a deck to be good, as if you can't get to your combo pieces, then you can't really accomplish whatever your deck's goal is. But sometimes the only search options available for the archetype are kind of bad. And in this list, we'll go over cards kind of in that vein. And at number 10, we have Underworld Egg Clutch. This is a trap card that allows you to search out a level 4 or lower fish, sea serpent, or aqua type monster from your deck to your hand. But only under the conditions that one of those types of monsters was banished face up on your side of the field first. So, being able to search out any of the level 4 or lower monsters from three different main types is pretty good, which is why this card has restrictions on its activation. Although if it was just a quick play spell card, it wouldn't be half bad, since there is an entire archetype of cards called the Banny Sharks, which revolve around wind attribute sea monsters who all have effects that revolve around banishing themselves or gaining advantage from banishing. So activating Underworld Egg Clutch in the deck it was made for is not difficult, but it is slow since it's attached to a trap card. Honestly, if it wasn't a trap, and instead a spell, it would be balanced enough since the deck is not good. But I guess since it can search from three different archetypes, they thought it would be just too good if it wasn't also a trap card that had to be set for a turn before you were able to perform the search. A search which already has a condition on top of it requiring you to banish one of your own monsters. Which is such a shame that the only search card for the archetype is kind of bad, as the archetype really suffers from the fact that it's wind as a lot of the support for sea creatures revolve around them being water attribute, which really screwed that archetype over. And the only good thing that came out of it was Levier the Sea Dragon. And at number 9, we have Card of the Soul. This is a search card which allows you to add any monster from your deck to your hand, as long as that monster you search out has an attack and defense which add up to equal your current life points. So if you start at a duel, you're only going to be able to search out monsters whose attack and defense equal 8,000 which actually makes it a searcher for Obelisk the Tormentor. Although there's very few cards which actually add up to 8,000 in attack and defense, so it's not very useful in normal Yu-Gi-Oh! Because as soon as you start losing life points, things get much harder to readily search out with it. But in Duel Links, where the starting life point value is 4,000, it is much easier to take advantage of this card. In Nephthys decks, they can search out Sacred Phoenix of Nephthys and their Ritual Monster, because both of them have attack and defense which add up to 4,000. In Toon decks, sometimes those decks will take a really garbage skill called Card Shuffle, just so they can pay 300 life points during the first turn so they can activate the effect of Card of Soul to add Toon Dark Magician from their deck to their hand, as she's the only Toon monster available in Duel Links which doesn't have Summoning Sickness. And then there's also Desperado Barrel Dragon. People will take a skill which increases your starting life points by 1,000. That way, they can use Card of the Soul in order to search out their boss monster, since its attack and defense equals 5,000 exactly. So actually, a pretty useful search card in Duel Links, but almost not at all useful in normal Yu-Gi-Oh!, which is why it makes this list, if at a low spot. And at number 8, we have Gather Your Mind. This is a spell card whose only effect is to search out another copy of it from your deck. And also, it has a hard once per turn on this effect, so you can't use the next copy of Gather Your Mind to search out the last copy immediately. And then once you have the last copy of Gather Your Mind, you can't actually use it. It's just a dead card in your hand unless you return the other copies of Gather Your Mind from your graveyard to your deck. So, the intended strategy of this card is to use it in decks which gain benefits whenever you activate spell cards, or to very slowly thin your deck, like a lesser version of Upstart Goblin. So think decks like spell counter decks, where a lot of those cards will gain spell counters every time you activate a spell card. Or even Sky Strikers, where they gain extra effects as soon as they have three spell cards in the graveyard. However, there are a couple of cards which do what Gather Your Mind is trying to do, but better. There's this card called Tune Table of Contents, which allows you to search out other copies of itself from the deck and doesn't have a once per turn on it. 
So a single Toon Table of Contents can search out the other two copies of it from the deck and allow you to activate all three spell cards in one turn. There is also Spell Power Grasp, which allows you to add a spell counter to a card on the field and then add another copy of that card from your deck to your hand. So Spell Power Grasp is a straight up power crept version of Gather Your Mind, since it's better at adding spell counters to cards and also allows you to use the third copy once it's in your hand. So it's not a dead card just sitting there waiting to be discarded for some kind of card cost. And then they released a power crept version of Spell Power Grasp with Spell Power Mastery, which allows you to add even more spell counters on the field while searching more targets. Gather Your Mind is just beaten out by a random tune card, which wasn't even trying to accomplish the goals of Gather Your Mind, and also beaten out by two other spell power generators. So it's kind of useless to an extent. Although it is easy to use, it does get spell cards into the graveyard outside of spell counter decks, so that does make it better than a lot of the other cards on this list. And at number 7, we have Burfamet. This card simply has the effect that when it's normal summoned, you can add one Gazelle the King of Mythical Beasts from your deck to your hand. So, being able to search a card on a summon is good. Even if the card it searches out isn't very good, but this card is level 5 and only has 1400 attack. Which means if you normal summon this card under normal circumstances, you have to tribute summon it. And this card is kind of terrible for tribute summoning because it's so low on stats for being level 5. And the intended use of this card was to bring it out in order to search out its counterpart to be used as a fusion summon for Chimera the Flying Mythical Beast. As that card requires both Burfament and Gazelle as its two materials. And if it's destroyed, you get to special summon one of those monsters from your graveyard. So if Burfamet was simply level 4 or lower, it would be much better. Still not very good, but not terrible like it is now. It's almost a wonder why they thought its effect was going to be that strong, when it's pretty standard practice for cards to be able to search out anything from their archetype, let alone one low attack vanilla monster. However, Burfamet was introduced very early on in the game when effect monsters were still not very good, so it's kind of a product of its time. And at number 6, we have Sargasso Lighthouse. This quick play spell card has the effect to search out the field spell card, Sargasso the DD Battlefield, if it's sent to the graveyard while set on the field. Which means it can only search out its namesake as a floating effect if sent to the graveyard by destruction or one of your own card effects. Like maybe sending it there in order to activate the effect of card breaker to special summon itself. Or that would have been a good use of the card if that wouldn't have caused it to miss timing as its floating effect is an optional win effect. So, it has to be sent to the graveyard in a very specific way in order to get that search off. However, it does have two other effects. Its search effect is only attached to its floating effect, so I guess that's not supposed to be the main use of the card anyway. As its actual activatable effect allows you to chain it in response to a spell effect that would inflict damage to you, in which case you take no damage from that effect, and then it has an effect in the graveyard, where you just passively are immune to the damage of the field spell card, Sargasso the DD Battlefield. Now, what Sargasso the DD Battlefield does, is each time a player performs an XC summon, they take 500 damage. And also, during each player's end phase, they take 500 damage if they control a face-up XC's monster. So, the intended use of the quick play is to chain it in response to the field spell card, causing you to take damage, and then to avoid its negative effects while it's in the graveyard. Here's the thing about the field spell card though, it's not very good. The card is supposed to be an anti xyz card, and not a lot of decks go into a lot of XC summon outside of Zodiac. And even against decks like Zodiac, you'd be better off running Extranet or Mystic Mine if you really wanted to counter them. Dealing 500 burn damage per summon is not that big of a deal, outside of a very specific type of burn deck. So basically, Sargasso Lighthouse is a support card to a field spell card, it's just the field spell card it supports isn't very good, and it's not very good at searching it out anyway, which is kind of funny. And at number 5, we have Worm Prince. This is a level 6 monster, which has the effect that if it destroys an opponent's monster by battle, you can add a worm monster from your deck to your hand. So, pretty standard search by destroying something effect, even if it kind of is hard to bring out at level 6. Plus, most likely we'll have to tribute summon it just like Burfamet. Although, at least Burfamet searches out on its summon and doesn't require you to destroy something by battle. Although, if that's where the effect stopped, it probably wouldn't have made this list. It would just be kind of a mediocre card. But it also goes on to have a maintenance cost. Where, if you do not control at least one other reptile-type worm monster, 
this card destroys itself during the end phase. This card isn't really good enough where it warrants a maintenance cost, so it's kind of funny that it has one, because it's not really a common thing amongst other worm cards. Most of the other high level worms don't have this kind of maintenance cost. They sometimes gain other effects if there's other worm monsters out, but they don't have negative effects requiring them to be out. It's also one level too low to be cheated out of the deck with the only good piece of worm support, W Nebula Meteorite, as that card allows you to reset the effects of your worms, draw cards for each one you're able to flip face down, and then special summon a level 7 or higher light reptile type monster from your deck. So it's not like it has a maintenance cost because it could be cheated out of the deck easily, it's really kind of random, and it has kind of a mediocre search option on top of it but at least it has average attack for its level, so you could expect it to beat over a weak monster and actually activate the effect if you use this card for some reason. And at number 4, we have Shock Troops of the Ice Barrier. This is a level 3 Ice Barrier monster which has the effect where you can tribute this card on the field in order to select a face-up water monster in the field and destroy it. Then you get to add one Ice Barrier monster from your deck to your hand. So at first glance, this effect actually seems pretty good. It allows you to destroy a card and add a monster to your hand. That's a plus one in card advantage. However, it only works specifically on water attribute monsters. So if your opponent isn't playing any water monsters, your only target for this card is to destroy another one of your own ice barriers. In which case, you're trading two cards to add one to your hand, which is a negative one in card advantage. And water is not a popular attribute. It's not the least popular, but you can't reasonably expect to pull off this card against any deck you go against. You have to specifically know you're playing against a water deck beforehand for this card to be useful. Or play something like DNA Transplant in order to change all monsters in the field to the water attribute. I think its intended use is to be comboed with Royal Knight of the Ice Barrier, which is a card that special summons a water token to your opponent's side of the field when it's tribute summoned, which would give you a target to destroy with shock troops. However, Royal Knight of the Ice Barrier is also one of the worst Ice Barrier monsters. So that's not a very good combo to do. It's kind of just an awkward effect to have that will most likely be used on your own monsters to just activate its search. And since it's so cumbersome to use, it definitely has to make this list. And at number 3, we have Symbol of Friendship. If you're able to activate this card, it essentially allows you to search out any card from your deck, which is pretty good. Although the activation requirements on it is that you can only activate this card if you drew it for your normal draw phase, and the game state is in a way where your opponent controls three or more monsters and you control no cards in the field. In which case, you get to reveal this card in your hand, then you get to activate it during your main phase one in order to add any one card from your deck to your hand. So, if you have the card in your hand during your first turn, it's a dead card and can't be used. If you draw it in a future turn and the game state is not in a way where it can be activated, it becomes a dead card in your hand and can't be activated. Although, there are ways to just top deck this card in order to forcefully activate the effect during your next turn, using something like Plague Spreader Zombie to put it from your hand back to the top of your deck. So it's not the end of the world if it's dead in your hand, but it is a problem that the card is so easy to become dead in your hand. And its activation requirements require you to kind of set it up yourself, and then you still have to wait a turn in order to use it, at a very disadvantageous game state. Although, being able to search out any card from your deck could quite possibly help you out of that situation, and if you're incredibly lucky and just happen to draw this card normally when you're behind in the game, it could help you search out whatever card you need in order to turn the duel around. I'm sure that was the intended use of this card, to kind of just be a homage to the anime where the characters very frequently draw the exact card they need in order to turn the duel around when they're in a disadvantageous game state, which this card does do a good job of replicating. It's just not very useful in any other situation. And at number two, we have Single Purchase. This card can allow you to add any one monster from your deck to your hand, but you have to banish your entire hand in order to use this card, and your hand needs to have three or more cards in it, and none of those cards can be monsters. So essentially, you need to go minus three in order to perform the search, and then it locks you out of summoning for the rest of the turn, except the monster you searched out. So at least it lets you use the monster right away, but not much else. Now, the reason this card is bad is because it requires you to go minus three for its effect, and specifically banish spell and trap cards, which historically don't really have floating effects when they're banished, so it's overly balanced for the search effect, which puts it in the bad territory, and just requires too many resources for what it's trying to accomplish. Although sometimes decks do really want one specific card and will pay those resources to get it, 
Just take a look at Left Arm Offering. It requires you to banish at least two cards from your hand in order to search out one spell card from the deck. And that card did see heavy use. But at least the card doesn't specify which kinds of cards you need to have in your hand, and is only two of them instead of three. Plus, searching out a spell card is more valuable than searching out monster cards anyway. That's what makes Left Arm Offering good, and single purchase kinda bad. And at number one, we have Dark Sage. This card has the effect to add any one spell card from your deck to your hand, which is pretty good. And its condition for this effect is to simply special summon it. And it could even special summon itself from the deck if its conditions are met. However, the bad thing about this card is the conditions for its summon, where you need to have two specific monsters on your side of the field, Dark Magician and Time Wizard, and you need to activate the effect of Time Wizard and call its coin toss correctly. Where Time Wizard has the effect, where you flip a coin and then call heads or tails. If you call it correctly, you get to destroy all of your opponent's monsters. If you call it incorrectly, you destroy all of your own monsters instead, and then take damage equal to their attack. So basically, you have a 50-50 chance of resolving this card, and getting Dark Magician and Time Wizard on the field is not that difficult. They both have mountains of support that allow them to come out easier. It's entirely in the fact that it's reliant on a coin toss, because that coin toss essentially makes it so it's possible that you can just never summon Dark Sage, even if you have the condition set up, if you're just unlucky. At least for all the other cards in this list, if you're able to set up the conditions for their effects, you at least get to perform their effects. But Dark Sage can just never come out if you're unlucky, no matter how many times you set up the conditions for its summon, because you always have to call a coin toss correctly in order to bring the card out. There are ways to give you more chances at calling the coin toss correctly, there's another card called Second Coin Toss, which allows you to reflip a coin if you don't like the result. Although this card is a hard once per turn, and adds one more piece that you need to get out on the board, making the combo even more complicated to pull off. And even then, that will only increase your chances to pulling off the effect to 75%. It won't guarantee that you get the coin toss correct. So, since the effect can just not work, I put Dark Sage at the top of the list. But if you're generally a pretty lucky person, and always call coin tosses correctly, then it's probably not worse than something like Single Purchase or Symbol of Friendship. Terrors of the Underroot allows you to banish up to 5 cards from your opponent's graveyard. However, it can only do so if your opponent has an equal amount of already banished cards to put back into the graveyard. So it basically swaps the spots of up to 5 banished cards for up to 5 cards in the graveyard. Now, what's wrong with this card is two things. One, requiring your opponent to already have banished cards makes this graveyard disruption very circumstantial, in that you have to rely on them banishing their cards for you first, or you have to banish their cards on your own in some way to first set it up. And second, returning cards to the graveyard activates graveyard effects, and a lot of cards banish for cost, so you might just be giving them their graveyard effects back to use again. So it's both too hard to use, and not very good against the decks that it's trying to counter. Spell Speed 4 is a fan term for card effects that don't allow other cards to be responded to them. So in this video, we'll be going over 10 of the worst cards that have an effect similar to this. And at number 10, we have Spiritualism. This is a normal spell card, which simply has the effect, where you can return one of your opponent's spell or trap cards to their hand. And it goes on to have the additional effect, where this card's activation and effect cannot be negated. Now, this one isn't Spell Speed 4 like most of the other cards in this list, since your opponent can respond to it, they just can't respond to this card. So, it kind of counts for this list, but it's not a true Spell Speed 4 effect like Super Polymerization or XYZ Encore. Now, despite Spiritualism's low power level, it is technically a useful effect. If you want to start your combo plays and your opponent only has a lone face down spell or trap card, this can allow you to very easily return that card to their hand so they can't disrupt your plays. Although, they can activate the card in response to this effect, like if they have a face down Raigeki Break, for example, or if they don't activate the card, they can just use it again their next turn, since it doesn't actually destroy it. In Yu Gi Oh! Duel Links, this card is a pretty popular option for free to play decks, because it's one of the few spell and trap card removals that is available to free to play players, and works every time, unlike something like Dice Foon, which is another free to play potential spell or trap card removal. It's not a great spell or trap card removal, but seeing as Duel Links only has three spell and trap card zones, there is a chance you'll be able to remove the only card your opponent might have that stops your plays, or to get rid of a battle trap so you can enter the battle phase and then win that turn. So the fact that it doesn't destroy the card doesn't matter very much in those situations where you're going to win that turn anyway. And at number 9, we have Nordic Relic Levitin. 
This is a trap card which can only be activated when a monster destroys another monster by battle. You can then target one of those monsters and destroy it. And also, cards and effects cannot be activated in response to this card's activation. Which means your opponent can't try to stop the destruction with some form of negation. So it's actually a pretty effective way to destroy a monster through a field of negations. The problem with the card, though, is entirely in its activation requirement. It only works on a monster who destroys another card by battle during the turn. Which means, best case scenario, you set this card during your turn, wait for one of your opponent's monsters that you want to destroy with this card, to destroy one of your monsters, then you can activate this card afterwards. So it doesn't allow you to destroy things in order to save your cards, it's only retaliatory in nature, which generally doesn't help advance the game state very much. So, it's a neat effect, but it's a little bit too cumbersome to use for any kind of actual competitive play. And at number 8, we have Fairy Knight in Gunnar. This is a rank 6 Xyz monster that requires 3 level 6 monsters for its materials, and then has the effect where, once per turn, you can detach 2 of its materials in order to return all other cards on the field to the hand. And also, your opponent cannot activate any cards or effects in response to this effect. So if you're able to bring out Fairy Knight in Gunnar, and your opponent doesn't negate its effects before it's able to activate its Detach 2 effect, then it's basically a guaranteed board wipe. So the effect is actually really good, and the spell speed forward nature of it makes it even better. So, here's the problem with the card. It's too hard to bring out. Xyz monsters that require more than two materials generally don't see play, unless they have an alternative way to bring the card out to rank it up on top of another card that only requires two materials. And usually the cards that require more than two Xyz materials that do see play saw play because they have an entire deck built around them, or just have straight up broken effects, like number 16 Shockmaster, or number 86 Heroic Champion Rongo Miniad. And level 6 monsters are even harder to work with than level 4s. Basically anything above rank 4s are not going to see play if they require more than 2 materials, especially not a popular level like level 6. Unless they release a whole bunch of really good level 6 support in the future like they did for level 9s. But if you're playing a deck that spams out a lot of level 6, like maybe in Duel Links and you're using a Hazy Flame Beast deck, then this could be an option. It's not bad, it's just hard to summon, and probably wouldn't win you the game even if you did resolve its effect because it requires so much effort to bring out and has kind of low stats for a rank 6 monster. And at number 7, we have Dark Magic Expanded. This is a quick play spell card which has 3 effects that it gains based on the number of Dark Magician and Dark Magician Girl monsters on the field or in the graveyards. If you have one, you can target a Dark Spellcaster monster on the field and give it 1000 attack until the end of the turn. If you have two or more, all of your spell and trap cards gain spell speed for protection, and also your spell and trap cards cannot be destroyed by your opponent's card effects. And lastly, if you have three or more, your dark spellcaster monsters become unaffected by your opponent's card effects until the end of the turn. So if you have three or more cards, you gain all three of the effects, as they do stack on top of each other. And the card basically just gives you a whole bunch of protection to your spell and traps, plus your dark spellcaster monsters, in addition to a single 1000 attack boost. And all of that is fine and everything, it's just a little bit underpowered for the TCG. This card came out in 2016, and in 2015 we had things like Full Power Pepe, so its power level was a little bit behind the times. It is really nice protection, but it's protection for Dark Magician monsters, which doesn't really matter. In fact, this kind of protection doesn't matter very much in a majority of archetypes, you know, if it comes from a conditional quick play spell card. Especially not one revolving around a normal monster with 2500 attack. But in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links, it's perfectly appropriate, and there's nothing Duel Links likes more than releasing a whole bunch of Dark Magician and Blue Eyes White Dragon support. So I'm sure Duel Links players have seen a lot of Dark Magic expanded play, but it's not something that really appears in competitive Dark Magician decks in the TCG, when those kinds of decks rarely see competitive play at all. It offers some decent protection, but it doesn't do enough in addition to that protection. And at number 6, we have the Winged Dragon of Ra, Immortal Phoenix. This card can only special summon itself from the graveyard if the Winged Dragon of Ra is sent from the field to the graveyard, and this card's special summon has spell speed for protection, where your opponent cannot respond to it in any way. The card itself is also immune to all card effects while it's on the field. It allows you to pay a thousand life points as in a monster to the graveyard, and has an effect where it sends itself to the graveyard during the end phase, 
In order to special summon the Winged Dragon Raw Sphere mode from your hand deck or graveyard, ignoring its summoning conditions. So, if you manage to bring this card out, it only stays on the field for one turn. And the reason this card is on the list is because it's too cumbersome to bring out. Kind of like Fairy Knight in Gunnar. In order to bring this card out, you need to get it in the graveyard first. Which means you have to use something like Foolish Burial or Beatrice Lady of the Eternal in order to send it directly from your deck to the graveyard. Or find some way to search it out and then send it to the graveyard from your hand. If the card could special summon itself from the deck, or was that at least a little bit more convenient and allowed you to use it from your hand in addition to the graveyard, that would definitely help. While it's on the field, it's actually pretty great. It has a baseline 4000 attack while being immune to card effects, and you can spam its effect to send monsters your opponent controls to the graveyard, just as long as you have life points to pay. And this effect doesn't target and doesn't destroy, so it's excellent removal. But it only stays around for one turn, and since it's unaffected by other card effects, you can't actually stop the effect from happening. Plus, getting the Winged Dragon of Raw on the field in the first place is not easy either. Even with its new support that's made bringing it out a lot faster. So again, decent card effect, but too hard to bring out, and that generally kills the viability of most cards like this. There are tons of cards in the game that technically have good effects, but don't see play because they're too hard to use. And at number 5, we have Lucius, the Shadow Vassal. This is a level 1 monster which can special summon itself from your hand by banishing one level 5 or higher monster from your graveyard. And if you bring it out with this effect, you cannot special summon monsters from your extra deck for the rest of the turn. And also, if this card is tributed for a tribute summon, you can look at all set cards your opponent controls. And your opponent cannot activate any card effects in response to this effect. Now, let's look at its summoning condition. On surface level, this actually seems like a pretty decent card. You get to special summon a monster from your hand pretty easily in a Monarch deck, which plays nothing but high level monsters. The problem being, generally the Vassal Monarchs are used in order to get the Monarchs on the field in the first place. So they're not going to have a readily available level 5 or higher monster in the graveyard to start off the plays. And since this is a starter card, that's kind of a big deal. If you draw this card later on the duel, you're probably going to be able to summon it, but that's not the point of this card. And if you try to use this outside of Monarch decks, it will just lock you out of your extra deck, which makes it almost completely worthless because there's lots of other cards that can special summon themselves from the hand without requiring you to remove very specific resources from your graveyard or locking you out of your extra deck in the process. And if you do tribute this card for its spell speed 4 effect, the effect isn't even good. Just being able to look at your opponent's set cards without doing anything to them isn't really worth trying to spend any kind of resources to gain that effect. Granted, you don't really have to spend resources to gain the effect, since you're just tributing the card whose main purpose is to be tribute fodder for monarchs anyway. But there are some good vassal monarchs that you could use besides this one, like Eidos, the Underworld Squire, or Edia, the Heavenly Squire, the two vassals that saw the most amount of play in monarch decks, mainly because both of them were actually good starter cards, didn't require you to remove resources to use them, and instead actually generated resources or extra effects that were useful like giving you an extra tribute summon for the turn, special summoning another vassal from the graveyard, or special summoning a vassal from the deck on their summon. Lucius is almost hilariously bad in comparison to the squire vassals, which is probably why the squires were almost exclusively used instead of any of the actual vassals themselves, besides maybe Landrope the rock vassal. And at number 4, we have Reverse Breaker. This is an equipped spell card that can only be equipped to a Utopia monster. And then in order to activate the effect of the card, you need the equipped monster to declare an attack. Where you can then target one spell or trap card your opponent controls and destroy it. And your opponent cannot activate spell or trap cards in response to this effect. So it's kind of like Nightbeam, allowing you to destroy one spell or trap card with some form of spells before protection. As it doesn't prevent monsters from responding to the effect. Just spell and trap cards. And while technically being able to destroy one spell or trap card is pretty good, especially every time you declare an attack, on a card that can potentially gain multiple attacks, the problem with the card is the fact that it doesn't do anything immediately, it needs to be equipped to a very specific type of monster, and its effect doesn't really become good until you've used it multiple times. In order for Reverse Breaker to be better than something like an MST, you would need to have a Utopia declare at least two attacks, which could happen during the course of a duel if you're trying to create a gigantic Utopia full of a whole bunch of effects that don't allow it to be destroyed by anything like the whole purpose of ZW decks. But at that point, you're better off just playing good Spell or Trap card removal. There's not really a reason to play this card over things like Harpy's Feather Duster, Twin Twister, or even Galaxy Cyclone, as all of those cards can gain more advantage easier 
without having the vulnerability of being an equipped card and requiring you to declare attacks. Equipped cards are extra vulnerable because they're so easy to remove as they're destroyed if the monster they're equipped to is destroyed or if your opponent destroys it with spell or trap card removal or if the monster on the field is removed temporarily or just flipped face down. So equip spell cards need to be really good in order to see competitive play or generate immediate advantage. And Reverse Breaker just isn't quite good enough and it's just a little bit underpowered. And at number three, we have Mila, the Temporal Magician. This is a level four monster which simply has the effect that when this card is normal summoned, you can look at one set card your opponent controls and your opponent cannot activate any spell or traps in response to this effect. So kind of like Lucius the Shadow Vassal, all it does is allow you to gain information without doing anything with that information. Part of the reasons cards like a Pointer of the Red Lotus is good is because it allows you to gain information on your opponent's hand and temporarily interact with it. Gaining information on your opponent's set cards is not as good as gaining information on your opponent's hand. And if effects don't do anything in addition to gain information, then there's not really a point in playing them. At least Lucius can special summon itself from the hand. Temporal Magician takes up your normal summon. If you really need a light spellcaster type monster with 1800 attack, you probably don't want to play this card even in those situations because it doesn't really do anything. And at number two, we have Insector Crossbow, Zakataro. This is an equipped spell card which can only be equipped to an Insector monster, where it then gives the monster 500 attack, and the effect where the equipped monster gains spell speed for protection to all of their activated effects. So, if you equip this card to something like Insector Dragonfly, your opponent won't be able to respond to any of its activated effects. Now, the problem with Insector Crossbow is kind of the same problem as Reverse Breaker. It's an equipped spell card that doesn't really do anything immediately, and a 500 attack boost is hilariously low, especially for Insectors who all have very low attack point values anyway. There's another Insector equipped card called Insector Gigamantis, which will change the original attack of the monsters equipped to to 2400. It is a monster that allows you to equip it to an Insector monster from your hand, and if this card is sent to the graveyard while equipped, you can special summon an Insector monster from your graveyard. And the Insector Gigamantis is really good in Insector decks, because Insectors actually love equipped spell cards, or monsters that can equip themselves to them, and their whole Arctar basically revolves around these effects. But they highly value cards that do something else besides just being an equipped card. Especially cards which can remove themselves from being an equipped card, like Insector Hornet or Insector Ladybug, or gain advantage after being an equipped card like Insector Gigamantis or Insector Sword Zectalibur. Insector Crossbow does none of these things. It just provides a minor attack boost and spell speed for protection, which doesn't really help their plays along. Even if you want to use the card for its intended effect of maybe equipping it to an Insector Dragonfly so your opponent can't negate its effects, your opponent can just negate the effects of the equipped spell card or just destroy it with any form of spell speed to disruption, as destroying the equipped monster or this card will put a stop to that pretty fast since it has the vulnerabilities of equipped spell cards. And at number one, we have Odin's Eye. This is a continuous trap card which has an effect that can only be used during a player standby phase, where you can target one of your Aesir monsters in order to negate its effects until the end of the turn. And if you do this, you get to look at all cards in your opponent's hand and set on their side of the field, with spell speed for protection. So your opponent can't activate cards and effects in response to this activated effect. So, first off, the effect is not good. Only gaining knowledge in your opponent's hand without being able to interact with it isn't that big of a deal. Even if it is technically better to gain information on your opponent's hand than cards on their side of the field. So if this effect was attached to Lucius the Shadow Vassal, that would make the card a little bit better, but not good enough to see play. However, the bigger problem with this card, besides the fact that the effect is not very good, is that there are only three Aesir monsters in the game, and all three of them are hard to bring out level 10 Syngro monsters, who either have effects that activate during your opponent's turn, or have some kind of floating effect that they don't want to be turned off. So the conditions to activate Odin's Eye are actually kind of a detriment to those three monsters, and too hard to activate, while also not really being a good effect for all the effort you have to go through in order to use it. But at least it's spell speed 4, which means almost nothing because you can only use this card during the standby phase anyway, and your opponent would probably be better off allowing you to resolve the effect because it leaves them in a better game state, which is why this card takes the number one spot on this list. Mimesis Elephant is a trap monster with a quick effect that allows it to change a monster's type and attribute until the end of the turn. Now, this effect is actually useful in FTK decks as the Link Monster Reprodocus has a similar effect. 
However, the big difference is that Reapodocus is a very generic link too, which doesn't need to be searched out for the effect. And Bemess's Elephant is not only a main deck card that needs to be searched, it's also a trap card that you have to wait a turn to use. So its ability to be an FTK enabler is almost zero, and its effect is not powerful enough to be useful outside of that purpose. In this video, we'll go over the worst synchro monsters in the game, which honestly are not half bad, so the worst of the worst will only be kind of mediocre. And at number 10, we have Mecha Phantom Beast Concorida. This is a level 7 synchro monster with generic materials, which has the effect, where while it's on the field, your tokens cannot be destroyed by a battle or card effects. Now, since this card is part of the Mecha Phantom Beast archetype, it will have tokens to protect, and the entire archetype kind of revolves around bringing out tokens, which will activate the shared effect amongst all Mecha Phantom Beast monsters, where they cannot be destroyed by battle or card effects as long as there's a token on the field. So, the synergy with this card is pretty obvious within its archetype. It's able to protect the tokens, which in turn, protect the other Mecha Phantom Beast monsters. Except this card. I think this is the only Mecha Phantom Beast monster in the game who isn't protected when there's a token on the field, as all it does is grant your tokens protection. But it itself receives none of that, so it becomes a sitting deck for your opponent to get rid of if they want to get rid of everything else you control. And I think that was kind of the intended drawback of this card, which just meant no one ever played it because its stats were kind of low for a level 7 synchro. It didn't really interact with the rest of the archetype in interesting ways, besides protecting the tokens, which you don't really care about protecting, and it also has a floating effect, which kinda goes against the whole niche of the card in the first place. Where if this card in the field is destroyed by your opponent, you contribute all tokens you control in order to special summon one level 4 or lower mecha phantom beast monster from your graveyard. So, a card whose sole focus is protecting your tokens has a mediocre floating effect which requires you to get rid of all of them in order to special summon a weaker monster than itself. Like, if this card only required you to tribute one token to bring out a monster from the graveyard with its floating effect, it still wouldn't be very good. If it allowed you to tribute all of your tokens to bring itself back from the graveyard, it still wouldn't be very good. The fact that it requires you to tribute all of your tokens to only bring out a weaker monster kinda makes it a garbage floating effect. On top of a mediocre main effect with low stats, which is why this card is definitely the best of all of the monsters that will appear on this list. And at number 9, we have Light and Dragon. This is a level 8 synchro monster which requires a light monster as one of its non-tuner materials, which automatically makes it a lot harder to use and would definitely contribute to its lesser played status. Although it also kind of has low stats for a level 8 monster at only 2600, and its effect is only a battle related one, where if this card battles another monster, you can have this card lose 500 attack and defense permanently, so that the monster it's battling loses 1500 attack and defense until the end phase. So since this card always loses attack when using its effect, the difference in attack has to be around 1000 if it's trying to beat over something with its effect. So it can realistically beat over anything with 3500 or less attack, which, hey, isn't half bad the first time you use it. But then after that, its attack goes down to 2100, where the threshold is lowered. Although the effect does work if it's attacked as well, so it can stay around for a little bit before being taken out by battle, even if it is constantly losing attack. However, at the same time this card was released, Dark End Dragon also came out, which has the same requirements and stats as Light End Dragon, except dark monsters instead of a light monster, and its effect is, once per turn, you can send one of your opponent's monsters to the graveyard, and then this card loses 500 attack and defense. Now, Dark End Dragon is way better, and saw play here and there on all kinds of different kinds of decks that could bring it out, because it was an extra deck monster, which had non-destruction removal of any monster, which could be used once per turn, with the only downside of losing 500 attack. It's basically the same thing, Light End Dragon allows you to attack over monsters, Dark End Dragon allows you to get rid of monsters, but the ability to non-destruction remove your opponent's monsters is much better than being able to attack over them if they have less than 3500 attack. And the level 8 synchro range is kinda stacked with some of the best monsters in the game. There's really no reason to play Light End Dragon over the many better generic level 8 monsters that don't require specific materials, which is kind of the only reason this card makes this list. Its effect isn't half bad, you can kind of expect to beat over at least one monster if it hits the field, but other better monsters are able to do way more than that while also beating over monsters without losing attack points. And at number 8, we have Thunder Unicorn. 
Now, this card isn't half bad, but kind of has a bad rap as one of the worst synchro monsters in the game, as what it does is it has a very restrictive tuner material, where it requires a beast type tuner as one of its materials, which generally makes synchro monsters see less play, especially when it's such an unpopular type like that. And then for the effect, you can decrease the attack of one of your opponent's monsters by 500 for each monster you control but then only Thunder Unicorn can attack that turn. Now, this effect isn't very good on its own. Generally, attack reducing effects don't see very much play, since it's much better to just destroy monsters rather than reduce their attack by a conditional amount. Although, this card is kind of meant to be a combo piece that works alongside Key Mouse, Lock Cat, and Chain Dog, as all of these cards roughly came out at around the same time, as Beast Tuner Synchro Pieces, so, they created a couple of synchro monsters specifically made for beast-type monsters, as there's also Voltic Bicorn and Lightning Tricorn, which have similar synchro materials that require beast monsters. And Thunder Unicorn was just the level 5 version of it, and it was made to be played in a deck with a whole bunch of low attack beasts that presumably could swarm the field easy. So, giving up those weaker monsters' attacks for this one card to be able to beat over one of your opponent's stronger monsters by lowering their attack by a large amount was the intended combo with this card. However, it was just a little underpowered for what it did, and really did not need to restrict your other monsters from attacking that turn. But it does also have decent attack for a level 5 synchro monster, as it matches another popular level 5 synchro monster, Ally of Justice Cataster, with 2200 attack. And there was cards like Mind Mole, which granted bonuses if it was used as a synchro material for a beast type monster, so it was meant to be a run-of-the-mill beast support card, which had a situational effect that could be useful, but if you didn't use it, it still had decent stats for its level, and could act as a legitimate beat stick. Although, here's one little problem with Thunder Unicorn, and that's Nature of Beast, which is just a straight-up better card, which is also a level 5 synchro, and has the exact same stats, and can be brought out with all of the cards that were created to bring out Thunder Unicorn as it just requires Earth Monsters as its materials. And Natura Beast is really good, and sees play even to this day. And Natura Beast came out about a year before Thunder Unicorn. So Thunder Unicorn came out of the gate power crept already, which is already why it gets such a bad rap. Although you do have to remember, Synchro Monsters were the first iteration of Extra Deck Toolbox. So having the option to go into Thunder Unicorn if you need to beat over a strong monster was still brand new to the game at the time which is why it probably has overly restrictive conditions to its effect. And at number 7, we have Fabled Leviathan. This is a level 10 synchro monster, which requires at least one Fabled Tuner as its materials, and then has the effect where, if this card on the field is destroyed and sent to the graveyard, you can add up to three Fabled monsters from your graveyard to your hand. Now, this effect sounds amazing. That's an excellent floating effect on a 3k beat stick. You basically get to go plus 2 off of its destruction. However, there is one little problem with its effect, and that's that it can miss timing, since it's a when optional effect. Although that's only part of the problem. You see, this is meant to be the end combo piece to the Fabled archetype, something you build up towards, and all you get out of that is a beat stick, which might replace itself with synchro materials it was used if it's destroyed, since it doesn't do anything else on the field except have high attack points. Now, the Fabled archetype can get this out decently quickly, they are a synchro focus archetype which specializes in gaining effects if they're discarded from their hand, and are much easier to activate than Dark Worlds, since they can be activated no matter how they're discarded, rather than Dark Worlds which require them to be discarded by a card effect, and will forever confuse new players to the game who don't understand why Lightning Vortex doesn't allow you to activate a Dark World monster effect. But here's the thing with the Fabled. Pretty much all of their other synchro monsters are much better at comboing with their archetype in more interesting ways. Their best synchro monster is their level 5 one, Fabled Dragon, which can let you draw two cards when it's synchro summoned, which is kind of super strong. Their level 8 monster directly contributes to the Fabled combos, where you can discard one of them to gain its effects in order to draw another card. The Fabled Unicorn is one of the few monsters in the game that can negate spell speed 4 effects, and was even retrained into Necroz of Unicorn, which is arguably the best Necroz monster. And then you have the Fabled Leviathan, which has a floating effect that can miss timing and only has 100 more attack than their level 8 synchro monster. In comparison, it's not as good. It's a little bit too high level for what it does, because the good fables are all kind of low level monsters, so you'd have to use quite a bit of resources in order to bring this card out. And the best this card can do is give you those resources back if it's destroyed in a way that doesn't cause its effect to miss timing. 
So it's really just not worth it over better generic synchro monsters, especially when they have three other better synchro monsters to use from their archetype already. And at number 6, we have Vortex the Whirlwind. This is a level 5 synchro monster which requires a winged beast monster as one of its non-tuner materials, and then has the effect where, if this card is destroyed by battle, you get to special summon a level 4 lower winged beast monster from your deck. Now, what's funny about this card is that not only is it hard to bring out since it has restrictive materials, its effect is pretty much equivalent to a level 4 main deck monster which wouldn't be very good as a combo piece. And generally, these kinds of effects are not very good if it's the only effect the card has. Like, if it had the ability to special summon from the deck on top of something else, it probably wouldn't be half bad. But since that's the only effect this card has, that kind of makes it mediocre, since generally effects like these that are on a monster with no other effects are usually relegated to low level main deck monster status and not something you build into from the extra deck. It also has less attack than Thunder Unicorn, which means it's kind of worse than that card, and its effect can miss timing funny enough, as it's an optional when effect, which only activates when it's destroyed by battle. At least Fabled Leviathan activates if it's destroyed by card effects as well, so Vortex Whirlwind is kind of an awkward card that has low stats for its level, is restrictive to bring out for no reason, and has an effect that really should be added on top of something else, and not the sole effect that this one card has. And at number 5, we have Jurak Velfito. This is a level 5 dinosaur synchro monster which has restrictive materials, a theme you probably notice with the cards on this list, as it requires at least one dinosaur non-tuner monster as one of its materials. And this is a question mark for attack and defense monster, which makes it very hard to use with a whole bunch of support cards that require monsters to have original attacks in the graveyard and stuff like that. But whatever, it's a synchro monster, which isn't a big deal when it's on an extra deck monster, and the reason it has question mark attack is because its attack and defense are equal to the total original attack of the synchro materials used for its summon. Now, the archetype this card belongs to, the Jurax, have this card called Jurax Alio, which is a level 1 tuner with 200 defense and is fire type. So, it actually sees play because of its stats and leveling, and is the only level 1 dinosaur tuner monster in the game which also has a good effect, which allows it to tribute itself to special summon any level 4 lower Jurak monster from your graveyard. So if you manage to bring it out with Jurak Guaiba or Jurak Velo, or just Flamevel Fire Dog, you can trade it in for any other Jurak monster in your graveyard, which is pretty good. Now, the reason I bring up Jurak Alio is because this card would be the easiest way to bring out Jurak Felfito, as Jurak Guaiba can bring out Alio directly from the deck. And then during the main phase 2, you could just easily go into a level 5 synchro monster. However, you definitely would not use them to go into their archetype specific level 5 monster. Because none of the level 4 or lower Jurak monsters have more than 1700 attack. And Jurak Alio is the only level 1 dinosaur tuner in the game. Which means Jurak Felfito would have 1900 attack if it was brought out with its most optimal combo which is 300 less attack than Thunder Unicorn, and not very good. This would allow Jurak Felfito to be beaten over by slightly strong level 4 monsters, and the other Jurak tuners do not easily allow you to go into Jurak Felfito with a higher attack. If you wanted to go for the highest attack Jurak Felfito within its own archetype, you'd have to use Jurak Dino and Jurak Star Rico, two not very good Jurak monsters which give Jurak Felfito 2200 attack, matching the Thunder Unicorn. Which is to say, even mid-maxing this card's attack within its own archetype only makes it as strong as other level 5 synchros, which aren't even considered on the higher tier of attack. Now, the reason I keep talking about its attack effect is because its other one isn't very good either. It's literally the exact same effect as Sasuke Samurai, where if it attacks a face-down defense vision monster, you can destroy that card without flipping it face up. So, this card is kind of a mess, and Jurax never played it. Instead, they would just go into generic level 5 synchro monsters, as there's a lot of really good ones, like Cataster. Or they would just focus on bringing out other level 4 Jurax so they can go into Logia or Dalka, two of the best rank 4 monsters in the game that require dinosaur type monsters. Their archetype specific level 5 synchro was so bad they never used it, despite the fact that they could excel at bringing it out. And at number 4, we have Ally of Justice Light Gazer. This is a level 8 monster with 2400 attack, which is very low stats for a level 8 synchro monster, seeing as Light and Dragon had kind of low attack at 2600, and all it does is gain extra attack if your opponent has light monsters in the graveyard. 
but only 200 extra attack. It's not even a significant attack boost. Like Buster Blader, for example, is a level 8 main deck monster, which was released in one of the first sets of the game, and it gains 500 attack for each of your opponent's dragon-type monsters on the field or in their graveyard. And it was never considered good. Ally of Justice Light Gazer is a worse version of Buster Blader, which has lower base attack, gains less attack per monster, and only works on your opponent's graveyard and not the cards they control on their side of the field. It's basically a low attack vanilla monster, which can't even benefit from Tenyu support since it technically does have an effect. The only saving grace it has is being a generic level 8 monster, where it at least doesn't have restrictive materials. The Ally of Justice cards are all pretty bad, except randomly Ally of Justice Cataster, which was one of the best level 5 synchro monsters in the game for a long time, and is still too strong to be added to Duel Links. Like, the whole idea behind Ally of Justice cards was that they were really good against light attribute monsters, but they all just had terrible effects that related to that. Except for Cataster, who randomly had a really good effect that fit the niche perfectly, where it destroyed any monster it battles except dark monsters. If all the other Ally of Justice cards had similar effects to Cataster, they probably wouldn't be one of the worst archetypes in the game. And at number 3, we have Natura Leo Drake. This is a level 9 synchro monster with restrictive materials, where it requires one earth tuner plus one or more non-tuner earth monsters, and does not have an effect. Now, some benefits to this card. It does actually qualify for 10 e support, since it counts as a non-effect monster. Some cons to the card. It's too hard to bring out for how little it does. It requires only earth monsters as materials, and that's generally enough of a detriment for a card not to see play. Goyo Guardian, for example, was an excellent level 6 synchro monster which saw so much play it eventually got banned. Then they unlimited the card and then gave it an errata, where it required an earth tuner monster instead of any tuner monster, but still allowed you to use any other non-tuner materials. And this was restrictive enough for the card, which was previously basically an auto-include in any deck that can bring it out, to it no longer seeing any play at all. Natura Leo Drake is harder to bring out, definitely does not have a better effect, and only has 200 more attack than Goyo Guardian. Now, a little context for Leo Drake. Back when it first came out, the only generic level 9 synchro monsters required two or more non-tuner materials. There were no generic level 9 synchro monsters who didn't require at least three cards for their summon. So, Natura Leo Drake was unique in that it only required two monsters for its full material in the level 9 range but even in its time period it wasn't considered very good, and didn't really see play. Then a couple of years later, Gigantic Castle was released, which completely dwarfs nature of Leo Drake in every way. It's an actual generic level 9 synchro monster, it doesn't require two more non-tuner materials like Trishula, and it could have more attack than Leo Drake with only two materials, as it would gain 200 attack and go up to 3100. Basically, once Gigantic Castle was released, Leo Drake became the worst option to use even a deck that could possibly bring it out and might want to use it as a beat stick, which is why it definitely has to take a high spot on this list, even if it is technically a target for Fists of the Unrivaled Tenyi, in which case you still wouldn't want to bring it out of the extra deck if it could be cheated out with a trap card because Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon is a much better target, as it has 1500 more attack. So, if they ever create a card which allows you to cheat out a non-effect Synchro Monster specifically, then we might see the age of nature of Leo Drake. And at number 2, we have Ally of Justice Field Marshal. Another Ally of Justice monster, and also another level 9 monster, which really fits the theme of other level 9 monsters at the time, where it required one tuner plus two or more non-tuner materials, so you had to use at least three monsters to bring it out. And what this card accomplishes for its difficult summoning requirements, which you would have to bring out this card over other cards like Trishula or Mistworm, two other level 9 synchros with the exact same materials, is if this card destroys a face down defense position monster by battle, you get to draw one card. And also, this card cannot be special summoned in any other ways except a synchro summon. So, if it gets destroyed on the field, you can't monster reborn it later. Now, its effect is not very good. Granted, drawing cards is always great. Having the condition that it needs to destroy face down defense mission monsters is kind of restrictive though, and really incentivizes this card not actually making use of its high attack points, and attacking over your opponent's stronger monsters to get rid of them on the field. Since you would probably have to put in a non-insignificant amount of resources to bring this card out, 
since it also specifically has effects that restrict its ability to be cheated out easier. Now, whether this card is worse than Leo Drake is the real question here. Leo Drake is also difficult to bring out, but it at least benefits from Tenyu's support, which is why I thought I would bump it up the list to number 3, since it can be cheated out of the extra deck, and I put Field Marshal here at number 2. But really, arguments could be made for either of them being around at the same spot. The number 1 monster is also not that much worse than the top 4, so let's just go on to the number 1 spot. And at number 1, we have Geogenix. This is a level 6 Ingram monster with more restrictive materials than Goyo Guardian, where it requires specifically Gen X controller plus a non-tuner earth monster as its other material. And then its effect on the field is, once per turn you can swap the attack and defense of this card as long as you control a level 4 or lower Gen X monster, which only lasts until the end of the turn. Now, this card has really low attack for a level 6 Ingram monster at 1800. So being able to swap to its defense, which is 2800, is definitely a huge improvement. But here's the funny thing about this card. Like I said a little bit earlier, Goyo Guardian has the same exact attack as this card's beneficial effect of 2800, and is easier to bring out, and has a better effect than just giving itself more attack, where it can steal monsters it destroys by battle. And they basically require the same materials to be brought out. Earth monsters. Now, this card was obviously made for the Gen X archetype, but here's the thing. If you were to bring this card out only within the Gen X archetype, using Gen X Controller, which is a level 3 monster, the only level 3 Earth Gen X monster in the game is Gen X Gaia. And Gen X Gaia is not a combo piece. It's a below average card with an incredibly mediocre effect, where if it would be destroyed, you could destroy a Gen X Controller monster you control instead. This card has pretty low stats for its level and is definitely not worth protecting, and it's the only card which allows you to go into Geogenix within its archetype, and it definitely is the intended card for it to go into, as Geogenix basically just looks like an upgraded version of Genix Gaia. Although, if the card was made to be a synchro material with this, it really should have had some kind of effect to special summon itself, or something else in some way. That's how Synchro Archetypes work. They need to Special Summon or have some kind of combo piece that Special Summons. And Gen X Gaia is just a below average card which requires external support to bring it out easier. And then if you're able to bring it out within its own archetype, which isn't advisable, it's much easier to use better combo pieces like Gillosaurus or Junk Forward, Geogen X requires you to have other Gen X monsters on the field to even use its effect. So this card kind of meets all of the requirements of a bad Synchro monster. It has overly restrictive materials, has a mediocre effect, low stats, and has unnecessary requirements for keeping its mediocre effect. Which is why I definitely have to put this card at the number one spot on this list. At least Ally of Justice Field Marshal and Nature of Leo Drake have high attack stats on their own, without requiring a cumbersome effect to gain attack for one turn, which just gets reset when your opponent's turn starts anyway and they can easily beat over 1800 attack with any slightly strong level 4 monster. Emperor Tanuki's Critter Cord is a monster with the effect that if you perform a ritual summon, you can send one monster from Yesha to the graveyard as one of the materials. Now, while this is actually pretty good for ritual summons, the problem with this cards are twofold. One, this card needs to be phasable in the field to use the effect, and it's a hard once per turn. So you need to waste your normal summon on it, and then you can only benefit from it once anyway. And two, the second reason this card has some problems, most modern ritual decks find some new and unique way to avoid a normal ritual summon anyway, so they don't need Emperor Tanuki to help them. A tuner monster is a type of monster in Yu-Gi-Oh that's required in order to go into synchro monsters, where you simply add the levels of the tuner and non-tuner materials to equal whatever level of synchro monster you're trying to bring out. So, at number 10 on our worst of list of these kinds of monsters, we have Blackwing, Kochi the Daybreak. This is a level 4 Blackwing Tuner monster, which has the effect that if this card is special summoned, it cannot be used as a synchro material. So basically, it has low stats and only a negative effect, so it's a great card to start this list off on, because it actually saw more competitive play than every other card on this list. You see, this card came out in the early days of synchro summoning, and they used to be very against allowing level 4 tuner monsters to exist. Back then, the level 8 synchro monsters were some of the best synchro monsters you can go into with cards like Stardust Dragon being a staple boss monster in the early synchro format. And since the highest level of monster you can bring out without a tribute is 4, being able to get out 2 level 4 monsters to go into a level 8 synchro monster was thought of as a beneficial condition. 
So they just straight up would not make level 4 tuner monsters unless they had some kind of ridiculous downside to them. Like Trap Eater and its ability to only come out if you destroyed one of your opponent's face-up trap cards. So this is the framing for Daybreak and its purely negative effect. Because in its deck of Black Wings, they have cards that allow you to search this card out pretty easily with Black Wing Whirlwind. And there were other Black Wing monsters who could special summon themselves from the hand if you simply controlled a Black Wing monster. Like Black Wing Boar the Spear or Black Wing Gale the Whirlwind. So the intended use of Daybreak was to have it use up your normal summon, and then use one of the other Blackwing monsters that could special summon themselves from the hand in order to go into synchro plays. And it saw some competitive play because of that, and the fact that Blackwing saw a lot of competitive play at the time. Not all Blackwing decks used this card though. It was definitely not a staple, but it was the ever elusive level 4 tuner monster, which might be useful. Eventually, Konami stopped worrying about level 4 tuner monsters breaking the game, and now we have excellent cards like Raiden Hand of the Lightsworn, a level 4 tuner monster which is one of the best Lightsworn monsters, or Wind Witch Glass Bell, who can be brought out directly from the deck with its level 3 counterpart, and can even surge out another card when it's brought out. So, even though Daybreak is terrible by today's standard, it is an interesting look back at early synchro cards, and how strong they thought a level 4 tuner would be at the time. And at number 9, we have Flameveil Archer. This is a level 3 tuner monster with 1000 attack that has the effect where once per turn you contribute a pyrotype monster you control to give all your Flameveil monsters 800 extra attack until the end phase. And since this card can tribute itself, if you wanted to waste your normal summon bringing this card out, you could give a boost to all your other low attack Flameveil monsters, since they're not really known for having high attack point values. Basically, cards which only have the effect to grant attack on the field are kind of useless, because that doesn't really impact the field very much unless the ability does something else. Especially made even worse when you have one of the harshest costs associated to that attack boost, being the requirement of a tribute of a monster. And an 800 attack boost isn't even that good. This card might be more useful if you could use the effect from the hand, but it was kind of one of the worst combinations of effects and costs, for a pretty mediocre attack boost on the field. However, this card does have one good thing going for it. It's a fire attribute monster with 200 defense exactly, which means it's a target for rekindling. A spell card that allows you to special summon as many fire monsters with exactly 200 defense as possible from your graveyard, but they're banished during the end phase. And since Flameville Archer is a tuner, which is a benefit of the card, that made it a decent target for rekindling. And so Flameville Archer actually saw play in a couple of Lightsworn Flameville decks, purely because of its stats and tuner status, and at least doesn't have a negative effect, like Blackwing Kochi the Daybreak, so it could be used for synchro plays when it was immediately special summoned. So technically a bad card, but useful for rekindling, so only number 9 on this list. And at number 8 we have Gusto Falco. This is a level 2 tuner which has the effect that, when this card is sent from the field to the graveyard except by battle, you can special summon any gusto monster from your deck face down. So on surface level, this sounds pretty good. If it's sent to the graveyard from the field in basically any non-battle way, you get to replace it with another gusto from the deck, and special summoning monsters from your deck is really good. Especially since this card is a tuner monster and can be sent to the graveyard for a synchro summon to activate its effect. Here's the thing though. Trying to activate its effect in that way would cause the effect to miss timing. If you use this card for a synchro summon, the last thing that happens would be the summon of that monster, so you wouldn't be able to use its effect to special summon any gusto from your deck. Because for some reason, nearly the entire gusto archetype is full of when floating effects, instead of if. And when effects miss timing very easily. Unless that's the last thing that happens, it's going to miss the activation window. So if this card is destroyed in a chain, like if you activate an effect, and then your opponent chains a Regeki break to this card, it would cause it to miss timing because it would happen mid-chain, and wouldn't be the last thing that happened on the field. If you tried to destroy this card in a creative way in order to gain a benefit, you'd have to make sure those effects happen simultaneously, otherwise it would just miss timing. And there's very few cards that destroy and activate their effects simultaneously, like maybe Kira's The Light Monarch. If this card simply had an if effect rather than when, it wouldn't be on this list. But most of the other Gusto monsters also miss timing very easily, but at least they can activate their floating effects when destroyed by battle, like Gusto Guldo, another tuner Gusto monster which can miss timing, but it can at least activate its floating effect when it's destroyed by battle. And at number 7 we have Watt Beta. 
This is a level 2 Watt Tuner monster, which has the effect that if it inflicts battle damage by a direct attack, your opponent can discard one card of their choice from their hand. It only has 100 attack and can't attack directly under its own power, like a lot of the other Watt monsters, and can't special summon itself, so you have to expend resources to get this card on the field. There is a level 3 Watt monster, which is also bad, called Watt Barracks, which has a similar effects. If it inflicts battle damage by direct attack, you get to discard one random card from your opponent's hand. Although Watt Barracks allows you to discard a random card instead of one of their choice, which is why Watt Beta makes this list over all the other Bat Watt Tuner monsters. It's just a slightly worse. Also has incredibly low stats. Even if the effect to discard a card from your opponent's hand is technically good. This is kind of one of the worst ways to go about it. Unless you really want to combo this card with something like Watt Key to allow all your Watt monsters to attack directly that turn. And at number 6, we have Swartolf of the Nordic Alfar. This is a level 5 tuner monster, which means it requires a tribute summon to be brought out on the field, and most of the good level 5 or higher tuner monsters have some special way to bring them out, like Quick Draw Synchron and its ability to special summon itself from the hand. This one really doesn't have support for bringing itself out, but if you do tribute summon this card and bring it out with a normal summon, you get to add a Nordic monster from your graveyard to your hand. So, a plus one in advantage with recursion from the graveyard. Not half bad. If it wasn't for the fact that this is a completely useless effect tied to a high level tuner monster. Especially in the Nordic archetype, which is already kind of bad. Quite possibly one of the top 10 worst archetypes in the game. They did release some new support recently in the past couple of years to make them a little bit less bad. And they do have a new card like Alvis of the Nordic Alfar, which could possibly special summon it from the deck if banished by their Link monster. So it could have some use in bringing out its boss monster, Loki, Lord of the Ace here. But not because Swarthalf does anything good on its own. And at number 5, we have Blackwing, Mistral the Silver Shield. This is a level 2 Blackwing tuner, which has the effect that if this card on the field is destroyed and sent to the graveyard, the next battle damage you would take this turn becomes zero. Now, this is a pretty unique effect. I'm not sure there's another card in the game which specifically adds a lingering effect to the field, which will reduce the next battle damage you take. But it's not a very good effect either. Basically, if you bring this card out and it gets destroyed mid-combo, then nothing happens since the effect doesn't carry over to your next turn. Basically, the intended use of this is to be destroyed during your opponent's turn to stop some battle damage, but Black Wings aren't really about bringing out low-level tuners to act as walls, they're more combo-oriented. That is to say, the effect is kind of useless in its archetype, but technically a positive effect nonetheless. Just kind of a really weak one, not really befitting a tuner monster. Although even though this card doesn't have a straight-up negative effect like Black Wing Kochi the Daybreak, this should show you something about how more useful level 4 tuner monsters are if Daybreak has seen more competitive play than Mistral the Silver Shield, despite the fact that Blackwing Mistral the Silver Shield also benefits from Blackwing support and doesn't have a negative effect tied to it. It's just incredibly mediocre, which is enough for it to make the worst of list. And at number 4, we have Sinister Sprocket. This is a level 1 monster that at least has synchro related effects, where if this card is sent to the graveyard for the synchro summon of a dark synchro monster, you can destroy one face-up spell or trap card. And being able to destroy face-up spell or trap cards is a good effect, as the card Twister saw a lot of competitive play over the years, and all it does is allow you to destroy a single face-up spell or trap card. Although the reason Twister saw play and Sinister Sprocket didn't is because Twister doesn't require you to jump through hoops or perform a synchro summon to use it. And of course, was a lot more versatile being a quick play spell card that could be used immediately and during your opponent's turn, while also being an excellent side deck addition that could fit into pretty much any deck. Whereas Sinister Sprocket is very specific in its uses. It basically has a side deck only useful good effect, while also being hard to use, which is why the card never saw play, and why it's kind of a bad card despite having a technically positive effect, like Blackwing Mistral the Silver Shield. And at number 3 we have Dark Tinker. This is a level 2 tuner monster which has the effect that if it's sent to the graveyard, you can look at the top card of your deck and you can return that card to the top or bottom of the deck. Now, unlike Gusto Falco, this card does not miss timing despite the fact that it's a win effect, because the effect is mandatory and not optional, so you can activate its effect if sent to the graveyard for a synchro summon. The only problem with this effect is that it's very mediocre. 
and not beneficial to a lot of decks. Most decks don't care what the top card of their deck is, and the few decks that do like to see what the top card of their deck is, like maybe Reversal Quiz OTK decks, wouldn't use a card like this in order to stack the top of their deck. But I don't think this was the purpose of the card, to actually fit into a type of deck that can actually make use of its effect to gain information on the top card of your deck. I'm sure its intended use was to just maybe look at the top card of your deck, and if it's not something you want in your hand on your next turn, you could just send it to the bottom of the deck in order to maybe try again with a random draw. So if we were to have a list on some of the absolute most minor, technically positive effects, this is definitely one of them. Gaining information on the top of your deck is not that big a deal. And since Dark Tinker doesn't really do anything else, I'm not even sure it really has much synergy outside of maybe Fables, or maybe the Malisphorus 3-card archetype. So it's probably just Pack Filler that was meant to be an option if you really needed a level 2 Dark Fiend Tuner monster. It might get used for its stats, but definitely not for its effect. And at number 2, we have Iron Chain Coil. This is a level 3 tuner monster, which has the effect that once per turn you can select one Iron Chain monster you control, and that monster gains 300 attack and defense as long as this card remains face up on the field. However, seeing as this is the only tuner monster in the Iron Chain archetype, and tuners kind of have to leave the field if they're used as a synchro material, its effect doesn't really make sense. Its stats are incredibly low for a monster that has to stay around in order to buff up someone else by such a minor amount. 300 is not worth it. That it's kind of a wonder what they were thinking with this card. The funny thing is, the Iron Chain archetype does have a good card in it, Iron Chain Repairman, which once per turn can special summon an Iron Chain monster from the graveyard. So if you used Iron Chain Repairman in order to bring out Iron Chain Coil, they would not be able to go into their only synchro monster, Iron Chain Dragon because it's a level 6 monster, and Repairman and Coil add up to 7. They could still just go into a level 7 Synchro monster, and that would be fine, but it's really funny that the only Iron Chain monster that can special summon other Iron Chain monsters, and the only Iron Chain Tuner monster, can't actually combo to go into their Synchro monster. And also, Iron Chain Coil just has the worst effect of them all, which is kind of hard to beat since Iron Chain Blaster and Iron Chain Snake don't have good effects either. A 300 attack boost is just so minor that if instead it could give a boost to everyone on your side of the field permanently, it still wouldn't be very good. But the fact that it needs to stay on the field to maintain that boost just makes it garbage tier. Especially since it only works on other Iron Chain monsters. The only good card you'd want to use this on is their Synchro Monster, which this card is ironically not good at bringing out. And at number 1 we have Majestic Dragon. This is a level 1 tuner monster with no stats and only a negative effect, where this card cannot be used as synchro material except for the synchro summon of a majestic monster. When this card came out, there were only two majestic synchro monsters who both required this card as one of its tuners, as well as a specific level 8 synchro monster, Stardust Dragon and Red Dragon Archfiend, plus one more level 1 non-tuner monster. So you had to have two specific monsters in the field plus an additional level 1, in order to bring out Majestic Red Dragon or Majestic Star Dragon. And because of this strict summoning condition, and the fact that Majestic Dragon was so bad, these two Synchro Monsters were some of the worst Synchro Monsters in the game, based purely on summoning condition. Their effects aren't half bad, they were just like impossible to bring out. In fact, Majestic Dragon is so bad that they're basically making a replacement for the card called Wish Converging Dragon, which is a level 1 tuner monster that can special summon itself from the hand when you draw into it and can treat its name as Majestic Dragon while in the field or in the graveyard. And also, if you control a level 8 or higher Dragon Synchro monster when it special summons itself, you can also special summon a level 1 Dragon monster from your deck. So, the retrain Wish Converging Dragon can actually ally to fulfill the conditions for bringing out Majestic Red Dragon or Majestic Star Dragon way easier than the original Majestic Dragon ever could, who only has negative effects. Which is why I think Majestic Dragon is probably the worst tuner monster in the game. Most of the other ones on this list technically had beneficial effects, except for Blackwing Coach of the Daybreak, but at least Daybreak benefited from the plethora of Blackwing support, whereas Majestic Dragon didn't really have that problem, so its negative effects weren't really warranted at all. Hydrolander Orbit has the effect where if you have no duplicate monsters in your graveyard and have at least four of them, you can tribute this card in order to excavate a number of cards from the top of your deck equal to those monsters. Then, if you found no duplicate monsters in at least two of them, you get to add one of them to your hand and then stack the top of your deck however else you want. Additionally, it has a graveyard effect, 
where you can banish it from the graveyard in order to put one monster from your graveyard on the bottom of your deck. Now, both of these effects are fine in theory, it's just the card has no inherent way of special summoning itself to the field. So you have to think of it under the context that you have to expend resources to get it out, and the card is not really worth expending resources to bring out because it has such a tough requirement to activate, and basically only replaces itself in card advantage with maybe putting a random card in your hand. And its graveyard effect seems like it's probably the most decent part about the card, since it allows you to kind of control the cards in your graveyard. Until you remember that the Ishizu Shufflers came out in the very next set after this card was released, which also allowed you to shuffle back cards from either player's graveyards, up to three of them, and at quick effect speed. Whereas this card only allows you to do one monster only from your own graveyard, and at spell speed one speed. The term Bounce in Yu-Gi-Oh! is a fan-made keyword associated to an effect that allows you to return a card from the field to a player's hand. But not specifically to the deck, as that's a different term called spinning. So in this list we'll be going over the worst cards which technically have an effect that allow you to bounce an opponent's monster card. And at number 10 we have Garmer of the Nordic Beasts. This is a level 4 monster with decently high defense stats and only 800 attack. Which does matter because its effect is if it battles a level 4 or lower monster, you can return that monster to the hand after damage calculation. So since its bounce effect happens after damage calculation, you kind of want this card to survive the battle in order to get the best use out of it. And with only 800 attack, chances are it's not really going to be surviving many battles. If you crash it into things anyway. But you should still be able to bounce whatever card it crashes into, whether it survives the battle or not. Now, what lands this card in this list is the fact that it's conditional on which monsters it can actually bounce i.e. only level 4 or lower. There are other cards in the game, like Kelbeck and Wall of Illusion, which can return any monster that crashes into them after damage calculation, instead of only specific types of monsters. Then there's other monsters which are better for ramming into your opponent, like Neospatian Grandmole, which can bounce a monster before damage step, so it will always survive the battle, and it also returns itself to the hand as well. However, if you want to crash an opponent's monster without returning it to your hand in order to bounce your opponent's card, then Hyper Hammerhead even has it beat as it has better stats and does the same thing without limiting to what types of cards it can actually bounce back. The only thing Garmer the Nordic Beast has going for it is that it's part of an archetype which could make use of the fact that it's part of that archetype. So it could be searched out and used as synchro materials for some of their boss monsters. Although the archetype it's part of is not very good, so that's not too much going in its favor. But just enough going in its favor that it's only the number 10 spot on this list. Technically, useful effect, has applications for it, it's part of an archetype that can make use of it, but it's just incredibly weak compared to other cards with similar effects. And at number 9, we have Dice Knight. This is a continuous trap which simply has the effect that each time your opponent's special summons a monster, you get to roll a 6-sided die, and then return all monsters in the field that have the same level as the dice result to the hand. So if your opponent's special summons a level 4 monster, and then you roll a 4 on the 6-sided die, then you get to return that card to the hand and there's no conditions for keeping this card in the field or even the amount of times per turn you can use the effect. So if your opponent is doing a lot of combos and leaves this card alone, there's a chance it might return something. However, there is a 1 in 6 chance that you'll be able to return a monster that's level 6 and below. And there's lots of monsters in the game which don't have levels that are commonly special summoned, like all Link monsters or XZ's monsters. And even some of the more popular Synchro monsters are level 7 and higher. So if you're incredibly lucky, this could be an excellent floodgate, which is why it's only number 9 spot on this list, but realistically, it's not very good at all, and you're better off playing a more reliable floodgate. And at number 8, we have Jiraki Guanon. This monster has the effect that activates when it destroys a monster by battle, where you can return one set card your opponent controls to their hand. Since technically it allows you to select set monster cards, it counts as a bounce effect for this list. Although this has got to be one of the worst targets of cards to return to your opponent's hand and the activation requirement is actually kind of tough to pull off in modern meta decks. You see, Jirak monsters do like to destroy opponent's monsters by battle, but generally if you're going to go through the effort to try to get a 1700 attack Jirak monster to destroy an opponent's monster by battle, you want to use that effect with Jirak Guaiba in order to special summon another Jirak monster from your deck, that way you can use them to go into Dalka or Lagia. Simply bouncing one of your opponent's set cards is not as useful of an effect, but it is technically a useful effect nonetheless. Just a really underpowered one, as generally the best targets to bounce are face up big boss monsters, or extract monsters as it returns those to the deck. Only being able to bounce set cards is not as good. And the activation requirement is also surprisingly not as easy to pull off as it might seem. 
Although it's not that bad, it technically does have synergies within the Jirak archetype, thanks to Jirak Guaiba being able to special summon it, or Jirak Velo. So again, low spot on this list. And at number 7, we have Dote Dotengu. This is a very low statted level 3 monster, which simply has the effect that if this card you control is sent to the graveyard by an opponent's card effect, you can then bounce one card your opponent controls. Now on surface level, this doesn't seem half bad. Basically, when this card is destroyed by your opponent, you get to bounce one of your opponent's monsters in retaliation. However, this is a low statted, non-archetype specific card, and doesn't really have good synergies with its type or attributes. And there's no reason to leave this card in the field, or care if your opponent destroys it by a card effect. The best you can hope for with this card is it being destroyed mid-combo if you're trying to use it as material for some kind of extra deck play, in which case, then you might get to bounce one of your opponent's cards as a result. Like, if you bring it out of the deck with Tour Guide from the Underworld, and your opponent decides to chain something that would destroy this card before you can use it as an XC's material, which is not very likely. Chances are they would just stop Tour Guide before it brings the card out. So, while the floating effect is technically pretty good, the thing that really drags it down is that it's only triggered by an opponent's card effect and not your own, which means you can't destroy this thing in your hand or on the field in order to proc its bounce effect like you can with Kaiser Glider. And also, if this card is destroyed by battle, it can't use its effect, like you would be able to do with Kaiser Glider as well. This card is kind of awkward in having a technically decent floating effect, but just not being useful in anything. And at number 6, we have Dark Cat with White Tail. This is a flip effect monster which has the effect where it can return two of your opponent's monsters to their hand, and one of your monsters as well. Although the caveat to this is that in order to return two of your opponent's monsters, you have to return one monster you control as well. And if this card is triggering its flip effect after it's been destroyed by battle, then it can't target itself, and needs to target one of your other monsters. Also, it has to be able to bounce two of your opponent's cards. The full trigger for this is that it has to bounce exactly three monsters, and if any of those monsters aren't available to be bounced, then it can't use its effect. This makes it seem like a pretty decent card, but it's actually kind of hard to pull off if you're using it specifically like Penguin Soldier, i.e. trying to return two of your opponent's monsters to their hand. Penguin Soldier is just a better card all around. It can return up to two cards, so it doesn't have to be exactly two monsters, and it doesn't require you to return any monsters you control to the hand, so it can just be purely two of your opponent's monsters. And it even has the same defense point value as Dark Cat with White Tail. Basically, Penguin Soldier is just a much better version of Dark Cat. Now, the only advantages Dark Cat has over Penguin Soldier is if you're playing some kind of control deck, where you know your opponent is not going to be attacking into your face down cards. Then you could use Dark Cat in order to return two of your opponent's monsters, and then just return Dark Cat to your hand, in order to set it again to use on your next turn. Penguin Soldier can kind of do the same thing though, by just targeting itself and then one of your opponent's monsters. So again, there's no real reason to play this card over Penguin Soldier or something that only bounces a single card, because almost none of them require you to bounce one of your cards as well. Because remember, flip effects activate after the card has been decided already if it's destroyed or not during the damage step, which means it can't return itself to the hand if it's been destroyed by that battle, which is something that could confuse newer players who don't understand the minutiae of the damage step. And at number 5, we have Hade Hain. This is the evolved form of Hain Hain, one of the first ever effect monsters added to the game which simply had the flip effect to return one of your opponent's monsters to the hand. So the more powerful version allows you to return up to three monsters on the field to the hand. So it looks like it's a way more powerful version of Penguin Soldier. Although there is the fact that Hade Hain is a level 5 monster, which means you need to tribute in order to set this card on the field. And hey, being able to return up to three cards seems like it's worth the tribute, right? Well, in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, it's really easy to just destroy face down cards without ever flipping them up. And if you're going to dedicate resources to putting a card on the field that can potentially bounce up to three cards, it's generally not worth it. Even when this card first came out in 2004, it was considered too slow for that effect. And there's also the fact that why would you go through the effort of using resources to bring this card out when you can instead just, just play Penguin Soldier if all you cared about was bouncing multiple monsters? Because Hate Hain is most likely going to die if it's attacked while face down because it has an incredibly low 1000 defense. So it's not like you're doing the tribute in order to keep the monster. So if it's going to get destroyed anyway, Penguin Soldier is just still better. It bounces two cards and doesn't require a tribute, and actually being able to bounce one more card is not that big a deal. Of course, one of the biggest benefits to bouncing cards over destroying them is the fact that it bypasses all kinds of protection effects. But even then, you don't really need to spend the resources to bounce three of them. 
And generally, two was more than enough if you want to go the slow route of setting a monster and then waiting for it to get attacked, or flipping it during your next turn. And Penguin Soldier had actually come out a full year before Hate Hain in 2003, so there was extra no reason to play it. And at number four, we have Gundari. This is a spirit monster which has the effect that if it battles a synchro monster, you can return both monsters to their owner's hand at the start of the damage step. So basically, it's like Neo Space and Grand Mall, except only against synchro monsters. And also, it's a spirit monster with all the restrictions of spirit monsters, where the card cannot be special summoned, and it returns to the hand at the end of the turn in which it's normal summoned. So basically, no reason to play this card over just Neo Space and Grand Mall, since you need to use up your normal summon to bring it out anyway, and Neo Space and Grand Mall can affect more things than just synchro monsters. However, Neo Space and Grand Mall was basically limited on the ban list for almost its entire history in the game, only coming off the limited list rather recently. So if you wanted more copies of a Grand Mole-like effect, and you were super afraid of synchro monsters, then Gundari is an appropriate card for that. It's an incredibly specific counter card, which just kind of made bad by the limitations of being a spirit monster. Basically, spirit monsters need to be incredibly good to see play, because of just how limiting their restrictions are and Gundari is not incredibly good. It's a mediocre counter card for Synchro Monsters, which is why it's on this list. I should also mention, technically any time you're bouncing an extra deck monster, it gets returned to the deck, which counts as a spin effect. But this card does specifically say it returns it to the hand, so it technically counts for this list, even though Synchro Monsters can only be returned to the extra deck. So I just thought it was funny that a card which specifically only works against extra deck monsters specify that it returns it to the hand instead of the deck which I assume is just the case to make the wording simple because it also returns itself to the hand. And at number three, we have Dark Scorpion Check the Yellow. This is a level three monster with only 1,000 attack, which simply has the effect that if it would inflict battle damage to your opponent, you get to activate one of two of its effects, where you can either bounce one card on the field or look at the top card of your opponent's deck and then either leave it on the top or put it on the bottom of their deck. So the problem with this card is it's just a very weak monster that has to inflict battle damage in order to activate the bounce effect. Which means the best way to get the effect is to have the card attack directly. Which you can do if you use their incredibly, laughably bad archetype trap card, which allows you to attack directly as long as you control all the dark scorpion monsters. Or if you go a more reasonable route and use something like Secret Pass to the Treasures or Infected Mail, which allows you to grant the ability to attack directly much better. Either way, you have to give this card support in order to get off the effect, because it's too weak to activate the effect itself. The Dark Scorpions are kind of infamous for being terrible. However, this card right here was one of the few Dark Scorpion monsters to actually appear on the ban list. You see, there's this incredibly niche loop you can perform with this card, as well as a copy of Call of the Haunted, and pre errata Macure the Destructor, which basically allows you to attack with Dark Scorpion Jug the Yellow an infinite amount of times by constantly using Chick the Yellow to return Call the Haunted to your hand in order to reuse it during the battle phase to bring Chick the Yellow from the graveyard, assuming your opponent had a clear field for you to attack directly. After they finally banned Mancure the Destructor for being crazy overpowered, they also put this card to semi-limited, and then immediately took it off on their next banlist cycle because no one was playing it, and it wasn't a problem at all without the ability to infinitely use trap cards from your hand. So. Outside of its 15 minutes of fame, it's just an incredibly weak monster that can sometimes bounce cards on the field if you give it support to allow it to inflict battle damage to your opponent. And at number two, we have Shino Bird Pigeon. This is a spirit monster which has the effect that once per turn, you can return one spirit monster on the field to the hand. Now, this does allow you to target your opponent's spirit monsters, so it counts for this list of cards which allow you to bounce your opponent's monsters. But it's pretty obvious the intended use of this card is to bounce your own spirit monsters to the hand. However, it's not useful even for that. You see, the best way to make use of this card is in Shino Bird Ritual decks, as the two ritual cards can special summon spirit monsters from your hand or deck, ignoring their summoning conditions, and they have a continuous spell card called Shino Bird Power Spot, which allows you to add a ritual spell card from your deck to your hand if a wind monster you control is returned to your hand. So the synergy is to use one of the ritual monsters to special summon Pigeon, and then use Pigeon to return the ritual monster back to your hand in order to ritual summon again, since you would be able to search out a ritual spell card. And the two ritual monsters have really good effects on their summon, to either bounce your opponent's monsters or spin three of your opponent's spell and traps. However, the ritual monsters have a better target to special summon, and they almost always choose a Mono Iwato instead. Because a Mono Iwato can shut down the effects of all monsters, and if you're able to cheat it out, it won't return to the hand during the end of the turn. 
and even without a Mono Iwato, they still probably wouldn't want to bring out Shinoberg Pigeon. There is another spirit monster called Hebo, Lord of the River, which has the effect when it's summoned in order to turn one face-up card on the field into a spirit monster. So if you have one of your opponent's monsters treated as a spirit monster thanks to Hebo's effect, you could then use Shinobird Pigeon to return it to the hand. The only problem is that Hebo also returns the card to the hand during the end phase anyway. So unless you have a way to get Hebo and then Shinobird Pigeon, and you want to return your opponent's card to the hand immediately instead of waiting until the end of the turn, then I guess its effect could be live. Which is still not a very good combo because of all the limitations of spirit monsters. Where again, they can't be special summoned and returned to the hand during the end phase. So Shinobird Pigeon has never actually seen competitive play, Despite the fact that the Ritual Shinobird monsters have seen competitive play, they just don't ever want to summon them. And at number one, we have Burst Return. This is a spell card which can only be activated if you control a face-up elemental hero Burst in Atrix, where you can then return all face-up elemental heroes on the field to the hand, except elemental hero Burst in Atrix. So this card technically does work on your opponent's monsters as well. So if you're playing against an opponent's deck that has nothing but elemental heroes, you could potentially bounce all of your opponent's cards to their hand with this effect. However, this is incredibly unlikely. If you're playing against a hero deck, modern hero decks play a combination of a whole bunch of types of heroes and not just elemental heroes. So only being able to return the elemental heroes to your opponent's hand is not that big of a deal. And even if you wanted to play this incredibly specific counter card, you would need to have a specific named monster on the field, which is also not very good. Elemental Hero Burst Natrix is a level 3 monster who's not even played in decks that can use her as a fusion material because it's just not worth wasting the slot on your deck. So I guess the best way to use Burst Return would be to return your own Elemental Heroes to your hand, like maybe reusing the effect of Elemental Hero Stratos, which still isn't a very good use of an incredibly specific card that requires you to have a specific named monster on your side of the field. Burst Return is most likely an anime card that was useful in a very specific situation in the anime, which are rarely actually good in actual play, which is why these kind of anime cards generally take number one spots on worst of list. Musical Sumo Dice Games is a rank 6 XCs monster with the effect that, where at the start of your opponent's battle phase you roll a 6-sided die. Then this card moves main monster zones clockwise around the board, and if it lands on a monster it attaches it to itself as a material. Then, if this effect causes it to exceed 6 materials, the player who now controls it wins the duel. Now, this card obviously was not meant to be competitive. It's basically a joke card mimicking the common party game Musical Chairs. And in fact, it's incredibly easy to circumvent it if your opponent doesn't want to actually participate in trying to use the effect. Because they can either just not ever enter their battle phase, since it only works on your opponent's battle phase, but they can also just link the monster away for a generic link summon, since you're giving your opponent a monster most of the time when you're using this card on the field. In Yu-Gi-Oh, the standby phase is usually reserved for miscellaneous effects and maintenance costs. And so in this video, we'll go over some of the worst cards with effects that trigger during the standby phase. And at number 10, we have Inspection. This is a continuous spell card with the effect that during your opponent's standby phase, you can pay 500 life points to look at one random card in their hand. Now, hand knowledge isn't a terrible thing by any standards, but it's never something you want to dedicate a whole card to with no additional benefits. Cards like Aqua Dolphin and Trap Dust Shoot have seen play because they give you hand information plus a hand rip. However, Inspection is the only card on this list that has actually had a niche in a semi-competitive deck back in the day, that being Last Turn OTK. Inspection used to be able to be activated any number of times during the standby phase, allowing you to drop your life points way down below 1000 by paying its cost several times. This enabled you to activate last turn as soon as possible, fulfilling a similar role to Wall of Revealing Light. And then you'd be able to win the duel by having something else like Jaujin the Spiritualist on the field as well. Somewhere along the years, Inspection got a ruling change that made its effect a hard once per turn, despite its card text not stating so. Granted, this was ages after Last Turn itself got banned, so it's not like Inspection was being used anyway. Still, for a card that actually saw play in an old school combo deck, this card gets only the 10th spot on this list. And at number 9, we have Curse of Fiend. This is a normal spell card that can only be activated during your standby phase, and its effect is that it changes the battle position of all monsters in the field, and then you can't change them except with a card effect for the rest of this turn. Curse of Fiend is one of the weirdest spell cards printed in Yu-Gi-Oh, since obviously you can only activate normal spell cards in your main phase since they're spell speed 1. But, well, since card effects override game mechanics, you can activate this during your standby phase if you set it first. It doesn't even behave like a quick play spell, but rather as a trap. That's how they ruled this card back then. This card is not only worse than spells, since you need to wait a turn to use it, but it's also worse than traps because you can't even use it during your opponent's turn. 
To top it all off, this card goes on to restrict the battle positions from being changed except by card effects for the rest of the turn. And since it must be activated during your standby phase, you will be the only one hindered by this. The only thing weirder than Curse of Fiend working like it does is the fact that someone thought it needed a drawback to balance it out as well. And at number 8, we have Return Zombie. This is a dark zombie monster who's level 4 with 1000 attack and 1600 defense. It has the effect that during the standby phase, you can pay 500 life points to add this card from your graveyard to your hand, as long as your hand is empty. If you didn't know, the standby phase happens immediately after your draw phase, so you'll have to find a way to lose the card you drew somehow. Now, that isn't the hardest thing in the world. When this card was released, there were actually many chainable traps that had discard cost and were seeing heavy play. In addition, Reckless Greed would prevent you from drawing for the turn entirely and could also fulfill the same role. Cards like Return Zombie, which would get you a free resource during even your standby phase, were actually massively popular around the time it was released too, with pre and Sinister Serpent being a mainstay in older formats until it was eventually replaced with Treeborn Frog. With all that said, why is Return Zombie on this list? Well, because it's unequivocally worse than the alternatives you had. The setup it needed wasn't that hard, but what made Serpent and the Frog so good was how easily accessible they were once you had them set up. Neither of those cards would rot in your graveyard doing nothing like Return Zombie most likely will. And at number 7, we have Malice Ascendant. This is a level 4 dark zombie monster with 700 attack, and it has the effect that during each of your opponent's standby phases, you can mill a card from their deck for each copy of Malice Ascendant you have in your graveyard. So if you just normal summon this card on your first turn, it'll have no effect whatsoever. And that's probably the best this card can be. Milling cards from your opponent's deck has never really been a good effect, since even by the time this card was released, cards in the graveyard were already being used as a resource. There isn't any point in milling your opponent unless you can deck them out in a reasonable amount of time. In this aspect, this card was heavily outclassed by Needleworm and Morphing Jar, who'd milled 5 cards compared to this card's 2 with the exorbitant setup. Eventually, once the Mayakashi cards were released, people would go and play the zombie mill that milled 2 cards and another gimmicky deck out strategy. But that was with the even older Soul Absorbing Bone Tower. Outside of these kinds of decks, there were some cards that milled your opponent that did see play, but always because they incidentally did it, never as the main feature. If anything, these effects were seen as a downside to using them. You can tell Malice Ascendant is bad when it asks you to waste additional resources for an effect that most people would avoid using if possible. And at number 6, we have Patrol Robo. This monster is a level 3 earth machine monster with 1100 attack, and its effect is that during each of your standby phases, you can look at one face down card on your opponent's field. Effects that just give you field knowledge have never really seen play. Knowing what your opponent has face down is something that's easier to deduce than knowing what's in their hand, especially in longer games. For example, if your opponent has used Charge the Light Brigade to search Raiko earlier this turn, you can probably tell that his face down card is that card. But, ultimately, even if you actually have no idea what your opponent has, interacting with cards on the board is much easier than with cards in the hand. Why would you waste a card just to know what your opponent has, when you could instead be using a card to get rid of it, like Dark Hole or Lightning Storm? Even in the context of this being a really old card, it was given a tiny stat line, which makes it unlikely it'll survive until your next turn to get its effect off, and would soon be power crept by a monster that has seen just as much play as itself. And at number 5, we have Pump King, the King of Ghosts. This is a level 6 dark zombie monster with 1800 attack and has two effects. First is it gains 100 attack if Castle of Dark Illusions is face up on the field. And then, as long as the castle remains face up on the field, this card will further gain 100 attack and defense during each of your standby phases, but this effect itself turns off after the fourth time you activate it. Before we go any further, Castle of Dark Illusions is a flip monster who increases the stats of all zombie monsters of the field by 200 on flip, and then by a further 200 every standby phase. These two are very old cards, of course, having come out during the second set of Yu-Gi-Oh! in the TCG, and their age really shows. They were heavily outclassed in every aspect, even upon release. These cards want you to play and protect the castle strategy between themselves, despite coming out alongside some of the best removal spells of all time. As a tribute monster, Pumpkin paled in comparison to Summon Skull of the same set, who would have higher stats on Summon than if it happened to live through many standby phases. And when it came to his partner in time, you'd be hard pressed to choose Castle for a Flip Monster over Man Eater Bug or Magician of Faith. And at number 4, we have Battle Scarred. This is a continuous trap which requires you to target an Archfiend monster you control to activate it. During each of your standby phases, if that monster would pay life points for its maintenance effect, your opponent has to pay that much as well. Additionally, if this card is destroyed, your monster gets destroyed as well. Archfiends are one of the oldest archetypes in Yu-Gi-Oh, and it has had multiple playable cards throughout the years. Even their spell and trap card support has been quite decent, with Archfiend Palabyrinth seen playing Infernity decks at some point, who also had an Archfiend monster. 
Battle Scarred wouldn't work with a single of these cards, since none of the good Archfiends actually have life point cost during the standby phase. You see, Battle Scarred was meant to work with the Chess Archfiends, a really small subsection of the archetype whose most notable trait was having a 2k normal summonable beater back then. You'd have a much better reward for playing Archfiends if you had just an old Falling Down instead, which is a snatch deal as long as you control one. It wouldn't make your Archfiend monsters die to MST like Battle Scarred does either. Throughout the years, they have released more Archfiend cards with a life point standby phase cost, but none that were actually good enough to see play. Not by themselves, and much less with Battle Scarred. And at number 3, we have Princess Pikaru. This is a level 4 light spellcaster monster with 2000 attack. It cannot be normal summoned or set, and must be special summoned with Trial of the Princess. Its effect lets you gain 800 life points for each monster you control during your standby phase. Princess Pikaru's effect isn't that bad at first glance, but begs up for it by being really hard to get out. To summon it, you need its base form, White Magician Pikaru, equipped with Trial of the Princess, an equip spell which is exclusive to the Pikaru and Kurin, and increases their attack by 800 points. Then, if your Pikaru beats over a level 5 or higher monster by battle, you can finally special summon Princess Pikaru from your deck. So you need a specific low statted level 2 monster equipped with a low power equip spell. Having these two requirements would be bad enough, but requiring you to beat over a level 5 monster brings it over the top. The only thing you could reasonably beat over when Pikaru came out would be an Air Knight Parshath, a one of in a meta filled with Chaos Sorcerers and Cyber Dragons. And yes, this card asked you for this much setup for a 2k beater in a meta where Cyber Dragon existed and was in every deck. Pikaru is on this list over its dark counterpart in Princess Garan because burn effects are generally more impactful than life point gain. Garan's 600 burn could win you the duel in very specific situations, which is something Pikaru's effect could never do. And at number 2, we have Senri Ai. This is a continuous spell with the effect that during each of your standby phases, you can pay 100 life points to look at the card on top of your opponent's deck. So far, we've seen cards that are bad because they just give you hand information or field information. However, Sedri I manages to be worse than both of these. The card on top of your opponent's deck doesn't affect the current game state in any way. To make matters worse, Sedri works only during your standby phase. So not only is this effect bad, you won't even see your opponent's top deck until two turns after you activate it. There's not even a guarantee their top deck will remain the same because they could just go into their deck during their turn with their cards. There have been a few cards that have seen play that would allow you to know your opponent's top deck, but these cards allowed you to actually give your opponent a bad top deck. The only other instance of a card like this being played was Convulsion of Nature in Reversal Quiz FTKs. But even in that deck, the effect of knowing your opponent's next card, which it actually did better since you weren't running the risk of ever losing information, was just a small bonus. The real utility was in having a spell that you could be bounced back with Giant True Nate to generate a lot of counters for Royal Magical Library, while comboing with Archfiend's Oath. Meanwhile, Senri's Eye's best use is probably as the worst, slowest spiral combo enabler in the game. And finally, at number one, we've got Germ Infection. This is an equip spell that says the attack of a non machine type monster equipped with this card is decreased by 300 points during each of its standby phases. As you could probably notice by the non machine part, this card came from a very weird time in Yu Gi Oh!'s history. But even inside this sub theme of cards that don't affect machines, Germ Infection is not even the best eco spell of the bunch. Despite what its text makes it sound like, it actually only reduces the monster's stats during your own standby phase. So upon equipping it to an opponent's monster, they'll still get a full turn of using it with its original attack. And then even after that, a 300 decrease is as bad as it gets. Even as far back as when this card is released, why use such a small debuff to beat over something when you could just boost yourself for way more? There was already no reason to run this card back in 2002, but of course it'd only get worse with time. Shattered Axe offers the same effect, but stronger and on a trap card, which is actually better in this case since you don't have to let your opponent know you will get an attack decrease two turns in advance. Not to mention the plethora of other stat reducing eco spells, that while still too bad to see competitive play, still put germ infection to shame, such as Dark World Shackles and Curse Armaments. Even if this card happens to be the most searchable card in this list, due to it being an equip spell, you wouldn't want to have this card in your deck, much less in your hand. Germ Infection is probably the closest you can get to a spell doing nothing as you can in Yu-Gi-Oh, and this is why it's by far the worst card of these 10. Parasomnia Pillow is an equipped spell card which will create a duplicate copy of the monsters equipped to when it's sent to the graveyard, only without an effect. So if you equip this to one of your opponent's monsters and destroy it, you'll get a token copy of it with its type, attribute, and attack, which is ready to attack right away. Or you can equip it to one of your own monsters just in case it gets destroyed and you want to be able to use its type, attribute, or more often its attack for whatever reason. 
It even has an optional effect where you can destroy the equipped monster during the end phase in order to forcefully create this token. However, there are so many downsides to playing equipped spell cards in general that only creating a vanilla token of a monster and only after it's destroyed is just not good enough to play the card for really any kind of deck. If you really want to play a token beatdown deck, even then it's kind of hard to find a correct target in order to get high enough stats and for the card to just not leave the field and make the card resolve without effect. Konami often makes mistakes with card design, which is why the Forbidden Limited list exists in the first place. However, sometimes they attempt to fix these cards by changing how they work instead of limiting how players use it, for the better or for the worse. And in this video, we're going over some of Konami's worst attempts at eroding cards to balance them out. Starting us off at number 10, we have Treeborn Frog. This is a level 1 water aqua monster with 100 attack and defense. Its original effect says that during your standby phase, if this card is in your graveyard and you don't control a Treeborn Frog, or any spell or trap cards, it can special summon itself. Treeborn Frog was a very good card for monarch-centered strategies back in the day. Being able to get tribute fodder every single turn for no cost was something no other card could do. And as duels took away more turns back then, you'd be able to trigger a Treeborn a dozen times in the same duel and have it provide value every turn. Another one of Treeborn's great attributes was how versatile it could be, as its revival effect was not once per turn. This meant that if you can get it off the field during the standby phase, you'd be able to bring it out again. You could use this interaction to do things like an enemy controller to trip the Treeborn to steal an opponent's monster and then get your frog again afterwards. The way this card was eroded was that its revival effect became a soft once per turn. This didn't interfere with the combos such as the Econ one, as that card is treated as another copy when it leaves the graveyard, but it made this card lose some key interactions. For example, when facing a Light and Darkness Dragon who can negate effects at the cost of 500 attack and defense, you could repeatedly trigger Treeborn in the graveyard to drain Light and Darkness Dragon's negates all at once. For a more modern example, say if Appaloosa negates your Treeborn in the graveyard, you'd be able to attempt to bring it back again. This errata made it so that you could no longer do this for both situations, as you'd only be able to trigger each unique copy of Treeborn in the graveyard once. This is just the first of the many unwarranted erratas in this list, and even if they did randomly nerf a card that hasn't been relevant in forever with it, at least it was only a slight hit. And now at number 9, we have Toon World. This continuous spell currently only has an activation condition, which says you must pay 1,000 life points to activate this card. Despite not really having an effect, Toon World has managed to see play a couple of times throughout the years. Even if Toons as a whole have never been a competitive strategy, the existence of Toon Table of Contents, a universal searcher for the archetype which can also search itself, boosts the playability of almost every one of these cards. Most commonly, this one was used in FDK decks played alongside Royal Magical Library, which can draw you cards if you activate multiple spells in the same turn. Toon World has some nice synergy in these decks since it can be bounced back to the hand with Giant Trune to get another spell activation and it also lowers your life points which helps for FTKs that use Reversal Quiz or Life Equalizer. One thing most people don't know is that Toon World has actually received an errata before it was released in the West. In the original OCG printing, on top of requiring 1000 life points to be activated, you'd also have to pay an additional 500 life points during each of your standby phases or else it'd be destroyed. But if it left the field, you'd get all the life points you paid for its maintenance costs back. This errata did buff the card by a small bit, but it does raise the question of why would Konami cut out most of this card's effects like this. It's not like this buff was going to make Toons anywhere near playable at the time. Though it's not like they'd ever end up doing that, since Toon Kingdom haven't managed to do so despite being one of the most over-tuned pieces of legacy support out there. The reason why they changed it is unknown, but it can probably brushed up as to an oddity from the really early Yu-Gi-Oh years where countless erratas had to be thrown around, though this seems to be one of the less justifiable ones. And at number 8 we have Brain Control. This is a normal spell card which lets you pay Android life points to target a face that monster your opponent controls that can be a normal summoner set and take control of it until the end phase. In its original state, this card could target anything instead of just normal summonable monsters, making it into what's essentially a change of heart with a slight downside. For that reason, it was very quickly limited after its release, as it was too strong for the metagame back then. This card and mind control both became must-have staples when the Synchro era started, as you now had way more ways of getting rid of stolen monsters by using it as a material. These two were in most decks that had any tuner access, though Brain Control was clearly the superior one as Mind Control still stopped the monster from attacking or being tributed over, and that's why Brain was the one that ended up being banned. This card remained on the Forbidden List until 2017 when it finally got an errata that made the card completely unplayable. Brain Control would have still been a decent card with its new effect back in 2009 when you were still taking main deck monsters with it anyway, but the same didn't fly for the modern era. Not being able to take extra deck monsters meant that often you wouldn't be able to take anything out of your opponent's board as that's what's pretty much every deck ended on. On the flip side, Mind Control, which is still out at 1 and didn't get an errata, had its restrictions matter less and less with time because of how less the battle phase mattered and how easily you could use your opponent's monster as a material. By this point, you could either synchro or exceed with whatever you took, 
and this had only become easier with the introduction of Link Monsters, making it so that pretty much every deck had a way to get rid of monsters on their side of the field. This made Mind Control a staple throughout all of the Link era, and it was even allowed at three copies for quite a few formats, put into question how necessary it was to kill Brain Control like that, as it's only slightly better than Mind Control. This question was finally put to rest when they freed Change of Heart itself, the stronger version of both of these cards, earlier in 2022, and it doesn't even see that much play now. The issue with this errata is how it completely killed off the card for good, as it became 100% inferior to every other option then, when Power Creep would have made it fine to have it at 1 in a few years anyway. And at number 7, we have Chaos Emperor Dragon and Void of the End. This is a level 8 Dark Dragon monster with 3000 attack and 2500 defense, which must be special summoned by banishing a light and dark monster from your graveyard. It has the effect to pay 1000 life points to send all cards in both players' hands and on the field to the graveyard, and then burn your opponent for 300 points of damage for each card sent this way. pre erotic Chaos Emperor Dragon was one of the best monsters in the game when it came out. Its summoning condition, a staple in pretty much all Chaos monsters for the time, made it easy to bring out as most good monsters around were light or dark. Its effect to wipe the field made for a deadly combo when used with Sangan, that could be used to search out Yadokarasu to leave your opponent with zero cards and without a draw phase. This is one of the most iconic cards in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, as its printing forced Konami to change the limited list to the forbidden and limited list. This is why it's such a shame that I got an errata that made it an entirely different card than it once was. The new version of Chaos Emperor Dragon has the same effect as the original one, but you cannot activate any other card effect the turn you use it. This checks for activating cards before as well as after Chaos Emperor Dragon comes down, meaning that if you want to use this, it must be the only thing you're doing on your turn. Functional erratas like this have always been a point of contention throughout the community, as what's the point of changing a card to unban it if it's effectively not the same card anymore? Players generally enjoy it when old powerhouses are brought back in a somewhat playable capacity. This has happened multiple times with things like Sangan seen play as recently as last year, or Ring of Destruction being playable in burn strategies. Chaos Emperor Dragon definitely won't ever be able to come back into the game with its old effect, but when it comes to dealing with such an iconic card, it'd be better to either print a new card that attempts to bounce its effect, such as a Pot of Greed and Pot of Desires, or to just accept it's going to be a permanent fixture on the list, like Graceful Charity. The new CED printing only serves to waste the cardboard it's been printed on. And at number 6, we have Night Assailant. This is a level 3 Dark Fiend flip monster with meager stats that has the effect to pop a monster your opponent controls when it's flip face up. Additionally, if it's sent from the hand to the graveyard, it lets you target another flip monster in your graveyard and add it to your hand. And with this card's newest errata, you have to add a flip monster that is not Night Assailant instead. The subtle change in wording has to do with how its old effect would play out when you had multiple copies of this card in rotation. With its past effect, if you discarded Night Assailant for something like Regeki Break while you had another one in the graveyard already, you'd be able to target the other one and add it back to your hand. This gave you infinite discard fodder while you had a little loop going on, thus giving Night Assailant a place in the meta back then, as a man-eater bug with an extra upside. The card saw play as an advantage engine for decks which played discard traps back then, up until it got limited to 1 to prevent said loop, and it remained playable anyways as a way to recycle good flip effect monsters like Dekoichi for a few years, before being naturally phased out of the meta as flip effects became too slow. In 2022, Assailant got an errata and was then allowed to come back to 3. The issue at hand is that Assailant would have been already unplayable at 3 with its old text. This kind of advantage engine has been far too slow to do anything since forever. The only utility they'd have is a two-card combo for infinite discard fodder, which there aren't really any good outlets for anyway. Sure, you can use Snipe Hunter to pop your opponent's whole board or Cold Enchanters for OTKs, but those would hardly be relevant in 2015, much less now. In the end, what this errata did was slightly nerf the card in Speed Duels, an alternate format with a much lower power level and limited card pool who had just received it. And at number 5, we have Sinister Serpent. This is a level 1 water reptile monster which originally read that during your standby phase, if it's in your graveyard, you can add it back to your hand for free. In its errata form, this card's effect not only became a hard once per turn, but it also makes you banish a Sinister Serpent from your graveyard during your opponent's next end phase. This card used to be one of the hugest staples of old Yu-Gi-Oh! Once it got into rotation, Sinister Serpent gave you value for the rest of the game in the form of easy plus ones during each of your standby phases. While it's not as impactful as a plus one as something like a Pot of Greed since you're only getting this weak monster back, it was still strong enough to be in a lot of decks. Its main application being letting you use cards which discarded for free. There were lots of great forms of removal locked behind discard costs back then, such as Regeki Break and Phoenix Wing Wind Blast, and also cards that comboed well with the extra fodder, such as Graceful Charity and Mirage of Nightmare. This kind of resource generation from the graveyard was something that wouldn't be seen in any other card all the way until Treeborn Frog, and that's why this card got banned alongside a lot of other staples in 2005. Around 10 years later, this card would get errata before being brought back into the game, and to no one's surprise, it never saw play again. 2015 was the time where the game started speeding up massively, where we got combo behemoths like Pepe. Even outside of that, control decks now had access to much better resource loops within their own engines. 
like Seer and Dante. This card not only had no niche, it was also massively nerfed. And just like most other entries in this list, it saw no play after being changed. And at number 4, we have Mermel Abyssus. This is a level 7 water aqua monster with the effect to special summon itself from your hand at the cost of discarding one other water monster to the graveyard. If it's summoned this way, you add a level 4 lower mermail monster from your deck to your hand. Abyssus has always been the best high level monster from the archetype. It has the easiest summon condition out of all of them, requiring just a single discard. It's important to note that this kind of cost is a huge boon for its deck though, since the Atlanteans all have amazing effects when pitched for the cost of a water monster's effect, with heavy infantry and marksmen giving you removal and dragoons giving you a search. When brought out, it also searches for the deck's other best normal summons in Mermel Abyss Pike. It did so much for the deck, it even came out already limited when it got imported into the OCG, where they wouldn't free it until years after Mermel's dominance on the meta was up. This card would end up receiving an errata while Mermel's weren't doing much of anything in 2017. It just changed how the effect to search when summoned worked. Before it read, you can add, making it optional, and now it's obligatory. This was a very unusual change, which was quietly rolled out without much fanfare. In practice, what it did was that it made it so that you wouldn't be able to chain block Tiz's effect. In Yu-Gi-Oh, you first build a chain for obligatory effects, and then for the optional ones. And since the Atlanteans are all obligatory, this meant you could choose the order of the chain to protect Abyssus. This change essentially made it so that whenever you pitched an Atlantean for this card, the Atlantean's effect would be chain link 1, and Abyssus on summons effect would need to be chain link 2. This wouldn't have been nearly as relevant back when it first came out, but in the more modern game, that meant you couldn't build the chain to protect Abyssus from hand traps such as Ghost Ogre and Ash Blossom, making this errata into a nerf, even if it wasn't a big one. People were initially confused by this change, as the deck hadn't done anything despite having received legacy support not long before, and many wondered if it was a preventative measure for some more future support, though that never came to be. And at number 3, we have Armory Arm. This is a level 4 light machine synchro with generic materials, which works like a union monster. In that, once per turn, you can equip this card to another monster or special summon from the spell trap card zone in attack position. While it's equipped by this effect, the monster gains 1000 attack. And if it destroys a monster by battle and sends it to the graveyard, you inflict damage to your opponent equal to the destroyed monster's attack. Armory Arm was one of the best generic synchros around back when it was still the newest summoning mechanic. This was in part due to being the only level 4 synchro at the time but it was also amazing at enabling OTKs. The extra damage could often be the difference between ending the game or not, but there was also a very popular OTK build around this card. By summoning both Colossal Fighter and Armory Armor in the same turn, you can use Armory Arm to equip itself to an opponent's monster with more than 1800 attack, and then crash Colossal into it. Since Armory Arm doesn't specify you have to be the one beating over an opponent's monster, it'll burn your opponent for 2800 when you crash into it, and then Colossal can special summon itself back from the graveyard since it's just been destroyed by battle, allowing you to crash it again. Repeat this a couple more times, and you can deplete your opponent's life points with just these two cards. This interaction was used as a payoff for many synchro combo decks for that time, such as Fish OTK, and though it wasn't something every deck could do, it was definitely a strategy you needed to be prepared for. That is, until Konami eroded Armory Arm a couple years after its initial release, making it so that its effect would now check the destroyed monster's attack in the graveyard, making it not work with Colossal since it comes back and breaking up the OTK entirely. This errata was probably done as a way to unify how the card worked between the TCG and the OCG, since in Japan, the card had slightly different wording, and so it was ruled there that the OTK wouldn't actually work. Still, the weird part about the Serata is that when 2022 came around and an Armory Arm got a reprint in the West, it had gotten its original effect back, making the OTK possible yet again. This is possibly the only instance of an Arata being reverted, and stealthily at that. As it's not like there was any announcement about it, Konami simply updated the database with its newer text and called it a day. And at number 2, we have Goyo Guardian. This is a level 6 synchro monster, which takes an earth tuner plus one or more non-tuner monsters, and has 2800 attack. Whenever it destroys a monster by battle and sends it to the graveyard, you can special summon that monster to your side of the field in defense position. Goyo was one of, if not the most powerful synchro back when the mechanic was still fresh out of the oven. With a gargantuan attack stat of 2800, Eclipse not only all other synchros of its level, it also beat many of the higher level ones as well. Not only is this a huge threat, it also snowballed extremely quickly as it's still in effect turns every successful battle from a plus one into a plus two. It's important to note that before its errata, this card had no restriction on its summoning materials, and also that level six synchros were really easily accessible. This card, together with Brionic, gave you tools to deal with almost everything that could be thrown at you, and made decks with easier access to level six synchros like Black Wings a considerable force within the metagame. Similarly to Brio, this card spent a long time limited before being banned due to how much they invalidated the rest of the available synchro pool. The thing is that Brio proved to be much stronger than Goyo in the long run. Battle-related effects fell off extremely quickly, while Brio's ability to bounce cards only got more applications with time. This led to Goyo eventually being freed somewhat around 2014, and though it still saw some play in decks like Shadal's, 
it wasn't really that big of a deal anymore. That is, according to the eyes of the TCG. In the OCG, this card remained banned all the way until 2017, where they finally allowed it to come back, but only with its errata to its materials, which made it require an earth tuner. To the eyes of the West, this was completely unnecessary, as the card had fallen out naturally a long time ago. To put things into perspective, the TCG got this change a month after Zodiac Dryden was released, the power level disparity between these two cards being such that Dryden is still banned to this day. It isn't clear if the OCG really feared this card, or if they just held a grudge from back when it dominated the metagame. But this is definitely one of the most unwarranted nerfs to a monster out there. And finally, at number one, we have Imperial Order. This is a continuous trap card, which reads, pre errata, negate all spell effects on the field. During your standby phase, pay 7 to your life points or destroy this card. Imperial Order got banned really early on in Yu Gi Oh!'s lifespan, finding itself a place on the Forbidden List all the way back in 2004, for a really obvious reason, too. This card allowed you to lock your opponent out of spells entirely for a few turns, which has always been game winning. And when you wanted to use your spells yourself, you could just choose to not pay the maintenance cost and it would destroy itself. It took over 10 years, but eventually Konami thought this card would be fine to be brought back into the game with one small change. They changed it so the 700 life point payment was no longer optional and also was done during both players' turns, meaning you couldn't get rid of your own IO as easily as before. While this did lower the power of the card slightly, it was still one of the most powerful floodgates in the history of the game. Overnight, this card became a staple in pretty much every side deck as one of the best going first options you could have. Spell cards play a vital role in pretty much every single deck, often being consistency pieces, utility, and removal. If you go first and have IO, you can use all your spells that you desire on your turn, and then when your opponent tries to use them to deal with your board, you flip over IO and lock them out of the game. Locking yourself out of spells for the next turn doesn't matter if you're so far ahead that your opponent can't possibly come back into the fray. It didn't help that many decks could easily deal with their IO if they still needed to use spells like Zudiant and Dryden to pop their own. This one of and many side decks helped turn many Yuga matches into non-games by how much it restricted your opponent going second, filling a similar role to what Trap Dust Shoe did in the past. This card only got more toxic as time passed too. The game became faster, making this even more of a blowout than it already was. The release of Pot of Prosperity gave decks even a higher chance of fighting it when going first, since many players would do their whole combo to empty the deck of their engine pieces and then have an even higher chance of fighting their order. Worst of all is that in the presence of Mystic Mind in the format, the card even had a reasonable reason to be main decked as it was a pretty good out, which made it more than a post-side worry. Now, despite being so hated and seeing such consistent play, Konami seemed unwilling to hit it all the way until early 2022, as if they couldn't admit they had made a mistake. Of all the erratas around, the one to Imperial Order is the most unfortunate one. Not because it ruined the card, but because of all the formats it made worse with its existence. Surprise Chain is a quick play spell card that can only be activated as a chain link 4 or higher where it gains multiple effects based on the chain link that it's activated on. For the best effect, which you get at chain link 4 or higher, you get to draw one card. So basically, for its best effect, it becomes a regular upstart goblin, which while a decent effect replaces itself within your deck, is not really worth the effort of going into a chain link 4, as it's actually kind of hard to accomplish that on your own, especially since all of the cards in the chain need to be unique cards, so you can't just chain it to one of your cards, chaining off itself with multiple activations of its effects, which is how most chain link cards work. However, it does have two other effects to get along the way. One of them is to simply send the top card of your deck to the graveyard, and the other one is to look at the top cards of your deck equal to the chain link and then place them back in any order, which is where the main merit of this card comes into play, as you can select which of the cards you're about to draw and also select which card you're going to send to the graveyard by simply having the one you want to send to the graveyard on top of the deck and the one you want to draw as the second from the top, which does make the card a lot better but still a little bit too hard to manage to see any kind of competitive play. Paying half your life points in Yu-Gi-Oh! is usually attached to really good effects because of how steep of a cost that can be. And in this list, we'll go over 10 of the worst cards that require you to pay half your life points for their effects. And at number 10, we have Steel Swarm Hercules. This card has the effect where you can pay half your life points to destroy all of the cards in the field once per turn. Now, this effect is actually pretty good which is why it's at the bottom of this list and probably one of the better cards here. The reason this card does make this list, however, is because of its summoning requirements. In order to bring this card out, you have to normal summon it with three tributes. Three Steel Swarm tributes to be more precise. You can't even use good tribute fodder engines in order to cheat this card out easier, like you can with other monsters that require three tributes. Luckily, for Steel Swarms though, they have some pretty decent cards that make bringing this one out not much of a chore. They have an archetype softly revolving around tribute summoning. And some tribute summon focused Steel Swarm decks even saw competitive play in Yu Gi Oh! Duel Links, though none of those decks used Steel Swarm Hercules. They were more revolved around Steel Swarm Gearstag and Steel Swarm Moth. 
monsters who require 1 and 2 tributes for their effects. And that's because getting out 3 tributes for a beat stick whose only effect is to wipe the field is just a tad bit cumbersome, especially when it's just a worse Judgment Dragon. Judgment Dragon has the same effect of destroying all other cards in the field, except it's much easier to bring out, only requires you to pay 1000 life points for its effect, and it can be used multiple times per turn. And it's really that ease of access that lets Judgment Dragon go down in history as one of the better boss monsters, and why Steel Swarm Hercules never saw play in comparison. And at number 9, we have Cybernetic Fusion Support. This card requires you to pay half your life points in order to gain an effect for the turn, where, if you would fusion summon a machine fusion type monster, you can choose to banish monsters from your graveyard in addition to the field in your hand for that monster's fusion summon, if you use a different fusion card in order to bring out that fusion monster. This card doesn't actually let you fusion summon anything on its own, it just allows you to also use targets from your graveyard, and it only lets you bring out one machine fusion monster in this way. So it's kind of like Chain Material, a card that lets you use monsters from your graveyard and deck as fusion materials for the entire turn, except you can't attack that turn, and your fusion monsters are destroyed during the end phase. And Chain Material is actually a pretty good card, which would be very broken if it was a spell card and could be used during your first turn. And since Cybernetic Fusion Support is like a weaker version of Chain Material, I can see why they gave it so many restrictions, only allowing it to use on one fusion monster, not allowing you to use monsters from your deck, and requiring you to pay half your life points to do so, where Chain Material doesn't have an activation cost. This card did see some play, however, in one Cyber Dragon Kaiju deck that saw some competitive success multiple times, though I wouldn't say this card was a central combo piece in that deck, as it was played as a one-off and wasn't really necessary to the win condition, as most other Cyber Dragon decks forego playing this card, as it's not very good. It's not terrible, though, despite the fact that it's making it in this top 10 worst of list. It can essentially turn any polymerization into a Miracle Fusion, though at the cost of using two cards and half your life points, instead of one card like Miracle Fusion. And this card does see a lot of play in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links. You see, there's this special kind of deck that tries to lose as fast as possible. That way players can use it in rank matches if they want to drop ranking quickly, or farm out skills. And since this card is an easy to use spell card that pays half your life points that doesn't require a board state, it's a very fast way to reduce your life points to a low value so you can burn yourself quicker. Although it's been a while since I've seen people do this, so I'm not sure if this strategy works anymore in that game. And at number 8, we have Dark Magic Curtain. This spell card requires you to pay half your life points to special summon a Dark Magician from your deck. Which, right off the bat, being able to special summon a monster from your deck at the cost of half your life points is a good effect. That's why cards like A Hero Lives sees lots of play and is currently limited on the ban list. However, the card continues to also have another restriction on it, where you cannot summon other monsters the turn you activate this effect. So it locks you out of any other monsters except that one Dark Magician you bring out, except for maybe a card you want to set later on. It does allow you to normal set that turn which is still a really terrible restriction on the card. That's also why no one played a very good card like Red Eyes Fusion until Predaplant Verte Anaconda came out. Red Eyes Fusion would allow you to use monsters from your deck as fusion materials, but since it won't let you summon other monsters for the turn, it didn't really see any competitive play. And Predaplant Verte Anaconda allows you to bypass this restriction and use the effect of the card from your deck, which is why it currently sees tons of play over in the OCG as well as having a really good target for that fusion card. And that's why even though it technically has a good effect of special summoning a 2500 attack beat stick from the deck, it never saw any competitive success. Despite the fact that Dark Magician decks have recently seen a resurgence, thanks to some new overpowered support cards, and even with the new support, they still don't use this card, because they basically released a better card that does what this card was trying to do, which does such a good job at it, that it sees play in other non-Dark Magician decks as well. And at number 7, we have Judgment of the Pharaoh. This is the trap card, which requires you to pay half your life points to select and activate one of two of its effects. The first is if you have Yujo Friendship in your graveyard, your opponent can't summon monsters or activate their monster effects for the rest of the turn. If you control Unity in your graveyard, your opponent can't activate set spell or trap cards, and all effects of face-up spell or trap cards are negated until the end of the turn. Now. Both of these effects are actually really good. 
And the only problem with this card is that you have to get these two cards in the graveyard in order to use this effect. Yujo Friendship is a unique card which has the potential to change you and your opponent's life points to half of a combination of both of your current life points. So it's only really useful if you're really behind in the game and you have like no life points and you want to steal some of your opponents while lowering theirs by a good amount at the same time, which honestly isn't super good. And Unity has the potential to increase the defense of a monster on your side of the field by a whole bunch, which can be useful for certain kinds of decks. But generally, cards that increase the defense are some of the worst cards in the game, as that's one of the worst positive effects in the game technically. And only one archetype makes positive use of their defense, and they don't play spell or trap cards. So having to play two dead cards and then get them into the graveyard so that you can use this one card's good effects, which essentially is just a floodgate for a turn, isn't worth it. And that's why this card with two technically strong effects doesn't see any competitive play. Having to set up your graveyard in order to pull off a floodgate effect for one turn is too much of a setup when you can just play normal floodgates that don't require you to jump through hoops to activate their effects. And at number six, we have Mixeroid. This card has an effect on the field where you can tribute a machine type monster to special summon a non-wind roid monster from your deck. And that effect is actually pretty decent in roids, as it can allow you to change out a low level roid for a high level roid from your deck. Although, it doesn't allow you to target any of the speed roids, since they're all of the wind attribute. And that's by design, because the speed roids are actually kind of good, whereas the normal roids are kind of a joke. Now, this card also has a graveyard effect, where you can pay half your life points in order to banish this card, as well as as many machine monsters from your graveyard as possible, in order to special summon a roid fusion monster with the exact same level as the amount of cards banished. Now, there are no speed roid fusion monsters, so you only have the choice of the roid fusions, and the lowest level roid fusion monster is Parasychroid, which isn't really worth bringing out on its own. That card was kind of made to be brought out with Power Bond, since it can attack directly with its effect, and it very much wants its attack to be doubled in order to make better use of that. And the good Roid monster you would want to bring out is level 10, so having to banish 9 other machine type monsters from your graveyard is not really a game state that happens very often, not with cards like That Grass Looks Greener being banned. This card is so close to being good. If it just didn't require you to banish so many monsters in order to bring out the good fusion cards, it would totally be worth its life point cost. Or if roids just had better lower level fusion targets, it might be worth playing. But as it stands now, normal, non-speedroid decks don't see competitive play. And the addition of Mixeroid, which was a new wave of support cards added to them, did not change that fact. And at number 5, we have Dark Lord Descent. This is a trap card, which requires you to pay half your life points to activate it, which then allows you to special summon up to two Dark Lord monsters from your graveyard in defense position, just as long as you meet one other little requirement, which is for your opponent to control a level that is exactly the same as the monsters you want to bring out. And since most of the Dark Lord archetype is level 6 and higher, with the majority of them being around level 8, this is not a game state that you see very often. This card would be a lot better if the Dark Lords had a whole bunch of level 4 monsters, but it's a purely high level archetype, which means this card sees absolutely no play because it's too difficult to force the requirement yourself. There are ways to do it. You can just give your opponent a Kaiju. Most Kaijus are high level and the best one is level 8, which would allow you to bring out the best Dark Lord. And there's even some Dark Lords who can just copy the effect of this card in the graveyard. So you can kind of ignore the other downside of this card to being a trap card which usually would require you to wait a turn before you could use it. But even though you can copy this card's effect from the graveyard, and you can give your opponent a kaiju in order to make this card live, it's still not played because that's still too much setup. It's kind of like why Judgment of the Pharaoh doesn't see play, even though it technically has two good effects. It's just too many hoops to jump through that's not worth it, which is exactly the case with Dark Lord Descent. Even though it technically has a really good effect that the Dark Lord archetype would love to use, it already has a tough requirement to pain half your life points in a deck that's all about paying a whole bunch of life points to use all of their effects. It's just not live very often, and it doesn't work as a good combo extender, which is what the card is kind of supposed to be. And at number 4, we have Soul Strike. This is a battle trap that can only be activated when you have 4,000 or less life points, which let me tell you a little something about battle traps. 
they already see very little play because they're sitting targets for your opponent's spell or trap card removal. And generally, the only trap cards that actually see play on a wide scale are cards that can either be used from your hand, or ones that can be chained to spell and trap card removal, which battle traps cannot be, since they require a specific trigger of the battle taking place. Now, let's continue with the rest of this card's effects. If you meet the conditions of this card, you can pay half your life points and then target one of your face-up monsters, and it will gain attack equal to how much lower your life points are than 4,000 until the end of your opponent's turn. So, since this attack increase applies after you pay life points, if you have exactly 4,000 life points, for example, when you use this card's effect, your life points will go down to 2,000 after you pay the cost. And then you increase the attack of one of your monsters by 2,000, since that's the difference between 4,000 and your current life point value. And it can get even higher if your life points are at 1,000 when you use this card. You then pay its cost and go down to 500, and your monster would gain 3,500 attack. So you have the potential to gain a whole bunch of attack from this one card as generally, the cap on effects that give monsters attack points is set at around 2,000 max, and rarely do cards give more than 2,000 attack. So this card does have the potential to give a hefty chunk of attack points, but better cards like the Mirror Force cards, which can just get rid of all of your opponent's cards without requiring you to have a weird specific life point value, don't see very much play nowadays, and those cards are technically much more useful than Soul Strike and don't require you to pay half your life points in order to use them. And at number 3, we have Sabatel, the Philosopher's Stone. Now, this card can allow you to pay half your life points to search out a polymerization spell card from your deck, or a fusion spell card. Now, being able to search out any fusion spell card is actually pretty good, and would definitely be worth paying half your life points for it on a spell card. But, you need to have a winged Kariba monster in your graveyard in order to activate this effect which puts it in the territory of Judgment of the Pharaoh, where it requires you to play subpar cards and get them in the graveyard in order to use a good effect. Which means this card doesn't see any play because that's not worth the cost. Now, this card has another effect, where if you have three copies of this card in your graveyard, you can banish all three copies in order to increase the attack of one monster on the field by the attack of the highest attack monster on the field. So if you choose a monster you control with 500 attack, and your opponent controls a monster with 4,000 attack, you can increase the attack of your card to 4,500 until the end of the turn. Now, that's not a half bad effect, but it's way too hard to pull off normally, and it's not good enough an effect where you'd want to put resources into getting three copies of this card into the graveyard. Although I do believe this card had a much more broken effect in the anime, and this is kind of the watered down version of it, which is probably why it's kind of bad. And at number two, we have Malefic Truth Dragon. This is a 5,000 attack main deck monster, making it tied with Dystopia the Despondent for having the highest original attack of a main deck monster in the game. And what this card does is if you destroy a monster by battle, you can destroy all of your opponent's other face-up monsters. Which, okay, isn't a half bad effect in a monster that has one of the highest original attacks in the game. It's kind of everything else about this card that makes it take a higher spot on this list. You see, you can only summon this card if another malefic monster you control is destroyed by battle or card effects. In which case, you get to pay half your life points to special summon this card from your hand or graveyard. And if there's no face-up field spell card on the field, this card destroys itself. So, not only does it have no protection, it has a weakness while on the field. Where if your opponent just destroys your field spell card, this card will destroy itself. Now, here's the thing about the Malefic archetype. They're better used as support cards to other decks than they are used in their own deck and Malefic Truth Dragon really requires you to play a pure Malefic deck for it to actually hit the field. Since only in a Malefic deck would you be playing this card and getting it into your hand or graveyard. As other decks that play the good Malefic cards, like Malefic Cyber and Dragon or Malefic Stardust Dragon, kind of use them as extenders or big beat sticks, because all of the Malefic monsters have this negative effect where other monsters cannot attack while the Malefic monsters on the field, and you can only control one face-up Malefic monster. This restriction is so bad that they release a new support card for Malefic monsters, specifically the card Malefic Territory, which straight up changes the effects of Malefic monsters on the field, so they no longer have that restriction. You know an archetype is in trouble when they release new support cards that change a shared effect amongst all their monsters. And even with Malefic Territory being released, Malefic decks still don't see competitive play, even if Malefic one-offs occasionally see play in decks as combo extenders. And at number one, we have Vanity's Call. 
This card can only be activated as a chain link four or higher and requires you to pay half your life points in order to use it. In which case you get to negate all other effects in the same chain as this card and destroy them. Now on paper this seems like a really powerful effect. Being able to negate a whole bunch of cards at once if your opponent is going through a huge chain link for some kind of combo. But this is actually an incredibly situational scenario which doesn't happen very often. Usually chain links end at two and you'd have to increase the chain link with one of your own cards in order to be able to activate this card as the fourth chain link. In which case you'd lose that card you use in order to force this card's activation. Trading two for two on your opponent while also losing half your life points in the process. That's why cards like Accumulated Fortune exist without any restrictions on the ban list. It's a trap card that allows you to draw two cards without any other negative side effects for the rest of the turn. And all you have to do is activate it as a chain link four or higher. And this can only be commonly done in chain burn decks. A deck specifically revolving around getting a whole bunch of chain link setups so that you can use cards like Accumulated Fortune to gain advantage. And Vanity's Call does not work at all in those decks. They're trying to get chain links high so they can gain beneficial effects for themselves, not negate every other card in that chain. Honestly, if they just dropped the chain link requirement of this card down to three instead of four, it would probably be really good. But four is just one too high that makes it almost useless, which is why it takes the top spot on this list. Though I would not say it easily takes the top spot on this list. This card definitely has the potential to be pretty good if used against a future deck that has a whole bunch of chain links in it. But as it stands now, it's more right to call this card an incredibly niche counter card that's probably not worth playing outside of very specific situations. Crow Tengu is a level 4 monster which has the effect where if it's special summoned from the graveyard or destroyed by opponent's card effect, you can destroy one attack with this monster your opponent controls. Now, the ability to destroy monsters when destroyed by card effect is decent, and so is being able to destroy a card when it's special summoned from the graveyard. Something that zombie monsters are very adept at even. However, for the same activation requirement, you could bring out Thunderclap Skywolf, which when it's special summoned from the graveyard can destroy all of your opponent's face up monsters and even has a higher stat line to boot. However, one of the main benefits Crow Tengu has is that it's a zombie type monster. So it's inherently able to benefit from zombie cards and can special summon from the graveyard a lot easier, like with the all-star Mezuki, which can banish off from the graveyard to special summon a zombie monster from the graveyard. The only problem is there are so many better cards to use Mezuki on instead that it's kind of a waste to use it on Crow Tengu, if you even had a good way to set it up. And it also shares a hard once per turn between both its special summon and getting destroyed effect, so you can't even destroy two cards during the same turn. Now, the effect to special summon a monster from the deck is one of the best effects in the game. So in this list, we'll go over some of the worst cards in the game that technically have good effects to special summon monsters from the deck. And at number 10, we have Dark Sage, one of the few monsters in the game that can special summon itself from the deck, as long as the conditions for its summoning have been fulfilled on the field. Now, this card has a really convoluted requirement in the fact that you need to have Dark Magician on your side of the field, who was there after you applied the effect of Time Wizard, in which you resolved its effect correctly. As Time Wizard has an effect where you can flip a coin and then call it either heads or tails. And if you call it correctly, you get to destroy all monsters on your opponent's side of the field. But if you call it incorrectly, your monsters are destroyed instead, and then you take some damage to your life points. So if you have two specific monsters on the field, and you successfully call a coin toss correctly, you'll get to tribute your Dark Magician to special summon Dark Sage from your deck. And when you do so, you also get to add any one spell card from your deck to your hand, which is another one of the best effects in the game. Now, the reason this card is at number 10 at the bottom of this list is because if you do pull off its effect, it's actually pretty good, especially since it special summons itself and allows you to search out any spell card. But the requirements are a little bit too ridiculous for it to be competitive in any kind of sense, especially since it requires you to get lucky and isn't a reliable summoning method. And at number 9, we have Crop Circles. This is a trap card that allows you to send a monster from your side of the field to the graveyard in order to special summon an alien monster from your deck who has a level exactly equal to the levels of the monsters sent to the graveyard for its effect. So if you send a level 4 monster to the graveyard, you can special summon a level 4 alien. Or if you send two monsters whose levels equal 6, you can bring out a level 6 alien. But if you fail to find an alien with the exact same levels, you instead take 2,000 points of damage. Now, this card is actually fine in everything. It's just there aren't really any good aliens that you'd want to use this card with. 
generally, the best way to use this card would be to swap out a level 4 for another level 4, and the best one I can think of that you'd want to swap out during your opponent's turn from the deck is probably Alien Kid, who can give your opponent A counters during their turn. And if you want to combine low level aliens to bring out a high level one, the best target is Alien Overlord, who can already special summon itself pretty easily from the hand, and is not really the kind of card you need to special summon directly from your deck by getting rid of three resources for it. In order to go into Alien Overlord, you'd have to go minus two in card advantage, and Alien Overlord is just not worth that amount of effort. There are other high level aliens, but they're not very good, and all of the low level aliens are kind of similar in strength and power levels, where you wouldn't really want to waste a crop circle swapping them out, especially since aliens also have a good card that special summons aliens from the deck already, called Mysterious Triangle, where you can destroy one monster on the field with an A counter, and then special summon any level 4 alien monster from your deck. Mysterious Triangle is all pure advantage and is actually good, and can be used during your turn since it's a quick play spell card, whereas Crop Circles requires you to wait a turn and is an inherent minus one. So you would just never play that card unless they released a really good low level alien that you want to search out from your deck as soon as possible and during your opponent's turn. And at number eight, we have Gusto Falcon. Now this card has an effect that when it's sent from the field to the graveyard, if it was face up and it wasn't destroyed by battle, you can special summon any one Gusto monster from your deck in face down defense position. Now at first glance, this seems pretty good. It's a standard floating effect that allows you to special summon any Gusto from your deck, including the high level ones. And this card itself is a tuner monster. So you could even go for synchro summons and then maybe proc its effect. And you'd be absolutely wrong to think you could use it in this way because this effect is worded in a way that it would actually miss its timing if you used it in a synchro summon. You see, this card has what we call an optional when effect to its special summon from the deck effect, where when this card is sent to the graveyard, you can special summon a gusto from your deck. And since it's optional, it can miss timing if something else happens immediately after it's sent to the graveyard. And since synchro summoning requires you to send cards to the graveyard as a cost, in order to bring out the synchro monster, it will miss its timing as you have to activate it as soon as it's sent to the graveyard. And you'll miss that with the synchro summon monster coming out afterwards. It also doesn't work if this card is destroyed by battle, nor if this card is face down. So the only way to actually activate this card's effect is if it's sent to the graveyard while it's been face up on the field and it was sent there by a card effect which doesn't cause it to miss its timing. So. If your opponent uses something like a dark hole on you, and you had Falcon face up, then you would get to activate its effect. Honestly, this effect is kind of difficult to activate on your own, because it misses timing so easily and has so many restrictions on it, especially since it's a low attack monster with only 600 attack. So it's not like you're going to normal summon this thing face up so that you have the chance to activate its floating effect. Honestly, the main use of this card is probably the fact that it's a tuner who can be special summoned from the deck with other gusto monsters and just use for synchro summons, and then maybe occasionally will allow you to float into a monster if your opponent tries to disrupt your strategies by destroying this card first. And that's kind of why it gets a low spot on this list, since it's still a little bit more useful than all the other cards on this list, even if it is still kind of an incredibly difficult floating effect to activate for how simple it seems. And at number seven, we have UFO Roid. Now this card is pretty simple, in that if it's destroyed by battle, you can special summon any machine type monster with 1500 or less attack from your deck. And since UFO Roid itself is a machine type monster with less than 1500 attack, it can special summon other copies of itself from the deck when it's destroyed by battle. However, this is a level 6 monster who has this effect, and it's part of the Roid archetype, which is kind of one of the worst archetypes in the game, who definitely don't have a way to get this card out easier. And that's kind of why it's on this list. In order to bring out this card normally, you have to tribute summon for it, when it has an effect very similar to a lot of the other elemental floaters, who get to special summon a monster from their deck of their attribute as long as it has less than 1500 attack, whereas all of those are level 4 monsters and can be used directly from the hand. UFO Roid is a high level monster for some reason, so the best way to use UFO Roid would be to cheat out of the deck with one of the elemental floaters, like Shining Angel, ironically who can then bring out UFO Roid from the deck if it's destroyed by battle. And really, if you need to bring out a machine type monster with less than 1500 attack, 
you're better off running one of the elemental floaters who happens to have the attribute of the monster you want. Which is usually not these cards at all because they've been kind of power crap to uselessness. Monsters who only activate their effects when being destroyed by battle are just not very good in the meta game anymore. Doubly so when they didn't even see very much play when that was part of the meta. Like in the case of UFO Roid. And at number 6 we have Rosebud. This is a specific spell card that allows you to tribute one elemental hero no spay in order to special summon elemental hero poison rose from your hand or deck. Now the thing with these cards is that they're not very good and generally using an unsearchable normal spell card in order to tribute summon one specific monster to bring out another specific monster that's not even good is generally not very good. As the card it brings out elemental hero poison rose is a 1900 attack beat stick, which can't be brought out unless it's with Rosebud, and all it does is gain attack whenever it inflicts battle damage, and your opponent can only target this card with attacks. That is not at all worth its summoning requirements, and kind of makes it one of the worst elemental hero monsters. So of course its specific spell card that brings it out from the deck easily makes a spot on this list. However, these cards are part of the elemental hero archetype, and there's like 1 million support cards for searching these cards out, so it's a little bit more playable than some of the other higher spots on this list. And at number 5 we have Rainbow Gravity. This is a trap card which has the effect to special summon any one ultimate crystal monster from your deck or graveyard, ignoring its summoning conditions, which means you can bring out Rainbow Dragon with this card. However, this card has the requirement where you must have 7 Crystal Beast cards with different names on the field or on your graveyard in order to activate it, and until recently there were only 7 Crystal Beast monsters in the game, with a new one being released called Rainbow Dragon the Zenith Crystal Beast, which isn't even in the TCG yet. And of the 7 Crystal Beast monsters, 6 of them are pretty terrible. So if you just replace one of those 6 with the new one, that would still require you to play 5 terrible monsters in your deck in order to meet the requirements of Rainbow Gravity. Now, all you have to do is get those cards in the graveyard, so it doesn't seem that bad. Until you remember, getting 7 specific cards in the graveyard is incredibly difficult. So difficult that only being able to special summon a rainbow dragon for your deck for all that effort is not worth it. Especially since you have to play basically 5 bricks in your deck, which could muddy up your hand with mediocre cards that will just lose you the game. And that's kind of the crux of the Crystal Beast archetype though. A lot of their cards are just not super playable in the modern format, and weren't even that good back in the day when they first came out. Which is why requiring 7 cards of different names in your graveyard is a little bit too steep of a cost for a 4k beat stick. If they were to release new, better Crystal Beast monsters in the future, Rainbow Gravity might leave this list and actually be pretty good, but for now it squarely takes a number 5 spot on this list instead. And at number 4 we have Familiar Possessed Hita. Technically all of the Familiar Possessed cards make this list since they all basically do the same thing with just different attributes, as what this card does is it can special summon itself from the deck once its conditions have been met, similar to Dark Sage. And all you need to do is have one Hita the Fire Charmer and one Fire Monster on your side of the field, in which case you send both those cards to the graveyard in order to bring this card out. Now Hita the Fire Charmer is a low level flip effect monster who simply has the effect that when it's flipped face up, you can take control of a face up fire monster your opponent controls. You know, as long as this card survives that battle. It needs to stay face up on the field in order to control that card. So it's already dependent on your opponent controlling a certain attribute of monster. But hey, there are ways to change your opponent's attributes around, so that's not a deal breaker. So the intended summoning method would be to use Hita the Fire Charmer to steal one of your opponent's monsters, and then you send both of them to the graveyard in order to bring out familiar possessed Hita. And what do you get for accomplishing this somewhat cumbersome summoning method? you get an 1850 beat stick who can inflict piercing battle damage. And that's it. Which is to say, not very good. Kind of on the terrible end of the spectrum, but hey, at least you can use this card from your hand as if it was a normal level 4 monster. It just won't gain piercing damage as its effect. Now, this card came out back in the day when piercing battle damage was only on low attack monsters, so having an 1850 piercer was alright, but wasn't even a big deal back then. So when they released the light and dark versions of this card later on, they gave them the added effect of being able to search out a spellcaster type monster from your deck, in addition to them summoning themselves from the deck and having piercing battle damage, which really helped offset the cost of how cumbersome these cards are to use. 
So really, only the original Familiar Possessed cards make this list, with them being some of the few cards in this game that can special summon themselves from the deck. And also keeping true to the theme that all cards that can special summon themselves from the deck are pretty bad. Speaking of cards that can special summon themselves from the deck and are also bad, at number 3 we have Red Eyes Black Metal Dragon. This card can special summon itself from the deck if you tribute a Red Eyes Black Dragon who is equipped with the specific trap card called Mental Morph. Now, Red Eyes Black Dragon is a level 7 Nora monster who definitely requires resources to be brought out, so it's not an easy feat to get this card on the field. And Metal Morph is a normal trap card, which means it does have lots of search methods. And it has the effect where it can equip itself to one phase that monster you control, it gives that monster 300 attack and defense, and if your monster attacks into an opponent's monster, it will gain half the attack of the monster it's attacking during the damage step. So it's actually a really good card for beating over pretty much any of your opponent's monsters, and was a staple card in Duel Links during the early days of the game, because it's a legitimately good card. Now, Red Eyes Black Metal Dragon is basically a 2800 attack vanilla monster. It has 100 more attack than Metal Morph would give the original Red Eyes Black Dragon, and it doesn't have the good effect of Metal Morph of gaining extra attack when it attacks into a monster. So actually bringing out Red Eyes Black Metal Dragon would be a straight up downgrade to just keeping the normal Red Eyes Black Dragon equipped with Metal Morph. A card that's actually worse than the materials used to bring it out kind of has to make a high spot on this list. Because at least the familiar Possessed cards and Dark Sage are better than the cards that bring them out. Not the other way around like with Red Eyes Black Metal Dragon. Although I should say Metal Zoa should also take this spot on this list. It has the exact same conditions and summoning requirements as Red Eyes Black Metal Dragon, only with a card called Zoa. And these are the only two Metal Morph upgraded forms in the game, and they're both pretty bad. But at least Red Eyes monsters have a mountain of support cards to bring it out easier. And at number 2, we have Bonding H2O. This is a spell card which requires you to tribute three specific monsters on your side of the field in order to special summon Water Dragon from your hand deck or graveyard. So, this is an inherent minus 3 on summon. Which, okay, that's pretty bad, but maybe the card it brings out is super good? Well, it definitely is if you're going against a Fire or Pyro deck. As while this card is out, the attack of all Fire and Pyro monsters on the field just becomes zero. So, this is the ultimate counter to Fire type decks, of which that's probably the least used attribute in the game, and Pyro type is one of the least plentiful types in the game. And it also has an optional floating effect to bring out the three monsters used to bring this card out. And it's also worded in a way that it can miss timing. So that's a pretty good floating effect on this card. If it's destroyed, it floats into three monsters. You know, as long as it doesn't miss its timing or get removed from the field in some other way. Now, to give this card some credit, of the three monsters used to bring it out, one of the cards, Hydrogen On, can potentially bring out other copies of itself from the deck in order to make tributing two of them much more easier. Although Bonding H2O is still a really bad card, which is why when they released new support for this archetype, they created a brand new card called Bonding D2O, which just straight up replaces Bonding H2O, as it can bring out Water Dragon from the deck and treats it as if it was special summoned through the effect of Bonding H2O. And Bonding D2O still requires you to tribute three specific cards, although it does allow you to tribute cards from your hand as well as the field, so it's a lot easier to use, and can special summon Water Dragon Cluster, who is a much better Water Dragon that can actually float into two Water Dragons when it's destroyed. And Bonding D2O also has a graveyard effect to return itself to your hand if a water dragon on the field is destroyed. Now, if the original card was so bad that they created a brand new card that makes the old one obsolete, that kind of says something about how unfixable the original card was, and also why it takes the number two spot on this list. And at number one, we have Magical Labyrinth, another specific spell card that summons one specific monster from the deck. Now, this one is actually a lot easier to use than Bonding H2O, as you just have to equip it to another card called Labyrinth Wall, who is a level 5 vanilla monster with 3000 defense. And if you fulfill these conditions, you can tribute Labyrinth Wall in order to special summon Wall Shadow from your deck. Wall Shadow is a level 7 effect monster whose only effect is that it cannot be summoned except by the effect of Magical Labyrinth, and has 1600 attack and 3000 defense. Now, here's the thing about Wall Shadow. It's not really an upgrade over Labyrinth Wall. Sure, it actually has attack points at 1600, but that's not a good attack point value. The whole benefits of using Labyrinth Wall is that it has very high defense for a one tribute monster. And there's even a couple of ways to cheat it out since it has normal monster support. 
whereas Wall Shadow has no such support, is much harder to bring out, and isn't even worth being brought out because you wouldn't want to put this card into attack position. There's no reason to tribute Labyrinth Wall for a 1600 attack boost, when the whole point of the card is just having high defense, which Wall Shadow does not beat. It has the exact same defense, so this could be considered a downgrade to Labyrinth Wall, despite requiring more conditions for its summoning. So this is kind of the case like with Red Eyes Black Metal Dragon, where the original card is probably better than the card it's bringing out, as even Water Dragon could float into three monsters when it was destroyed. Whereas Wall Shadow does nothing, it's just a defensive wall that has mediocre attack point values, which can be beaten over by pretty much any average level 4 lower monster. Which is why I think Magical Labyrinth takes the top spot on this list, because its only effect is bringing out a card that's basically not an upgrade over the card required to be tributed, who itself is not very good either. Omega Judgment is a trap card that allows you to send one phase-up monster card and spell and trap cards onto the graveyard in order to destroy two cards your opponent controls. So it's like an Icarus attack for monsters that go into the spell and trap card zone. And while this seems like it might be a decent card for decks like Crystal Beast or even Infernoble Knights, it's a decent tech option that none of them would really consider. Simply because they already use their cards in the spell trap card zone to do their own things already, and they don't really need the destruction. There's not really an archetype that puts monsters into the spell and trap card zone regularly that doesn't already use them for something. And while the effect to destroy two cards is good, it's a little bit too slow on a trap card and a little too unimpactful as it only destroys cards instead of banishing them or something else, to be worth considered running even as a niche option. In this video, we'll be going over some of the worst equipped cards in the game. And at number 10, we have Koitsu. This is a union monster who has the effect that while it's on the field, you can equip it to an Aitsu monster that you control in order to increase the attack of that monster by 3000 and give it piercing damage. Now a 3000 attack boost in piercing damage is pretty great, if there's something more to it than that. Instead, what you have are two incredibly low attack, high level monsters that are going to require you to use a whole bunch of other cards to get them out, and when you finally do, you just get an attack boost with piercing damage. And at that point, you're better off just playing Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon, who does what these two cards are trying to do, but 10 times better, and almost never sees competitive play. Because it turns out, big beaters with piercing damage aren't super good. Especially when they have no other kind of protection and it's really hard to bring out the cards associated to that combo. You can cheese this a little bit with Union Carrier, but it won't actually gain the effect. And it would still require you to get out Aitsu, which is a level 5 normal monster with almost no stats. Now, this isn't all doom and gloom. They are incredibly high level monsters with low attack and defense. So there's lots of support cards that work on them which normally don't work on high level monsters. So if you're playing gimmick decks that really need level 10 or 5 monsters, there's probably a way to use these two cards. But honestly, they were kind of made as jokes, I assume. So of course Koitsu would take a spot on this list. And at number 9, we have Evil Blast. This is a trap card, which can only be equipped to one of your opponent's monsters after they special summon a monster. And then, this card has the effect to increase the attack of your opponent's monster by 500. But, during each of your opponent's standby phases, they take 500 points of damage. Now, 500 burn damage every turn is pretty good in stall burn decks in Duel Links, but even in that game, Evil Blast is too cumbersome to use for that effect and they don't even bother with it. Because it can only be activated when your opponent special summons a monster. So it's not like you can activate this card and use it immediately in order to inflict 500 burn damage to your opponent as soon as your opponent's turn starts. You have to wait for them to special summon a card, and then hope they don't link it away or something. Plus, it gives that monster an attack boost, which is only really useful if you're playing cards that specifically want your opponent's attack to be changed, like Smile Potion or Ragna Zero. That is to say, not very useful in too many situations. Kind of a bad card, where even in Duel Links where it might be useful, they don't even use it. And at number 8, we have Insector Ant. This card has the effect, while it's on the field, you can equip an Insector monster from your hand or graveyard to this card which is an effect all the Insector monsters have. And its other effect is while this card is equipped to a monster, that monster's levels increase by 3 and it also gains that monster's attack and defense. And if the equipped monster would be destroyed, you can destroy the equipped card instead. Now, this card has 200 attack and defense, which means you're not gaining much of a boost. And increasing your card's level by 3 is kind of irrelevant, because an Insector monster is going to have to use their one equip per turn in order to put this card on them and all they gain out of that is 200 attack and a level boost. Now, 
What makes this card particularly bad is that there are so many good Insector monsters to use instead. Like, let's take a look at Insector Ladybug, for example. This card is miles better than Insector Ant, as it has the exact same effect, where it gives them the attack of this card as well as increasing the level that monster is equipped to. But it also has another effect while it's an equipped card, where it can send itself to the graveyard in order to increase the level of its equipped monster by two. And Insector monsters love to have their equipped cards on themselves being sent to the graveyard, because it allows you to activate the effects of Insector Dragonfly and Insector Centipede. Both of those cards have effects that activate when a card equipped to them is sent to the graveyard, where they can either search out an Insector card, or special summon an Insector card from the deck, and neither of these effects are once per turn. So they love cards like Ladybug that can send themselves to the graveyard in order to proc these search effects. And there's even cards like Insector Hornet and Insector Hopper, who similarly have effects that send themselves to the graveyard in order to gain effects. Insector Hornet can destroy a card when it sends itself to the graveyard, so it's the best Insector monster to equip to stuff. And Insector Hopper can allow the monster to attack directly. And Insector Ant does none of these things, and only provides an incredibly mediocre attack boost. It's kind of funny comparing cards like Insector Ant to Insector Hornet, where one of them is so laughably bad it's almost never used in Insector decks, and the other one is so amazingly good that it was limited on the ban list for years. Although, to be fair, Insector Firefly is pretty bad too, so it's not like Insector Ant is the lone terrible Insector card, but it's still bad enough in its archetype to make this list. And at number 7, we have Armed Changer. This is an equipped spell card, which can only be equipped to a monster by sending an equipped spell card from your hand to the graveyard. And when it's equipped to a monster, if that equipped monster destroys a monster by battle, you get to add a monster with an attack equal to or less than the equipped monsters from your graveyard to your hand. Now, adding cards from your graveyard back to your hand is a good effect, but this card is heavily limiting you on which cards you can actually add back. And technically, adding cards from your graveyard to your hand is considered going plus. So in order for this card to pay for itself, you would need to attack over two monsters in order to activate its effect twice. After which, it would then start going pure plus off of its effect. Although in normal Yu-Gi-Oh, equip cards generally don't see play because of how easy it is to destroy them. If you simply get rid of the monster it's equipped to, that card goes to waste, and pretty much all good decks have a way to destroy monsters. And if you equip it to an indestructible monster, if that card is simply flipped face down, this card gets destroyed. It's also vulnerable to all spell and trap card removal as well, and it's definitely worth a target since it requires you to discard in order to equip. So basically, all forms of removal work against equip cards, and that's why the only ones that generally see play are ones that allow you to gain immediate advantage off of them, which generally just involve equip cards that special summon monsters. And having such a steep cost for activating this card just makes it even more terrible. However, if you're able to ignore the card's discard costs and equip this card to a monster directly from your deck with something like Armory Call, then it's an okay card. You can use it to like add back hand traps or something if you manage to destroy something by battle, especially since you can just use Armory Call when you're about to attack something. You can even equip it to one of your opponent's monsters in order to get cards back every time your opponent destroys one of yours. Though it's very easy in modern Yu-Gi-Oh for them to just get rid of their monster for link plays or something. That's not super recommended either, but since it's not half bad if you can ignore its cost, it gets a slightly lower spot on this list. And at number 6, we have Germ Infection. This card has an effect that while you equip it to a non-machine type monster, that monster will start to lose 300 attack during each of its standby phases. Now, a little history about this card, well, personal history for me anyway, this was one of the first cards I ever owned, and I used to think it was amazing. A card that continuously reduces the attack of a monster each turn? That's crazy! And when I actually use the cards in decks, it never really performs super good. Because you see, this card doesn't actually do anything until your next turn. It won't actually start decreasing the attack of the monster until the start of your next standby phase. And a 300 attack reduction is not very much. So the intended use of this card would be to play it in stall decks and slowly whittle away at the attack of one of your opponent's strong monsters. But it doesn't actually prevent that monster from attacking or anything and you'd be much better off with really anything else. This card also has been power crept by Shattered Axe, which can be equipped to any monster and reduces the attack of that monster by 500 instead of 300, 
during each of your standby phases. And Shattered Axe is not very good either. And it's kind of funny that German Faction doesn't work on machine type monsters for lore reasons. Because, you know, can't really give a machine an infection. Although I'd argue can't really give pyrotype monsters an infection either. Or rock type monsters, but whatever. A lot of old school Yu Gi Oh cards had lore related effects that restricted them to not work on machine types, which is pretty funny. And at number 5, we have Brutal Potion. This is a trap card that becomes an equip card to a monster you control, and doesn't do anything on its own. This card has the potential to increase the attack of the equipped monster by 1000 until the end phase, but only if you're able to inflict effect damage to your opponent. If you're not able to inflict effect damage during the turn, then this card doesn't do anything. And if you do manage to do that, all you get is a 1000 attack boost until the end phase. And it's not like you can keep inflicting effect damage to increase the attack of the monster by a whole bunch for one turn, as its attack boost is once per turn. And you can only ever increase the attack of the equipped monster by 1000 per turn. And 1000 attack is not even worth it. There's cards like Axe of Despair which increase the attack of a monster by 1000 at all times for no cost. And that card's not even good. Now, I can imagine some intended use for this card. Like, your opponent is attacking into one of your monsters who has this card equipped. And then you activate some trap card which inflicts burn damage to your opponent in order to increase the attack of your monster by 1000 in order to maybe destroy your opponent's monster by that battle. Now, this card is still not very good even if used in that circumstance because you could use something like Blazing Mirror Force instead which would inflict a whole bunch of effect damage and destroy all of your opponent's monsters. And there's also the fact that even if you were using a decent deck that had a whole bunch of effect damage, you still wouldn't want to use this card because decks that focus on doing effect damage don't attack over things by battle. Generally, their monsters are there to just inflict effect damage as well, or draw more cards, or be stall options. There's very few archetypes which actually try to attack things and also inflict effect damage. There is one really good archetype which does exactly that, the Trickstar archetype, but even they wouldn't use this card because it's not good enough for them. And at number 4, we have Demotion. This card has the very outdated effect where it downgrades the monster equipped with this card by two levels. You can tell this is an old card by its wording, and surprisingly, reducing the level of one monster by two isn't super good. It's not useless though. There are ways to use this card to your advantage. Like, if you're playing against an opponent who goes into lots of Xyz monsters, messing with their levels can make it so they can't use that card for Xyz plays. You can also equip it to a normal monster who has the Amulet of Ambition card in order to make their level as low as possible. That way, you can gain as much attack as possible due to the effect of Amulet of Ambition, which increases the attack of your monster by 500 times the difference in its level to your opponents. So, if you are able to decrease the level of one of your monsters to 1 with this effect, and then you attacked into a monster who was level 7, that would be a 3000 attack boost. Still not super useful for that. It could also be used in one of your level 4 normal monsters to reduce its level to 2. That way it could be a target for the League of Uniform Nomenclature, which would net you a plus 1 in card advantage, which is not half bad. It could also be used to decrease the level of one of your monsters to 2, so that a Junk Warrior could gain a whole bunch of attack when it hits the field. Or so that you could attack under the effect of Gravity Bind. There's lots of really mediocre ways to take advantage of this effect, and you may be surprised to hear that this card was never used in a topping competitive deck. But there's so many gimmicky ways to have fun with this card that you can't really hate it too much. And at number 3, we have Assault Spirits. This card manages to do something I didn't think was possible, and be an actual worse version of Brutal Potion. You see, this card also becomes an equip card after you activate it, and then doesn't do anything. Not until you attack something anyway, at which point you can send one monster that has 1000 or less attack from your hand to the graveyard during the damage step, to have your monster gain attack equal to the sent monster until the end phase. So with Brutal Potion, you gain 1000 attack if you were able to inflict effect damage that turn. But with Assault Spirits, you can only gain a maximum of 1000 attack if you're able to discard a monster who has exactly 1000 attack, as you only gain attack equal to the monster you sent to the graveyard to activate the effect. And sending monsters to the graveyard to activate this effect is not at all worth it, and for some reason it's restricted to low attack monsters. Having to discard a card from your hand is one of the steepest costs in the game, because of how important card advantage is in Yu-Gi-Oh! So having to discard a card to activate an effect means it better be a good one, and this effect is almost laughably bad, 
because not only does it require you to discard a monster for a temporary, low attack boost, it's restricted in what it allows you to discard. You can't even discard a high attack monster in order to gain a thousand attack. It only works on monsters with less than 1,000 attack. There is almost no situation in which you'd want to use this card, which is why it easily takes a high spot on this list, only being out marginally by the top two spots. And at number two, we have Omega Goggles. When this card is equipped to a monster you control, you gain the effect where once per turn, you can look at one random card in your opponent's hand. But the monster you equip this to cannot attack during the turn you activate this effect. And yes, this card can only be activated on your own monsters, so you can't even prevent your opponent's monsters from attacking to use this effect. Now, there's this spell card which came out in the first set of the game called Inexperienced Spy, which basically has the same exact effect, and never saw play because it's an almost useless effect that only loses you advantage. Omega Goggles really lives up to the legacy of the Inexperienced Spy, where it allows you to look at one random card in your opponent's hand, and then will also lock that monster from attacking that turn. Now, I assume the intended use of this card is to just equip it to something that's not going to attack anyway, like Marshmallow, and then just look at one random card in your opponent's hand every turn, because gaining information on your opponent's hand is valuable in Yu-Gi-Oh! But then you run into the problem that most equip cards have, where it's vulnerable to two forms of destruction. If your monster is destroyed, this card goes away, and if you only used it once, you basically just activated a worse version of Inexperienced Spy. And if you're stalling out long enough, you probably don't care what cards in your opponent's hand. Wanting information on your opponent's hand is more of a thing good decks want to do. So it's just an incredibly minor positive effect, which has downsides associated to it that aren't really worth the downsides of both losing a card that could have been useful in your hand for something else, and also stopping a monster from attacking, which is why Omega Goggles easily takes a high spot on this list, with the number one spot just being a little bit more useless. And at number one, we have Magical Labyrinth. This is an equipped spell card which can only be equipped to Labyrinth Wall, and then it has the effect to tribute the equipped monster in order to special summon Wall Shadow from your deck. Wall Shadow is an effect monster whose only effect is detailing how it can be special summoned, with the effect of Magical Labyrinth. And the only advantage Wall Shadow has over the card needed to bring it out is that it has 1600 attack instead of zero, while having the exact same defense. Now, having 1600 attack on a monster with high defense is kind of useless, unless you have a way to make use of that attack in some way, like how Total Defense Shogun can attack while in defense position, but uses its attack value for damage calculation. If Wall Shadow did that, then it might actually be an upgrade over Labyrinth Wall. But it doesn't. It doesn't have a useful effect. It just has restrictions on how it can be brought out. And 1600 attack is not worth tributing a level 5 monster with a specific equip spell card. And if all you wanted is 3000 defense, then you already have that with Labyrinth Wall. So there's no reason to bring out Wall Shadow. And since Wall Shadow is so useless, its equip spell card has to be on this list for the same reason. X Exclusion is a counter trap card that can only be activated in response to a monster effect activated in your opponent's hand, where you get to negate the activation and then you get to allow your opponent to discard one card from their hand of their choice. Now, this card has competition with other counter trap cards like Solemn Strike, which can negate any monster effect anywhere and also destroys the card afterwards, or even Debunk, which can negate a monster effect in the hand or graveyard and even banishes the card afterwards. So, while monsters activating their effects in the hand are common, it's not common enough to play an exclusive counter trap for it, and the reward for being able to properly resolve the card is not better than more general options. In this video, we'll go over the worst fusion monsters in the game that actually have effects, because I didn't want to rank a lot of the bad non-effect vanilla monsters because there's not much to talk about with them. And at number 10, we have Armatile, the Chaos Phantom. This is the boss monster of the Sacred Beast archetype, which requires a contact fusion of the three Sacred Beasts on your side of the field, each of which is incredibly difficult to summon. Or, at least they used to be. But recently, they got a whole bunch of new support that makes bringing them out much easier, and they even printed a new fusion spell card called Dimension Fusion Destruction that allows you to bring out Armatile a lot easier. And even with all of this new amazing support for the Sacred Beasts, they still don't use their fusion because it's kind of bad. You see, this card has the effect that it gains 10,000 attack during your turn only, which is one of the biggest attack gains a card effect gives in the game and it also cannot be destroyed by battle. So it gains a pretty hefty attack boost. If you attack directly with this card, you're going to win. 
but that's pretty much all it does is be a big beat stick and requires a lot of resources to bring out and it only has this attack during your turn. During your opponent's turn it goes back down to zero. So any kind of effect negation can render this card's attack to zero and make it an incredibly vulnerable zero attack target on your side of the field which it already is during your opponent's turn as its attack goes back down to zero anyway. Honestly, since they released support for this card that makes bringing it out a lot easier than it used to be, I have to put it at the lowest spot on this list for being probably one of the best cards on here. If it wasn't for the new support cards, this card would probably take a higher spot on this list, which when I'm doing a worst of list is not a good thing for a card. And at number nine, we have Elemental Hero Marine Neos. Now, this card actually has a good effect, where once per turn you can destroy one random card in your opponent's hand. Being able to destroy one card in your opponent's hand without any other kinds of costs is actually kind of amazing. Now, this card makes this list for its summoning requirement, where its materials are Elemental Hero Neos and Neospatian Marine Dolphin. Neospatian Marine Dolphin is a level 4 fusion monster who has an effect where its name is also treated as Neospatian Aqua Dolphin which is the main deck monster that starts this whole chain. And this card can only be special summoned with the effect of Nex. Nex is a spell card that allows you to send a Neospace and you control it to the graveyard to special summon a level 4 monster with the same name from your extra deck. And Nex was supposed to be part of the Neospacian support that allowed them to have one card fusions. Kind of like a precursor to the Mask Heroes. But here's the thing with how the Nex cards worked. Since the fusion monster also had its name treated as the main deck monster, that meant it ran into the three cards per deck rule. Where if you played Neospatian Marine Dolphin in your extra deck, you could only play two copies of Neospatian Aqua Dolphin in your main deck. Or if you played two copies in your extra deck, you could only play one copy in your main deck. So it vastly lowered the consistency of actually using the combo. And the card it brought out wasn't that much of an upgrade either as it just had a tiny bit more attack and defense and had a slightly better effect, where you could discard a card from your hand to look at your opponent's hand and destroy a monster in it if it has an attack less than a monster you control, and then inflict 500 damage to your opponent, which is the exact same effect as the main deck monster, Neospace and Aqua Dolphin, except it doesn't have the negative effect on it, where if you don't find a target you take 500 points of damage instead. Now, just removing the negative side of that effect is not much of an upgrade to be perfectly honest. And 900 attack is not much of an upgrade over 600 attack, as they're both incredibly weak. So there's no real reason to play this next card. And there's only one other Neospatian that has a next upgrade, Neospatian Glomos. And that upgraded version is actually not half bad in comparison to the main deck counterpart. But only Neospatian Aqua Dolphin was given a contact fusion with Neos based on its next fusion monster, as all the other Elemental Heroes can contact fuse with Elemental Heroes in order to go into a fusion monster, including the main deck Neospatian Aqua Dolphin. And Elemental Hero Marine Neos is the lone contact fusion between the next fusion monster and Elemental Hero Neos, which would require you to play the terrible next card in order to bring out the terrible fusion monster in order to finally go into a good card like Elemental Hero Marine Neos, who I don't think is good enough to justify all the materials needed in order to bring it out. The Neos archetype was given a really good fusion card in order to bring out their contact fusions easier, called Neos Fusion, but that card doesn't work in bringing out Marine Neos because it only sends materials from your hand deck or field to the graveyard, and doesn't include sending materials from your extra deck to the graveyard. And it's also very difficult to name change cards in the field in order to bring out a Marine Neos as a very common name changer, like Elemental Hero Prisma, cannot copy the names of extra deck monsters, only main deck monsters. So the only way to get out Marine Neos easier would be to use a card like Fusion Tag, which specifically allows you to rename a card on the field after a fusion monster in your extra deck, which actually might be worth the trouble of bringing out Marine Neos, because the effect is pretty good, which is why this card only gets number nine spot on this list. It may be difficult to bring out, but it actually has a pretty decent effect. And at number 8, we have Moki Moki King. This is an incredibly low attack level 6 fusion monster that requires 3 Moki Mokis of its materials, and its only effect is if it's removed from the field, you can special summon as many Moki Mokis from your graveyard as possible. Now, since this card is level 6, 
it's one level too high to be an instant fusion target, which will be the case for every card on this list. None of them are instant fusion targets. You can't easily cheat this card out of the extra deck in order to easily remove it from the field to get three monsters. So you're kind of stuck with bringing this card out the old fashioned way, of using three Moki Mogis, or two Mokis and a fusion substitute, plus some kind of fusion spell card to bring it out. But if you do bring this card out, you can abuse its card effect by removing it from the field yourself, and then bringing it back, with cards like Interdimensional Matter Transporter. But you have to be careful because its effect can miss timing. And being able to bring out three normal monsters from the graveyard by bringing out a high level, low attack fusion monster is kind of not worth it when you have cards like Triwhite that can do what this card does but better. But technically, you could abuse card effects in order to gain some nice advantage from this card. So it's not higher on this list. And at number 7, we have Dragon Master Knight. This is one of the highest original attacks of a monster in the game at 5000. And its only effects are ones that say this card must be fusion summoned, so you can't cheat it out of the extra deck. And another that allows this card to gain 500 attack for each dragon monster you control except this card. So, with a full board of dragon type monsters, you can increase this card's attack by 2500. And when you have a starting attack of 5000, that's not really a big deal. This card is basically just a big beat stick that's kind of difficult to bring out, as one of its materials is the Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon. Now, you can just use a fusion substitute for that, and then just play Black Luster Soldier plus any fusion substitute in order to bring this card out, so it's not that big of a deal. But, the original Black Luster Soldier card isn't good either, and doesn't even see play in its own deck. And you definitely wouldn't use Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon as this card's material. And you also can't copy the name of Blue Eyes Ultimate Dragon with something like Prisma. Because remember, you can't use extra deck monsters with that card's effect. So since it's kind of a hard to bring out beater, that doesn't really do anything else and has no protection, it takes a spot on this list, because it's really not worth the resources needed to play this card, if all you want is a big beater. And at number 6, we have D3S Frog. This was the fusion monster that was meant to be the boss monster of the frog archetype when it was first released. And it's kind of funny how modern frog decks have completely gone away with what this card was trying to do. This card requires three Death Frogs as its materials, and there are a couple of frogs that change their name to Death Frog when they're on the field, so that's not that hard to accomplish. And this card's effect is that it gains 500 attack for each Treeborn Frog in your graveyard. Now, Treeborn Frog actually got limited to one copy per deck pretty quickly when it was first released, so for a long time you could only ever give this card an additional 500 attack. And bringing out a 3000 attack beat stick for three materials on a fusion monster was not at all worth it. So it definitely didn't see any play, even though frogs have kind of seen play consistently ever since they came out. And frog decks are even meta to this day, and it's definitely not because of a 3k beat stick that's an inherent minus 3 to bring out. And at number 5, we have VW Tiger Catapult. Now, there was a series of Union monsters released who could all combine together into a respectable boss monster, through some of the first ever contact fusion introduced to the game, i.e. fusion that doesn't require you to use a fusion spell card like Polymerization. And they also had some side combinations, fusion monsters they can be brought out with just combinations of two of them. And VW Tiger Catapult was one of the later ones added, and is definitely the worst of the bunch, as this card requires you to banish its materials from your side of the field, and its materials are two pretty mediocre main deck monsters, one of them even being a vanilla. And its effect is that you can discard one card in order to change the battle position of one of your opponent's monsters. Now, a spell speed 1 battle position changing effect is not very good, especially since all the other combinations had effects to destroy cards. Now, if this card just had the ability to change a battle position without having to discard for that effect, it wouldn't really fit the theme of all the others, where they all have to discard in order to use their effects, but it would be better. And this card is just kind of a gimmick, and only exists if you're trying to bring out VWXYZ Dragon Catapult Cannon for fun. Although, they did release a way to bring this card out easier, if you use the card Ojama Simulation, though that would require you to play Ojamas, and that card is much better spent on bringing out ABC Dragon Buster cards instead. And at number 4, we have Dark Flare Knight. This is another fusion monster which requires a fusion monster as one of its materials, as this card can be brought out with Dark Magician and the Flame Swordsman. 
Although you can just substitute Flame Swordsman with a Fusion Substitute Monster and you're good to go. Now what's funny about this card is that this fusion of two monsters is actually weaker in stats than one of its materials, as it has less attack and defense than the Dark Magician, who already doesn't have a lot of stats for a level 7 vanilla monster. But this card does have an alternative summoning condition where you can just use the Eye of Tamias on a Dark Magician on the field. And what this card does for all the effort of bringing it out is that you take no battle damage from battles involving this card. And if this card is destroyed by battle, you can special summon a Mirage Knight from your deck. Now, Mirage Knight himself actually has a pretty decent effect, where its effect is, basically, it can only be special summoned by Dark Flare Knight's effect, and when it battles a monster, it gains attack equal to the original attack of the other monster. So it has a built-in Honest-like effect, and Honest is a very good card. So this card can basically beat over anything, or take out anything trying to attack over it as it works during both players' battle phases. That is, if this card can last long enough, as during the end phase of any turn in which this card attacked or was attacked, this card banishes itself. So if you go through all the effort of bringing out Dark Flare Knight, and then you manage to let it get destroyed by battle specifically, not removed by any other card effects, you then get to bring out a Garnet from your deck who can destroy one thing by battle, and maybe inflict a decent chunk of life point damage, who also has no protection of any kind. Now, this may surprise you to hear, but Dark Flare Knight did see lots of play before Synchro Monsters came out. You see, before Synchros, the extra deck was called the Fusion deck, and had a limit of around 30 cards instead of 15. And a lot of decks didn't use their extra deck, so they just filled it with a whole bunch of random Fusion Monsters. And since the Dark Magician archetype is kinda popular, and since this card has neat artwork, it was just thrown in there randomly to fill the extra deck space. But it was never actually played. The correct terminology would be more like, it definitely appeared in the extra deck of a lot of decks that topped events, but it was never actually used. It was just kind of put in the extra deck as a joke. And at number three, we have Elemental Hero Inferno. This is another card like Dark Flare Knight, where the fusion monster is kind of worse than one of its materials that can bring it out, as this card has two effects. One of them is a negative effect that makes it so this card can only be special summoned by fusion summon, meaning you can't monster reborn it after it's been brought out properly. And its other effect gives it 1000 attack when it battles a water monster. Why this effect is attached to a pyro type monster is beyond me, but it's probably related to the anime in some way. I think I've mentioned this card in videos in the past and I've had a few comments tell me this card was actually good in the anime. So they probably added that on as a way to nerf it and make sure no one would play it. As one of the materials for this card, Elemental Hero Heat, has an effect to gain 200 attack for each hero monster you control. So with a base attack of 1600, if you manage to get three other Elemental Heroes on the field, Elemental Hero Heat will have more attack than Elemental Hero Inferno, and has the potential to get even stronger than its fusion counterpart. However, as a beat stick, 2300 is decent I guess. And since this card can be used to get heroes in the graveyard, thanks to Elemental Hero Prisma, it has the potential to exist in the extra deck as a Prisma target, in order to get some fire Elemental Heroes in the graveyard, in the form of Elemental Hero Heat and Elemental Hero Lady Heat. So you can use Miracle Fusion to bring out a good fire fusion Elemental Hero monster, like Elemental Hero Nova Master. And at number two, we have Elemental Hero Mudball Man. This is a fusion monster whose only effect is a negative one that states it cannot be special summoned except by fusion summon. So if you do manage to bring this card out properly, you can't monster reborn it later to bring it out, in the same way as Elemental Hero Inferno. And this card has a low attack stat for a fusion monster with those kinds of requirements and restrictions on it, at only 1900. But at least it does have decent walling capabilities at 3000 defense. Although. Generally, bringing out a 3000 defense wall while wasting materials for a fusion summon is seen as a bad move, as outside of Miracle Fusion, fusion summons are generally an inherent minus 2 in card advantage. And if all you need is a 3000 wall, there are two vanilla monsters that are a lot easier to bring out who could accomplish the same feat. And generally, those cards don't see play either, because that's not a really good strategy. Having a high defense on a monster isn't really a selling point if you don't have a way to take advantage of that high defense, like with the Super Heavy Samurais. And since this card is level 6, it can't be used as an instant fusion target, which like I said a little bit earlier applies to all the cards on this list. Honestly, if some of these cards were just level 5 or lower, 
they probably wouldn't make this list because being an instant fusion target would give them some merit. And at number one, we have Super Robo Lady, another low stat level six fusion monster who is just a little bit too high of a level to be an instant fusion target. Now, this card has the wonderful effect of gaining 1000 attack when it inflicts direct damage to your opponent. And with a baseline attack of 1200, this card is just straight up weaker than Elemental Hero Inferno, even when attacking directly. Now, this card is brought out with two terrible vanilla monsters as materials, and has a unique effect that can tag out with another fusion monster from your extra deck, called Super Robo Yaro. But you can't do this during the same turn you special summon this card. So you have to wait until your next turn in order to tag out with this card, as it's spell speed 1. And the other card is a little bit better, as it also has the same terrible stat line of 1200 attack and 500 defense, but it gains 1000 attack when battling monsters. So at least it has the potential to maybe destroy something by battle with 2200 attack. Which again, is weaker than Elemental Hero Inferno. Now, these are the only two effects these cards have, but this card does have a couple of pieces of supports for its stats and type. You see, since this card is level 6, it's technically a target for Fusion Weapon, which would increase this card's attack by 1500, which is actually a pretty hefty chunk for an equip card. Just as long as you forget that cards like Psychic Blade exist, which can technically give more attack to any monster, or cards like Mage Power or United We Stand, which could give even more potential attack points, and none of those cards see any play. But that's just the nature of equip cards in general. They need to be kind of broken or special summon monsters for them to see play. This card also has the support of being a machine fusion type monster. So you can bring it out with something like Power Bond in order to double its attack to 2400, which means it would inflict 3400 points of direct damage if it attacked directly. And there's even a quick play spell card called Cybernetic Zone, which allows you to remove one of your machine type fusion monsters from play until the end phase of the turn. And when it returns to the field, its attack is doubled, but it's destroyed during the next standby phase. And this card was kind of made for Super Robo Lady, as it even has Super Robo Yaro in the artwork. You see, since this card is so bad and has terrible stats, you could use Cybernetic Zone to protect it during your opponent's turn, so it's not sneezed upon and destroyed by battle. And then, when it comes back during your next turn, it will have its attack doubled. And then during your main phase 2, after it inflicts an extra 1000 points of direct damage, you can then tag it out with Super Robo Yaru, since it technically was special summoned in the previous turn and not this one. And it allows you to bypass the destruction effect of Cybernetic Zone. Now, that combo isn't super good either, but I assume that's the intended method of using these cards. And even considering their support cards with everything else, Super Robo Lady still takes number one spot on this list, as the worst fusion monster in the game that has an effect. Void Cauldron is a continuous trap card which has the effect that if an Infernity monster or a level 8 Dark Dragon Synchro monster would be destroyed by your opponent's card effects, you can banish an Infernity card from your graveyard instead. So it's basically a way to protect your Infernity cards and their boss monsters. However, this card goes on to have an additional effect, where if you ever have any cards in your hand, it immediately sends itself to the graveyard. Which means as soon as your next turn starts and you draw a new card, it's going to get destroyed. Even if Infernity's cared about its protection, which is actually incredibly weak for the archetype, the self-destruction effect of the card is way too harsh, since the archetype does like to put at least one card in their hand and special summon it over and over. Graveyard effects are some of the best effects in the game, as usually it's like gaining extra advantage from a card you've already used. But in this list, we'll go over some of the worst graveyard effects in the game, which there are not a lot of. Most graveyard effects are pretty decent. And at number 10, we have Induced Explosion. This card's graveyard effect is that when cards you control are destroyed by your opponent's spell card effects, you can banish this card from your graveyard to destroy one card your opponent controls. And its on field effect is pretty much the same. If cards you control are destroyed by your opponent's spell card effects, you can then activate this card to destroy one card your opponent controls. So it seems like the ultimate spell card counter card. And before Lightning Storm came out, this wasn't really a huge concern for most decks. You can count on cards occasionally being destroyed by spell cards, but unless your opponent's deck was built around that, like Sky Strikers, it didn't happen very often. And even then, you probably want to prevent your cards from being destroyed, not use this card which just destroys one of your opponent's cards in retaliation, and only if your cards are destroyed specifically by spells. It's just a little bit too niche of a counter card, 
which probably isn't worth its counter card effect, as only being able to pop one card for having your cards destroyed by spells isn't super good. But still one of the most useful effects on this list since it can at least destroy cards and impact the field. And at number 9 we have Barrage Blast. This is a continuous trap card which allows you to once per turn detach as many Xyz materials from machine type monsters you control to destroy cards on your opponent's side of the field equal to the amount of materials you detached. So if you have a whole bunch of machine Xyz monsters in the field, you can convert their materials into targeted destruction. Which hey, isn't half bad, especially since you can use this effect during either player's turn. So it allows you to convert materials into quick effect disruption. Its graveyard effect is that if this card is in your graveyard and a machine Xyz monster you control is destroyed, you can banish this card in addition to one machine Xyz monster from your graveyard to then inflict effect damage to your opponent equal to the rank of that Xyz monster times 200. So if you use this on a rank 4 monster, you get to inflict 800 points of damage, which isn't a really super good effect on a graveyard effect. But assuming you use this card with the archetype it was intended for, rank 10 trains, this card has the potential to inflict 2000 points of damage, which is pretty good, in an archetype that's already able to inflict hefty chunks of damage thanks to cards like Gustav Max. Although this is just kind of a minor extra effect to a card that's not really used for an effect that the archetype doesn't really care about, on a condition that you can't really proc yourself very easily. So while it's not terrible if used in the archetype it was intended for, it's not really something they go out of the way to use anyway. Which is why it makes this list, because honestly, there's not a lot of bad graveyard effects in the game. Most of them are pretty good. Half this list will just be mediocre graveyard effects, and we won't get to the truly less than mediocre effects until we get to the higher spots. And at number 8 we have Malefic Truth Dragon. This is one of the highest attacks on a main deck monster, and it technically has a graveyard effect where if a malefic monster you control is destroyed while this card is in your hand or graveyard, you can pay half your life points to special summon this card, as long as there's a field spell card out. Otherwise, this card will destroy itself right away. And this card has a pretty decent effect on the field. Kind of, where if it destroys a monster by battle, you can then destroy all of your opponent's other phase up monsters. And with a base attack of 5,000, this card can beat over pretty much anything in order to proc its effect. Now, the problem with this card lies in the fact that it requires you to pay half your life points to special summon it, and the archetype it's part of, the Malefics. You'd have to play a pretty pure Malefic deck in order to bring this card out, and Malefics do not allow other cards to attack while they're on the field, nor do they allow other Malefic monsters onto the field. So if you bring out Malefic Truth Dragon, that's it for your Malefic monsters. And these restrictions to the Malefic archetype were so bad that they actually released new support for them which just straight up changes their effects to allow other Malefic monsters on the field, with the continuous spell card Malefic Territory. Although it requires you to play their field spell card, which isn't super good either. Plus, the Malefic monsters that do see play are generally used in decks as combo extenders and one-offs, and not played in any quantity big enough where you could realistically also play Malefic Truth Dragon. So in the future, if they release better support cards with the effect of Malefic Territory, Malefic Truth Dragon might finally be able to see some play. Maybe. And at number 7 we have Dice Roll Battle. This is a trap card which has an effect that can only be activated when an opponent's monster declares an attack, which allows you to use a Speedroid monster from your graveyard and a Speedroid Tuner monster from your hand in order to special summon a Synchro monster from your extra deck using those two cards. Which isn't the best effect in the world, generally battle traps aren't super good, since they're sitting decks for spell or trap card removal, and usually get destroyed before they get a chance to ever activate. And this card basically just allows you to synchro summon during your opponent's turn anyway. Although it does allow you to use one of the materials from your graveyard. And then its graveyard effect can only be activated during your opponent's battle step, where you can banish this card from your graveyard in order to target a face-up attack position synchro monster on both sides of the field. In which case you get to force those two cards to battle each other. This card basically requires your opponent to also have a Synchro Monster out, so it's already pretty limited in when you can actually use it, but it does have the potential to give you one extra free attack, which would be a lot more useful if it wasn't during your opponent's battle phase only. And at number 6 we have Sabatel the Philosopher's Stone. This card has a graveyard effect that can only be activated if you have 3 copies of this card in the graveyard, 
in which case you get to banish all three copies in order to target one monster on the field, who will then gain attack equal to the highest attack monster on the field until the end of the turn. So if you control a monster at 2,000 attack, and your opponent controls one with 3,000, you can have your monster gain 3,000 in order to go up to 5,000 for a turn, which is a pretty hefty attack boost from a graveyard effect, with the only downside to it is the whole requiring three copies of the card in order to do this. Getting three copies of any one card into the graveyard in order for an attack boost is not really worth it, especially since its normal effect, while, you know, used from your hand, isn't super good either where you can pay half your life points to search out a fusion spell card from your deck, which is good, but you can only do this if you specifically control a winged Karibo in your graveyard, which means it's not super useful, as that's just a little bit too much of a setup for an effect that requires you to pay half your life points. This card was, however, an anime card that was incredibly overpowered, so they did what they usually do with these kinds of situations, and just gave it an incredibly nerfed effect in the actual TCG that kind of vaguely resembles what it used to do, which was to give it a bad activatable effect, and then a bad graveyard effect. And at number 5, we have Cosmorning. This is a continuous trap card for the Cosmo archetype, where monsters who are destroyed in battle with Cosmo monsters are shuffled into the deck instead of going to the graveyard. Which is not half bad. This essentially allows your attacking Cosmo monsters to bypass a lot of floating effects when they destroy monsters by battle. It also has a graveyard effect, where you can banish this card so the first time you would take battle damage involving a Cosmo monster you control, you instead gain that amount of life points. So it basically stops you from taking battle damage, and then will give you a small life point boost. Kind of like the effect of Rainbow Life, but for one battle. It's not the best effect in the world, but it's not a negative effect either. You won't be playing this card in your deck in order to prevent a little bit of battle damage, and you probably wouldn't be playing it for its on-field effect either, as this is not a super heavily played Cosmo card, despite the fact that the deck did see a lot of competitive success in the past. This is just a case of an incredibly minor positive effect, which when compared to all the other graveyard effects in the game, definitely puts it on a lower end of the spectrum in terms of usefulness. And at number 4, we have DD Reroll. While this card is on your side of the field, your dark contract cards cannot be destroyed by your opponent's card effects. And since DD decks do play a lot of face-up, speller trap card, dark contract cards, this is a technically positive effect for them, though they don't care that much about losing card advantage in order to protect their face-up dark contract cards. And this card also has a graveyard effect, where you can banish this card from your graveyard in order to target up to three of your banished DD cards, in order to shuffle them back into your deck. If this card shuffled them back into the graveyard, it wouldn't be half bad. Returning them to the deck, however, that's not really worth playing this card at all. If you could gain advantage while shuffling them back, like how the Orcus Link monsters use their effects, then maybe DD decks would actually use this card. But since it has a mediocre on-field effect, and then an almost useless graveyard effect, it surprisingly doesn't really see competitive play. And at number 3, we have Iron Core of Koakimaru. This card's only effect is a graveyard effect, which can only be activated during your draw phase, where, if this card is in your graveyard, you can add it to your hand instead of drawing, or you can send a Koakimaru monster from your hand to the graveyard in order to add this card to your hand. Now, this card is required for some Koakimaru monsters to use their effects, so it did occasionally see competitive play because Koaki decks had no choice but to play this card, even though they didn't really want to. It was kind of a weird mechanic. Koaki Meru monsters had a lot of effects that required them to either send an iron core of Koaki Meru from their hand to the graveyard during the end phase, or reveal a different card from their hand in order to stay on the field. And some of them required interactions with the iron core of Koaki Meru in order to hit the field at all. Like in the case of Koaki Meru Maximus, where you had to banish an iron core from your hand in order to special summon it. And Koaki Mirror Maximus decks were even a top meta deck in Duel Links when they came out, to the point where Koaki Mirror Maximus had to be restricted on their ban list. So it's not like the card didn't see play. It even saw play in normal Yu-Gi-Oh as well. But I guarantee you, the people who played Koaki Mirror decks probably wish that iron core of Koaki Mirror wasn't so useless. But technically, since it does have an alternative graveyard effect to return to your hand by replacing itself with a monster, it's just a tiny bit more useful than the top two spots on this list. 
especially since it's so required for a lot of the archetype to work. And at number 2, we have the Phantom Knights of Tomb Shield. Now, the Phantom Knight archetype is known for having a lot of wonderful graveyard effects. So many good graveyard effects that their Link monster, Phantom Knights of the Rusty Bardiche, got banned partly because it could send Phantom Knight monsters to the graveyard in order to also search out cards. So, it's almost a wonder why this card got the short end of the stick, as its graveyard effect, which can be only activated during your turn, except the turn this card was sent to the graveyard of course, allows you to banish this card in order to negate the effects of one face-up trap card your opponent controls until the end of the turn. Now, this is incredibly restrictive of what it can even target, and a lot of decks don't play face-up trap cards, so it's useless against a majority of decks, and it doesn't really solve the problem as it only negates the effect for one turn. So in best case scenario, your opponent has an oppressive floodgate out, like Imperial Order, and you want to use spell cards this turn. You can negate that card's effect for one turn, as long as you sent it previously, which is technically useful, but not a situation in which you would specifically play this card for, as its on-field effect allows you to special summon this card as a normal level 3 warrior type monster with no stats. So it's basically a trap monster that exists to use for extra deck plays. And the Phantom Knights do love level 3 monsters, so it fits in with their archetype. But they also have this other Phantom Knight trap monster called the Phantom Knights of Shade Brigandine, which can special summon itself as a trap monster during the turn it sent. If it had a useful effect like that, then its graveyard effect would just be gravy on top of a good effect. But instead, it kind of has a mediocre trap monster effect with also a situationally useful mediocre graveyard effect, which is why I had to kind of give it a high spot on this list. And at number one, we have Magical Blast. This card's effect, when you use it from your hand, allows you to inflict 200 damage to your opponent for each spellcaster type monster you control. Which isn't super good, that's not a lot of burn damage. And rarely would you be trying to inflict burn damage when you had six spellcaster type monsters out, which would only deal 1200 damage anyway. And its graveyard effect is during the draw phase, you can add this card to your hand from your graveyard instead of drawing a card from your deck. And this card's effect is definitely not good enough where you'd want to add this card to your hand instead of drawing a card normally. So it's a pretty bad effect. However, this card did see competitive play one time in 2008 in a Light Sworn deck used in the World Championship. It was a side deck addition, which would only be used if they wanted to prevent themselves from decking out, as Light Sworn decks all have the effects that send a whole bunch of cards from your deck to the graveyard during the end phase. So if they went against any kind of stall, it would basically deck themselves out, which Magical Blast could technically prevent them from doing, Though that's not something you'd really have to worry about, which is why it hasn't been used in really any other Topping Light Sworn deck since. And I probably would have put the Iron Core of Koaki Meru at the top spot if it wasn't for the fact that it could instead add itself to your hand by just discarding a monster. Whereas Magical Blast can only add itself back by giving up your draw phase, which is only useful graveyard effect if you literally don't want to draw cards because you would lose which is why it takes the top spot on this list. Vision Hero Multiply Guy has the effect that if it's in your graveyard and you take damage, you can place it from your graveyard into your spell trap card zone as a continuous trap card. Additionally, during the main phase, if it's currently being treated as a continuous trap, you can tribute a hero monster in order to special summon this card. Both of these effects are shared by pretty much all of the other main deck Vision Hero monsters. What makes them unique is what they do after they special summon themselves. And what Multiply Guy does is simply give one face-up monster on the field an 800 attack boost. Now, generally, the best Vision Hero monster special summon effect is to special summon another monster from the deck, which is like one of the best effects a card can have. So only increasing the attack of a monster by a minor amount is kind of laughably bad in comparison especially since the effect of gaining attack points is generally just not very valuable anyway. In this video, we'll go over 10 of the worst pyrotype monsters, in a pool of monsters which is one of the least plentiful in the game. And at number 10, we have Burning Algae. This card has the effect that when it's sent to the graveyard, you increase the life points of your opponent by 1000, and its stats are not very good, so it basically only has detrimental effects to you, as it increases your opponent's life points and not your own. 
However, if you play this card in a bad reaction to Samachi deck, that 1000 life point increase can turn into 1000 burn damage. And 1000 points of burn damage isn't half bad, and this card is only ever used in bad reaction to Samachi decks anyway, as they have very few monsters to put on the field to protect their life points or something. It was kind of in the earlier versions of the deck. They don't really use the card anymore, but technically it is useful in those decks which makes it a lot more useful than some of the other cards on this list. And at number 9, we have Gen X Furnace. This is a level 5 monster that has the effect where if you control a face-up Gen X controller, you can normal summon this card without tributing. And the intended use of this card was to maybe get Gen X controller on the field in some other way so that you could use your normal summon to bring out Furnace. That way you could use the two of them to go into Thermal Gen X, which is a synchro monster that requires Gen X controller, plus one non-tuner fire monster as its materials. And its level just happens to be the exact amount for both Furnace and Gen X controller combined. However, Thermal Gen X isn't very good. It has kind of low stats for a level 8 monster, and its effects are that it just gains 200 attack for each fire monster in your graveyard. And if it destroys a monster by battle, you can inflict burn damage to your opponent equal to the number of Gen X monsters in your graveyard times 200. And besides Furnace and Thermal Gen X, there is only one other Fire Gen X monster in the game. So it wouldn't get super high attack boosts in the deck that's trying to bring it out. So Gen X Furnace is okay to an extent, as it can bring itself out without a tribute. It has a decent attack at 2000, it's just it kinda requires a bad tuner monster to be on the field in order for it to bring itself out. Its main combo potential isn't very good, and it would be better served going into other generic level 8 synchro monsters instead. And it'd be a much better card if it could special summon itself, because it does still take up your normal summon with its pretty mediocre effect. And at number 8, we have Laval Stanon. This is a synchro monster that has the negative effect that when it's synchro summoned, you must send one card from your hand to the graveyard. However, its effects on the field is that if it's targeted by a card effect, you can banish one Laval monster from your graveyard to negate the activation and destroy that card. So, it does have a pretty decent target protection, and at 2700 attack, that's not a half bad stat line for a level 7 synchro monster. And its materials are basically just any tuner plus non-tuner fire monsters, so it could be brought out in a Laval deck without much hassle. That being said, it does have a negative effect when it's summoned, which means it's still slightly worse than the first two options on this list, even if everything else about this card is not half bad. Also, according to Dual Terminal lore, Laval Stanon is the combination of Laval Cannon and Violent Stella, which you can see if you look at them pretty closely. Laval Stanon obviously is those two guards combined together. And at number 7, we have Master Craftsman Gamil. This card is a hand trap that can only be activated during the damage step when a face-up monster you control battles, where you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard to cause that monster to gain 300 attack until the end phase. This card's effect is not a hard once per turn, so it is possible to stack multiple copies of this card's effects onto one monster for a potential of a 900 attack boost. That is to say, it is technically a beneficial effect. It's just an incredibly minor one. I think this card sees play in the speed duel format, and only because the amount of cards in that pool is very low. I can't imagine it sees very much play, but it definitely doesn't see any play anywhere else. Especially since this card came out in 2014. It's kind of a newer card, and also kind of a wonder why it's so incredibly mediocre. Usually, when they put out underpowered cards and newer sets, I immediately assume they were probably added for Duel Links one day, but this card is too weak even for Duel Links. But hey, it at least has a beneficial effect. That is useful in lots of situations, so it's not the worst card in the world, but it is kind of like the sparks of hand traps. And at number 6, we have Volcanic Blaster. This is a volcanic card that has a floating effect when it's destroyed by battle, that allows you to place any volcanic monster in your deck on top of your deck. It also has very low stats. Now, this card is kind of an underpowered floater that searches cards from its archetype, which is kind of a wonder when the volcanics also have cards like Volcanic Rocket, which is an excellent search card that can add a card directly from your deck to your hand, instead of having to top deck the card you're searching, which also works no matter how it's summoned instead of being destroyed specifically by battle and it also has much better stats. 
Volcanic Blaster is just not very good at its job, especially since it's so convoluted on two levels, where it needs to be both destroyed by battle and an archetype about destroying by card effects, and it only top decks the card you're searching instead of getting it directly to your hand. But I guess it is technically a good effect, just kind of a really underpowered one, and one that didn't really see play. And at number 5, we have Invasion of Flames. This card has the effect that when it's normal summoned, no trap cards can be activated. Now, this card actually is a cause of some confusion for newer players, because the way it's worded makes it seem like no trap cards can be activated ever again, or until the end of the turn, and neither of those are the case. It specifically just stops trap cards that would be activated in response to its normal summon, and that's it. So, cards like Trap Hole or Torrential Tribute, two cards that require a trigger of a monster being summoned for them to be activated, would not be able to be activated in response to Invasion of the Flames being normal summoned. However, you would be able to use things like Solemn Judgment against Invasion of the Flames, because Solemn Judgment has the potential to negate that normal summon. So. Invasion of the Flame can't stop all trap cards when it's summoned, and it's also not very good anyway, because it has really low stats and only works on normal summon instead of all of its summons, and your opponent wouldn't want to waste their trap hole on this card anyway. If this card actually had a good effect in addition to this, or better stats, its effect might make sense, but it has neither of those things. It's just a really low attack level 3 monster that does nothing once it's on the field. So its effect is kind of bad but technically not a detriment, which is why it has like a medium spot on this list. And at number 4, we have Guardian Seal. This is a level 4 monster that cannot be summoned unless you control a face-up equip spell card called Shooting Star Bowl Seal. And Shooting Star Bowl Seal has the effect that the monster it's equipped to loses 1000 attack, but it can attack your opponent directly. And there's two main uses for this card. One of them is to equip it to your opponent so that it loses 1000 attack, so that you can then attack over that monster easier, and the other is an OTK deck that uses card to attack for game, that have nothing to do with Guardian Seal. So if you do control this face up spell card, then you can normal summon Guardian Seal from your hand, as it doesn't allow you to special summon it if its conditions for being summoned are fulfilled, it just no longer has the negative restriction of not being allowed to summon itself. So once this card is on the field, its effect allows you to send one equip card you control that's equipped to this card to the graveyard to destroy one of your opponent's monsters. Which, hey, not half bad effect. There is another card though, called Evocator Chavalier, who has a similar effect where you can send any face-up equip card you control to the graveyard to destroy any card your opponent controls and it even has 200 more attack and is much easier to summon, as it's a Gemini monster who just requires itself to be normal summoned twice. So Guardian Seal is like a much worse Evocator Chevalier, so there's no real reason to want to use it, especially since it has a convoluted summoning requirement that requires you to play a pretty mediocre equip spell card. One that you can't even send to the graveyard to activate Guardian Seal's effect, as it would have to be equipped to a different monster in order for you to summon this card in the first place. And at number 3, we have Elemental Hero Inferno, who is the only Elemental Hero fusion monster that's not a warrior type. And what this card does is, if it battles a water monster, it will gain 1000 attack during the damage step only. And it also has added restrictions to it, where it can only be fusion summoned and cannot be special summoned in other ways. Now, this card's restrictions and effect are both not very good, especially since its stats are pretty low for a level 8 monster, at only 2300 attack. And the funny thing is, the two cards required to fusion summon this card are actually not half bad. Elemental Hero Heat gains 200 attack for each Elemental Hero monster you control, so it immediately becomes an 1800 attack beat stick when it hits the field as it counts itself which is a pretty good stat line for a level 4 monster. And Elemental Hero Lady Heat inflicts 200 damage to your opponent during your end phase for each E-Hero monster you control. She is kind of weak though at 1300 attack and was nowhere near as heavily played as Elemental Hero Heat, and it makes sense why these two cards have a fusion summon together. It's just their fusion summon card is really bad, and almost not worth using as Elemental Hero Heat has the potential to get stronger than its fusion counterpart if you have at least 4 Elemental Hero monsters on the field. 
and the effect that's restricted to only water monsters for some reason is not even very good. It's just a minor attack boost. This card wouldn't even be that good if it worked on all monsters, but it only works on water monsters, which I think makes this one of the worst pyrotype monsters in the game, if one of its materials is actually better than it. And at number 2, we have Helios Duo Magistus. This is a level 6 monster that has an alternative summoning condition, where you can special summon this card from your hand if you tribute a specific monster named Helios the Primordial Sun. It can also just be normal summoned with one tribute. And what this card's effect is, is this card gains 200 attack and defense times the number of monsters you have removed from play. And also, if this card is destroyed by battle and sent to the graveyard, you can special summon it during the end phase and it will gain 300 attack and defense. Now, there is another card in the game called Grandmaju Daiza, who gains 400 attack and defense for each of your removed from play cards. And Grandmaju is a level 3 monster which is much easier to bring out. And here's the important thing about its attack gain. It works on all of your removed from play cards and not just monsters. Which means Grandmaju works on banished face down cards as well. Whereas Helios Duo Magistus does not. And there's also a card called Golden Homunculus, who gains 300 attack and defense for each of your banished cards as well, and not monsters, and has a much higher base attack and also requires one tribute for its summon, just like Duo Magistus. And the Golden Homunculus is also way better than Helios Duo. But that's not all. The deck that this card was made for revolves around the continuous trap card called Macro Cosmos. Macro Cosmos can special summon Helios the Primordial Sun directly from your deck when it's activated, which would then allow you to special summon Helios Duo from your hand. But Macro Cosmos has the effect where all cards that would be sent to the graveyard are banished instead, which seems like it's really good for Helios Duo and allowing it to get to some pretty high attack power values. But its floating effect specifically only activates if it's destroyed by battle and then sent to the graveyard, which means if you have Macro Cosmos on the field, you can't use its floating effect. So it's just a really awkward card to play in the deck it was made for, and it's not even that good. And there's much better cards that exist that kind of do what it's trying to do, but better. There is an upgraded version of this card called Helios Trice Magistus, which kind of has the same problems as Helios Duo, except it can at least attack twice, even if it does have the same downsides and it's also difficult to summon. Out of the three Helios cards, only Helios the Primordial Sun saw any play, even though it has the weakest effect of the three, as it only gains 100 attack and defense for each you remove from play monsters. But it could at least be special summoned directly from the deck with Macro Cosmos, which means it could be used for combo plays. And finally, at number one, the worst pyrotype monster in the game, and that is the Dragon Piper. This is a flip effect monster that has the effect when it's flipped face up, to destroy all face-up dragon capture jars on the field. And if you do destroy any, you can then change all face-up dragon type monsters in the field to attack position. Now, Dragon Capture Jar is a continuous trap card that is specifically designed to counter dragon type monsters, as its effect is that while it's face-up on the field, all dragon type monsters are changed to defense position and they cannot change their battle positions. So basically, it forces all dragons into defense mode and keeps them there so that they can't attack. And Dragon Capture Jar falls squarely into the counter of specific counter cards, as it only counters dragon type monsters, which makes Dragon Piper a counter card to a counter card. But it's even more specific as it only counters one specific type of counter card, whereas Dragon Capture Jar counters an entire type of monsters, one of the most plentiful types in the game at that. And not only does Dragon Piper only counter a counter card, it has to flip itself face up first before it can do it. You have to set this card and then wait a turn before you could even destroy Dragon Capture Jar if that was your main goal with this card. It's just incredibly convoluted and not at all good in any sense of the word. And the only reason Dragon Piper ever saw play, if it did ever see play, I don't actually know if it did, would be because it has 1800 defense which was actually decently high in the early days of Yu-Gi-Oh. So it probably could have seen play in decks that were trying to use high defense monsters to stay alive, so that they could then tribute them for summon's goal or something. I'm pretty sure this card wasn't used, but its high defense is the only good thing it has about it, because its effect is kind of laughably bad, and I think it only exists because it was an anime card, where incredibly specific effects like this were pretty common. 
Monster Rebirth is a normal trap card which has the effect to send a monster reborn from your hand or deck to the graveyard in order to target any monster in either player's graveyard and special summon it, with the added clause that the monster is treated as being special summoned by the effect of Monster Reborn, which I have to assume is only there for the anti-Monster Reborn cards that specifically only work on countering Monster Reborn and its effects. Now, this card would actually be very good if it wasn't for the condition for its activation, where you can only use the card if a monster was destroyed by battle this turn. So basically, during the battle phase or main phase 2. And most trap cards are completely hand-boned if they can't be chained during the main phase 1 to destruction effects. So this card is basically a sitting deck for your opponent's removal, and most likely won't even survive to the battle phase to be used. Which is basically the only reason it's not that great. Even though you do have to send a specific card from your hand or deck to the graveyard, it's a good card that you're going to play anyway. This card is just not good enough that you want to spend resources protecting this card in order to be able to use the effect. Quick play spell cards are some of the strongest types of spells, because they can act like trap cards during your opponent's turn, but you can also use them immediately during your turn as soon as you draw them. But in this video, we'll be going over the worst of the bunch. And at number 10, we have Column Switch. This card allows you to move one monster in your main monster zone to another one of your main monster zones. This effect is kind of useful if you're trying to rearrange your monster zones for more link plays, or to better arrange guard dragons so they can special summon dragons with their effects, as they need to have two cards point into the same zone. But the fact that all this card does is move monsters around in the zone, and it only allows you to do it a single time, makes it a little bit too underpowered for any kind of practical use. There's a card called Senate Switch that allows you to move one monster per turn. That card isn't exactly considered a good card, and Column Switch is an even more limited version of that card, Although, to be fair, the ability to move your monsters in your main monster zones is not half bad with how much columns have come to matter thanks to Link Monsters. Which makes this card better than every other card on this list, but still not very good since it can't move your monsters out of the extra monster zone to the main monster zones, like World Legacy Guard Dragon can do, where not only can you move a dragon out of the extra deck zone, it allows you to special summon a dragon from your graveyard. That's the kind of versatility a column switch like card needs to have in order to see play. And at number 9, we have Soul Reversal. This card has the effect to return a flip effect monster from your graveyard to the top of your deck. So, this card is obviously meant to be a recovery tool for flip effect monsters specifically, but in order for them to try to balance it out, and not allow you to just add any flip effect monster directly back to your hand, they thought to place it on top of your deck, so you'd be forced to draw the card during your next turn. Basically giving you the trade-off of recovering any flip effect monster at the cost of giving up one of your draws. You know, as well as the minus one for using Soul Reversal. And if you're playing a deck that really needs its flip effect monsters, like maybe the early days of Yu-Gi-Oh! when Magician of Faith and Mask of Darkness were considered OP, then Soul Reversal is definitely a way to recover those cards. If you use this card with Morphing Jar, being able to resolve one Morphing Jar would totally make up for the cost of having to use this. So technically, there are some beneficial ways to use it, and not even half bad ones, if you use it with Morphing Jar. It's just generally, recovery tools from the graveyard don't see very much play, even ones that directly let you take a card from your graveyard and add it to your hand with a one-for-one -one trade like the warrior returning alive. That's because a one-for-one one from your graveyard is kind of slow, and is more of a later game tactic, as it's not something you can really do in your first turn very consistently, and most decks are built around their first or second turn plays. But if you absolutely needed to recover a flip effect monster from your graveyard, you would still probably not use this card, and instead you'd be better off with something like Monster Reincarnation, since it allows you to add any monster card from your graveyard to your hand at the cost of discarding a card which is generally not a super used effect, but if you really needed a card from a graveyard, then that option is better, because you get the card immediately without having to wait for your next turn, or hoping you have a card that lets you draw it directly from your deck immediately. That being said, if you use a card like Archifiend's Oath, for example, you'd be able to call the top card of your deck correctly and add it to your hand immediately. That's definitely a combo that can be done with this card. It's not super good, but hey, a positive combo nonetheless. And at number 8, we have Trading Places. This card has the effect to swap life points with your opponent, but only if your life points are higher than your opponent's. There is almost no case in which you want to give your opponents more life points than yourself with this card. But there are cases in which you'd want to have less life points than your opponent, like if you're trying to use Self-Destruct Button, for example, or Life Equalizer, 
And in those cases, it's much easier to reduce your life points with good cards like Solemn Judgment, and to increase your opponent's life points with things like Gift Card, as it's much easier to manipulate the life point difference between you and your opponent if you just use cards that give your opponent a ton of life points, because you can always give more life points to your opponent than you can give to yourself. So if you wanted to use trading places in some kind of beneficial way, I guess you could slowly increase your own life points and then give them to your opponent so that you could activate cards which require life points to be lower than your opponent's, but that's really stupid, it makes no sense when there's much better ways to make your life points lower than your opponent. But seeing as this is a quick play spell card, I guess you could use it during your opponent's turn if you know they're trying to use cards which require them to have less life points than you. Like if you chain this card to your opponent using Supremacy Berry, where they would lose life points instead of gaining life points due to the life point value change. But that's not very good, so this card is kind of useless. And at number 7, we have Greed Grotto. This card has the effect to draw two cards if you manage to destroy a synchro monster your opponent controls. So it's kind of like a counter card to your opponent if they play synchro monsters, but it doesn't do anything to counter your opponent. It just allows you to draw cards if you yourself manage to counter your opponent in some other way. So it's not very useful, even if its effect is not half bad, because its activation requirement is too specific. And usually when an activation requirement is really specific, that card itself has to do something amazing, like Witch's Strike, which allows you to destroy all cards in your opponent's hand on their side of the field when your opponent does something specific. Now that's a good example of a counter card, and Witch's Strike doesn't see competitive play. Greed Grotto is much worse and more specific because it's only useful if your opponent uses Synchro Monsters, or if you give your opponent a Synchro Monster for you to destroy, and it's not good enough where you'd want to give your opponent a Synchro Monster in order to destroy to activate this card. And at number 6, we have Star Changer. This is a quick play spell card that allows you to target any monster on the field and then either increase that target's level by 1, or reduce the level of that monster by 1, and these effects are permanent. Now, being able to change the level of a monster by 1 is an okay effect for certain decks, but only if it's tied to something else as well. Like Unizombie, for example, can increase the level of a monster on the field by 1 by sending a zombie-type monster from your deck to the graveyard. And this effect is really good because it sends a zombie from the deck to the graveyard and the level change being useful is kind of an added bonus. So a card like Star Changer whose whole effect is to just manipulate the level of one monster by one is so incredibly underpowered that it's not worth using, even if the effect technically can be beneficial. There is a card called Turnabout that can only be activated if there's a face-up monster on the field who has a different level than its original level, and its effect is to flip all monsters on the field face down. So, like a Book of Moon for all monsters in the field, which is a good effect. If you use Star Changer of one of your monsters, you'd be able to then activate Turnabout whenever you want it, to disrupt plays or protect one of your monster effects going off. That still doesn't make it very useful, I'm just trying to give an example in which this card could technically be useful, and even then, it's not worth running just to activate Turnabout, or to manipulate the level of your cards for other reasons, unless you're able to gain some kind of really good advantage off of it. And at number 5, we have Space Cyclone. This card only has the effect to detach one exceeds material from a monster. Again, technically a beneficial effect if you use it to remove the exceeds material from one of your opponent's monsters before they get a chance to use them, like removing one from Castell before it has a chance to return one card back to the deck. It's just really underpowered, and also a really specific counter card, which makes it not very good because of those two things put together. But the fact that it technically can have a beneficial effect does make it better than some of the other top cards on this list. And at number 4, we have Mind Wipe. This card can only be activated if your opponent has three or less cards in their hand, in which case this card allows you to add your opponent's hand to their deck and then forces them to draw the same number of cards. Now, this card is like a worse version of Disturbance Strategy, since it requires your opponent to have a small hand, but it can be useful for shuffling your opponent's hand back to their deck if they added a card to their hand that they really needed, with something like Reinforcements of the Army. Or if you combo this card with Droll and Lockbird, after your opponent adds a card to their hand and has three or less cards in their hand, 
in the same way you can get rid of your opponent's hand with the Trickstar Reincarnation combo. But in those cases, Trickstar Reincarnation and Disturbance Strategy are better cards, as they can be used regardless of your opponent's hand size, and this one wouldn't allow you to get rid of too many cards from the hand anyway, as it's only three or less. And at number three, we have Ring of Defense. This card can only be activated when a trap card is activated, which has the effect to inflict damage, in which case you can make the effect damage zero. So this card is basically an anti-burn card, as there are quite a few of those in the game, and burn decks do occasionally see competitive play, so they're not totally useless. Although Ring of Defense has got to be one of the worst anti-burn cards in the game, as it only stops effect damage from one card, and only if it's specifically a trap card, whereas cards like Eco, Mystical Spirit of the Forest, can inflict burn damage back to your opponent in response to taking damage from any kind of card effect special summon itself from the hand, and then make it so you can't take any more burn damage for the rest of the turn. This card is much more useful at accomplishing the task of preventing burn damage. That Ring of Defense is incredibly underpowered when compared to something like Eco. There's others, of course. I just chose one of the better anti-burn cards for comparison. Its obvious synergy was to work with Ring of Destruction to make it so that you would take no damage, although I'm pretty sure it prevents your opponent from taking that damage as well which doesn't make it very good for that purpose either. Ring of Defense technically has a positive effect, it's just an incredibly underpowered effect, like most of the other cards I've talked about so far. And at number two, we have Cold Feet. This card has the effect that after it's activated, you cannot set or use the effects of any spell or trap cards for the rest of the turn. Not your opponent, this card works on the player who uses this card, as it only has negative effects. Now, the reason this card exists is because occasionally Konami will release intentionally bad versions of once overpowered cards, and this is the intentionally bad version of Cold Wave, the card that's currently banned for having an effect similar to Cold Feet, except one that works on your opponent and not you. Now, situations in which you'd want to negate your own spell and trap card's effects do exist, it's just they're so incredibly specific and niche that they don't really show up in competitive decks. Like, for example, if you use Brain Research Lab and you get a whole bunch of counters on the card, and the card itself has a negative effect where, if this card's destroyed, you take damage equal to the amount of counters times 1000. So if you chain Cold Feet to an effect your opponent is using to destroy Brain Research Lab, you could make it so that you don't take the damage. However, you cannot use this card to not pay costs as the cost of a card cannot be negated, so you'd still have to tribute with Regulation of the Tribe or pay life points with Mirror Wall. You can also use Mystical Rep Panel with Cold Feet during your opponent's turn, since Cold Feet is a quick play spell card, which will redirect the effect to your opponent, and then give them basically the exact same effect as Cold Wave, and lock them out of spell and trap cards for a turn. And you know you have a bad card if giving the effect to your opponent is seen as a benefit, which is why Cold Feet easily takes the top spot on this list, just not the number one spot. And at number one, we have Self Mummification. This card has the effect where it allows you to select one monster you control and then send it to the graveyard. Now, there are cards that allow you to send your own monsters to the graveyard for some kind of benefit, like Mystic Walk, for example, which is also a quick play spell card which allows you to send one of your monsters to the graveyard to gain life points. So there isn't much use in using Self Mummification, which basically only has a negative effect. If you wanted to send one of your monsters to the graveyard to prevent it from being banished or returned to the deck, there are better cards to use than self mummification, and that's not even a really good reason to run cards in your deck anyway. If people run defensive cards, it's usually to prevent your cards from being sent to the graveyard or removed from the field, not to send it to the graveyard first before your opponent could do something else with it. There is almost no reason to run this card, as it's really hard to gain any beneficial effects from it as it's almost entirely negative. That being said, there are a couple of cards with floating effects that miss timing pretty easily, which you could then use this card in order to activate. Not a lot of them, mind you, since it doesn't destroy the target, and it sends it there directly to the graveyard. So, only cards like Fortune Lady Light, for example. It has a really good effect when it leaves the field, but it also misses timing very easily. So a card like self mummification which sends it to the graveyard without any other effect, basically guarantees that it won't miss its timing. In which case, there's also lots of other better cards to use in self mummification, which is why this is probably one of the worst cards in the game, and arguably the worst quick play spell card in the game. 
I only put this card over Cold Feet because technically you can use Cold Feet on your opponent with Mystical Rift Panel, which is not a half bad lockdown for a turn, even if it's incredibly inefficient and gimmicky, where no such good combo really exists for self mummification. Just a whole bunch of mediocre ways to use it in which there's already cards that do what it's trying to do, but better which is why I think it deserves the top spot on this list. DD Assault Carrier is a level 8 monster with 2500 attack, which can special summon itself from your hand if you control exactly 3 banished cards. However, this card cannot declare an attack unless you banish one card from your graveyard. Additionally, you can only use its effect to special summon from your hand on a hard once per turn. Now, the summoning condition of this card is very reminiscent of Dark Arm Dragon which can special summon itself from your hand if you control exactly three dark monsters in your graveyard. However, if you had multiple copies of Dark Arm Dragon in your hand, you could bring them all out for this same summoning condition. And it also had a great effect to destroy cards in the field. Assault Carrier can only bring out one card from your hand if you have the conditions met, has no other effects on the field other than a negative one, where you have to pay a cost in order to even attack, which makes the card kind of mediocre. A lot of the times I'll see comments from new players asking about particular cards and why they don't see very much play. So in this list, we're going to go over 10 cards that seem really good at first glance to newer players, but don't really see much competitive play for various reasons. And at number 10, we have the Five-Headed Dragon. This is a fusion monster with 5,000 attack and defense, the highest attack point value in the game that a monster can have, and simply requires any five monsters as its materials, and can't be destroyed by battle with certain attributes of monsters, with the restriction where this card must be fusion summoned. Now. I'm sure most people realize why this card isn't very good immediately, and it's not too hard to see why this card doesn't see competitive play. It requires 5 monsters as materials, and its effects on field aren't really that impressive, or having battle immunity for certain types of monsters isn't super useful on a monster with 5000 attack. However, you may be quick to mention cards like Future Fusion and Dragon's Mirror, which will allow you to bring out the card much easier. Future Fusion allows you to fusion summon a monster using cards from your deck and could potentially allow you to send any 5 dragons from your deck to the graveyard. However, Future Fusion received an errata where it won't actually send any cards from your deck to the graveyard until the following turn after you activate it, giving your opponent a full turn to destroy the card, which is pretty easy to do in the modern meta. But pre errata Future Fusion used to send the cards immediately from your deck to the graveyard and that's why the card was banned, because that was actually very good especially if combo with something like 5-headed dragon to get a whole bunch of graveyard dragon effects set up. There's also Dragon's Mirror that allows you to banish 5 dragons from your graveyard to bring it out. The thing is, it's actually kind of difficult to set up 5 materials in your graveyard, and if you're going through the effort to set up so many monsters, usually there should be a better payoff than a 5,000 vanilla beat stick. There is also the option of using Greater Polymerization, which will grant it immunity to destruction effects and piercing damage, since it's a fusion monster that requires more than 3 materials. Although Greater Polymerization requires you to use monsters from your hand or field, so it's inherently a minus 5 in card advantage to bring out 5-headed dragon. And that is definitely not worth the effort for just adding destruction immunity on top of it. Although it can be fun in a gimmick deck. And at number 9, we have everybody's favorite ritual monster, the Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon. Now, this card did actually see some competitive play, Although that was definitely in the past, and some of the other cards on this list saw some competitive play in the past as well, but they're definitely way past their prime. This is a 4000 attack ritual monster, which has the effect where it can't be targeted or destroyed by card effects, and if it attacks a defense boosted monster it deals double piercing battle damage. So if you give your opponent a zero defense monster with creature swap, you can deal 8000 points of damage if you attack into it with your blue eyes chaos max dragon. So having destruction and target immunity is a good form of protection. And having 4000 attack makes it unlikely to be destroyed by battle very easily. However, it's not that difficult for the average meta deck to actually out Max Dragon, as two very common extra deck monsters are able to just beat it in battle no problem. The thing is though, if Chaos Max Dragon was just a little bit easier to bring out, it wouldn't be half bad, because the card is pretty decent. One of the main things holding Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon back is that its Ritual spell card does not mention its name specifically. Chaos Form has the ability to Ritual Summon this card by tributing monsters from your hand or field, or it allows you to banish a Blue-Eyes White Dragon from your graveyard in order to Ritual Summon Blue-Eyes Chaos Max Dragon from your hand. But, Chaos Form does not specifically mention Blue-Eyes Chaos Max Dragon in its text, and simply says it can be used to Ritual Summon any Chaos or Blackluster Soldier Ritual Monster. And this is the distinction that matters, because one of the best singular pieces of Ritual Support is Pre-Preparation of Rites. This card has the effect to add a ritual spell and a ritual monster from your deck to your hand, just as long as the ritual's monster's name is specifically listed in that ritual spell card. 
so it's a straight plus one in card advantage, in one of the best ways possible of allowing you to search those specific cards from your deck. And because pre Preparation Rites is so good, it kind of gives a boost to any ritual monsters that are specifically listed in their good ritual spell cards. Although, just not being a pre Preparation of Rites target isn't the worst thing in the world. It's the fact that it also has a very high attack point value of 4000. You see, they also released a whole archetype of support for ritual monsters called the Drytrons and they have one of the best ritual spell cards in the game called the Meteonis Drytron, which allows you to ritual summon a ritual monster from either your hand or graveyard by tributing machine-type monsters from your hand or field whose total attacks equal or exceed the ritual monster you're trying to bring out. And because it uses attack point values instead of levels, Meteonis allows you to cheat out some very powerful ritual monsters like Herald of Ultimateness and a whole bunch of other ritual monsters, but you'll always have to use two cards if you want to bring out Blue-Eyes Chaos Max Dragon because it has 4,000 attack baseline. Now, it's not impossible to use the Drytron. The Drytron ritual monsters themselves have 4,000 attack even, but they're also better to use than Blue-Eyes Chaos Max Dragon if you're going to go through the effort of using two Drytrons to go into them. So because of a combination of having a bad ritual spell card that doesn't list its name specifically and having too high of an attack point value, it doesn't gel very well with modern ritual support. And rituals are so inherently bad that they need to be almost broken in order to see competitive play, which Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon is not broken enough to reach that threshold, especially not in the modern meta. And at number 8, we have the Winged Dragon of Ra. This is one of the few monsters in the game that has the Divine Beast type and Divine Attribute, and it was a very popular overpowered card in the anime, which has an effect which seems like it's pretty good. It requires three monsters for its tribute summon, your opponent can't negate the tribute summon, and when it's summoned, you pay life points and you only have 100 left in order to give this card attack and defense equal to the amount of life points you paid. And lastly, you can pay 1000 life points to destroy one monster on the field on an effect that's not once per turn. So if you have a full 8000 life points and you bring out the Winged Dragon Raw, it will have 7900 attack and defense, which is definitely enough to beat over pretty much any monster in the game. So, here's the problem with this card. Outside of its summon not being able to be negated, it has absolutely zero protection. If your opponent activates something like Infinite Impermanence on your Winged Dragon of Raw, its attack will be reset down to zero and you don't gain your life points back, so you're just stuck at 100. Also, you can only pay multiples so that you have 100 left and not just any amount of life points you want. So summoning the card and using the effect is always going to put you in a very risky position unless you just don't use the effect to gain any attack points. And if you do use the effect to gain attack points, you can't use its other effect to destroy monsters because you won't have any life points left. So if your opponent just has any form of disruption at all, they can easily target the Winged Dragon of Raw and get rid of it since just lightly breathing on the card will reset its attack point value or get rid of it. And since it requires so many resources to hit the field in the first place, it's usually a good idea to just save your forms of disruption for when the Winged Dragon Raw comes out. In fact, the card was so bad that they released six support cards which exist solely to give it some of its effects back from the anime, which would actually make the monster more useful. In at number 7, we have Chainsaw Insect. This is a level 4 monster with 2400 attack, which has the effect where at the end of the damage step of this card battled, your opponent draws a card. Now, 2400 attack on a level 4 monster is really high. That's one of the highest values of a level 4 monster in the game. So if you get Chainsaw Insect on the field, chances are you'll be able to beat over any of your opponent's level 4 lower monsters, and even a lot of their other normal low attack boss monsters. And the cost for this is just your opponent drawing one card, so you can attack with it all you want without having to worry about too much of the downside. The problem though, is that giving your opponent card draw is one of the worst effects in the game, because card advantage in Yu-Gi-Oh is everything. In other card games, they usually have a resource system which will inherently limit how many actions you're able to perform in a turn. So cards that allow you to draw other cards in other card games are usually not that big a deal, even if the effects are still definitely good nonetheless. In Yu-Gi-Oh though, a single card draw is so good that we have cards like Chicken Game banned because they allow you to draw a single card and can be used too easily. A singular card in Yu-Gi-Oh can kind of win you the game on its own because of all of the combos it can allow you to perform, or just because there's a lot of super powerful singular cards in the game. So giving your opponent any kind of card draw better be worth that effect. There's a card called Dark Bribe, which allows you to negate any spell or trap card at the cost of giving your opponent a plus one draw, and that card is considered not very good and only played in very niche situations like Mystic Mind stall decks, and even then, it isn't considered that great of an option compared to other alternatives. So having a monster with the same detriments is obviously even worse, because your opponent can proc the effect by attacking into it as well, which is definitely worth it because of how valuable that card draw is. And at number 6, we have Dances with Beasts. 
This is a trap card which has the effect where if an opponent declares a direct attack, while the combined attack of all face-up monsters they control is 8,000 or higher, you can summon three monsters with different original names. One from your deck, one from your hand, and one from your graveyard. So, being able to get out a card from your deck and graveyard out of those three is really good, especially since it's completely unconditional on what your targets are. If one of your targets is something like Thunderclap Skywolf, it can use its effect on your opponent's turn to destroy all of your opponent's monsters. And Modern Yu-Gi-Oh! is all about accumulating a huge board of monsters that can easily have over 8,000 attack. So the effect will probably be live more often than you'd think. However, the big problem with the card is the fact that it's a battle trap, whose trigger is a direct attack and not an attack on one of your monsters. There's another card in the game called Drowning Mirror Force, which can only be activated when your opponent declares a direct attack as well, and it shuffles all of your opponent's monsters back into the deck. And the effect of returning monsters back to the deck is one of the strongest forms of removal in Yu-Gi-Oh! because it prevents a lot of floating effects. And Drowning Mirror Force sees almost no play in modern Yu-Gi-Oh! although it is heavily played in Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links. Dances with Beast has an even harsher restriction of also requiring your opponent to control a lot of high attack monsters. And the reason these effects are not very good is because modern Yu-Gi-Oh! is about destroying your opponent's board before entering the battle phase at all. So basically any battle trap, no matter how good it is, is just a sitting duck for your opponent's destruction effects. And that's why cards like Torrential Tribute are a lot more valuable, because they can be activated outside of the battle phase and during the process of your opponent establishing their board, which would be able to destroy your back row. And at number 5, we have Shard of Greed. This is a continuous spell card which has the effect where each time you draw a card for your normal draw phase, you get to place one Greed Counter on this card. Then, once this card has two or more Greed Counters, you can send it to the graveyard to draw two cards. So the card is basically Pot of Greed that takes two turns in order to activate. And Pot of Greed is one of the best singular cards in the game because it just gives you an effortless plus one. And as I've talked about in the Chainsaw Insect section, being able to draw cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! is very good compared to other card games. So having a generic draw two card that just takes two turns to activate sounds like a no-brainer good card. The problem, though, is the same problem as the previous card, in that modern Yu-Gi-Oh! is all about destroying your opponent's board before entering the battle phase, and Shard of Greed is basically a sitting target waiting to get destroyed by basically anything. It's just too vulnerable and doesn't offer you the immediate advantage that would be necessary in order to be played in a combo deck that might want generic card draw. If you're playing an incredibly slow control deck, you also kind of want your effects to do something immediately, because you're playing against your opponent's combo deck that's trying to destroy all your cards. So control decks definitely value cards that are able to stop their opponent's plays, and not cards that take up one of their card draws and waits two turns before being useful. So it's not really useful in combo decks since they need to be able to use everything immediately, or control decks that are trying to survive against combo decks destroying their field. And at number 4, we have Witch's Strike. Witch's Strike is a trap card which has the effect that it can only be activated in response to your opponent negating either the summon of one of your monsters, or the activation of one of your cards or effects. In which case you gain the effect to destroy all cards your opponent controls and in their hand. So basically, if you activate the effect, you gain so much advantage from the destruction that you've basically won the game. Being able to destroy all cards on your opponent's side of the field is pretty good, being able to do that in addition to their hand is even better. Because there aren't really cards in the game that can just get rid of your opponent's entire hand. That is like the rarest effect in Yu-Gi-Oh! and also just one of the strongest. And since the modern metagame is all about negating your cards anyway, wouldn't it seem like this card is kind of overpowered? Well, the problem with this card, and why it doesn't work very well, is mainly tied to the fact that it's a trap card. You see, since this card is a trap card, it's not usable on your first turn or going second, which is usually when the most amount of negates are happening. So this card is something that would be very good during your first turn, which is not usable until your next turn, which immediately takes it out of the running for a lot of decks. Because if you want your combos to go off uninterrupted, you basically have to wait a whole turn before being able to set Witch's Strike if you want to use it in retaliation for something getting negated, in which case you're probably going to lose by that point since you didn't actually do anything. If you're just setting it because you play a whole bunch of control trap cards in the first place, chances are you're trying to stop your opponent from getting out monsters which can negate, or you're playing a whole bunch of floodgates, where you don't really get your stuff negated in the first place. And there are a lot of modern cards which don't negate activations, simply the effects of cards. Two of the most popular hand traps in the game are Ash Blossom and Joy Spring and Infinite Impermanence, and neither of the negates from these cards can activate Witch's Strike, since they don't specifically negate the activation of a card, they negate the effects, which is a difference that matters. Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring won't proc Witch's Strike, but Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion will because it does negate the activation. Sword Soul Master will not proc the effect of Witch's Strike, but Barone will. 
So it's kind of an awkward card to use because there's lots of negates in the game which don't actually negate the activation of cards and only their effects. So realistically, even having the option of activating Witch's Strike itself is kind of hard, as most of the time, if your opponent is able to get up a board of negates, they'll probably have at least one other negate to then negate the effect of Witch's Strike, since it's just a normal trap card which happens after the negate takes place and not during the chain. So if Witch's Strike was a quick play spell card, it would actually be really good. The fact that you had to wait a turn in order to maybe use it means it's not likely to be resolved outside of very specific types of decks, just because of how important the first couple of turns are, and how bad trap cards are which have incredibly specific triggers, since they're usually so vulnerable to being destroyed by your opponent's destruction effects. However, if you do resolve the effect, you probably win. So it's a nice gimmick with a situational effect that comes up a lot more often than other gimmicky cards, to the point where it might see competitive play someday, depending on certain specific trap synergies or support that might be released in the future. And at number three, we have Mirror Force. This is a trap card which can only be activated when your opponent declares an attack, where you then get to destroy all attack vision monsters your opponent controls. Now, there is a card in the game called Lightning Storm, which has an effect that can only be activated if you control no face-up cards, and allows you to either destroy all face-up attack position monsters your opponent controls, or destroy all spell and trap cards your opponent controls. And Lightning Storm is an absolute staple card that sees all kinds of competitive play in both the main and side deck, whereas Mirror Force does not, despite sharing the same effect of being able to destroy all your opponent's attack position monsters. And the reason for that is because it's a trap card which can only be activated during the battle phase from a specific trigger by your opponent. And the same reason Witch's Strike and Dances with Beasts is not very good kind of applies to Mirror Force, in that trap cards kind of have to be usable whenever in order to see competitive play, and most of the time even then they're too slow and they need to be usable from the hand immediately if they're going to actually see widespread competitive play. And because, as I mentioned earlier, the metagame is more about destroying your opponent's board before attacking, rather than building up a huge board and then attacking. Usually, a deck won't enter the battle phase until after they've already destroyed all your opponent's cards. So, Mirror Force is just way too vulnerable to survive to the battle phase, even though the effect is technically good. The effect of Mirror Force does have a history of competitive play, but not really in the modern game. The power level of Mirror Force is probably a little bit higher than the rest of the cards on this list, but it's definitely a new player trap that seems a lot better than it really is. Although I can't really think of a better new player trap than the next two cards on this list. And at number two, we have Magic Cylinder. This is another battle trap which can only be activated when your opponent declares an attack, just like Mirror Force, except its effect is that it simply negates the attack of the monster, then inflicts damage to your opponent equal to that monster's attack. So if your opponent is attacking with something like a number 100 Numeron Dragon that has 9,000 attack, then you can reflect all of that damage back to your opponent and win the game. Or if your opponent is attacking with some other big attacking monster and they're low on life points, this can kind of steal you the game with the massive amount of effect damage it deals. Although, here's why this card isn't very good. This situation, and when this card can single-handedly win you the game, are incredibly situational and niche at best, and not really worth playing a main deck card for. So in all other situations, and normal situations, monsters will not have more than 8,000 attack. And all you're doing in those normal situations is stopping a single attack by going minus one in card advantage, and while having a vulnerable battle trap on the field the whole time. Dealing damage to your opponent's life points is not really worth anything, unless that's the whole point of your deck. And even most burn decks don't play Magic Cylinder because it's too reliant on your opponent performing an action, and they'd rather play other burn cards that can be chained immediately to your opponent trying to clear your back row. And being able to stop a singular attack is also not a good effect, unless you're able to do it incidentally through some other amazing effect. Because even using a card to stop an entire battle phase like Threatening Roar is not worth playing unless the point of your deck is trying to stall out. And even Threatening Roar isn't considered a very good card anymore. Same with Scrap Iron Scarecrow, which can stop one attack every turn while not losing any card advantage. And that's mainly the problem with Magic Cylinder. It's too hard to trigger because it has to survive to the battle phase, and both of its effects are not really worth playing the card, since there are other better ways to deal burn damage, and there are better ways to stop a singular attack, which don't really see play because neither of those things are very important. And at number one, we have Magical Mallet. This is a spell card which has the effect where you can shuffle any number of cards from your hand back into your deck and then draw the same number of cards. And on surface level, this card seems very good, as it allows you to basically mulligan your hand, and a choice of returning singular cards rather than returning everything like what Reload does. However, you may be surprised to hear, but Reload is actually better in certain circumstances and has seen more play than Magical Mallet because it has some combo potential with certain cards. But the reason Magical Mallet is not as good as you would think 
is because it's an inherent minus one in card advantage. You see, whenever you count the amount of advantage a card has, you have to also count the fact that the card is going to go to the graveyard after you use it. That's why something like Pot of Greed is considered a plus one, even though it lets you draw two cards. That's because the card advantage is counted to the fact that you're losing the card from your hand in order to draw two. So, while being able to reset choice cards from your hand in order to redraw them is actually a very good effect, having to go minus one in card advantage to do it is generally not worth it, because card advantage is everything in the game. Having to play a specific card in your deck that you have to specifically draw into to have a chance to reset a dead hand is just not worth playing that card. Especially since you're basically planning for a failure stage, rather than trying to plan for a way to advance the game state. I've had many streams where people would come on and suggest that I add Magical Mallet in order to deal with Garnets that I draw into my deck. As of course a Garnet is a card that you never want in your hand and you want to stay in your deck. And it is the ideal card in order to potentially deal with a Garnet. But that's playing a card in order to only deal with Garnets, and taking a loss in card advantage that could be used on literally anything else that could actually advance the game state. You could instead play something like Evenly Matched to single-handedly win you the game, Dark Ruler No More to turn off all of your opponent's negates, or even an Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring to stop a key search. You have to compare this one Magical Ballot, which is only planning for a failure state, to all of these other very game-changing staples that could instead help you actually win the game. All while most of these other staple cards trading evenly, or even netting you advantageous card advantage, instead of a guaranteed minus one like what Magical Mallet will always be. Really, the easiest way they could fix the card for Magical Mallet to be as good as people think it is, is to change its effect to draw the same number of cards you return to your deck, plus one. Which is exactly what they did with some archetype specific Magical Mallets, like Ignite Reload, which allows you to shovel back Pendulum Monsters from your hand to your deck, then draw the same number of cards, plus one. Or even Sekka's Light which allows you to return a singular card from your hand to your deck and draw a card, but it does so from the graveyard, so you don't lose any card advantage. So there are cards which have good effects similar to Magical Mallet, but the only good ones that do, don't lose you any card advantage for doing so. Rebuild Deer is a level 4 monster with 1800 attack, which has the effect that if it destroys an opponent's monster by battle, you can special summon a Cyberus monster with 1500 or less attack from your graveyard. Now, while being able to recover monsters from your graveyard is good, the effect being tied to a battle trigger is kind of bad, because it's really hard to actually destroy things by battle in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, because generally you're trying to remove your opponent's monsters from the field before entering the battle phase anyway, or just attack with a whole bunch of power. However, what's interesting to note about this card is that it came out in 2021. Whereas the card by the name of Flame Veil Fire Dog came out in 2009, had 100 more attack, a similar effect, but it special summoned its chosen monster from the deck rather than the graveyard. So it's really surprising to see they printed a similar card to Fire Dog over 10 years later, that in all respects is a downgrade, when Fire Dog had already been powercraft itself. Yu-Gi-Oh! is an ever-changing game, with new and old cards coming in on the meta all the time. And in this video we'll go over cards which people thought would change the game, but ended up not doing much at all. Starting us off at number 10, we have Crystal Seer. This is a level 1 spellcaster which has 100 attack and defense, and when it's flipped you excavate the top two cards of your deck, and pick one to go to your hand, and then place the other on the bottom. Seer came out in the middle of the GX era, in a format dominated mostly by Monarchs. Rise of the Storm Monarch was one of the strongest tribute monsters of the time, letting you stack a card from the field on top of your opponent's deck, a deadly combo together with Phoenix Wing Windblast. Seer was hyped not only as a consistency tool, but also a reason for Monarch decks to go back to using Apprentice Engine. Apprentice Magician used to be the best recruiter to play since it could float into either itself, Old Vindictive Magician, who can pop a card in the field, or Magician of Faith who can recover a spell from the graveyard. There were lots of parallels between the latter, in fact, since they were both level 1 spellcasters that got you back advantage, but Faith itself had been banned at the time. The issue with Seer is that its effect wasn't nearly as good to make up for its pitiful stats. Dekoichi had nearly the same payoff while also being usable as a beater. As a cherry on top, they even unbanned Magician of Faith for a format just a couple of weeks before Crystal Seer, its supposed replacement, dropped. All of this happened quite early in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, and at least Pot of Duality, a card with a similar effect but on a spell card instead, did impact the game as much as Crystal Seer was expected to many years later. So this card is at a pretty low spot on this list. And coming in at number 9, we have Dark Worlds. The Dark Worlds structure deck was said to be released in late 2011, and it had many powerful cards that looked like they would break the meta. This archetype is made out of a series of monsters that get their effects when discarded, but only when discarded by effects and not cost. So they don't work on cards like Raigeki Break, and also they gain bonus effects when discarded by an opponent's card. 
Silva and Gold had been seen play as tech against cards that discard random cards from your hand like Spirit Reaper and Don Zalug in earlier metas, but at the time the archetype didn't have enough engine to be played by itself. The new structure deck was supposed to change them, giving them strong consistency tools like Snow, who can add a Dark World card when discarded, and Gate to the Dark World, which lets you discard them for effect and draw a card at the same time. But the most hyped of them was certainly Graffa, which could only be special summoned by returning another Dark World monster from your field to your hand, and when discarded would let you pop a card in the field, all while being a 2700 attack beat stick. The hype was so much that even Konami hopped on it, who did their coverage of the next big event while roleplaying as Graffa itself on their blog. Players feared the deck, and after release, many would cite in many direct counters to the strategy in Shadow and Prison Mirror and DD Crow. All of this hype just for the deck to get zero top cut slots in the next event, being heavily outclassed by other meta decks of the time, like Plant Synchro and Agents. Results which Konami tried to explain by saying that it was only because the new Dark World support card, Dark Smog, hadn't been released yet. Dark Worlds did go on to get a couple of tops later on, it just wasn't the dominant force it was made out to be at first. And number 8, we have another structure deck, the Layer of Darkness structure deck, named appropriately after its main card, Layer of Darkness. This is a field spell card that turns all monsters in the field to dark. Its main effect is that if you would tribute monsters to activate card effects, you can tribute your opponent's dark monsters for them instead. Then, during the end phase, the turn player gets as many Torment tokens as possible in defense position, up to the number of monsters tributed this turn. Tributing monsters as cost is still one of the most powerful forms of removal in the entire game, and this deck would allow you to do it without going minus, which was even better than using Kaijus. The other cards revealed all synergize perfectly with the strategy, with the Field Spell Searchers and ways to tribute off your opponent's monsters at quick effect speed. Additionally, Field Spell decks were much better back then because Terraform hadn't been limited to one yet. The deck came out first in the OCG, where it became a widely used strategy combined with Infernoids, an archetype where almost every monster needs a tribute to activate its effect, giving it perfect synergy with Lair. But when it finally came out to the West, it barely did anything. The issue was how powerful every other deck at the time was in comparison, with the likes of Sky Striker and Triple Engage, and Goki with both Isolde and Nightmare Mermaid, how can a deck that dies to a single MST compete? Some of the cards in the structure deck did end up seeing play in other decks, such as Lilith and Trap Heavy Strategies, or Diabolos as Attack and Sky Striker at least. Still, despite the disappointment at first, Layer Infernoids did eventually manage to get a few tops in lower powered metas as a rogue pick. And at number 7, there's Crossout Designator, a quick play spell that allows you to banish a card from your deck to negate the effects of cards with the same name until the end of this turn on a hard once per turn. Crossout's main use is negating hand traps like Ash Blossom and Nibiru, since you can't chain it to their activation on your turn as long as you play a copy of them yourself. This ability to get hand traps is what made Called by the Grave see play in almost every deck, and even got it in the limited list. Even if you don't need to use it defensively, you can still set it and use it during your opponent's turn. This can be devastating in mirror matches, and there's always a chance you can use it to get a stable like Proud of Prosperity during your opponent's turn. This card saw a ridiculous amount of play in the OCG, and was even put on their ban list in the same month it was released in the West. All the anticipation made this card into the most expensive of its set, and then the card went on to see little play in the following months. The TCG and OCG metas are so different that Crossout didn't become nearly as much of a staple as it is over there. The main reason is because Max-C is not legal in the West, and the card by itself is a turn ender for every deck that special summons more than a couple of times, with Crossout being one of the few counters. So even though it was a staple over there, it was just a rare side pick inclusion here. Recently, Crossout's been mostly in Despia decks, since it's the only generic card that can counter both of its biggest counters. But that's still nothing compared to how it was in the OCG, who had to put it all the way down to 1 eventually. And at number 6, we have Natura Pineapple, a level 2 earth plant that turns all monsters you control into plants. Also, during your standby phase, if it's in your graveyard and you don't have any back row and only plants and beasts in the graveyard, it can special summon itself from the graveyard. The Naturias were a quite mediocre archetype at the time. Their situation was exactly like the Ice Barriers, where their synchros were good to play in other decks, but they didn't really work by themselves. Pineapple was supposed to fix that. Being a TCG exclusive card released at the highest rarity available, just like the previous meta breaker Gateway of the Six. This monster is extremely similar to Treeborn Frog, a card which had been a mainstay in the meta for a few years before itself. It was supposed to give you easy tribute fodder for the only good main deck Nature monster at the time, Nature of Bamboo Shoot which locks your opponent completely out of spell traps. The theorized Pineapple Cat deck made this Natura card hit really high prices at first, as it used Rescue Cat's engine to give the Naturas more combo while staying within Pineapple's restriction. Not only did it not live up to the hype, Rescue Cat would also get banned just a couple of weeks after the card came out. There weren't any easy ways to set up Pineapple in the graveyard deck like Treeborn Frog had. Also, even if Bamboo Shoot actually had a good effect, it'd lose its effect completely if it got hit by Effect Veiler, 
which was a staple in almost every deck. Additionally, since its stats were on the lower side for tribute monsters, you'd need to run a lot of defensive cards to keep it alive, all of which would turn off your pineapple due to its restriction. The deck just couldn't compete with the meta threats at the time, like x Xavers, and once again, outside of their synchro monsters, the Nichiras were forgotten. And at number 5, we have Magical Musketeers, a series of fiend monsters with a very interesting gimmick. They all let you activate Magical Musketeer spell traps from your hand while on the field, and then they have an additional effect when a spell trap is activated in the same column as one of them. They were announced at the beginning of the Link era, and the Magi Bullets, as they were called at the time, were instantly prompted up as the second coming of Zodiacs, which had just left the meta with the banning of Dryden and Broadball. Caspar and Doc set your advantage engine by letting you get Magical Musketeer spells from both your deck and graveyard every turn. The deck even had a powerful draw effect with Kid Brave and even Zodiac Barrage-like effect with Starfire. The spell trap lineup was no slouch either, with quick effect pops, graveyard disruption, and monster and spell trap negates. However, this deck could not possibly have been released at the worst time in the TCG, being dropped in the middle of a format mostly dominated by Spiral. The Magical Musketeer Advantage engine was good in theory, but there was no way to keep up with combo decks using tools like Ancient Fairy Dragon and pre errata Firewall Dragon. When it came to the slower decks, the deck was worse than Trickstars, which had a much more compact engine as well as a way to win the game instantly with Reincarnation and Draw and Lockbird combo, banishing your opponent's whole hand. So the new Zodiacs were left to rot, never really finding their place competitively as the meta progressed and left them behind. They managed to secure themselves a few top spots years later, however, with the release of the Link monster in Magical Musketeer Max before fading off completely again. And at number 4, we have Spell Chronicle. This is a continuous spell card that requires you to send your entire hand to the graveyard to activate it, and then it banishes 5 spell or trap cards from your deck. Then, each time your opponent activates the spell card, you place one Chronicle counter on it. You can remove two of these counters and let your opponent choose one of those banished cards to add to your hand. And if this card ever gets destroyed, you take 500 damage for each of the cards still banished by its effect. Despite sounding like some terrible pack filler, this card managed to get an amazing amount of excitement surrounding it years after its release in Duelist Alliance format. What happened is that, as a joke or otherwise, this card was hyped by multiple competitive players at once, with some even saying they were going to buy all copies of Spell Chronicle that they could. The most baffling explanations on why this card were good were given, such as being able to use it to trigger your Shadow All effects, despite it sending cards for cost and not effect, so it couldn't even trigger the Shadow All effects. This all resulted in the almost useless card skyrocketing price from night to day, as everyone wanted to get their hands on the new meta as soon as they could. Even though the rest of the playwrights kept theorizing why this card was supposed to be so good, by thinking it should be used with Primal C to get cards back or trigger BA effects, no one could really figure out why it was supposed to be so good. This would only last a couple more days before everyone who bought in realized it was a joke and they had all been duped. The hype dissipated and so did the discussion and price speculations around this card shortly after. Funnily enough, half a decade later, they actually released a card that comboed very well with this with the Witchcrafter's Patronus. After activating Spell Chronicle, it could be used to add all the cards back to your hand, as long as they were Witchcrafter cards. But even that was too inconsistent to ever see play. And coming in at number 3, we have Sinet Switch. This is a continuous spell that lets you, once per turn, move one monster on your side of the field to an adjacent horizontal unoccupied monster card zone. Even though this reads like one of the most do-nothing cards in the whole game, Sinet Switch's demand soared during the final days of Master Rule 3. The new Master Rules announced and the player base would slowly learn about Link Summoning and the Extra Monster Zone mechanic. Since you would need to Special Summon Extra Deck Monsters to either the Extra Monster Zone or Zones a Link Monster pointed to, people looked for cards that could potentially free up your Extra Monster Zone. It's important to say that this card actually received an errata after Master Rule 4, as it used to not say Horizontal in its card text, so it was thought of as one of the best ways to free up your Extra Monster Zone to allow you to keep playing. This was not the only card to get hyped up due to zone shenanigans, since other zone manipulating cards that were just pack fillers before came into the spotlight, like a ground collapse which people thought you could use to block the extra monster zone. But of course, as more information came to light and all cards that mentioned zones were eroded, Sinet Switch went back to its obscurity. This wasn't the first or last time cards got hyped due to a misunderstanding like this. Around the same era, there was also a rumor that Konami would increase the life point starting value to 16,000 to slow the game down, leading to buyouts of the card Ancient Leaf since it's Pot of Greed if your life points are over 9,000. Funnily enough, Ascendant Switch became relevant again in 2022 with the release of the Valence Archetype, a series of Pendulum Monsters which all get their effects off when they change zones. Their most recent piece of support in the OCG can even search Ascendant Switch itself from the deck. And coming in at number 2, we have Sea Monster of Theseus. This is a level 5 tuner fusion monster with the shortest card text in Yu-Gi-Oh! Two tuners, its summoning requirement. This card was another one hyped by Konami itself, ages before its set came out. This TCG exclusive card was said to be the strongest card of 2017. To put things into context, 2017 was the year when Zodiacs came out, who were the centerpiece of countless formats until their good XEs were all banned. 
This was also when the true Dracos were released. Another archetype which saw lots of play for years, including their boss monsters and masterpiece, which is still banned to this day. Among these two, and countless other titans in the meta, including other cards such as Priorata Firewall Dragon and Ash Blossom, this non-effect monster was supposed to be the strongest monster of that year. Now, Konami's reasoning was that since Elder Entity Norden was now banned, this card would take its place as the instant fusion target of choice. Norden was the reason why instant fusion saw play in pretty much every deck back in the day, since it was one of the easiest ways to spam materials on the field, and it was even summoned using the usual way of fusion substitute in Zodiac decks due to how strong it was. In the article released to hype this card up to the player base, they talked about how you could use it to go into synchros for decks that generally couldn't. Being able to suddenly make something like Black Rose Dragon or Cypher Lord Omega in decks that normally couldn't were decent plays at the time, but nothing that would shake up the meta like the previously mentioned cards. The issue with Theseus is how much extra deck investment it took up to actually do anything, while also requiring you to hard draw instant fusion and already have bodies in the field in order to make use of it. Of course, there was massive disappointment for the player base who were expecting a TCG exclusive that broke the game once again. At the very least, this card actually got better with time, since Christian Hockey Fibrax gives you a really nice payout for having a 200 body on the field. And despite instant fusion being limited, you now have a higher chance of being able to access him due to the release of Retort Fusion. Though none of that changes how much of a disappointment this card when it was revealed. And finally, at number one, to no one's surprise, we have the Noble Knights. The Noble Knights are an archetype comprised mostly of warrior monsters and their weapons with the Noble Arms sub-archetype. They first came out during the Xyz era, being released in small batches with every coming set. Starting out with the vanilla with Noble Knight Artorius. These TCG exclusive cards hogged lots of high rarity spots in older sets, much to the dismay of whoever bought them. On the third or so wave of support, the player base could already tell the whole archetype wasn't going to amount much to anything, having lots of their cards being based on some of the worst mechanics in Yu-Gi-Oh! with Geminis and Equip spells. When the first piece of support came out, the strategy couldn't lift a candle against the meta strategies at the time in Mermail's Fire Fist. The deck's main play was to try to summon out their Xyz monster with a bunch of Equip spells to protect it, something which wasn't very good in the first place and it couldn't even do it consistently. For a couple of years, accompanying every new Noble Knight card release, there would be a Konami article calling it the new meta contender. This kept going all the way until the Duelist Alliance era, where they would infamously say a Noble Knight with a bunch of equip spells was the best out in the meta to shout all construct. The cards weren't completely hopeless, and some of the later pieces of support were even quite decent, earning this deck a couple of tops throughout the years, but it was not nearly the game breaker as Konami's fan favorite lets you on. This subpar archetype got countless pieces of support, its own box set, and even its own exclusive rarity at some point in Platinum Rare. It was a shame how mediocre it was due to how much it cost and how gorgeous some of the artwork was, but at least this archetype made up for it with the cards it got years later, deep in the Link era. Isolde, 8, Two Tales of Noble Knights broke the meta with Gokis at release as an amazing tool for Warrior Link spam. She didn't really have anything to do with the main deck Noble Knights, but because of it needing equip spells to go to the graveyard to use its second effect, it led to some Noble Arms cards seen play as the Solde Gardens. Later on, Infer Nobles, another sub-archetype of the Noble Knights, would eventually become a tier 1 strategy for a while. But even if they did make a good new support eventually, that doesn't change how much of a disappointment the original Noble Knights were at first, especially since the Infer Nobles don't really use any of the support from the early Noble Knights. So, Noble Knights are still mocked to this day as the most overhyped series of cards ever printed in Yu-Gi-Oh! Brave Drive is a level 4 1500 attack Cybris monster which has the effect that if a Cybris monster declares an attack, you can discard one monster from your hand, so the monster gains 600 attack until the end of the turn. So, if you use it on itself, the monster goes up to 2100 attack temporarily. If you could use this card without a trigger, it would still be incredibly mediocre as discarding a monster specifically is not worth a 600 attack boost. If the attack boost was permanent, it still wouldn't be worth it. If the effect was not once per turn, it still wouldn't be worth it. It's so incredibly underpowered for its cost, it's almost a wonder how this card came out in 2021. This is the definition of a garbage pack filler in the modern age, where back in the day, they would just print cards with no effect that had terrible stat lines. With this card's effect, it might as well be a vanilla monster. You can call Yu-Gi-Oh a lot of things, but oftentimes a fair game isn't one of them since there have been hundreds of cards printed over the years with effects that are lame, unfun, or even sometimes downright toxic. Using these cards doesn't mean that you're a toxic player though, and several toxic cards have actually seen a ton of competitive play. These cards can just make games feel almost unfair. So today, we're going to look at 10 of the most toxic cards in the game, what makes them unfun, and why they even see play in the first place. Crawling into number 10 spot, we have Maxi. One of the most controversial cards on this list that's inspired a ton of debate about whether the card is toxic or actually healthy for the game. 
With Max E, you can send it from your hand to the graveyard during either player's turn, at any point to apply a lingering effect that makes it so that each time your opponent spells summons a monster, you get to draw a card. But you can only use one Max E per turn. The reason why a lot of players consider Max E a healthy card is specifically because of the interesting dynamic and counterplay provides against combo strategies. Going second in Yu-Gi-Oh! is already a monumentally difficult task, since if most combo decks are left uninterrupted, they're going to have the opportunity to build a nearly unbreakable board, or just FDK you outright. But because hand traps exist, a lot of these combo strategies can be easily punished by a well-timed interruption. And the same is true of Max E, because whenever it resolves, it provides combo strategies with a difficult choice. You either pass on no interruptions to stop your opponent from drawing, give your opponent a few draws to end on a small board with few interruptions, or you can just combo off and give your opponent as many as they want in hopes that your board is strong enough to deal with their card advantage. This pushes a lot of unhealthy combo strategies out of the format. Since these decks are built too greedy with their end boards or focus on overextension, they're going to get harshly punished by the bug. But for a lot of people, this is actually precisely why Maxi is so toxic, because even though it gives a choice in how you can deal with it, every one of those options is a huge gamble. It usually results in you losing the game regardless. If you end on a board of little to no disruption, then your opponent can just play almost uninterrupted and OTK you easily. Or if you combo off, then your opponent is going to be able to brute force their way through your board with a sheer mass of card advantage. It's a lose-lose situation that relies on random chance to beat with almost zero effective counterplay once it's resolved, and turns games that would previously be surefire wins into definite losses if you have no way of dealing with your opponent's draws. This pushes out unfun combo decks from seeing play, but also pushes out a ton of fun and interesting combo strategies from the meta, purely for the reason that they can't play under Max C. But not only does the bug push certain decks out of the meta, it centralizes the entire format around its existence, since you have to ensure that you have a way to beat it, forcing you to play cards like Crossout Designator just so you're not caught off guard by a Max C jump scare. But by far the most toxic part about Max C is that it's not just a tool that helps decks when going second, it also guarantees wins if your opponent happens to draw it when going first. Because now not only do you have to break your opponent's board, you have to do so while providing them with almost uncapped follow-up by giving them a ton of free draws. Because if you don't, you're likely to just get OTK'd. No matter which side of the maxi debate you're on, both sides can agree. Getting put under maxi sucks and feels like a punch to the gut. Especially if you happen to be going second. And it existing can lead to games that would otherwise have interesting back and forth to be unwinnable on one side. Forcing every deck to be built with a card in mind and restricting a ton of strategies from heavy meta impact. The only reason it's so low on this list is calling Maxi toxic is somewhat controversial, since there are a lot of people that consider it healthy for the game, since for all the bad it does, it allows for slower strategies a chance to actually see competitive play, and because it can easily be played around if you build your deck with Maxi in mind. Tributing over number 9 is Gamma Seal the Sea Turtle Kaiju, a representative of the Kaiju archetype, a series of monsters that act as some of the best removal in the game's history. Most kaijus have a secondary, unique effect that makes each of them relevant within their own strategy, or when splashed into other decks as end board pieces. But in terms of toxicity, only one aspect of kaijus really matters. And that is that with a kaiju, you contribute an opponent's monster as part of their summon condition, and then special summon that monster to your opponent's field and attack position. But this particular summon condition isn't unique to the archetype, and some cards can even tribute more than one of your opponent's monsters. Like Lava Golem, which can tribute two monsters, and Sphere Mode, which can tribute three but for these cards you have to give up your normal summon. These summoning conditions are toxic because there's no real way of interacting with the kaiju-like monster before it hits the field, because its ability to tribute one of your monsters isn't an effect that activates, it's a summoning condition. Which means that there's no window to actually respond with a negate or disruption, it just happens. This means that if your opponent has drawn a kaiju, you have to just accept that one of your key inboard pieces is being removed from the field. It doesn't matter if you spent your entire turn building up into it, or even if it's completely unaffected, it's being replaced by a turtle. This issue is exasperated by cards which tribute multiple monsters like Lava Golem and Sphere Mode, being able to clear away your entire field at the low cost of your normal summon, which gives decks like Kastir and Runic easy ways to deal with your boss monsters when going second without giving you any real opportunity to fight back. Now, to a certain extent, kaiju-like effects are a necessary evil in the modern game and are really important for breaking almost unbreakable boards or dealing with difficult out boss monsters that a lot of decks would struggle to deal with otherwise. But the lack of potential counterplay available is why a lot of people consider these monsters, as well as cards like Super Polymerization and Dark Ruler No More, somewhat toxic, since you don't have a way of keeping your hard-earned end board safe from cards you can't respond to. Shifting into number 8 is Dimension Shifter, a lingering macro cosmos on a hand trap that can force you to skip your whole turn if your deck uses the graveyard. You need to have no cards in your graveyard to activate Shifter, but if you do, you can send it from your hand to the graveyard at quick effect speed to make it so that until the end of the next turn, any card that would be sent to the graveyard will be banished instead. 
In the modern era, a ton of different strategies are reliant on the graveyard in some way, since they're able to use it as a secondary resource due to the number of powerful graveyard effects a ton of different cards have, which can allow you to search, extend, or even interrupt your opponent. So effects that force cards to be banished rather than sent to the graveyard are insanely powerful in decks that don't need their graveyard. They're capable of shutting down some decks entirely and leaving them with no way of actually comboing off, which makes them pretty toxic already. And Dimension Shifter can apply this effect at quick effect speed. So instead of needing to set up a Macro Cosmos or a Dimension Fisher on your turn, you can drop a Dimension Shifter during your opponent's turn to lock them out of the graveyard entirely, forcing them to either pass turn or to pull all the resources into a mediocre board so they don't just get OTK'd. And regardless of what they pick, if your deck doesn't care about the graveyard, you're probably going to be able to OTK them in some way. As a result, Shifter sees competitive play in a ton of different meta and anti-meta strategies that don't care about the graveyard like Kashtiro and Fluenda Reeds. That can afford to have their cards banished, and was one of the most important tools for these decks during Tier Limits format, since it gave these decks a fighting chance when going second in the Tier 0 format by locking the graveyard focused Tier Limits out of the game entirely. For a lot of decks, Shifter isn't just a useful tool, it's almost a win condition in of itself, since it can stop so many strategies from being able to play the game. And while its effect eventually stops applying, it's an incredibly difficult card to deal with, and one that can steal games because of just how strong its particular floodgate is. Rocking into number 7 is Barrier Statue of the Stormwinds, a representative of cards that stop your opponent from being able to summon in some way. The way Stormwinds does this is by stopping both players from special summoning any monster other than wind monsters while it's on the field. And it's typically brought out at the end of a combo so your opponent has to contest a board full of interaction while being locked under an oppressive floodgate that stops them from playing the game. And there are a ton of different cards in the game that all do pretty much the same thing in different ways. Artifact Scythe applies a lingering effect which locks you out of the extra deck. Protoss locks you out of specific attributes, and Pachycephalo locks players out of special summoning monsters entirely. And every one of these cards is toxic in their own right, because pretty much every competitive deck in the modern era relies on special summoning in some way to make their plays, with only a few notable exceptions. Whether it's accessing boss monsters, combo pieces, or even floodgates of their own, Almost every deck values being able to special summon in some way, and if your opponent happens to be sitting behind a card like a Barrier Statue or Majesty's Fiend, it can be really annoying to deal with since you're either relying on your normal summon to hopefully beat over it, or you're hoping to draw the specific out you need to negate it so you can actually play. And some of these anti-special summon floodgates are really difficult to deal with. You might be able to Dark Ruler or Barrier Statue, but you'd need Forbidden Chalice or Droplet to deal with Scythe to stop its lingering effect from applying and a card like Dimensional Barrier has even fewer answers. Even if you happen to draw the out for a specific floodgate, sometimes that's not enough either, especially because meta viable strategies that use these kinds of floodgates usually back them up with the rest of their end board in order to secure a victory. Scythe decks, for example, would often race to reach Baron de Floor as early as possible to have a negate prepared for your opponent's DD Crow or Infinite Impermanence, and Flint of Reason often back up Stormwinds with M-Pen, Shifter, and the rest of the engine to make it safe to deal with these three floodgates and not just one. Whether they're a meta strategy or a jank stun deck, these kinds of cards just aren't fun to play against, and can create so many one-sided games where you're locked out of the one core mechanic that almost every deck needs to use in some way. They do have their outs, and some can even be beaten by a single high attack normal summon. But in most situations, if these cards are allowed to remain on the field, your opponent just isn't having fun. Switching it up to number 6 is Red Reboot, a counter trap that stops trap decks from being able to play the game. Because with Reboot, if your opponent ever activates a trap card, you can just chain Red Reboot in order to negate the trap card and then set it face down on the field. But then your opponent gets to set any trap card they want directly from the deck as well. This might seem like an insane downside at first, since it gives your opponent access to pretty much their entire deck. But the other two parts of Red Reboot's effect make it more than worth it. Because, for the rest of the turn, after Red Reboot resolves, your opponent can't activate trap cards at all. If all these effects were on a regular counter trap, it'd be a decently strong card that would barely ever see play, because it'd need to be set for a turn before you could use it. But with Red Reboot, you can activate it directly from your hand by paying half your life points. This made Reboot an auto-win in pretty much any trap-based matchup, because if you've drawn into Reboot, and your opponent tries to access their engine or interrupt you at a key point in your combo, you can just slam down a red reboot to immediately counter whatever they're trying while locking them out of using trap cards for the entire turn. And for trap decks, this lingering effect is devastating and makes duels involving red reboot incredibly unfun for back row pilots because after red reboot resolves, they pretty much have to sit there and wait for their opponent to combo off and OTK them while they can't do anything to stop them, since most of the best interruptions is concentrating to their back row. What's worse is that Reboot is a counter trap, which makes it really difficult to actually interact with because the only thing you can chain to a counter trap is another counter trap. Now, there are some instances where Red Reboot actually acts as a way to beat some of the most toxic cards in the game, 
and was a mainstay in people's side decks as a way to counter oppressive and unfun floodgates like Imperial Order and Dimensional Barrier. And it can either backfire against the person who used it, because if your opponent can't clear their field or OTK, then getting access to any trap card in your deck is a huge benefit. But for as long as you're locked under Red Reboot's floodgate, you're pretty much a sitting duck regardless. Overall, Red Reboot's toxicity can't be underrated. And even though the card can technically benefit your opponent or be used to stop the toxic cards, its floodgate makes the game really unfun for anyone playing a trap deck because the card has a very little counterplay once it's activated and almost zero once it's resolved. And at number five, we have Called by the Grave, one of the most insane anti-hand trap tools in the game that makes a ton of common interruptions do nothing. Called by stops hand traps by letting you target a monster in your opponent's graveyard, banish it, and negate its effects as well as the effects of monsters with the same original name until the end of the next turn. So, if you ash your opponent and discard it to the graveyard for cost, your opponent can chain Called By to negate Ash's effect by banishing it from the grave. This particular effect is toxic because it essentially means that hand trapping your opponent during their combo is pretty much worthless, because your opponent can just chain Called By to negate your hand trap for free and continue playing as if they weren't interrupted. This is especially frustrating if you waited until a key part in your opponent's combo to hand trap them at the exact right time, only to find out they've drawn into a called by to make your hand trap worthless. Especially if your opponent has called by, drawing just a single hand trap means nothing and you need multiple in order to actually interact with their combo. Called by isn't the only anti-hand trap tool though, since cards like Triple Tactics, Talents, and Thrust also punish you for using hand traps and are arguably just as toxic. You see, while called by just negates the hand trap you activate, Talents and Thrust punish hand traps by giving your opponent access to some absolutely absurd effects. So, if you even dare to use a Cyframe Gear Gamma on your opponent's Cash Tier Unicorn, it might stop their effect from resolving, but then turns their Thrust and Talents online. With Thrust, you get access to any normal spell or trap card in the game. Meanwhile, with Talents, you get to either draw two, as if it were Pot of Greed, steal your opponent's monster like Change of Heart, or use its most toxic effect to mirror the Forceful Sentry by looking at your opponent's hand and shuffling their best option into their deck. Given how strong hand traps can be in Yu-Gi-Oh, it's good that anti-hand trap tools exist, especially in formats where Maxi is legal, since it's usually a difficult card to interact with. But, called by talents and thrusts are disproportionately strong, and do too much to counter them by either making them worthless, or by giving your opponent access to some ban-worthy effects that can mean they end up winning the game anyways, even if you hand trap them at the perfect opportunity. And at number 4, we have Cyberstein, one of the oldest cards on this list. And just like a lot of old cards, Cyberstein's effect is incredibly simple, but absurdly strong since it lets you summon any fusion monster from your extra deck in attack position, but you have to pay 5,000 light points in order to do so. Now, this effect has a ton of versatility in what it can summon, since it pretty much allows you to summon out any fusion monster in the game that doesn't have a restriction on its summon, and enables a ton of fusion boss monsters to see play that otherwise would be too difficult or awkward to bring out. However, this has also allowed for some oppressive and unfun fusion monsters to see some play as well. In the past, Cyberstein was usually seen as the center of FTK strategies, where a long and arduous combo you would set up Reaper Docus in order to point to Cyberstein to change its type to Psychic, and then you could equip with Telekinetic Cyber Cells that Cyberstein would no longer pay life points in order to use effect. And because Cyberstein isn't once per turn, this allows you to summon out multiple copies of Blaze Phoenix in order to burn your opponent for 8,000 life points of damage. FTKs in general are already fairly toxic, since they're made to ensure that your opponents don't get a single turn. But even in non-FTK strategies, Stein can still be used to summon out one of the most busted fusion monsters of the game, Naturia Exterio. Because Exterio can negate any spell or trap card by banishing a card from your graveyard and sending the top card of your deck to the graveyard. And because it has no once per turn, this pretty much means that your opponent is locked out of every single one of their spell and trap cards. Usually, Exterio is balanced by the heavy investment required to make it since it needs two synchro monsters in order to bring it out normally. But some modern combo strategies search out Stein, normal some to the field, and then slam down Xterra to lock your opponent out of their starters, extenders, and board breakers. There are stronger cards than Stein out there, and at the very least, it requires a lot of investment both in your extra deck and to actually summon it in order to make it playable. But whenever you see your opponent summon Stein, it's never going to be a fun time. Digging into number 3 is Mystic Mine, one of the most oppressive floodgates in Yu-Gi-Oh's history that's capable of winning games all on its own, to the point where it even became its own strategy. You see, if you control more monsters than your opponent while Mystic Mine is on the field, you're locked out of being able to declare attacks or use any kind of monster effects. But the same is also true of your opponent if they happen to control more monsters than you, making them the one to be locked in their mind. However, if you both control the same number of monsters during the end phase, Mystic Mine ends up destroying itself. However, despite having this inbuilt out, Mystic Mine was still incredibly toxic during the time it was legal, because if your opponent managed to keep Mine in the field while you controlled even a single monster, they could just sit behind it until you lost via deck out. This led to some incredibly unfun game states where both players were pretty much forced to pass their turns over and over. Drawing cards and doing pretty much nothing because the person locked under mine hasn't drawn their out. 
while the person that played it isn't incentivized to break the lock. This meant during the time mine was both legal and popular, you were forced to place some kind of out in your main deck. Since if you were ever hit with Mystic Mine without a Harpies or Cosmic Cyclone on your list, you lost the game on the spot. And because Mystic Mine was so powerful, you could even dedicate a ton of your deck to using it with decks like Sky Striker and Mystic Mine Burn, playing cards like Demise of the Land and Metaverse to ensure they always had a way to lock your opponent under Mine. What's even worse is that because these more dedicated Mine strategies cared so much about Mine as a win condition, they'd also play a ton of cards designed to protect it even if your opponent actually did draw into their outs. So while a Harpy's Feather Duster might be enough to break a normal Mystic Mine, it's not really helpful in one that's protected by Solemn Judgment, Field Barrier, or Beat Cop from the Underworld leaving you trapped. And no one enjoys being trapped under Mine. While it may not be an amazing tool for going second, and one that only is really important for certain strategies, the amount of unfun game states it can generate just makes the card really boring and bad for general player experience. Especially when your opponent tells you that you should just draw the out. And at number 2 on our list, we have Skill Drain, a representative trap card that are designed in some way, shape, or form to floodgate your opponent out of the game. The way Skill Drain does this is by letting you pay 1000 life points and negate the effects of all on-field monsters while they're face up on the field. Effectively, this means that both players are locked out of on-field monster effects, preventing them from being able to combo off and reach their actual strong boss monsters leading to the player with the highest attacking monsters or the best spell and trap card effects to a free victory, draining all the skill from the game. But Skill Drain isn't the only trap-based floodgate in Yu-Gi-Oh, and it definitely isn't the only toxic one either, since there have been a number of different trap-based floodgates that have played important roles in the metagame over the years, while making the game incredibly unfun. So much so that this entire list could be dedicated to only toxic trap cards. For example, during the time they were legal, both Imperial Order, Vanity's Emptiness, and Royal Oppression saw a ton of playing people's main and side decks because they could turn off some of the most important mechanics of the game with a single card. With Imperial Order stopping all spell cards, and Vanity's Emptiness and Royal Oppression locking players out of special summoning. Meanwhile, in the modern era, the most typical trap floodgates you'll see in a match are cards like Dimensional Barrier to stop extra deck summons, Anti-Spell Fragrance to stop spell cards, the trio of Gozen, Rivalry, and TCBOO to stop your one from being able to play, and of course, Skill Drain. What all of these cards have in common, no matter their era, is that they restrict either their opponent or both players from being able to form an action which is insanely powerful but also incredibly toxic. Especially because they're so easy to activate and don't require much investment to use, giving you an absurdly restrictive payoff for little investment. Whether it's Skill Drain, Imperial Order, or Royal Decree, trap-based floodgates are some of the most toxic cards in the game. They can make for some incredibly unfun games where you're not allowed an opportunity to fight back. Made even worse by the fact that they're usually harder to interact with than most other monster cards. But even with how awful most trap blaze floodgates are to face, there are still some cards out there that are way more toxic, such as the number one spot on this list. And claiming the title of most toxic card of the game is number 86 Heroic Champion Rongo Minion. One of the most overpowered boss monsters in the game, and a representation of the monster based floodgates that combo strategies can reach. In the case of Rongo Miniad, you can make it with at least two, but a maximum of five level four warrior monsters with every material on it giving it a new effect, but during each opponent's end phase you have to detach one material from Rongo. So if it only has one material, it can't be destroyed by battle. If it has two, then it gains 1500 attack and defense. Then at three, it becomes a tower as it's unaffected by all cards. At four materials, this card becomes really toxic because it prevents your opponent from being able to normal or special summon monsters at all. Then at five materials, you can just destroy all cards your opponent controls once per turn. Essentially, a Rongo Midiat with a ton of materials is no different from just being an outright FDK because you can't commit anything to the field since you're unable to summon any kind of monsters. And even if you try to set a back row, your entire field has the potential to be wiped depending on how many materials Rongo has. Especially because, contrary to its summoning condition would have you believe, Rongo can have way more than 5 materials thanks to Bamboozling Gossip Shadow. What's even worse is that the actual counterplay and its outs that exist for Rongo are very specific and fairly rare. You can't Kaiju Rongo because that would be a special summon a monster. And most spawn trap cards can't do anything to remove it from the field since it's blatantly just unaffected. So if you're worried about number 86, you have to rely on cards like Herald of the Abyss, Karma Cannon, and Xyz Encore if you want even a hope at being able to deal with Rongo. Because if you can't, you've lost the game. Now, like with Skill Drain, Rongo isn't the only toxic boss monster that combo decks have produced in the game's history, and a whole other list could be dedicated to toxic boss monsters, like the likes of True King Vault Calamities and Thunder Dragon Colossus, which floodgate your opponent out of the game as well to the likes of Firewall Dragon, which enabled a ton of FDKs. But even amongst them, Rongo Midiat takes the cake for being difficult to deal with, hard to prepare for, and overall just really lame to face. So much so that both the TCG and Master Duel have hit Rongo's strategies in some way. In Master Duel, Bamboozling Gossip Shadow is banned, so that you can no longer stack up a bunch of materials onto Rongo, while the TCG used the opposite solution, keeping Gossip Shadow, but banning Rongo in the process. 
A lot of strategies are better than those that are dedicated to summoning Ronko, since there are a lot of amazing boss monsters in the game that are stronger, more easily accessible, or sometimes both at the same time. But these monsters usually allow for some kind of counterplay, some way to beat them or force their interruption. While for Rongo, that barely exists. And it hitting the field means you're better off spending your time scooping up your cards rather than actually trying to beat it. Cyanide Cascade is a normal trap card which has the condition for its activation where, if you Link Summon a Link Monster, you can special summon one monster from your graveyard that was used as a material. Now, if this effect was tied to a spell card, it would be amazing. Simply because special summoning anything from the graveyard unconditionally like this, attached to a spell card, is extremely rare because of how abusable it is in combo decks. Even with the restriction that it only works on Link Summoning, it would still be pretty good. However, the fact that it's tied to a trap card makes it almost worthless. Because there are tons of trap cards in the game that have unconditional special summons from the graveyard already, and they're a lot easier to use than having to perform a Link Summon. So there's really no reason to play this card over the plethora of other, much more easily usable trap cards that special summon from the graveyard. Which really shows why Cyanet Cascade is a good card to show off how powerful effects tied to a trap card kind of makes it worthless. In this video, we'll go over 10 tech cards which absolutely no one uses that actually have some pretty good effects. And when I say nobody uses it, I mean they do sometimes see competitive play, but just not a lot or not recently. And at number 10, we have Ghost Mourner and Moonlight Chill. This card has the effect that allows you to negate the effect of a monster on the field after it's been special summoned, and also if that face-up card leaves the field this turn, the controller takes damage equal to its attack. So basically, it's like Effect Veiler or an Infinite Impermanence, except it also deals a little bit of burn damage, and has the stats of the Ghost Sisters, where it's a level 3 tuner, so it has some niche uses with Christian Hockey Fibrax. And the reason this card doesn't see very much play is because it's a slightly more restrictive to use Infinite Impermanence or Effect Veiler, and also has a hard once per turn, which the previous two cards lack. So if all you need is a hand trap that negates your opponent's card effects, usually you're set with just Effect Veiler or Infinite Impermanence, as they can target any effect monster while not having once per turns on their effects. Which means if you have three copies of Infinite Impermanence in your hand, you can use all three copies of them in hand during your opponent's turn. But if you have three copies of Ghost Mourner and Moonlight Chill, you'll only be able to use a single copy. So the effect is actually pretty good, as most people will use Infinite Impermanence on a monster of a special summon from the extra deck anyway. And if your opponent continues their combos in order to get rid of the card in the field, they'll take extra damage. So it's a perfectly viable tech option, even if it's not as live as the other two, and absolutely does see competitive play occasionally. And at number 9, we have Gizmek Kaku, the Supreme Shining Sky stack. This card has the effect in the hand, where if there's a monster in the extra monster zone, you can special summon this card from your hand, and it has another effect where it can absorb a monster in the extra monster zone, and if it destroys a monster by battle, you can special summon a monster that's currently being absorbed by the card. It is a pretty decent stat line at 2750, so with most decks ending with a monster in their extra monster zone, this card is almost always live, and it has a really good form of removal and a chance to just special summon the card it removes. This card kind of reminds me of Dino Wrestler Pankratops and its usefulness, except the effect is purely limited to monsters in the extra monster zone, which is most likely only going to be a single target. But its effect is not spell speed 2, so it can't avoid disruption like Pankratops can. So, because it can't just choose anything your opponent controls, it's limited enough where it doesn't see widespread play, but has a technically really good effect, which is also pretty generic. And at number 8, we have Mistaken Arrest. This is a quick play spell card, which has the effect where cards cannot be added from either player's main deck to the hand, except by drawing them, until the end of your next turn after this card resolves. So, since it's a quick play spell card, you can actually chain it in response to your opponent activating something that searches from the deck, like Elemental Hero Stratos, for example. Then it will stop the card from searching, and stop them from searching for the rest of the turn, which sadly does carry over to your turn as well, and makes it so you can't do any searching when your turn rolls around. So Mistaken Arrest is basically a longer lasting version of Drone Lockbird, except it has the benefits where it's able to stop a search from happening in the first place, rather than stopping searches from happening after a search has already been performed, which is how Drone Lockbird activates. Although Drone Lockbird has the advantage where it's a hand trap, so you can use it during your opponent's first turn, whereas Mistaken Arrest can't. Although if you're going first, or if you just really don't want to play any monster cards in your deck at all, Mistaken Arrest is a perfectly fine alternative to Drone Lockbird, assuming you're fine being locked out of searching during your turn as well, which some decks can accommodate. And at number 7, we have Ghost Reaper and Winter Cherries. This card has the effect where if your opponent controls more monsters than you do, you can discard this card from your hand in order to reveal one monster in your extra deck, 
to then banish all copies of that card from your opponent's extra deck with the same name. So if you just stack your extra deck with a whole bunch of very common boss monsters, you can completely stop your opponent's end goal, where they have to use their second best cards, or just lose in some cases if you banish the card their entire deck revolves around, like ABC Dragon Buster. And this card absolutely did see some competitive play. It just hasn't seen very much competitive play recently, because most meta decks go into a wide variety of boss monsters, not really a specific one. And because this card kind of falls into the category of just not being played right now, it's somewhat low on this list, kind of like all the other ones I've talked about so far. And at number six, we have Shared Ride. This card has the effect where after you use it, each time your opponent adds a card from their deck or graveyard to their hand except by drawing, you get to draw one card. So it's kind of like a spell card version of Maxi, except one that only triggers on searches rather than special summons. And generally, most decks special summon a lot more than they search, but copious amounts of searching is kind of a requirement of a deck being a meta deck, and since you can just chain it in response to your opponent already performing any search, you'll always go at least card neutral with it, even if you only draw a single card. It seems like all the cards that have Sangen in their artwork, like this one in Mistaken Arrest, kind of just have effects that are similar to popular hand traps, while being slightly weaker than them. And the fact that they're quick play spell cards inherently nerfs them compared to their hand trap counterparts. In addition to just not being as strong as their hand trap counterparts. As generally, the reason hand traps are really good is because you can use them during your opponent's first turn. That way you can stop your opponent from establishing an unbeatable board, rather than trying to react to it. And at number 5, we have Royal Decree. This card has the effect that where it's faced up on the field, it straight up negates the effects of all other trap effects on the field. So, it's a trap card that stops all other trap cards, and is basically the trap card version of Jinzo, the card that has seen competitive play ever since it came out in 2002. And it's pretty obvious why. It's one card that shuts down a third of the cards in the game. However, in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, actual trap cards aren't really played very much. And the best way to stop trap cards is usually to just use Red Reboot. Red Reboot can negate the effects of trap cards for only a single turn. However, it's spell speed 3 and can be activated from the hand. And that hand trap status means you don't need to set it like Royal Decree for a turn in order to flip it face up on your next turn in order to gain the benefits of locking out your opponent's trap cards. Plus, Royal Decree has counterplay to it, where your opponent can stop it with just any form of removal. Red Reboot is much harder to stop though, because of that spell speed 3 nature and you don't need to wait a turn in order to make sure the card is live. In fact, Red Reboot is so good at stopping trap cards that it's currently limited on the ban list, whereas World Decree is completely unlimited at 3 copies. And World Decree does have a long history of competitive play in the side deck as a tech option, which shouldn't surprise you based on what this list is about. In fact, the card was even semi-limited for 4 formats back in 2007 through 2008, and then one more time in 2010. Although it's definitely in the category of fallen out of favor recently, mainly because trap cards on a whole aren't as widely played, and it requires just a tiny bit too much setup, where actually it's kind of better to just use a Denko Seca instead, for example. And at number 4, we have Retaliating C. This card has the effect where, if your opponent activates a spell card that has an effect which can special summon a monster, you can then special summon this card from your hand. And it has an additional effect where, if it's special summoned by its first effect, it gains a floodgate effect where any card sent to the graveyard is banished instead. So a hand trap version of Macro Cosmos. In addition to this card's effect on the field, where if it's sent from the field to the graveyard, you get to add an insect type monster from your deck to your hand, just as long as it's earth and has 1500 or less attack. Now, its floodgate effect is actually kind of limiting in how it can actually be applied, because not a lot of decks use spell cards to special summon pretty heavily. Although there are some archetypes which almost exclusively special summon through spell cards, and those are generally fusion archetypes, where pretty much all fusion spell cards are spell cards. So it's an excellent option to use against a fusion heavy deck. In addition to its floating effect not being once per turn, it doesn't miss timing and activates no matter how it's sent from the field to the graveyard. Since Maxi is currently banned, there isn't a super good generic card you can search out, but I do use this card a lot in Duel Link specifically because of that effect in order to search out Resonance Insect which is another insect type monster which does not have a once per turn on any of its floating effects that can search or send cards to the graveyard. If they ever create a really strong insect type archetype in the future, you can bet they're going to be using resonant insects and retaliating C to some advantage. And in number 3 we have Witch's Strike. This is a trap card which can only be activated if your opponent negates the activation or effect of a card, or if they negate the normal or special summon of a monster. 
in which case you get to destroy all cards your opponent controls and in their hand. And since the name of the game in modern Yu-Gi-Oh is to negate, it seems like this card would always be live and provide you amazing advantage because it just destroys your opponent's entire hand. And that is 100% correct. The card is potentially incredibly good. However, it's a trap card, which requires you to set it first and wait for your opponent to negate an effect before it gets destroyed on your side of the field. If the effect was simply a quick play spell card, or a hand trap, it would be kind of broken. The way they rein in the power level of this card is by attaching it to a trap card, which slows it down just enough that it's just a really neat tech option, but doesn't see very much competitive play. Because if you're able to resolve the card a single time, the amount of advantage it nets you can kind of win you the game. However, your opponent can just negate the effect of Witch's Strike in order to stop that from happening, which is kind of ironic considering the activation requirement of the card. And at number two, we have the Engraver of the Mark. This is a card which has the effect where, if your opponent activates an effect, which requires them to declare exactly one card name, you can send this card from your hand to the graveyard in order to declare another name, which then becomes the name they declared for that card's effect. And it also has an effect on the field where it can destroy one of your opponent's monsters after a turn. Now, this card falls under the category of having an incredibly niche counter effect, but it's potentially pretty good. There have been some cards in the meta which required you to declare exactly one card name, and I have seen competitive play, like Mind Crush or Prohibition. Although those cards haven't really seen competitive play recently, and they were never really widespread enough where it was worth running a card like Engraver of the Mark in order to circumvent their effects. So unless Konami puts out a new, really strong card which declares exactly one card name, it's probably going to stay a niche card that no one uses, but has the potential to be very useful. And at number one, we have Sales Pitch. This card can only be activated if your opponent adds a card from their deck to their hand except by drawing, in which case you get to add any card from your deck to your hand although you can't activate the card for the rest of the turn. So, Sales Pitch basically just lets you search out any card in the game without any restrictions, and that's almost useful to literally every deck. There isn't really a deck that doesn't benefit from being able to search out any card. And the activation requirement is the same as Mistaken Arrest or Shared Ride, i.e. your opponent just adding cards from their deck to their hand outside of drawing, which means you're pretty much going to have the card live in any normal duel. So why does nobody use Sales Pitch if its effect is obviously super good? Well, the same reason as Witch's Strike or Royal Decree. Because it's a trap card that needs to be set for a turn first. And that's pretty much it. I bet there will be some decks which can make use of it in the future because the effect is just really good and it's not that hard at all to activate. It does have the restriction where you can't use the card you add to your hand during the turn, which definitely limits it a lot. If you could use the card, then you could use it to search out a hand trap during your opponent's turn in order to stop your opponent from doing whatever they're doing during their turn. Although, since you can't, you're basically just limited to searching out a card that'd be really useful during your next turn. But being able to search out any card is still really good even under those restrictions. So it might see some competitive play in the future, who knows? And it's definitely one of the best tech cards that no one's currently using. Dealer's Choice is a trap card that has players shuffle their deck, then each player draws one card. Then each player discards one card from their hand. So, while this card does allow you to perform an unconditional draw, and an additional effect to discard a card from your hand by effect, which can activate a lot of discard effects and graveyard effects, the thing that really makes this card kind of bad is that it affects both players, and makes you go minus one in the process. We don't actually gain any card advantage for using this card, just a tiny bit of hand manipulation. So, if this effect was tied to a spell card, it probably would see play, just like similar card Dark World Dealing does. But, since it's tied to a trap card, it's just a worse jar of greed. Matching Outfits is a trap card which has the effect where both players reveal the top card of the deck. Then if both players have the same type of card, they get to add those cards to their hand. Otherwise, both of those cards get banished instead. Now, this card, even without the random chance, would not be worth using, simply because it gives your opponent a card as well. We already have a card in the game called Jar of Greed, which simply draws you one card from your deck on a normal trap card, and it's considered way too slow to see competitive play in the modern game and it actually replaces itself and doesn't cause your opponent to gain any kind of advantage lead. Whereas matching outfits is basically just a worse pot of greed that doesn't even give you a guaranteed card. Jar Generosity is a card which simply has the effect to place one card from your hand on your choice of the top or bottom of your deck. Now, this card was most likely created specifically as a joke, because it's referencing another really bad card called Pot of Generosity, which allows you to place two cards from your hand back into your deck. Jar of Generosity is printed in 2021, so it's a modern era card, and with its effect being purely detrimental, 
There is no other way to describe this card other than one that was made bad on purpose. 